Audio book title, Mix Collection The 8th of October 2023 Walker of the Worlds Chapter 1829 Two Singing Swords Yao Cheng Ying had not expected Lin Mu to be this dismissive about the attack. I've lost too many of them, so I kinda need to care. Lin Mu replied to the woman, making the audience stunned. Though, now that I know, I may as well not wear them, he said before letting the tattered robes fall off. Lin Mu's golden body was revealed and shone like a lamp. His muscles which had been tempered through years of effort and pain looked imposing. Enough. Yao Cheng Ying seemed irritated and slashed out again. Tilda clank clank. This time, Lin Mu defended against the slashes in a rather crude way. He directly used his bare hands to slap the sword slashes. Similar to before though, the slashes only broke partly, with the remnant still striking Lin Mu's body. He's still fine? The audience wasn't able to figure out why. Once again, faint lines appeared where Lin Mu was struck by the two broken sword slashes. The people who saw this were fleet stunned, while some tried to make sense of it. He, he's a body cultivator. The audience finally realized, there were hundreds of body cultivators in the audience along with other experienced cultivators thus after seeing Lin Mu easily defend against the sword slashes they found it easy to come to a conclusion. Before this, Lin Mu had fooled them by using his chi skills and sword skills for the most part. Even in his battle against Tan Ning, while his body cultivation was revealed on some level, the people attributed it to some defensive skill. It makes sense. His chi cultivation is just at the second tribulation stage of the immortal realm, but his body cultivation is definitely higher. No wonder he managed to come this far, he was simply hiding it all. The audience broke out in an uproar, it was so obvious, how did we miss it? They couldn't help but question, his sword skills are too good. I just thought he was a dedicated sword cultivator. Even his Tao skills are too good. I don't think anyone that focused on Tao skills that strong would also be able to focus on their body cultivation too. They tried to come to possible explanations. SSH. Just look at the fight. I don't think that's all he was hiding from us. An old expert silenced the juniors around him. Tilda clank clank clank. And sure enough. Looking up they saw Lin Mu face off against Yao Chen Ying directly using his body. The woman's sword slashes were problematical in that they couldn't be fully blocked, but they still didn't manage to deal that much damage to Lin Mu. The unstoppable sword slashes even made Lin Mu wonder just how was Yao Chen Ying was doing this. Her sword skills are certainly top notch. Her comprehension also seems to be one that has been gained through many years of learning. Lin Mu thought but this doesn't match up with her actions from before. If it was all correct, she shouldn't have sword skills like this. He wondered. Yao Cheng Ying might not be able to inflict much damage on Lin Mu right now, but her attacks still contained enough impact to push Lin Mu back. She prevented Lin Mu from getting close to her and also seemed to be intensifying her attacks. I need to get close to her to use the bracelet, but her attacks keep on pushing me back. Lin Mu tried to think of a method of overcoming this. Tilda clank clank. Lin Mu slammed his palms against another sword slash, this time focusing on the dispersal of the sword intent contained within it. This won't work. I can't sense it fully, Lin Mu muttered to himself. The sword intent itself is meant to dissipate somehow. It is also why it is able to keep its force even while being blocked. Having realized this, Lin Mu figured out at least one aspect of the sword intent. Tilda clank clank, he swung his palms around, trying to deflect the sword slashes this time, but still managed to fail, as the sword intent simply broke a part of them where his palms struck, the rest of the sword intent still continued towards his body, the sword intent's property seems to be dispersal, instead of letting the entire sword slash collapse, it sacrifices a part of it to continue onwards. Lin Mu analyzed further. By now, Yao Cheng Ying was also starting to realize that her attacks weren't doing much to Lin Mu. As such, she decided to change her method of attack. Tilda Shua, she held her sword horizontally in front of her as her aura changed into a new form, Dance of the Flourishing Flowers. Yao Cheng Ying lightly muttered, Tilda Hum Novel Next com, as if her sword was singing. A melodious tone was heard and Yao Cheng Ying's aura transformed. Oh, Lin Mu's immortal sense picked up on the transformation and also what Yao Cheng Ying was doing. 
Her sword intent is merging into her aura. Tilda whoosh. A couple of seconds later, a wave of energy spread from Yao Cheng Ying, carrying with it thousands of flower petals. Tilda Xing. Yao Cheng Ying twisted her sword and twirled it in the air, creating illusory flower petals that flew out. The illusory flower petals were larger than the other flower petals that were surrounding and exuded a lot of power. Feeling the pure sword intent contained within all the petals, Lin Mu couldn't help but feel his own sword intent getting excited. Very well, I'll figure it out as we go, Lin Mu said before withdrawing afternoon pine again. You're using petals, I'll use trees. Tilda Xing. The double edged sword hummed similarly as if taunting the opponent's sword. Golden Noon Pine. Lin Mu slashed out with the sword, as yellow pine trees composed of metal immortal chi rose from it. Tilda den deng deng, pine trees composed of metal immortal chi rose from it. Tilda den deng deng, the metal pine trees collided against the thousands of petals filled with sword intent, creating a noise that seemed to be composed of two opposing songs. Tilda boom, the two melodies reached a crescendo before finally exploding apart. Chapter 1830 Natural State The clash of the two sword intents was both dangerous and beautiful at the same time, making the audience marvel at it. A cloud of dust and debris covered the area of the clash, hiding both Lin Mu and Yao Cheng Ying in it. But inside this, a mix of yellow and pink swirled. The yellow color was from Lin Mu's sword attacks while the pink was from Yao Cheng Ying's sword slashes. Damn it, we can't see shit. The audience was bothered by the blocked screen. Tilda whoosh. Thankfully, just a few seconds later, another attack from the two contestants blew all the dust away. It revealed the scene of the fight that had greatly changed from before. Deep craters mixed with long gullies were left on the ground. The rocks that composed the ground had been thoroughly ground to dust due to the thousands of petals from Yao Cheng Ying's attacks while the metal pine trees of Lin Mu had fissured it to no end. You're certainly improving, Lin Mu muttered, looking at the tens of small dents that were left on his skin. Yao Cheng Ying's petals had hit him several times, which were a lot stronger than her previous sword slashes. It was clear that she had been holding back this entire time. As for what reason, Lin Mu didn't know. All he knew was that she probably had a lot more to show, and he needed to match up to it as well. Through this clash, Lin Mu also realized that just his own sword skills alone won't be enough to go up against Yao Chen Ying. He had gotten damaged from the woman's attacks, albeit it was still not on the same level as Tan Ning. But then again, Tan Ning was using all his power and also had the advantage of lightning bypassing my defenses. Lin Mu thought to himself, Yao Chen Ying will surely be using more and more of her power as the fight goes on. It'll eventually reach a point where my defenses won't hold up either. He realized. Lin Mu glanced at Yao Chen Ying who was dancing around with her sword, creating more and more petals. It was clear that her attacks were about to get stronger than earlier. I had thought about this beforehand too, but guess this just confirms it all. Lin Mu thought before taking a deep breath. Holding back all this time had been getting a bit annoying, but I guess this much is enough. He said, confusing Yao Cheng Ying. Tilda Huala. In the next moment, a surge of aura rose from Lin Mu's body, revealing his endless vitality. Tilda Hong. The vitality continued to rise until it became almost palpable. A red aura surrounded Lin Mu, which was built from pure vitality. Heavens. What even is that? The body cultivators in the audience stood up, seeing the scene. What is his body cultivation base for his vitality to be that strong? Have you seen any other body cultivator like that? They couldn't help but ask amongst themselves. Not many. Some can replicate that, but what Taoist Mulin is showing isn't even his body cultivation aura. That is pure vitality, one of the body cultivators replied. What does that mean exactly? A child with a Tao treading realm cultivation base asked. It means. He hasn't even started to use his body cultivation yet. The body cultivator answered, that vitality is something that is something normal to his being, if it is only appearing now it only means that he had been sealing it within him all this time, the body cultivator explained, this is his natural state, he added, stunning the people that were hearing him, natural state. Do you even know what you're saying right now? Another body cultivator protested, 
if this is his natural state, do you intend to say he's the same as the steel-horned general? The general's mention aroused the memories about the tournament in which he had fought, as well as his many exploits. He was well known in the Rust Sky world as one of the strongest body cultivators and also as one of the winners of the tournament of the four guardian beasts. He might as well be. I don't have to say much. We'll see soon enough, the first body cultivator said with a frown while pointing at the formation screen. Tilde Hong Long. And sure enough, the audience didn't need to guess for long as the truth revealed itself to them. Lin Yu's body seemingly grew in size, while a couple of patterns appeared on his body. The first one was on his chest, which was that of an inverted triangle from which multiple bands extended. These bands reached his shoulder and wrapped around his back where another pattern was present. But this pattern was different and a lot more detailed than the one on his chest. Wait, that totem isn't that. Someone recognized the totem on Lin Mu's back, but before they could speak more, a loud roar was heard. The roar seemingly came out of Lin Mu's body, as the pattern on his chest glowed in a red light. A second later, the form of a large beast materialized behind him. Tilda Roar. The large beast was a giant bear that had horns on its head as well as long claws that reached nearly a foot in length. Its own height was about 5 meters tall and looked massive compared to Lin Mu, Tilda Mu and Ophel Next.com. But another loud cry was heard, this time coming from the totem on Lin Mu's back. The totem was that of a legless bull and gleamed in a yellow and red light. The totem's cry caused another beast's form to appear. This form appeared above Lin Mu's head and was even bigger than the bear behind him. Similar to the totem on his back, it was that of a legless bull. The bull only had a body and horns on its head. It looked to be furious and puffed out red steam from its nostrils. No way. That. It can't be. The body cultivators trembled upon seeing the bull. Chapter 1831 Tyrannical Display What is that? The child couldn't help but ask upon seeing the two beasts feeling immensely curious. Other people in the audience were also wondering the same, not knowing the significance of the two beast forms that had appeared. I don't know what that bear is but that, that is, the tyrant bull, Tilda Mu. As if on cue, the bull's form above Lin Mu's head let out a cry before a great strength filled Lin Mu's body. A tyrannical aura surrounded him as two terrifying beast forms backed him up. Tilda Roar. The giant bear roared as well. Joining in with the tyrant bull, not wanting to be underestimated, the two beasts infused their powers into Lin Mu's body. While it kept on growing, I would have never thought I'd get to see tyrant bull marrow secrets today. An elderly body cultivator in the audience said, The tyrant bull marrow secrets was one of the best body cultivation techniques that many body cultivators yearned to practice. Despite the fact that the manual for it was actually common, not many could go ahead with their desires. Obtaining the tyrant bull marrow was a difficult and expensive task that only a few body cultivators with a rich and powerful background could afford. But that was merely half the battle. In order to actually be able to practice the technique, one needed to make the tyrant bull's spirit submit to them. It was a task harder than anything else, and most failed at this step. And through some luck of talent, they did manage to survive this but they would still have to continue surviving it further. After all, being a body cultivator was the same as always having a tribulation on one's head. Those with weaker wills could not survive this. Thus, while the tyrant bull marrow secrets was a strong technique accessible to many, seldom did anyone try to practice it. Seeing someone actually practice and succeed in the technique was even rare. Just what level has he reached? The people in the audience couldn't help but wonder. Looking at the tyrant bull's form, it is still legless. He should be at the third level and equivalent to the third tribulation stage of the immortal realm. The elderly body cultivator answered for the others. Third tribulations stage in body and second in chi. He's done both almost at the same level. Many couldn't believe that someone could balance both this well. Don't forget. He's also using a risky technique like the tyrant bull marrow secrets and even has sword skills with a strong sword intent. Another cultivator reminded Tilda Raw. While the audience was marveling at Lin Mu's capability, the man in question was ready to act. The tyrannical aura surrounded him and was reinforcing his body as well. Lin Mu could tell that his body was different than the last time he had used the tyrant bull marrow secrets. 
Their great slumber bear bloodline is also amplifying my body with its power. I guess the tyrant bull's spirit made it come out too. Lin Mu thought to himself, combing them with the true gold body forging arts, I should be able to handle even more attacks. He reckoned. Yao Cheng Ying gazed at her opponent and felt shocked. Lin Mu, who had exceeded a height of two meters and was exuding a tyrannical aura unlike anything she had seen so far in the tournament, to her it was a massive difference, as his style and demeanor seemed different. All the skills and methods that Lin Mu had used in his earlier fights seemed incomparable to what he was showing now. The past information might not work here. Yao Cheng Ying thought, furrowing her brows but he is still lacking. She had her own pride and wouldn't be backing down this easily. Flourishing flower sword art, dazzling petal rush. Yao Cheng Ying spun her sword before thrusting it towards Lin Mu. This created a spiraling wave of energy that carried thousands of pink petals with it. They rushed towards Lin Mu, threatening to grind him to dust. And yet, Lin Mu was unfazed, having a look of casual confidence. Tilda Hu, -u, taking a deep breath. His chest perked up before he made his move. Clenching his fist tightly, Lin Mu threw a simple punch. Till rumble. And yet, the simple punch transformed into something otherworldly. A tyrannical aura coalesced around his fist and transformed into a large fist imprint. It then rose towards the incoming petals. Colliding with it effortlessly, the pink petals were like paper against the fist, crumbling into specks of chi and dissipating. The sword intent contained within the petals managed to sustain the power, but the tyrannical aura of the fist was simply too domineering. It crushed the sword intent, forcefully making it disperse. He blocked it. He actually blocked the attack fully. The audience screamed in shock. They had seen the unstoppable attacks of Yao Cheng Ying and had thought that it would be the same as before. And yet, a simple fist of Lin Mu's had collapsed the entire attack in one go. Ho. Looks like this is what I need to keep as a standard, Lin Mu said, opening his fist into a claw form. If it is just this much, then I can do this all day. He smiled wildly, a rush of excitement and violence spreading through his heart. Tilda Boom, with a single stomp, he turned into a blur, appearing right in front of Yao Chen Ying. Gar, the woman was still a fifth tribulation stage immortal and managed to react to it thrusting with her long sword. Tilda Deng, Lin Mu's red and yellow hand that was bare, struck the sharp sword of Yao Cheng Ying, creating a shockwave between them. Tilda Kaboom, both of them were pushed back in this, while Yao Cheng Ying's sword was deflected back. Tilda Drip, a single drop of blood fell from Lin Mu's hand, and a small cut could be seen on it. NFLnext.com. That's a strong sword, for sure. Lin Mu said, looking at the cut on his hand that was already healing. Is she still holding back? He couldn't help but wonder. Chapter 1832 Breaking a Top Skill Yao Cheng Ying felt the throbbing pain in her arm and infused immortal chi into it to suppress it. He managed to take the thrust with his bare hands. Even with his body cultivation, he should still have had his hand shredded. Yao Cheng Ying found it astonishing. But at the same time, she felt angered at it. She was angry that some random cultivator that had no backing that she knew of was able to block her like that. I'll finish him directly now. She thought as a scowl appeared on her face. Die. Yao Cheng Ying was pissed from all this, having not expected the battle to go like this. Tilda Xing Xing. She moved her sword in an inverted V shape as an illusory mountain condensed in front of her. Flourishing flower sword art. Blossoming mountain rise. Her sword intent infused into the mountain, turning into a peak that was filled with millions of petals. The said mountain quickly increased to a size of 50 meters and continued to grow while threatening to crash upon Lin Mu. With the sword intent and immortal chi that was contained with it, if it hit Lin Mu, it would be the same as getting pressed into a blender. I've been wanting to try this out, you just gave me the perfect opportunity. Looking at the massive size of the mountain, Lin Mu wasn't dissuaded. Instead, he decided to take it head on. Ha! Lin Mu let out a loud cry as the tyrannical aura filled his arms. His muscles bulged out and multiplied rapidly, growing his arms in the process. His already large body grew even more bulky, with unnaturally sized arms attached to it. Those knowledgeable about the tyrant bull marrow secrets watched it all with wide eyes. From the second stage. There, 
Before the man in the audience could speak though, Lin Mu's loud shout spoke for him, Tyrant lift. Lin Mu spread his arms wide open while using his hands as claws and collided against the incoming mountain. The millions of sharp petals that were surrounding the mountain were forcefully scattered by Lin Mu. Tilda boom. His arms struck the mountain and dug into its sides, while his claw-like hands gripped it tightly. Ah! Letting out a loud roar Lin Mu thrust his legs against the ground, shattering all of it in a kilometer's radius. Tilda crack. But this was all just to give him momentum as he rose up from the push, pulling the mountain along with him. Lin Mu's large arms exerted terrifying strength, as numerous cracks started to spread on the mountain. Novelnext.com The mountain itself was also resisting Lin Mu's attack, or at least attempting to and yet it was unable to do so. Tyrannical aura seeped in from the cracks while Lin Mu continued to rise up higher and higher. In just a few seconds, he had reached a height of 500 meters while the mountain reached a height of 100 meters break. At this point, Lin Mu squeezed with all his might before forcibly changing the trajectory of the mountain. Tilda crumble. The mountain composed of immortal chi and sword intent was unable to withstand Lin Mu's tyrannical might, crumbling into rocks that fell down from the sky. The rocks didn't last long either, and quickly dispersed into chi before they reached the ground. Good heavens. He broke the strongest skill from the flourishing flower sword art. The audience was absolutely gobsmacked. Even if the flourishing flower sect was from another world, it was still rather well known in the rust sky world. There were many people from other worlds here to watch the tournament too and were thus knowledgeable about their techniques and skills. What Yao Cheng Ying had used was the strongest skill in the flourishing flower sword art. It was something that was the pride of the sect and yet, it had been broken by a black horse in the tournament. This was almost unbelievable to them as an attack like this would have injured a 6th tribulation stage immortal while pushing a 7th tribulation stage immortal back. Of course, they didn't know that when Lin Mu had practiced the same with the same Tess, he had broken an equally strong cloud pillar. Ha ha ha. Lin Mu laughed wildly, seeing his handiwork. His body wasn't fully safe either though, as hundreds of fine cuts could be seen on his torso, arms and face. The sword intent contained within the peak and the petals were trying to infiltrate Lin Mu's body, but the tyrannical aura and vitality were proving to be a great obstacle. To the sword intent. It was the same as swimming up a waterfall. Yao Cheng Ying looked up at Lin Mu in the sky, who seemed to be pleased with his act. You dare humiliate me like this? Yao Cheng Ying felt her pride being insulted. This isn't all that I know. She screamed before a cold and unsettling aura rose from her body. The aura was unlike her sharp sword intent and also didn't have the color of her petals. Instead, it was a lifeless slate gray, causing those who looked at it to feel unnerved. Tilda Huala. Yao Cheng Ying coated her long sword with this aura and slashed at Lin Mu in the sky. Tilda Wang. The sword slash this time looked incomparable to the mountain from before. Its size was also small, being only two meters wide. And yet, when Lin Mu felt it, he instantly became alert. His laughter stopped and his face became serious. Tilda Whoosh. He kicked in the air, changing his direction forcibly, and tried to dodge the incoming sword slash. But he witnessed the sword slash changing the directions and following after him, too. As if the sword slash was sentient, its speed suddenly rose and it struck Lin Mu. Tilda hiss. A sizzling sound was heard when the sword slash hit Lin Mu's left arm. A burning pain rose from his hand, alarming Lin Mu greatly. It bypassed my defenses as if they didn't exist. What is this? Chapter 1833 A Devastating Clash Lin Mu hadn't expected the sword slash to move like that at all, not to mention the injury that he had sustained. What is this? Lin Mu frowned feeling his skin continuing to burn. My body cultivation isn't working and even the metal defenses of the true gold body forging arts have been suppressed. He observed. NFLnext.com the tyrannical aura of the tyrant bull was actively trying to resist the invading energy of the sword slash but was struggling. Meanwhile, Lin Mu's vitality was pouring into his arm, trying to heal the damage that was being done. At first, his vitality was unable to do the energy from causing more damage, but a few seconds later they managed to reach a stalemate. The invading energy couldn't progress anymore and the vitality couldn't heal the damage either. 
the spreading stopped at least. Lin Mu muttered as he gazed at his skin which had turned an eerie grey. It looked like he had been poisoned but knew that attack had no poison in it. Tilda Xing Xing. But before Lin Mu could think of much, he was attacked again. Multiple sword slashes filled with the lifeless slate grey energy flew towards him. Damn it. Lin Mu flew about to dodge the attacks, but they continued chasing after him as if they had a mind of their own. True Earth Heart Dao Embryo. Great shield form. Seeing that dodging wasn't working, Lin Mu knew he had to take the attack head on. And what better way to do so than using his defensive Dao embryo? Tilda Shua. The shield like Dao shell rose from Lin Mu's chest and quickly grew a layer of rocks to transform into a large shield. Tilda Clang. Just when the attacks were about to hit Lin Mu, the great shield had formed and blocked them. Tilda Crack. Surprisingly, the rock layer on the shield cracked and fell off from the attack. At the same time, Lin Mu felt a drain on his immortal chi as the Dao embryo tried to repair the shield. Lin Mu watched with bated breath, whether the shield would be repaired or not. After all, his arm had still not healed and the burning sensation within it continued. Tilda Shua. Thankfully, it seemed like the Dao embryo was a lot more resilient than he had thought and the shield repaired itself quickly. A new layer of rocks grew back on it, while the true earth Dao embryo continued to throb within it. Tilda Hong. But Yao Cheng Ying wasn't one to let Lin Mu rest and slashed out with her sword again. This time though, the sword intent combined with the slate grey energy and took on an illusory shape. It condensed to form a large chain that was covered in deadly looking spikes. Withering life chain. Yao Cheng Ying muttered, her voice strange. Her words weren't heard by anyone else. But Lin Mu's immortal sense was always close to her thus he picked up on them. Her voice. Seems different. Lin Mu wondered what was going on. Dodge that, Lin Mu. Suddenly he heard an urgent call. Senior. Lin Mu heard Zukong's warning and knew that the incoming attack was a lot more serious. If even Senior Zukong has to warn me, this must not be something simple. He realized as such, Lin Mu decided to avoid at all costs. Tilda Wush. First. He flew back at great speed while covering his back with the earthen shield. At the same time, he gathered chi and vital essence in his right arm, turning it into a spiral. And the moment that Lin Mu felt it was ready, he turned around. Boulder collapsing fist third form, devastator. Lin Mu unleashed one of his strongest attacks while also amplifying his strength with the tyrannical aura, Tilda Boom. The pinkish red ribbon of energy shot out of Lin Mu's fist, leaving his knuckles bloodied from it. The ribbon of energy looked otherworldly and the people that watched it were left astounded. They had no idea what it was but knew that it made the hair on their necks stand up. The ribbon of energy shot towards the deadly spike chain and collided with a great impact. Tilda Kaboom. A bright red light spread from the collision, blinding the formation screen for a few seconds. What's happening? We can't see anything again. The audience was getting restless. They were sitting at the edge of their seats, looking forward to how the fight was progressing. Elders, please do something. They called out to the elders of the temple that were overseeing the fight. The formation masters stained around the platform quickly got to adjusting it all, and the point of view changed. They could now see the two illusory constructs clashing from the distance. The pinkish red ribbon and the spike chain spun endlessly and tried to eradicate each other. Lin Mu too was surprised as this was the first time Devastator had been stalled this way. Is this her true strength? Lin Mu wondered. He had been able to handle her so far just using his own strength and hadn't gotten the chance to use the bracelet that the crown princess had given him. Lin Mu had even wondered if it would be necessary for him at a certain point. But now he was sure that he really had to use it. That lifeless slate grey aura of her continues to strengthen. I cannot let it progress anymore. Lin Mu made up his mind and thought of a plan to use the bracelet. Before he could do that though, Lin Mu heard Zukong's voice again. You cannot carelessly approach her. That lifeless slate grey energy that you are seeing is a type of baleful energy. Zukong warned. A baleful energy? Lin Mu raised his brows while continuing to move. He still needed to put distance between him and Yao Cheng Ying after all. I was able to withstand the baleful energy on the battlefield. So why can't I block this? Lin Mu asked. Is this stronger than that baleful energy? Yes, more particularly it is withering baleful energy. 
it contains traces of the withering down and is rather hazardous for all living things. Xukong replied, your injuries won't heal as long as the withering energy lingers within your hand. Your vitality can only stall it for now, but it will continue to consume your vitality, he explained. How do I stop it then senior? Lin Mu asked with concern. You need to get rid of the person who used it, Xukong replied. I do not know how that girl managed to obtain control over the withering energy, but it is not normal at all. Considering she can use it without stop like this, she has great proficiency in it, he added before taking a pause as if deliberating his next words. What is it senior? Please tell me, Lin Mu urged. The withering Tao isn't something even a transcendent immortal can grasp easily. In order to understand it, one needs to first experience withering. How do you think one would do that? Xukong asked instead. By watching things wither? Lin Mu guessed. If it was as simple as that, there would be many experts using it. Xukong denied. Rather than watching other things wither, the person attempting to learn it needs to watch themselves wither. He revealed. Hearing that Lin Mu's eyes went wide. Does that mean they need to die? Lin Mu asked in doubt. Not die, but they need to be in a perpetual state of withering. Always stay at the doorstep of death, suffering at its edge, Xukong replied. And the only ones who can do this are those that can afford to sacrifice the longevity to experience this, he added. So even a transcendent immortal's longevity isn't enough? Lin Mu frowned. No. Perhaps not even the combined longevity of ten transcendent immortals would be enough for this, Xukong stated, surprising Lin Mu. Only a celestial might be able to take on such a grave endeavor, he revealed. There's no way Yao Cheng Ying can't be a celestial though, Lin Mu couldn't believe it. It is well known who she is and what power she belongs to. Plus, even her cultivation base is still at the fifth tribulation stage of the immortal realm right now, he added. You are correct. It shouldn't be possible for someone like her to learn the withering Tao at all, Xukong agreed. Which is exactly what makes her much more dangerous. It might be a treasure of some kind that is allowing her to do this. Could it have come from that world that Yao Cheng Ying raided? Lin Mu suddenly put the pieces together. It is likely. The sacrifices that she used might have been used to feed the withering Tao somehow, Xukong said, having doubts of his own. That bracelet that you were given seems to contain a counteracting energy that stalls the functioning of the withering energy of Yao Cheng Ying. Considering that counteracting energy is still able to work on her, we at least know that she doesn't have full control of the withering Dao. Chapter 1834 Doubts on Yao Cheng Ying Xukong's explanation was enough to make Lin Mu take this with grave seriousness, enough that he was even willing to use his spatial skills if push came to shove. But before that, I can still use something, it'll definitely injure me too, but I can still handle that. Lin Mu thought to himself with determination. Tilda Shush Wushwa. Yao Cheng Ying hadn't stopped her attacks either and swung her sword non-stop. Her expression looked a mix of anger and confusion though, which intrigued Lin Mu a bit. Tilda Boom Boom. Of course, Lin Mu didn't dare take the attacks directly with his body. While he could somewhat stall the effects of the withering Dao, he didn't wish to let it affect him more, instead, he let the true earth heart Dao embryo's shield take care of it, till the crack, of course, this led to the shield cracking several times and rocks falling off it, Lin Mu removed the limits on the Dao embryo and let it absorb as much of his immortal chi as it could, he wasn't rationing his chi anymore and was letting it flow as it wished, because of this, the regeneration speed of the great shield increased and was able to recover before the next flurry of attacks. Stop running and face your end. Yao Cheng Ying shouted gathering a large cloud of the slate grey aura and thrusting out with it. The aura transformed into a strange worm that had no eyes but only a mouth. Its body had open wounds on it that were festering and oozing with pus. It looked disgusting, and the audience started to realize that something was wrong here. What is Yao Cheng Ying doing? What kind of skill is that? It is certainly not of the flourishing flower sword sect. The people in the audience wondered. Novelnext.com Though a few experienced elders in the audience could tell that what Yao Cheng Ying was using might not necessarily be of the orthodox path. And it wasn't just them thinking this, the elder of the temple overseeing this felt the same. As such, he secretly held a communication jade slip and sent a message. Yao Cheng Ying is using lethal attacks using an unorthodox technique, 
Should I stop the fight? The elder asked while trying to keep a neutral expression on his face. It wouldn't do anyone good for him to show anxiety or uncertainty on his face. There were millions of people watching at this time from several worlds. If he showed that things were going wrong, it could lead to a loss of face for the temple. If they hastily stopped the fight, and things turned out to still be appropriate, the temple could be blamed for incorrect decisions. It isn't the first time someone is using unorthodox techniques. And contestants do tend to get agitated when fighting, perhaps Yao Cheng Ying is just too angered but won't take the drastic path. The overseeing elder hoped, though he also wondered what exactly was the skill that Yao Cheng Ying was using. In all his thousands of years of experience, he had never seen an aura of that sort. Formation masters, do we have data on Yao Cheng Ying's technique? The overseeing elder asked while watching Lin Mu retreating high up into the sky. None of us can tell what it is just from looking, but we're analyzing it, overseer. The formation masters quickly replied. Being the ones in charge of controlling and moderating the arrays of the spatial plane, they needed to be careful about what techniques the contestants were using. Some techniques could very well damage the array after all. While there hadn't been any in this tournament, they have had several experiences in the past which had taught them enough. They tried to plan for as many contingencies as they could, but there was always something unexpected that could happen. As the elder and the others watched for updates on Yao Cheng Ying, Lin Mu was busy dodging her and trying to rise as far as he could in the sky. More. I need to be higher. Lin Mu thought to himself, continuing to fly upwards. The move that he had planned needed a lot of distance and height to work. The true Earth Dao Ha Dao Embryo's Great Shield was able to block Yao Cheng Ying's attacks, but they were only getting worse with each passing second. That illusory festering worm. It's actually corroding the shield. Lin Mu felt an ache coming from his Dao Embryo, making him look down. The shield was wrapped by the illusory worm, which seemed to be spreading slate gray energy from its body. This caused the rocks covering the shield to turn to dust and fall off. It was astounding, as they weren't just any rocks, but ones condensed from earth down and were highly compressed. Even an inch of rock was compressed from a boulder-sized rock. This increased the density of the shield and made it tougher. And yet, it was being eroded away like it was chalk. I don't have much time. This'll have to work. Lin Mu gritted his teeth. Return. He dismissed the great shield, making it fade away. Tilda Q. That caused the illusory festering worm that was wrapped around the shield to lose a target. It then rushed towards Lin Mu, sensing him as a foe. But that wasn't all, as Yao Cheng Ying had readied for more attacks. Seems like you're finally hitting your limit, Humphrey. She scowled before gathering three more clouds of the slate gray aura and thrusting them with her sword. Tilda Q. 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 Three more illusory festering worms were created from them and rushed towards Lin Mu. The man's troubles had just multiplied fourfold, and he had little to defend with. Lin Mu noticed this, but couldn't care less. He was already prepared to get injured from this. Gritting his teeth, Lin Mu released as much of his chi and immortal essence as he could. Ah, the immortal essence strengthened his body with the tyrannical aura as Lin Mu began his descent. Chapter 1835 Dire Descent Lin Mu knew to reach Yao Cheng Ying he would have to break through all her attacks, even if it meant getting injured himself. As such he used one of his skills with the greatest momentum, Falling Sky Lance. Lin Mu used the tyrannical aura to enlarge his arms again and flipped upside down. Next, he summoned the true Earth Heart Dao embryo above him and attached it to his legs like a firm platform. This increased his mass and increased the momentum by several times. But that was just the start as Lin Mu added more things. Tilda Shua. Fire covered his entire body as Lin Mu poured out the fire elemental immortal chi that was within his danshan. It first coated him and then flowed upwards to form a jet of flame. Next, Lin Mu extended both his arms and opened his giant palms. Tilda Hong. Pure sword intent manifested around him along with metal elemental immortal chi, further coating his hands in a sharp aura. Aspect of heaviness. Finally, Lin Mu used his Dao skill that exponentially increased his weight, and accelerated him, breaking the sound barrier, tilde boom, a sonic boom was heard, the shockwave causing the four illusory festering worms to halt temporarily, 
Lin Mu's form turned into a fiery blur as if a meteor descending from the skies, he could no longer be seen within it, leaving a kilometer long fiery streak behind him. The air started to heat up from the friction, causing the area to turn hotter faster than usual. Futile effort, Yao Cheng Ying shouted before spinning her sword in a circle, causing the four illusory festering worms to come together. Tilda Kua, the four worms seemingly merged together, turning into a large four headed entity. Its power had increased by a lot and the withering energy was palpable. Even the very air was getting corrode, a grey smog spreading from the four headed worm. The worm screeched and met the falling figure of Lin Mu head on. Tilda Splat, its illusory form was smashed from the initial impact. Three out of the four heads turning to mush. Tilda Kuoa, the lone surviving head bit Lin Mu's hand, infecting him with the slate grey withering energy. Ha! Lin Mu simply powered through it, forcibly burning the worm away while ignoring the energy that was spreading through his arms. The illusory body of the large worm faded away from the force and heat that was mixed with the sharpness of the sword intent before dispersing. But even when it did that, withering Dao traces were left behind which powdered Lin Mu's entire body in it. Tilda cough. Just a second after being covered by it, Lin Mu felt blood rising from his lungs. He forcibly coughed it out, finding it to be dark brown in color and foul smelling. Now, in addition to outer injuries, Lin Mu was accumulating internal injuries as well. The withering Dao traces had entered his body and were trying to cause havoc. Tilda Raw. Tilda Mu. But the bloodline of the great slumber bear and the spirit of the tyrant bull wasn't going to tolerate that. Lin Mu's body was their home and they wouldn't let an intruder harm it. Another battle began within Lin Mu's body as the two illusory beasts fought against the withering Dao traces. Lin Mu didn't have the luxury of observing this, as he had the target in front of him. But if he did see it, he would be rather astonished to see the two beasts working together to expel the withering Dao traces. And if he looked closer, he would even see two faint strings connecting the two illusory beasts. These two faint strings were made out of minuscule runes that looked to be obscure and esoteric. Secretly, Lin Mu's stomach also activated, releasing the stored energy within it and channeling it into the two illusory beasts through the threads. Coincidentally, the esoteric runes making up the string were the same ones that appeared on the stomach. Tilda boom boom boom. Lin Mu's body continued to descend towards Yao Cheng Ying and crashed against several of her attacks, that he directly tanked. They had come in a hurry and seemed weaker than her previous attacks, evidently having been made in a hurry. With fire and air blurring his vision, Lin Mu couldn't see clearly in front of him and was using his immortal sense to guide his falling trajectory. But if he could see, he would find Yao Cheng Ying looking rather shocked. Why aren't they working? Yao Cheng Ying screamed in anger. Stop. She slashed vertically, using as much energy as he could muster in that short moment. Unfortunately for her, Lin Mu was already within a hundred meters of her. The heat radiating from him was palpable and was already scorching her clothes. Ah, as a last ditch effort, Yao Cheng Ying's body overflowed with the slate gray aura and doused her in it. In the next moment, her and Lin Mu's eyes met. NFLnext.com. Anger reflected in her eyes while determination shone in Lin Mu's eyes. Tilda boom. The two finally collided. Lin Mu's infected arms hitting Yao Cheng Ying's shoulders. Tilda Kaka. ACK. Yao Cheng Ying couldn't even scream as the pain overwhelmed her senses. Both of her shoulders were broken from the sheer weight and impact. Unfortunately for her. There was no way for Lin Mu to stop. Tilda Kaboom. Tilda Rumble. Yao Cheng Ying's body disappeared along with Lin Mu, as a thick cloud of smoke, dust and debris was whipped up. Plumes of orange flames also spread out, turning the area into a burning hellscape. Slate grey withering smog also mixed in with it, making it impossible for anyone to see what was happening. Though a second later they could see the ground in an area of a kilometer collapsing. It caved in for nearly a hundred meters, forming a deep crater that somewhat managed to disperse the impact. This, the elder overseeing the fight didn't even know what to make of this. Tilda Hong, but that wasn't the end of it all, as a green light shone brightly from the smoke and dust. 
Chapter 1836 Drastic Disaster The green light that had appeared was unlike anything the Elder had seen before. It was vibrant enough that it could pierce through the slate grey fog, and illuminate the entire area. Lin Mu and Yao Cheng Ying could barely be seen in it, with Lin Mu's figure pinning the woman below. The vibrant green light was coming from his hand, and was flowing into Yao Cheng Ying's body. Lin Mu who was the closest could see it all happen in great detail as the bracelet was being held in his hand, it was crumbling by the second and was converting into pure green energy that invaded Yao Cheng Ying's body, it flowed into her vessels and meridians, highlighting them over her skin, it looked boothery and beautiful at the same time, while Yao Cheng Ying's face contorted into that of pain, and yet, no voice came out of her voice, as if having been suppressed somehow, this bracelet, just how did Crown Princess Shang make it? Lin Mu wondered, the energy coming from it seemed to be a mix of immortal qi and wood dao traces, but there was something else added to it, Lin Mu couldn't place his finger on it exactly but it still felt a bit familiar to him, it is wood dao insights, she has infused them into the bracelet, Xu Kong answered for him, wood dao traces, she can already use them, Lin Mu asked in surprised, she should be able to use them to a certain extent, but not enough to make this, Xu Kong replied, then how did she do this, for it to suppress the withering Dao traces like this, it has to be strong right, Lin Mu asked, indeed, while she did personally inject them into the bracelet and further when she modified it, there was a little external help involved, it is probably a treasure of some kind that contained wood Dao insights, Xu Kong answered much to Lin Mu's surprise, if she really did that, then it makes sense as to why it could suppress Yao Cheng Ying, Lin Mu said, though will this be fine, it feels like she's going to die, before Lin Mu could say anything more though, the felt strong spatial fluctuations filling the plane, this isn't the teleportation array, this is spatial collapse, Lin Mu became alarmed, till rumble, Lin Mu felt the very air shake as the barrier of the spatial plane was torn apart, the lesser void could be seen beyond it, while the arrays started to crumble away as well, how's this happening? Lin Mu didn't know why the arrays that looked to be very stable just a while ago were crumbling like dust. Lin Mu wasn't worried about getting swept away in this as he could easily manage in the void, if need be. He could even make his way back to the rust sky world through the remnants of the teleportation channels, but doing that would require him to use the ring as well as expose his ability to use space. If possible Lin Mu didn't want to show that, especially since he had managed to come this far without it, even managing to defeat Yao Cheng Ying, Tilda Hong, but as the time passed, more and more arrays collapsed, the spatial barriers ripping up all around. A few of the tears even appeared on the ground causing the crater that Lin Mu had made to widen. Damn it, the spatial tear is extending towards us. Lin Mu sensed it. I can't move from here either, the green energy is still flowing into Yao Cheng Ying. He found his arm stuck to the woman. Lin Mu felt like he could forcibly pull his hand, but doing that would likely result in the energy flow to be interrupted and the effect of the bracelet to fail. After all, while the bracelet was doing its work Yao Cheng Ying also seemed to be trying to defend against it unconsciously, the slate grey aura from his body was actively fighting against the green energy and was currently in a stalemate, if Lin Mu forcibly removed this hand, the stalemate would be broken and Yao Cheng Ying would likely counter attack, what should I do? Lin Mu was stuck in a complex situation. Sky Monarch Seal. It was at that point that a loud voice was heard. Tilda whoosh whoosh whoosh. Tens of gales flew toward Lin Mu, each carrying the might of a storm within them. The gales had a bluish green color that continued to flicker as if carrying glitter within it. The gales gathered around Lin Mu and blew away all the dust that was around him, fully revealing him to everyone. It also allowed Lin Mu to have a proper look, and saw the gales turning into a corporeal form. They turned into 18 sigils that floated around him and released a protective barrier, it surrounded Lin Mu and Yao Cheng Ying isolating them from the spatial tier that was just a meter away from them, formation masters, now, the authoritative voice was heard again, before millions of runes appeared in the sky, the runes rushed towards the spatial tears all around the plane and covered them in a temporary patch. This stopped the collapse of the spatial plane for the time being and gave Lin Mu time to breathe. Are you okay? 
It was now that Lin Mu saw the person who had been giving out command all this time. Hi Elder Juxiu, Lin Mu recognized the man. Come, we have to leave this place quick. The old man waved his hand, creating a solid platform made out of wind elemental chi under Lin Mu and Yao Cheng Ying. It lifted them up and quickly brought them out of the dangerous area, before the high elder took out a small talisman, tilde r.i.p. He tore the talisman and threw it towards Lin Mu, causing his body along with Yao Cheng Ying to disappear. Teleportation? Lin Mu could feel that he was being sent back to the tournament grounds. A few seconds later, he felt the scenery change and he had fallen onto the platform. Tilda thud. Yao Cheng Ying's body was still stuck to his hand and fell alongside him, hitting the ground hard. What's happening? Lin Mu was incredibly confused. His immortal sense spread around to get a sense of the situation, allowing him to see the expressions of all the audience members. Some of them looked to be anxious, while some looked to be very afraid. A few were even leaving the area, as if fleeing with all their might. Tilda Boom. Lin Mu's attention was forcibly brought back to the spatial plane, as he not only saw it explode, he also felt it. His senses were overwhelmed by the spatial disturbance that was caused due to it, leaving him a bit disoriented for a moment. Thankfully, he managed to get a hold of himself fast and quickly tried to analyze the situation. Tilda Shua. Get away from her, High Elder Jux you spoke again, this time in a commanding voice. Expression. I. I can't, Lin Mu replied. My hand is stuck to her, he said. Lin Mu found the man standing next to him with a concerned expression. I, I can't, Lin Mu replied. My hand is stuck to her, he said, unable to tell the facts. I'll assist. The High Elder had guessed something was strange beforehand when Lin Mu didn't move and quickly acted. Tilda Huala Novel Next .com. Before Lin Mu could even do anything. A thin layer of wind that was like cotton wrapped around him and forcibly separated him from Yao Cheng Ying. And due to how firmly he was struck to the woman, the force applied to him was also high causing him to be tossed 10 meters away. Thankfully, he managed to gain control of his momentum and quickly landed. Shit, I separated from Yao Cheng Ying before the energy had finished its work. Lin Mu thought, wondering what would happen now. There were several perplexing things happening at the same time, leaving him rushing for answers in his mind. Tilda Shwish Wishwa. It was at this moment, that tens of elders arrived, all belonging to the temple, thus surrounded Yao Cheng Ying and created hand seals, setting up a quick barrier. Even though the barrier was set up in a short time, Lin Mu could tell, even a seventh tribulation stage immortal would find it difficult to break. What is? Lin Mu now realized that the elders were targeting Yao Cheng Ying too. How are your injuries? High Elder Juxiu approached him, quickly checking his body that had several infected parts. Both of Lin Mu's hands had turned gray along with spots on his back, torso and leg. That technique that Yao Cheng Ying used. I can't seem to expel its energy from my body. Lin Mu answered causing the High Elder to quickly grasp his wrist. Lin Mu felt the man's immortal sense probe him, and was quickly replied by the slate grey energy. What foul energy is this? High Elder Juxiu was taken aback. In fact, he recoiled in horror, feeling the grey energy trying to invade his body too. System vs Rebirth. Chapter 853 Undying Fire. That's basically what happened in the Muevil Kingdom. Raincott had finished recounting the information he got from the spies that the Greenwood Kingdom had planted. I'm sure that other kingdoms have learned about her existence as well. To think she would be that strong, she can use the true spirit body as well, no? After listening to Anna's story, Noel couldn't help but fall silent. On the one hand, his ice abilities had improved drastically over the past week. On the other hand, it was nowhere near Anna's level. Noah looked down for a moment, wondering what he should do. While he treated Anna as his ally, she was also his rival. There was no way Noah liked the fact that he was currently weaker. That silence of his couldn't help but make Rain cut a little bit sad. He comforted him by saying, You don't have to think too much. Your progress is exceptional as well. If the Ardigan family is still backing you, you would have reached the same level as her. Noel didn't reply to him, causing Raincart to think that Noel hadn't recovered. Raincart asked, 
That's right. You're planning to reach the Spirit Grandmaster during your stay here, right? From the looks of it, you are already at the peak of Spirit Master. Is there anything troubling you? Although I'm not good with swords or runes, I'm good at elemental spirit. Maybe I can advise you or something. Noel's eyes lit up as he looked at his grandfather. There was always one thing that stuck in his mind. Even after learning the secret from Damien, he didn't know how to master his undying fire. Yes, he managed to improve his control and its intensity due to old Rue's training, but he was nowhere mastering it. Actually, I have been wondering about something. Noel scratched the back of his head, feeling a bit embarrassed. He thought this was just a simple question, so the fact that he didn't know it made him look ignorant. It reminded him of how he first started. What's wrong? Raincart asked with a serious expression. That expression startled Noel. It felt like Raincart was telling him that asking any questions was never a dumb action. Noel felt reassured and decided to share his problem. I'm confused about my flame. I don't mean to brag, but my flame is strong. It's so strong that I feel like something is missing. Continue. Raincart nodded in agreement as he had seen Noel's undying fire previously. I'm not very sure about this, but... Noel pointed his palm to the side and started forming his undying fire. After that, the flame flared up, releasing an intense heat. Yet, when it died down, Noel replicated the same thing. Surprisingly, the flame didn't release an intense heat, but it reduced everything to ashes. As you can see, I'm kind of confused. On the one hand, I can control the temperature, the heat, and its burning power. On the other hand, I can't relate this flame to the one in nature. Because of that, you don't know how to proceed? Raincart asked a core question, showing that he was listening attentively. Yes, Noel explained, I have asked my spirit, but that's actually the last requirement for me to master my flame. So, have you put any thought into it? Yes. If I can control the temperature, I can control the heat. But it's kind of conflicting with the burning power because it can burn everything even without releasing that heat. No, I'm not talking about that. What do you think about those three characteristics? No. Should I say, what is actually your flame? Raincart asked. Mm. Noel tilted his head in confusion. It felt like Raincart was questioning him about the flame characteristic, but at the same time, there seemed to be another profound meaning behind that question. What is my flame? Noel muttered that question while looking down. Now that I think about it, why is Ardigan's flame called undying fire? How about other things like just fire? Why does Ardigan specify its name to be undying fire? Noel fell into deep thought. He had never questioned it. In Heisk's case, the first ability he got from her was ice control. It had evolved a few times, but it didn't change the fact that Heisk considered her ice as normal ice. There was also another question similar to it. Why would Heisk's control change its name to spiritual cold control? Did it mean Heisk's element was now a spiritual ice or cold? I think you should take a look at novelnext.com. He had never paid attention to the name change and the meaning behind those names. This might be what his grandfather was implying. Why undying fire? What is undying in the first place? Noel tried to recall the meaning of undying and thought, undying means lasting forever. Wait a minute. Lasting forever? Noel's body trembled. If the flame lasts forever, doesn't that mean the flame won't be able to change its attribute? If it can burn for thousands of years without me there, what kind of power does it have? If the flame burns everything, will it engulf this world with its power? How about its heat? What kind of impact does it bring? Will the temperature remain the same? If the flame has a low temperature but can burn everything, there will be a lot of implications. For example, I can separate liquid by making one liquid into a vapor. But if the fire temperature is low, the liquid will only evaporate into nothing. In fact, not even the vapor remains. On the other hand, if the fire temperature is high and maintained at that level, it will stay at that level until the end of time. That's the meaning of undying. In other words, the last requirement to mastering the undying fire is not control whatsoever. Instead, it's the identity of the undying fire. What kind of fire do I want? Noel came to a realization. It turned out the problem was not an extraordinary challenge like he expected. 
it was actually the basic thing. He'd gotten the fundamentals wrong. And the reason why Ardogan didn't say the correct answer was because Ardogan wanted Noel to choose without influencing him in any way. Ardogan once explained that the spirits resided within the people because they wanted to see how the humans wielded their power, using it as an inspiration. Ardogan was the same. It wanted to see how Noel wielded him. Even Raincart could see this problem. Noel stopped responding to his grandfather as he was too engrossed with this new thought. He had to confirm what kind of flame he wanted from Ardogan and set it that way so that the undying fire could truly last forever, not change with the passage of time. Seeing his expression made Raincart feel relieved. Raincart didn't know anything about Noel's talent in spiritual energy or his conversion rate. In fact, having two spirits alone was enough to confirm his talent. However, Raincart could see that Noel's true talent was hidden in his mind. Noel's mind worked differently from normal people's. It was due to his past. He had been reading so many books in the past. People thought he was lazy. But his father never stopped him. There was one big reason. When reading those books, Noel's mind would often wander in his imagination of those books. That imagination had been trained since he was very young and Noel wasn't disturbed by how the people described him. That was why when Noel faced a question, his mind would wander to all kinds of things. And the only thing people needed to do was to leave a single clue to narrow his imagination. He would come up with the answer himself. This was the hidden intention that his father had when training Noel. In the past, he never asked Noel to learn sword or business. Instead, he only taught him about morale and train of thought. In other words, his imagination, to think about the problem, come up with a solution, and execute the plan were something that people needed. And Noel could vividly imagine the scenario and the result. He might fail sometimes, like fighting against Lorfi or Alexander, but he took that experience for future choices. This time, Noel had been presented with a problem about his undying fire. Would he choose to let the fire burn without any heat? Would the flame lose its burning power in exchange for a natural power from the temperature and heat? Noel had to be the one to discover it. While Noel was tackling his current problem, Raincart moved away, curious about the disciple Noel took in. It was quite surprising to know that Tristan was a slave, but there must be a quality that Noel wanted from Tristan. By the time he learned about Tristan's extraordinary memory, he would be so excited that he bothered Noel for days. But that was for later. Noel was undergoing a transformation to reach the stage Anna stood on. He didn't plan to give the lead to her. Chapter 854 Progress In the garden located at the back of the Inham family, Noel had been meditating for a few hours. He was fully absorbed in the current problem, which was to determine the power of his flame. Raincart, who was watching from a distance, couldn't help but furrow his eyebrows. There was a spark of interest flashed in his gaze. But he contained that curiosity so as to not bother Noel. The black fire was gushing out of Noel's body. At first, it was a mild fire. There was no heat or whatsoever. However, the more time passed, the higher the temperature of the fire. They started feeling the intense heat even though they were standing 30 meters away. Even Raincart had to raise his guard against that fire, but it seemed that he didn't have to worry. Before it grew out of control, the fire temperature gradually decreased. Noel appeared to be having second thoughts about raising his fire temperature. Of course, it didn't mean that he would completely ignore the temperature. After some adjustment, the fire seemed to have stopped fluctuating. When the heat brushed Raincart's skin, he could roughly measure its temperature. Noel actually wanted to maintain the flame's behavior. Since it was the flame, it was obvious that it should have intense heat and high temperature. But the question was, how high? If he set it too high, the flame would destroy everything and become uncontrollable. Hence, he settled for two and a half times higher than the average flame. This should be enough to overwhelm any fire his opponent might have, even if they were quite extraordinary. After all, Noel had a few other properties to adjust on. Since the fire radiated the heat, he wanted to adjust the amount of heat. If the heat was too strong for the current temperature, it would become unstable. In addition, it would burn everything around it. At the same time, the fire couldn't be without heat. He thought that for an undying fire that would last forever. The sufficient heat would be two times more than normal, but he also made an adjustment with the temperature. 
this way, he wouldn't accidentally hurt his people when fighting around them, while he was a fighter, he was a lord. So, there was no way he would fight alone in the future. The flame began to swirl around Noel's body, it looked like the fire was eager to show its power, starting from burning the grass and soil. However, Noel immediately stopped it with his control because if he wasn't careful, he could easily burn the mansion behind him. It also reflected the possible future after becoming a noble. While Noel was adjusting his flame, Raincart got a guest. The guest was a middle-aged man. He had a straight posture and gallant figure. So, he is Layshaw's son. The man said, a bit surprised by what he saw from Noel. Even he felt some fear toward that flame. And after hearing about Noel's achievement, he might not be able to win against Noel once he becomes a spirit grandmaster. Indeed, Raincart nodded proudly. But don't take it to heart. He is just too irregular. You're already talented enough, and your children have nothing to worry about. Thank you, father. The man turned out to be Raincart's son, the current family head of the Enham family. But if I'm not wrong, Layshaw also. Yeah? He has inherited his mother's element as well. In other words, he has two spirits residing within his body. But it's even more surprising because those two spirits have opposite elements. The man thought for a moment and asked, those two elements are in harmony. How? Normally, if two opposite elements reside within a body, they would clash and end up harming its host. However, I could see that the flame, despite overbearing, is the one harmonizing the relationship between the two elements. What? Then, the flame is actually lowering its own property in order to match the ice? Yeah? But doesn't that mean the flame's full potential hasn't been released yet? The man gasped. Exactly. Yesterday, he asked me whether there is a way to procure an ice element item or herb and a large quantity of demon crystals. The man fell silent as something clicked in his mind. Father the reasons for him to request those things. Might be for the flame development. Yeah, I'm thinking the same thing. If my prediction is correct, that ice spirit is trying to increase its power so that the flame can release its full potential. Actually, after he came here last time, I had been researching about the Ardagon family. If the record is correct, Noel actually possessed a similar if not the same spirit as his ancestor the same spirit that gave birth to the only spirit king in history. Raincart narrowed his eyes as his expression turned grim. What? Raincart asked. Can you help me procure those things? The man fell into deep thought, muttering. The demon crystals are not a problem. Even if those families feel something weird about our large purchase this time, I can fend them off. The problem is the ice element item. I think I have to ask an old friend to see if he has any clue or not. Raincart smiled. It wouldn't be weird if he felt awful after knowing that his nephew was as strong as him, but that assurance from Raincart indirectly implied that no matter how talented Noel was, he didn't belong to the Enham family, and that was enough. After some consideration, he stated, I think it's possible, but I need a few weeks to one month. Sure. Thank you. I think you should take a look at. He is my nephew. So of course, I will help him. Raincart patted his shoulder while walking away. He said, let's not disturb him. Just put some guards there to make sure that the fire doesn't reach the mansion. Where are you going, father? I'm going to visit another little devil. Raincart waved his hand while walking toward the mansion. That was right. Noel's talent was frightening, but his eyes for talent were similar to his father's. Novelnext.com the reason why the Ardagon family became the wealthiest family in the Muevel Kingdom was because Luke Ardagon managed to find a lot of excellent subordinates. They became the pillars of the family and made the territory prosperous. Raincart was heading toward Tristan's room. On the way, he could hear a maid shouting in anger. That's not it. Put your hands together and straighten your back before bowing. Just from those words alone. He knew what was going on. It was the voice of the head maid who was training Sandra on the etiquette required to become a maid. After a while, he opened the door and found Tristan inside. Now that they had reached the Enham family, there were a lot of resources that could be used to practice runes. On the corner of the room were a few bags of low-level demon crystals. Noel wanted Tristan to begin absorbing the crystals to build up his spiritual energy reserve even if he hadn't awakened his spirit. The runes were a method to fight without the spirit after all. During the day, 
Tristan would fully focus on drawing all kinds of arrays from his memory before matching them with the original. This way, he could see which stroke was too thick, too thin, or curved incorrectly as a result. There were a few stacks of paper on his tables. Some of them had even dropped, but Tristan had no time to tidy it up yet. When the door was opened, Tristan's body shook as the last stroke became too long. Tristan raised his head, wondering who entered the room. Without hesitation, Tristan stood up and greeted him, Sir, you don't have to be that stiff. Raincart chuckled. It seems that you've been busy. How is your progress? I don't want to disappoint teacher. Tristan made a wry smile. He suddenly remembered that the paper was scattered on the ground and hurriedly said, I will clean this up immediately. It's fine. Just let the maid do it. But, Tristan wanted to reject it. He felt weird asking the maid because the thought of being a slave was still stuck in his mind. Your life is about to change, so you have to get used to it. In any case, how is your progress in runes? Do you find anything you don't understand? I'm currently reviewing all the runes I can draw, so not yet. How about your spiritual energy? I have been absorbing the spiritual energy through the method you've taught me. I think I have managed to accumulate it a bit. But master said I still didn't have enough to form a rune. Once I got enough, I would start creating runes with spiritual energy so that I didn't waste all these papers. Is that so? Raincart smiled while taking a glimpse of his works. Tristan's hands weren't that nimble yet, so the stroke felt a bit too stiff. It was bound to create some mistakes. Still, this kind of progress was far faster than the average person. Once he got the hang of it, he would progress by leaps and bounds. If you have any problems, just tell me about it. I'm also quite curious about the runes, so we might have some chats sometime in the future. Yes, sir. I will be very honored. Raincart patted his head while saying, Keep up with the good work. Don't disappoint your teacher. Tristan bowed his head as Raincart left the room. Surprisingly, a butler had been waiting outside the room. Raincart said, help me tidy up the room. Yes, sir. The butler acknowledged the order, but before coming in, he whispered, you have a guest, sir. A guest? Yes, the guest is a bit special, so. Remembering that his son was helping him to bring the stuff Noel needed, Raincart nodded his head. I'll meet the guest. Chapter 855 After Training A burning noise echoed in the garden, the fire seemed to be burning the grass, but surprisingly, it didn't spread like a normal fire, the fire only moved toward a specific area and drew a pattern on the ground. After the last crisp sound vanished, the guy, who was sitting in the middle of the pattern, opened his eyes, he was none other than Noel. In the past three days, Noel had been adjusting the characteristics of his flame so that he could define it with precision. It was surprisingly harder than he thought, but Noel could see that the missing part he had felt before was getting filled up. As much as I want to continue, I don't think I can focus any further. I have to consider a few other things as well, so let's continue tomorrow. Noel took a glance at the sun's position. Fortunately, there were still two hours before dusk. So he stood up and gave a nod to the soldiers who had been protecting him the whole time. After seeing Noel leave the area, the soldiers made sure that there was no more fire before dispersing. It's been a while since Anna has become an arbiter. She should have made some foundation in her new post. As for me, I think I still need a few more days to finalize the concept of my flame. After that, I can begin my breakthrough to the Spirit Grandmaster, which shouldn't take more than three days. I have to teach Tristan as well. Wait, there is also a Spirit Link and those Awakening Pills. If I have to sum everything up, I might need another two weeks before completing everything, and another week to help grandfather. After that, I will return to the Muevil Kingdom and become a noble. Noel nodded in satisfaction. Since he had finished his training earlier than he expected, he wondered what he should do. Tristan should be in his room reviewing his works. Should I go to grandfather? Noel muttered while walking down the garden. On the way, he heard an energetic voice from the side. Oh. Is this it? As those words resounded, a fluctuation of spiritual energy occurred. This fluctuation was something Noel was familiar with. Rune? Noel raised his eyebrows and turned around. He didn't expect that someone from the Enham family had practiced a rune. Still, the Enham family was famous for producing an exceptional spirit magician. 
and with the fact that the author of the rune book was related to the Enham family, it was obvious that they would ask the people from the house to learn runes. So, Noel couldn't help but follow the voice, wondering who managed to use the runes. He might be able to teach her a little bit to repay everything that his grandfather had done for him this whole time. After walking for several meters, he took a sneak peek from behind a tall bush to see who managed to use runes. The woman appeared to be 16 to 17 years old. She had long, wavy green hair. Surprisingly, there were a few ivy rising around her, those ivy formed a strength blessing rune. Noel observed her a bit further. She was wearing a one-piece light blue sundress that reached up to her knees. It was normal for someone of a noble family, making Noel think that this person should be his cousin. Still, there was one thing that piqued his interest. The ivy was covered in thick energy, and the strength blessing rune, the simplest rune in the book, made the success more convincing. But, she is using the plants, her spirit should be a plant spirit, Noel frowned, the strength blessing is the easiest because the thickness in all strokes is basically the same, so, using ivy to form a rune is easy, but that method will cause problems if she attempts more advanced runes, suddenly, the ivy was trembling and gently brushed the person's forehead, mhm, the woman immediately turned around as if she could tell what the ivy was trying to say, even Noel was surprised that he was noticed by her, while he didn't erase his presence, he had made sure not to take any actions that would alarm her, it seemed that her plants could get the help of the ones around them to locate their target, when their gazes met, Noel made her eye smile while scratching the back of his head, sorry, did I disturb you? No, no, it's my fault for doing it here, the woman smiled gently, is that rune? Noel asked, yes, I have been into it for a while, the woman grabbed the book on the table and showed it to him, do you have any interest in it too? You can consider it that way, Noel nodded and walked slowly, as expected, it was his rune book, that's great, I have been doing this by myself, so it would be great to have another person who has the same interest, is that so? Noel finally arrived at the gazebo, I'm rather perplexed though, is there anything I can help you with? I don't know much about runes, but please don't hesitate to ask, I'll answer if I can. Noel paused for a moment, choosing words so as to not hurt this woman's heart. It seemed that she wasn't aware that he was the author of that rune book, but he didn't plan to brag either, he asked, your spirit must be a plant type spirit, right? I'm wondering why you chose to create a rune with your ivy, oh? She pointed at her ivy and explained, that's because I've been controlling my ability for a long time, so I'm more confident in handling it. To make her point, she waved her hands. The ivy began to spread, grab a few items, and stack them with precision. Novelnext.com. She must have used that plant for a few years, he thought. Still, it didn't change the fact that the ivy would have a problem replicating the more advanced runes. Yeah, that's what confuses me. I can see that the ivy is creating the runes. And you infuse your spiritual energy into the ivy to create the runes. In other words, it's not the ivy that is used to form the rune, but the energy within that ivy. She was dumbfounded. This was the first time someone managed to see through that trick. Is there a problem? Ah, I'm not trying to attack you or something. Noel shook his head and raised one finger. I'm just thinking, what will you do once you become more adept and create more advanced runes? For example, this rune. Noel raised his palm and controlled his spiritual energy to draw a muscle enhancement rune. The strokes were delicate, but if one took another look, there were a few strokes that almost touched each other, in other words, if she used the ivy, the ivy had to cross each other as the spiritual energy matched its shape, the contact between the stems would cause a disruption in the flow of energy, that's, the woman didn't have the answer to that problem, of course, I'm not saying your method is wrong, look, Noel started infusing his ice element to freeze the spiritual energy, this way, his ice would create the same rune, however, it couldn't be activated because the spiritual energy had been frozen, at first glance, you won't be able to activate the rune this way, but if you look at it from another perspective, don't you think that this ice can be used for training? The woman was confused, but upon looking at the pattern again, she understood his words, so, you're saying that the ice or plants can form the rune, well, 
I can see that it's very effective for practice, especially drawing. But ultimately, the spiritual energy will be the one forming the rune. Yes, I have thought about the possibility of using my ability to form a rune. But the more advanced runes are stopping me from that. So, I chose to get used to the original method as soon as possible. Noel nodded. I see. I have never thought about that. The woman nodded in agreement. You're very knowledgeable about runes, is that so? Noel smiled humbly. Yeah, you seem to be only one or two years older than me. But this is the first time someone has given me this suggestion. Well, I've been researching runes for a while, but I don't think my skill is that high. Noel chuckled. If I'm not wrong, the rune you created earlier is the muscle enhancement rune, right? Yes, you're definitely more skilled than me. The woman's eyes flashed as she couldn't help but ask, if you don't mind, can I ask you a few questions about runes? Sure, I'll give you the answer if I know about it. Without hesitation, the woman began talking about runes and showed the problem in her understanding. Noel took his time to learn about her mastery and offered some explanations for her problem. She was shocked because Noel felt like a teacher who taught her everything about runes. There was nothing she could refute in his explanation. Without them realizing it, the sky had turned orange. It was time for them to stop. Since the woman was a part of the Enham family, he thought that they would meet again. Hence, Noel stood up and said, I guess we'll have to stop here. A. Eh? Her body trembled as her eyes looked watery. She was reluctant to end their conversation here. But Noel only said, I have other things to do. Well, we can meet again at this place tomorrow around the same time. Ah, she realized that she had been rude earlier. She hurriedly nodded her head, agreeing to the meeting. I'll definitely be here tomorrow. Then, see you tomorrow. M. Noel had just realized that he hadn't asked the other party's name this whole time. Maria, you can call me Maria. She immediately introduced himself to spare Noel from the awkwardness. See you tomorrow, Maria. Noel waved his hand and just walked away. Maria was silent for a while before realizing something important. Ah, I haven't asked his name either. I was too engrossed in the topic. Never mind. I'll meet him again tomorrow. Chapter 856 A Sly Bear How is your training going? Raincart asked while walking down the hallway with Noel the next day. Noel thought for a moment and said, I should be able to complete my training and do the rest in two weeks. I see. Tristan is doing well, and I'll be monitoring his study for now. So, you don't have to worry about him for now, thank you. Noel nodded. His grandfather had been helping him this whole time. Even during the previous stay, he instructed him on a few tricks for controlling his ability. And he could make a breakthrough soon because of his advice. So, he felt indebted to him. Noel raised one finger, asking, Grandfather, do you mind if I teach someone the rune? Come on. Are you thinking of owing me something? It's fine for a grandson to rely on his grandfather. Besides, you're a responsible young man, so there's no need to feel that way. Raincart chuckled while patting Noel's head. Well, if I teach someone runes, it will definitely be useful for the Enham family. Even if you don't want me to thank you in any way, how about accepting it for the sake of mother and father? I feel like they have owed you a lot. Raincart smiled gratified. He could see that Noel had grown upright. Of course, he didn't have any intention of receiving the gift, but it seemed that Noel would be adamant about it. So, Raincart said, All right, you can do whatever you want. Actually, I saw a talented person in the family yesterday. She had a good understanding of runes and progressed very quickly. It's just. Noel stopped abruptly as if contemplating something. Is there something wrong with her? Yeah? Noel nodded with a serious expression before asking with a worried tone. Do I have a cousin called Maria? Raincart became speechless in that instant. And that reaction was what Noel needed. He said, while I haven't eaten with the entire family this whole time, I'm still keeping track of the people inside this family. It's just. This is the first time I've seen her. Noel had expressed his suspicion. Even Raincart could see that Noel would have no trouble in seeing through his lies either. Raincart let out a long sigh, saying, No, you don't have a cousin called Maria. Then, who is she? Noel frowned, feeling something weird about the whole situation. Her real name is Livia. Livia, which Livia? 
Noel tilted her head in confusion, but after seeing Raincart's troubled face, something clicked in his mind. Wait a minute. Are you talking about Livia de Greenwood? Raincart nodded his head helplessly. Don't tell me. Noel clicked his tongue, annoyed, but Raincart added, no. She is not aware of your identity or any of this scheme. After his majesty heard about your disciple, he sent her to this family in order to become your disciple. She is extremely talented and can learn a lot from you. This means she will become the leading rune master in the kingdom. Still, Noel wanted to rebuke him, but he suddenly fell silent as though there was another idea flashed in his mind. I think taking her as your disciple is not that bad either. I mean, I taught the current king so it wouldn't be weird if my grandson did the same to a royal princess. Besides, there are several advantages you can get. It appeared that Raincart wasn't aware of this scheme until the princess arrived at his family. But after thinking about it, Raincart deemed that there were things that could be taken advantage of. Novelnix.com Noel asked, is there any condition? It's actually at your discretion. As long as she is safe, everything is fine. Noel asked. That means I can demand a lot of things from him? Yes. He won't interfere with your teaching. I believe you can see through his intentions. Let her become my disciple and learn runes from me directly. He should be able to see the potential from Damien's result alone, so following me for a few years will give a far bigger result than that. And there is a possibility that he is trying to make her close to me so that I can fall for her or something. You're truly my grandson. Raincart nodded in agreement. Still, there should be a tuition fee, right? Noel smirked. I think you should take a look at. Raincart's serious expression turned into a sly face. He said, Don't worry, I'm going to extort him for you. You can get all the demon crystals you need to break through to Spirit Grandmaster, including that ice element item. Of course, I will definitely add a lot more crystals for your soldiers. The serious conversation earlier had turned into a cunning conversation between two sly foxes. Noel added, but I still have a condition. I am still going to ask her to do everything and I even want to create a rune school in my territory. You don't have to worry about that. Just say that it's for her training and everything is settled. Don't forget that she is known to be extremely smart. She is also a team leader in the Royal Magician Bureau. Her control over her element should be higher than you. There are also several achievements under her belt. As a person alone, she is talented enough to help you manage the territory. And she is only 17 years old. Still, she has to go back to marry, no? It's her royal duty. Actually, you don't have to care about that. His majesty has considered her to be more useful to let her do whatever she wants instead of burying her under the political marriage. Well, if she can achieve all that when she is only 17 years old. Her achievement would be boundless when she is older. Noel agreed with Raincart and the king's opinion. Still, it's annoying to talk to her politely. Say her name again. Raincart shook his head. Livia. No, Maria. Noel raised his eyebrows, finally understanding why she had given that false name. That's right. What you're going to bring is Maria. Not Livia de Greenwood. You can treat her the same. I see. Noel fell into deep thought. On the one hand. He was a bit annoyed that the king decided to employ this move. On the other hand, he could see a lot of benefits by taking her as his disciple. Raincart raised one finger. Actually, there is one more reason why I want you to accept. MHM? Noel was confused. He tried to come up with an answer, but he couldn't find any other reasons. However, Raincart was an old noble. He had more experience than him as a lord. So, Raincart said, the Atarukka kingdom's second prince had gone too far. How dare he extorted my grandson with that opportunity. Raincart's eyes were emitting killing intent as if he was ready to skin him alive. He added, Noel, don't forget that you will be a noble. I can see that you have integrity. After hearing your story, I know that you will be trusted since you always deliver your promise. However, if you just let them extort you without paying any consequences, you will be looked down upon. My grandson is not a pushover. Noel's body couldn't help but tremble. Raincart's tone was strict yet protective. Even if the other party was a prince, Raincart wasn't afraid. This shows how much Raincart cared for Noel. Even Noel reconsidered his approach. Just like Raincart said, if this matter was known to other nobles, they would simply pull off their trade after he delivered his side of the agreement. 
his strength could somehow scare them, but it didn't change the fact that he looked like a pushover, and Raincart didn't want Noel to be looked down on by everyone. With his experience as the head of the Enham family, he explained, by taking the second princess of the Greenwood Kingdom, you are showing to the Atrika Kingdom that they have lost their chance. In other words, you can give those tips and tricks about runes to the second prince, but you can also give a letter of dissatisfaction to their grand protector. Just tell him that he is disappointed and only took a slave from his country as his disciple instead of any important people. And Her Highness Livio is that living proof. You should be able to see what kind of thing will happen in that country, right? Noel shivered just from that thought alone. In a battle, he was smart and experienced. But Raincart was a veteran in a political battle. After doing those two things, the Grand Protector would unleash his anger toward the second prince. After all, Tristan had proven to be more trustworthy than their second prince. Meanwhile, the Greenwood Kingdom had a better approach and ended up with their second princess becoming Noel's disciple. Tristan wouldn't go back to the Etrukka Kingdom. While Livia would still give a lot of knowledge and information even if she didn't return, their second prince simply chose a box of gold in front of him compared to the numerous diamonds he could get along the way. It was clear who was smarter and better. But won't that cause an international problem? Wait a minute. Noel stopped talking. The second princess is going to prevent that from happening? That's right. With Her Highness Livia being your disciple, if the second prince or the Atresca kingdom decided to attack you out of spite, not only the Muvel kingdom, but the Greenwood Kingdom will also stop them. I see. Noel agreed with this solution, but he noticed one more hidden intention. Don't you think the Zecuria Kingdom will see all this? Exactly. They don't want to follow the Atrika Kingdom's move and decide to approach you with a peaceful method. You can simply promise them related stuff to your rune schools, which allows you to gain a lot of resources from the Zecuria Kingdom. This will prove to be useful for your development, right? Indeed. I have to fight the royal family and the Supreme Devil organization so I can get all the support I need just by taking her as my disciple. And with that big movement, other nobles won't be able to look down on me as well. If the organization is trying to harm Olivia, the Greenwood Kingdom will wreak havoc. Noel had learned a lot from this brief exchange alone. This was the first time he learned anything related to politics from an experienced figure. Even his father only told him philosophy, while strength might indeed be the most important factor in a duel, sometimes, they could avoid all kinds of problems just by taking a step back. They wouldn't be seen as a tyrant who shut people's mouths with their strength as well. After a brief consideration, Noel whispered something to Raincart. The latter considered Noel's suggestions and whispered another thing. It seemed that they were satisfied with that arrangement as both of them gave a thumbs up with a sly smile on their faces. It was clear that they were truly blood related. Chapter 857 Accepting Another One Two hours before dusk, Livy or, as she introduced herself, Maria was waiting for the mysterious person that taught her yesterday. There were two books sitting on the table this time. One of them was the rune book that Noah wrote while the other one was her notebook. MHM, MHMMM. She was humming heavily while reading the rune book. I wonder how the author can write all these things? While it looks like the spirit enchantments are the downgraded versions of runes, it's still impossible to find all these completed runes. There are a lot of runes that have to be researched first, including the ones without any records from the spirit enchantment. It's a completely new area but it appears that the runes want everyone to be able to fight against their opponent without relying on the spirit. While the spirits play a big part in one's power, if there is a rune master, who can form runes, at fast speed, they would be able to contend against them. Of course, from what I can see, the rune power is only limited to spirit practitioner. No, spirit wielder. It doesn't have anything stronger to harm a spirit master or above all of a sudden, a gentle voice echoed in her ears. That's not true! Exclamation mark. Livia widened her eyes in surprise. This time, Noel had moved so fast that her plants couldn't detect him. Sorry if I startle you. Noel chuckled before raising a finger. But I don't lie about that. There are stronger runes. Because all these runes are the basic form. Huh? The shock turned into confusion. How could Noel know about such a thing? Even the Greenwood Kingdom needed a lot of research before they could prove that theory. 
Noel sat down on the opposite side and asked, since you're in this house, you're my cousin, right? To thank my grandfather, I want to teach someone from this family about runes. Thank your grandfather, cousin? Livia made her eye smile. She almost forgot that before coming here. Her father asked her to act as a part of the Enham family and stay for a while. Although she didn't know why he wanted her to act that way, she still had to follow his instructions. She nodded her head, saying, yes. So, I'll be teaching you about runes during my stay here. Noel smiled before forming a rune blast. This is what I mean by those runes are the basic form. Exclamation mark Livia widened her eyes in shock when she saw the rune on Noel's hand. She rose from her seat just so that she could lean forward to take a closer look. What is this rune? It's far more complicated than the ones in the book. When she traced the strokes on each rune, she said, this is. It consists of at least 50 more lines than the runes in the book. The spiritual energy contained in each line is also twice, if not three times stronger. With each line that strong, the power that it can exert is at least a hundred times greater than the basic runes. It's possible to harm a spirit master or even a spirit grandmaster with this rune, as one would expect from the second princess. Her reputation was truly well deserved. She managed to assess the runes in just a short time. While her talent was different from Tristan's, her talent still suited the runes. Noel nodded his head and continued with the explanation. The spirit enchantment is only one of the uses of the runes. There are several other ways to utilize the runes. For example, you can form the runes like this and apply it, right? And there are things that can be summoned and controlled by using runes like this, Novelnix.com. Noel changed his rune into rune sword. As a result, a sword created by pure spiritual energy floated above the rune. It began flying around as if it was alive. Livia couldn't believe what she saw. She had never thought that the runes could be used like this. Even Damien didn't tell her anything about this type of rune. How do you know about all this? Wait. That's a foolish question. Livia couldn't believe it. But the proof was right before her eyes. There was no one who understood the runes other than the author of the rune book himself. He had shown her all the hints contained in those advanced runes and knowledge. There was no need to introduce himself. Livia shivered, recalling all the questions she had yesterday. While the questions weren't that weird, her eagerness somehow made her embarrassed. She said, I apologize for my rudeness yesterday. No, Mr. Noel Ardigan. Really? Hasn't Noel Ardigan died in the Muevil Kingdom? Noel chuckled. That's what has been known. But they haven't received any report about your body, meaning that there is no proof. Damien's got a lot of important knowledge just by following a man called Iadera, and with the relationship between the Ardigan family and the Enham family, it's no wonder you call Sir Aincart, your grandfather. If I link everything, it won't be hard to deduce that you're the real Noel Ardigan. Sir Aincart, Noel squinted his eyes, judging Livia. If she wanted to show that she was a part of the Enham family, she shouldn't have addressed him that way. But Livia actually placed her hand on her chest while saying with a calm tone, Yes, I wasn't aware of the reason why I sent it here. But after knowing that the real Noah Lardigan is currently staying in this mansion, everything is clear. I believe it is rude for me to hide my identity anymore. Despite the fact that you will have the chance to become my student and learn a lot of things about runes as Maria, Noel asked, slightly impressed by her action. If I continue as Maria, I might be able to get all that. However, as soon as you find out, not only you but the Enham family will dislike the royal family, then, does that mean you're going to leave right now and just step away from this opportunity? Noel asked another question. Livia shook her head. After realizing my father's intention, I don't think I can back away. You should know that I've made an agreement with the Greenwood Kingdom previously. And our relationship is just a mere business partnership. Yes. However, I believe that taking me in will prove to be advantageous to your position. Livia and Noel stared at each other. The former tried to explain the reason despite fully knowing that Noel wanted to accept her. On the other hand, Noel was questioning her despite already agreeing to the arrangement. So, are you planning to force your way to become my student? A royalty becoming the student of a commoner? Noel smirked. This was a tricky question. However, 
Livy actually went beyond Noel's imagination. I believe that words alone won't be sufficed. Livia suddenly lowered her head and stated, Please let me become your student, Mr. Noel. Exclamation mark Noel was dumbfounded. A noble had their dignity to maintain, so they couldn't bow to the commoners easily. However, the royalty was even stricter about this. After all, the royalty carried the pride of the entire kingdom. If they lowered their heads easily, the entire kingdom would become a laughing stock. Yet, the second princess, who had a lot of achievements and represented the kingdom far better than some princes or princesses, actually lowered her head to plead to Noel to take her in. This showed enough of her determination. She stripped away her pride and lowered herself down to the very bottom just to become Noel's disciple. It was a hard thing to do even for a noble, let alone a princess. Noel could finally see the real reasons for the second princess achievements. He raised one finger. Even if I'm planning to become a noble, I'm still a commoner. Don't you think your action is a bit excessive? If my action can let my kingdom prosper, I won't hesitate to do it. But, I would be lying if I said I don't have any interest in it either. Livia took a deep breath and expressed her real intention. Why do we have to be bound by our social stratification when our home is threatened? Why do humans have to fight against each other when we have one common enemy? Pride, greed, lust, or whatever. It can be used as a reason, but while we're fighting among ourselves, the demons are still going to hunt us. The nobles can wield their power and wealth to assemble a lot of people to protect them. The royalty can escape easily with the power they have, but the common people can only accept their death if the demons attack us with their full force right now. If lowering my pride or even sacrificing my life is the only price, I think it's pretty cheap. That's why Livia lowered her head again. Please accept me as your disciple. I wish no more than the common people to have the power to fend for themselves. Noel was amazed by her speech. This was the first time he found someone who directed their attention not on the people, but on the demons. As she said, the demons were their common enemy. Noel naturally knew this, but he was still a human. He asked, Are you trying to force me to accept you for the sake of morality? If morality could be used on everything, the royal family wouldn't have executed my parents. I'm aware. I will do my best to satisfy all your conditions. All my conditions? Noel squinted his eyes while scanning her body. Livy understood that gaze, but she didn't have any change of expression. Yes, please put any conditions. Even Noel was speechless about this determination, unless he directly rejected her. No, even if he rejected her, she would continue pestering him in the future. It seemed that the most dangerous thing was not the royal family's scheme but to actually meet her in person. It was because she was this kind of person that the king was convinced that his plan would succeed. I guess I haven't learned enough about people's characters. Noel could only sigh at his mistake while adding, Fine, I will accept you as my student. I'm planning to open a rune school as soon as I become a noble anyway. However, I have several conditions for you to fulfill. I understand. Please state them. I'll do my best to satisfy all of it. I'll just write it down, in the past. Noel had been showing his determination, plan, and courage to get people's approval like Dimitri, Harley, or other pillars of the Ardigan family, but this was the first time he was moved by someone's determination. Chapter 858 Reaction In the Greenwood Kingdom's royal palace, an old man bowed his head while saying, Your Majesty, we've got the news from Raincart. Noel Ardigan has agreed to take Her Highness Livia as his student, just like his other student. He will impart all kinds of knowledge about runes. Upon hearing it, the king couldn't help but clench his fist while smiling. Finally, still, are you sure about this, your majesty? Her Highness Livia is a bright child and her talent is extraordinary. What are you saying? Are you thinking that sending her to him would only bury her talents? The king frowned. No. That's not what I mean. The old man could only scratch the back of his head, not knowing what to say. He believed that Livia was still too big for Noel to handle. In addition, staying with Noel would be extremely dangerous to the point there was a chance that her status as a princess alone wouldn't be enough to protect her. The king asked, Do you know that a princess and a prince, a thousand years ago, left their homeland and encountered a legend in the making? Back then, they simply didn't want to get involved with the throne war. That was the greatest loss of the Greenwood Kingdom. Do you know why? 
the old man obviously didn't have a record of such a thing, only the royal family would be able to read that record, that was why the king said, the princess married the strongest man alive in history, at the same time, her achievement wouldn't be lost to the likes of our royal guard captain, had she returned to the kingdom, no one would dare to say if she suddenly sat on the throne, the old man looked down, but he soon remembered that the king mentioned one more person, and the prince, who was known to be useless at that time, he ended up becoming the sword saint, the sword saint, the old man dropped his jaw to the ground, unlike the princess, the name of the sword saint had spread in all kingdoms, it was said the sword saint was so strong that not a single city could withstand his slash, even if they erected a hundred meter tall wall, he would simply split it like cutting a hill, in terms of his achievement in the way of the sword, if he said he was the second, no one dared to claim they were first, the name of the sword saint had become the inspiration of many sword users, and to think that such a person was connected to the Greenwood Kingdom's royal family was simply unbelievable, but there was one detail that he managed to pick up, with such a strong brother and sister, why would they not return and create a golden age in the Greenwood Kingdom? the answer was as simple as marriage, why would the princess return to her country when she could just stay peacefully with the strongest man alive, the sword sent would follow the suit, the king explained, I know that you're worried, but sometimes, if we don't take the risk, we won't be able to achieve a greater height, just like those researchers, people think they are foolish for studying an impossible thing, but when they succeed, they call them pioneers, the old man lowered his head, I apologize for being rude earlier, your majesty, it seems that I'm still lacking as your minister, people make mistakes, anyway, did Raincart say other things, yes, he stated a few conditions, ha, tell me, first, he wants a tuition fee, it appears that he is requesting a massive amount of demon crystals and a nice element item, I can understand about the demon crystals since it has a higher worth compared to gold, but the ice element item, the minister thought that Raincart planned to use this to satisfy the people in his family, however, the king recalled the information that was sent by the border general, and with the information about Noel being Eardera, it was clear that Noel was the one who requested it, I don't mind, the second princess is studying a new power system that can revolutionize the entire world, so we will pay the tuition fee no matter how high it is, understood, as for the second condition, he requests the princess to follow her teacher to the Muevel kingdom, she has to abide by his instruction for the sake of studying, it's not a problem, in fact, I don't mind if she brings home a kid or two, the king nonchalantly said before adding, there should be a lot of requests, right, just say the important ones and send the rest to me later for me to review, yes, your majesty, the third request is that she will receive the same treatment as his first student, the minister thought it was absurd to treat the princess the same as a commoner, but only the king knew that the boy was actually a slave, if what Damien said about Noel was correct, this was the most important condition, that was also the reason why he sent Livio under the name of Maria, he nodded in approval, I don't mind, as long as he doesn't forbid her from sending the letters home, then, I think this is the most important one, she will learn from him for five years before she can return home, of course, his teacher will provide some level of security, but he also needs us to protect her in one way or another, but it doesn't mention that she can't send a letter, I see, I don't mind that condition, the king nodded but was a bit hesitant, five years were quite long after all, there are a few more conditions, but I think they are minor, and last but not least, in exchange for all those conditions, her teacher will teach her everything about runes, including numerous new runes as well as a few rune systems like rune engineering, rune spell, and rune body, rune engineering, if I'm not wrong, it's that moving runes, as for rune spell, it's embedding a rune onto something that can be used by normal people, right, the king frowned, forgetting about all the details, yes, your majesty, and the rune body is the new system that Damien brought, albeit incomplete, normal people could activate these runes like a part of their bodies, from the current information alone, the rune engineering can be used to automate a few workshops or even help with moving parts, there is a chance that we can finally fly in the sky, as for the rune spell, 
there would be an entirely new legion where these people use runes instead of their elements. It is like having another legion of spirit magicians, but without the needs of spirits. And lastly, the rune body will be useful for the fighters out there. The king fell into deep thought. Those three systems alone were already worth the wait. If they managed to gain all that knowledge, the Greenwood Kingdom would become the leading kingdom in rune development. That's right, your majesty. He stated that his new place would be in a location where the cooperation between them could progress smoothly. The new location? Where is it? The king asked. It's located in a new region near the border. Its location is only a hundred kilometers from our border, so about three to five days if we go slowly, Novelnix.com. The location is near the border. The king furrowed his eyebrows, not understanding Noel's intention. However, the minister had learned from his mistake and considered the risk. He said with an unsure tone, Your Majesty. I am assuming that he is talking about the border. It would be troublesome if we crossed the border. But with his location, shouldn't it be easy for him to leave the Muvel Kingdom and enter the demon territory? Exclamation mark the king gasped. Then, we can simply stay around that area and do the transaction there. This will give another layer of protection for the second princess as well as ensuring more cooperation in the future. Yes, your majesty. Good, good. It seems that I'm still underestimating this brat. The king took a deep breath having a hard time to calm down his excitement, but can he actually get that territory? I mean, in the tradition of the Muvel Kingdom, I don't think he can choose his territory. While it's true that he can't choose his territory, have you forgotten that his family was once the wealthiest family in the kingdom? Exclamation mark the minister understood what he meant. It seemed that the Ardagan family's influence was still quite strong, that they could influence the royal court. The king rose from his seat and waved his hand, ordering, We'll accept his request unconditionally. Also, form a new legion that will handle this new route. Who is the leader of this new legion? Your Majesty. The king thought for a moment and answered without hesitation, Damien. Chapter 859 Preparation. That's perfect. Tristan said out loud while pointing at the drawing Livia had just created. Is that so? Livia smiled. I have never thought that your memory would be this extraordinary. We'll be learning from the same teacher, so I'm happy to meet you. Did teacher accept you too? Yes. What is your name? I'm Tristan. I'm Livia. Since we've done our homework, should we visit him? I want to do that, but teacher is doing his best to get stronger. I'm afraid that I will be in his way if I interrupt him. Tristan shook his head helplessly. We're not going to disturb him. We just visit him and see him from afar. If he is free, then we will come to him. How about that? I think we can do that. Tristan nodded in agreement. This was the first time he had finished his homework this fast, so he didn't know what to do with his spare time. Tristan and Livio ended up visiting the garden to see Noel's progress. He had been practicing in the same place so it didn't take too long for them to discover him. However, they were stopped by the guards more than 30 meters away. I'm sorry, you can't visit this area. Tristan and Livia were confused, but their doubt was answered soon as the heat emanating from Noel brushed their skin. Exclamation mark. Both of them trembled as they exchanged looks, asking the same thing. Did you smell it? Their attention soon shifted to the figure sitting far away from them. It looked like a simple meditation, but the entire ground had been burned to a crisp. There was no grass or flower that remained standing after that heat wave. Occasionally, a black fire flared up and soon disappeared. Those flares shot out a heat wave so strong that most of the guards had taken off their helmets as they couldn't withstand the heat. The only thing stopping them was their huge shield that blocked the airflow. All the guards around Noel had been on high alert, stopping Noel from getting out of hand. While they were doing their best to block Noel's power, the latter felt the calmest during his stay with the Inham family. Novelnix.com. When he opened his eyes, he realized that his consciousness had traveled back to meet his spirits. Ardagon. Noel muttered, finding Ardagon floating above him. Instead of saying anything, a blue screen popped out. Mission. Advancing to the Spirit Grandmaster. Description. After mastering the Undying Fire, it's time to become the Spirit Grandmaster. Reward. Spirit Step. Mission. Forging Spirit Link. 
Description. Once becoming a Grand Master, Ardagon is fulfilling its promise. Reward. Undying Fire Will. Mission. Force Awakening. Description. Once creating a Spirit Link, it's time to upgrade the Spirit Link by the Force Awakening pills. Reward. Noel was startled to find three missions at once. On the one hand, two missions only gave one skill each. On the other hand, he knew that Spirit Grandmaster was a major breakthrough, so that reward must be extraordinary. There was even one question mark reward. Ada, Noel tried to call him, but his vision turned dark again as his consciousness returned. Huh? Noel gasped for air, waking up from his meditation. He looked around and noticed that the guards had been standing far from their usual position while staring at him in fear. Perplexed, Noel tried to figure out the situation and noticed something changed drastically. His meditation spot had turned into a crater not because of force but because the ground underneath him had been burned into nothing. Even so, he could see the destruction expanded far more than he originally expected. I think you should take a look at. Seeing the guard's conditions could give him the gist of the situation of what had truly happened. Did I do all this? Noel muttered while glancing at the guard leader, who had been talking to him in the past few days. With a wry smile, he approached Noel and explained, I apologize, sir. It's just the heat coming from you is too much for us to handle. I'm afraid that we have to require some ice element spirit magician if it's going to be much worse. I see. Noel thought for a moment and asked, is my grandfather here? Sir Raincart has been away since yesterday. He is supposed to come back today, but we don't have a specific schedule. Understood. I'll stop for today and wait until my grandfather returns before continuing this. Thank you for your consideration. Noel nodded before noticing that both Tristan and Livia were visiting him. He waved his hand to the guard leader and walked to his students. What's wrong with you two? Since when are you so free? We've completed our homework earlier. So, we visit you, wondering if there is anything you want us to do. Livia explained since she was the one suggesting Tristan to visit Noel. Well, Noel contemplated for a moment. I think I'll be leaving for a few days. So, I'll give you a lot of work to the point you can't complete it in a week. So, prepare for it. Livia and Tristan were speechless. On the one hand, they wanted to do a lot of things to master the runes. On the other hand, the way Noel worded it sounded like he truly meant it. In fact, it might be an understatement. Before he could say more, a guard and Raincart had rushed to the garden, worried that Noel's fire would become even more uncontrollable and that it would harm nearby people. Noel, Raincart shouted before realizing that Noel had stopped and nothing really happened. Grandfather, you've come back. Noel greeted him with an innocent expression. I thought you were going to burn the entire house. Raincart let out a sigh of relief while asking, Are you done? Yes. I'm thinking about waiting for the demon crystal to break through to spirit grandmaster. I have kind of mastered my fire, but I need to become a spirit grandmaster to fully grasp that concept. Also, as soon as I become a spirit grandmaster, I'm going to absorb the ice element item before forging a spirit link with my fire spirit. If everything is set up correctly, I can awaken my spirit link and evolve it even further. Then I have good news for you. Raincart smirked. The royal family has accepted the condition. They are still escorting all those things. But if you're aiming for the spirit grandmaster, the Enham family can give those demon crystals first. If you feel bad about it, we can deduct it from what you've got. I see. How long do I have to wait? Noel asked. Since the message arrives after one day, they should arrive in another three days. I can absorb the required demon crystals in a flash, but breaking through will require more than one day. In that case, I'll teach Tristan and Livia for the next two days. Got it. Do you need anything? Considering you've caused this much scene just by mastering your ability, I'm afraid that you're going to burn my house down when becoming a grandmaster. Ahaha, you're exaggerating. Well, if you don't mind, I want a spacious place to break through. If possible, there is nothing I can burn there. How about the plane not far from our territory? I will be going with you to freeze everything extraordinary while trying not to disturb you. The entire process might take an entire week, you know. Yeah, I don't mind. I have nothing to do anyway. Raincart shrugged. Though, I hope you give me a scene that I will never forget. Don't disappoint me. You know how to create pressure. Noel chuckled, 
I just hope that it's not going to be too big that I can't leave this country. That's true. Raincart nodded in agreement. After seeing Noel's fire and ice, Raincart realized that while the ice was doing its best to improve, the fire had yet to reveal its true nature. According to his estimation, Noel had only exerted 20 to 30 percent of the fire's ability. If becoming a spirit grandmaster allowed him to tap that remaining 70 percent, he was afraid that he would become uncontrollable. That was why he decided to accompany him this time. He was the only one who had the power to prevent anything bad from happening. Anastarges has shocked the world by harnessing that level of power, and my grandson is no less than her. I'm afraid that he will show me something so unbelievable that I can't prevent it. More importantly, there is a possibility that the fire element will dominate the entire system and completely devour the ice spirit. While it shows the strength of the fire spirit, it won't have any good effect on Noel's body. Meanwhile, Noel turned to Tristan and Livia. There you have it. Since I can't teach you for a while, I'll cram everything on you for the next two days. So, don't expect any sleep. Yes, Tristan and Livia replied while straightening their back. Unbeknownst to them, Noel would surpass even the wildest dream of Raincart. Chapter 860 Advancing to Grandmaster Part 1 Have you noted everything? Noel asked with a smile. Yes, Tristan and Livio answered at the same time. Then, I'll leave for a bit. Make sure to do everything before I return. Noel waved his hand while walking away. Raincart, who was next to him, nodded in approval as they exchanged looks before accelerating. With their speed, horse or carriage was far too slow, especially for a small distance. Even though Noel was a spirit master, he could easily keep up with his grandfather's speed. There were already a few guards standing by, ready to spread out upon seeing Noel and Raincart. I will be waiting nearby. If you're done, return to the camp in the southeast. You can sleep, eat, or anything. If you have any injuries, inform me straight away. There are enough demon crystals to break through. So once you've reached the Grandmaster level, consolidate your strength before absorbing the ice element item. It should arrive by tomorrow. Understood. Noel nodded with a serious expression. When he broke through to the Spirit Master, he required a whole night to consolidate his strength. So, he expected that it would be much longer. Even Ardigan was ready for the breakthrough. After saying everything he wanted, Raincart finally stopped and waited with the soldiers. Meanwhile, Noel continued forward and found a lot of demon crystals lying on the ground. This was the necessary amount to break through. In fact, he believed that there were more than he originally stated. It seemed that his grandfather was worried that it wasn't enough. Thanks, grandfather. Noel smiled. Before attempting the breakthrough, Noel checked his status through Ardagon. Name, Noel Ardagon. Job, Rune Swordsman. Weapon, Ardagon Sword. Main Medal, Demon Hunter Medal. Elite Medal. Honor Point, 120 Pints. Skill Point, 5 Pints. Status, Stamina plus 5.1%, Constitution plus 5.1%, Sword Mastery plus 4.3%. Spiritual Energy plus 4.5%, Rune Mastery plus 4.0%, Low Quality Crystal, 4585,000, Mid Quality Crystal, 2102,3000, Advanced Quality Crystal, 351,500, Peak Quality Crystal, 38,600, Superior Quality Crystal, 2,300. It's not bad. In this advancement, I'm going to max out the low-quality and mid-quality ones. Since my limit is twice that of normal people and my conversion rate is at maximum, my advanced and peak quality are still on the low side. As he said, Noel had been absorbing a lot of low-quality and mid-quality demon crystals but still managed to reach Spirit Master. Even Anna had ingested more advanced quality and peak quality crystals to become a Spirit Grandmaster. This was the biggest advantage Noel had. If Noel continued at this pace and fully filled the advanced and peak quality crystals, he could easily surpass a spirit transcendence. By filling more superior crystals, he would reach the legendary spirit king stage. However, finding a superior quality crystal was easier said than done. Unless one ventured deep into the demon territory, they would hardly find any, and once they entered, they had to prepare to lay down their life. That was why the Spirit King stage was just a legend.
let alone with not a perfect conversion rate. Now that he had checked the amount, Noel tried to calculate the distance between him and the spirit grandmaster stage. Noel glanced at the amount of crystals. I guess I should absorb everything except for the excess low and mid-level crystals. Normally, people wouldn't attempt such a thing because that excess energy can't be used properly. But I have two spirits as well as runes, so that excess energy is something I need. After making sure everything had been prepared, Noel asked his spirits, Are you ready, guys? We're ready. Seeing Ardigan's notification put his mind at ease. He sat down next to the pile of crystals while grabbing some of them, he began circulating his energy around the spirit seal and started sucking the energy from the crystals through those spirit seals. Noel could feel the surge of energy that rushed through his veins, filling him up. Heisk's spirit seal got contaminated by the spirit link, turning the pure spiritual energy into ice spiritual energy. That cold energy rushed and spread all over his body, chilling him. No one could withstand that surge of energy without resting since it felt like the entire body was being frozen from the inside. Fortunately, Noel wasn't an ordinary expert. All of a sudden, a fiery energy burst out and warmed his entire body. The intense heat met with the extreme cold, neutralizing each other. While that clash of energy was pure torture, this was enough to balance everything out inside Noel's body, allowing him to continue for a long time. The eruption of that energy felt like dry ice. It was extremely cold, but when it was touched, the coldness turned into a sharp pain as though one was burned. Yet, Noel remained calm. The absorbing process went relatively calm, considering Noel had just to absorb and refine them. Even Raincart wasn't too worried during this phase as he only asked someone to monitor Noel's situation. Raincart, on the other hand, was handling a few things such as what would happen if Noel's energy burst caused a problem, he had to prepare the soldiers well to avoid unnecessary trouble, Noel might have lost his parents, even if it was only a scheme and they were still hiding somewhere, however, it didn't change the fact that he had lost the love and care he had received the whole time, due to that loss, Noel matured, he changed the way of life and pursued the ultimate strength, but that path was extremely lonely, if Anna wasn't there, revenge would have clouded his mind. There was a high possibility that Noel would attempt something reckless just to fulfill his revenge. So, Anna might be the greatest blessing he had in the past. However, Noel was aware he was personally responsible for Anna's interference. If he didn't ask Cold Rue and use that power to turn back time, Anna wouldn't be there. Of course, Anna had only told him about the alternate world, not about the regression part. But after seeing Oldru, it was easy to deduce this part. At the same time, there was one more fortune he got after losing his parents. It was his grandfather. Because of the death of his parents, Raincart became more concerned about Noel's situation. Noel fully understood that Raincart wouldn't support him this much if he didn't have this kind of talent. But Raincart would still give a considerable amount of support even if he couldn't awaken his spirits. So, his grandfather was similar to Anna in his heart. Hence, Noel had only one thought when attempting this breakthrough. He wanted to make sure that his grandfather was proud of him. That was probably the best thing to repay for his kindness. Noel took a deep breath every few crystals. In just an hour, he managed to absorb 200 low-level crystals. If this continued, he should be able to fill up all the space for the low-level crystals in one more hour. Although the absorption speed would be slower for the mid-level crystals, this speed was beyond anyone's imagination. Even the soldier, who observed Noel from afar, notified Raincart of his concern. Sir, it appears that he is ingesting those crystals at high speed. Is there something wrong? His conversion rate should be extremely high so I'm not that worried. Raincart tilted his head in confusion, but he is at 200 crystals per hour. Are you sure about this? He what? Raincart rushed to the front and checked the fluctuation of energy in Noel's body. To his surprise, the energy looked extremely stable. What? Even I could only handle 50 crystals per hour. How did he do that? Raincart wanted to stop him, but because there was no anomaly, he could only watch for the time being monitor him closely. If there is an unstable fluctuation coming out of his body, inform me and get ready to intercept. Understood, sir. 
the people began to raise their guards, seeing something unprecedented. The only reason why Noel could reach this speed was the two spirits in his body, the two opposite elements inside his body that supported each other instead of clashing. Noel continued filling up his quota after another hour. Noel picked up his last lower level crystal out of curiosity. He also grabbed another crystal. It was said that when the limit was reached, the energy absorbed from it would simply leak out of his body, and he confirmed it after the first try. As soon as he filled up all the spots for his low level crystals, he instantly felt full. It was hard to describe the sensation, but he knew that there was no more room for it. So, when he tried another one, the absorption was a bit chaotic. Ultimately, Noel dropped that crystal, abandoning his thought for it. After that, he continued with the mid-level crystals. As expected, the soldiers and his grandfather were shocked by his speed once again. It was clear that Noel's method was far better than any of them. So, Raincut warned them not to disclose the information and continued observing Noel. Chapter 861 Spirit Grandmaster This is. Noel felt that his body was being filled to the brim. It was to the point that he was suffocating. However, this was a good sign. This meant the energy was enough to advance to the spirit grandmaster stage. Ardagon, Heisk, get ready to transfer the energy you two have absorbed to the mind. We'll proceed with the spirit mind. After asking the two spirits, Noel felt the spirit seal was reacting to his words. They began channeling the energy toward his brain. When someone absorbed the demon crystal for the first time, they had officially become a spirit apprentice. Once their body got used to the spiritual energy, they could exert strength beyond a normal person. This was the spirit practitioner stage. However, spirit wielder was even more different. The human body began assimilating with the spirit, allowing them to fully utilize the spiritual energy. That was when the spirit master came into place. While their body could release spiritual energy, they didn't have the organs to store and channel everything. That was why they condensed the energy into their heart, creating a second heart called spirit heart. This heart allowed them to change their body like that of a spirit. Now that they had the core of the spiritual energy in their body, all they needed next was none other than the one controlling it. Noel was beginning to form the organ that controlled the spiritual energy, the spirit mind. The process was not that much different from when he created the spirit heart. He condensed all that energy and wrapped it around his human brain. The remaining energy continued flowing into that brain and created the remaining outer layer of the spirit mind. Noel could feel a sharp pain all around his brain. After all, the surge of energy was extremely powerful due to the fact that two spirit seals were sending the energy simultaneously. Noel began gritting his teeth, enduring the pain quietly. This was not the time for him to scream or alarm his grandfather. He persisted for two hours and the outer layer had begun taking the shape. Little by little, he began opening a passage for the rest of the spiritual energy to fill up the spirit mind. At first, it felt like blood rushing into his head, but soon, his brain felt warm as Ardagon had planted the seed of his element. This seed would manifest in the spirit mind, fully controlling the flame energy. The warmth was perfect as it made Noel feel relaxed. Unfortunately, that comfort only lasted for an hour before the temperature rose even further. Noel was gasping for air as though the liquid in his head had completely evaporated. Luckily, before something happened, a cool breeze flowed through his veins and lowered the temperature. This chilling sensation came from Heisk. The latter appeared to be using her full power in order to lower the temperature. Heisk had created an opportunity for Noel. By lowering the temperature, he could continue with the next step. He planted those two seeds in his mind and nurtured them with spiritual energy. This way, the pure spiritual energy began to be influenced by both sides, creating two sides of opposite elements. Normally, these opposite elements would clash with each other, but surprisingly, Ardogan controlled his own power and tried to harmonize with Heisk. The harmonization gave the sensation of a whirlpool of two liquids that were being stirred to fuse with each other. Sadly, the two opposite elements might be able to live in harmony, but they, by no means, could fuse. As a result, Noel could feel the intermittent temperature during the whole process. While it wasn't as painful, he was certainly uncomfortable. Noel knew that the absorbing process didn't last for a long time. 
breaking through to the spirit grandmaster required a lot of time. Just waiting for the two elements to harmonize alone took at least three hours. Noel had to endure all the uncomfortable feelings for that long. Even then, it wasn't over. Once the spirit mind was established, it would form a connection with the spirit heart, forming one spirit vein that would connect both of them. The vein had to be strengthened by the fire and ice energy. After that, the energy all over Noel's body had to be washed anew. Instead of the normal pure energy he usually used, he could only use two types of energy. In other words, his energy wouldn't match with anyone other than him anymore. This was one of the features that a spirit grandmaster had. It was true that having this unique energy would cause them to be unable to help anyone, this also showed the value of force control that Eldrew was talking about. Noel didn't have the pure spiritual energy anymore, but he could still use the force control to direct the energy within someone's body to heal them. In addition, by having this new type of energy, his power would be amplified threefold at the very least. It was no wonder Anna could cause such a commotion. There was such a big difference between the spirit grandmaster and spirit master. More importantly, Noel's sense was heightened to a level where he could feel his own veins. It could be said that because the veins had been strengthened by those two elements, he sensed those elements instead of the veins. This was the reason for spirit grandmasters being able to recover from their injuries quicker than anyone below that level. If Anna had reached this level before using the true spirit body, the broken veins could easily be sensed and she would control her own energy to patch up those holes herself. Finoel, who had just finished linking the spirit mind and the spirit heart, the next process was torture. By gathering all the pure energy into the spirit heart and changing their element through the spirit mind before spreading it again, Noel felt like he was dying a few times. At one time, he felt so dry as though every liquid, including his blood, vanished from his body. At another time, he felt so energetic that he had a hard time focusing on controlling his energy. More importantly, once the unique energy was released back to the entire body, it was like he was being boiled alive and frozen again and again. At one point, Noel couldn't even feel a single thing from his body, he didn't know how much time had passed. All he could do was to make sure that this process didn't cause any injuries or encounter any mishaps. Noel said once that he needed to become a spirit grandmaster before being able to master his undying fire. Now that he had this new energy and sharper senses, Noel could measure the temperature and characteristics of the fire energy that enhanced his body. Novelnix.com By mastering that fire, he also created stability within the undying fire, allowing his veins to have the same temperature, amount of energy, and heat. He registered all that into his spirit mind, allowing Heisk's ice to match Ardagon's flame before reharmonizing them. In other words, Noel had just experienced the breakthrough two times. By this time, Raincott grew worried, thinking that something must have happened. Fortunately, he understood the fact that the true nature of two spirits residing in one's body wasn't fully recorded. So, unless Noel showed any signs of failure, he wouldn't stop him. Approximately 40 hours after he began absorbing the demon crystals, Noel gradually opened his eyes. The spiritual energy surprisingly changed its attribute when it made contact with his skin. So, this is the realm of fusion. By synchronizing the spirit mind and the spirit heart, the nature of my energy changes to match the unique ability that my spirits have. In my case, it's the ice and fire energy. Thanks to Ardagon and Heisk doing their best to harmonize the two opposite elements, the energy is stable. Ardagon also showed his confirmation by sending the completion of his mission. Mission, advancing to the spirit grandmaster. Description, after mastering the undying fire, it's time to become the spirit grandmaster. Reward, spirit step, spirit step, huh? By using the explosiveness of my fire element, I can increase my speed to the extreme. That's quite good in battle. I don't know if it can match Anna's speed though. In any case, I have officially become a spirit grandmaster. Now, I understand why spirit grandmasters can look down upon those who are below them. Dimitri's worries are also justified. I don't know how much time has passed, but it's clear that I took longer than I needed. Noel rubbed his belly. Even though he was a spirit grandmaster, not eating for almost two days surely took a toll on his body. Let's just recuperate and understand my current power before continuing the next step.
Noel took a deep breath. Calming his excitement down, he rose from the ground, signaling Raincart and the guards that he had finished. A Tale of Steel and Gunpowder 77 to 81 by Pixie Tokaizaki 14, Chapter 77, Explanation. After their purchase, they looked for a place to eat. The midday sun was now up, which slowly dried up the water that was left from the rain shower earlier. Eventually, the two came across the cafe where Nari met Eric for the first time in this city. The swordsman from last night was nowhere to be found, though Nira guessed he was somewhere inside the city. Looking for a girlfriend once again, Nira felt a tug on her shirt and saw Ellie pointing at the cafe. How about we eat lunch here, sis? I really want to try out their new chocolate cake, she said Wild Rule went down from her chin, presumably because it is being advertised outside the story by a sign or people eating said cake, which she can see through the window. Hm, why not? Ellie wore a soft smile at her sister's words, after which she led Nira towards the cafe. The building was predominantly made from spruce wood and had a cobblestone foundation. It had a porch outside where people could eat their food, complete with wooden tables. Each wooden table had at least two chairs, and there were four tables in total. As they entered through the wooden door, which had a glass top that allowed them to see inside, they were greeted by the smell of freshly baked cakes and brewed coffee. The interior was cozy as it is from the outside, with small lamps illuminating the walls, which were made from wooden planks. There were a total of fifteen other tables, each covered in a white cloth. Some had four chairs, others only had two. A window beside the main door let in the noontime sunlight. In front of them was a counter where there were several people waiting in line to get their order. The cafe was packed, given that almost all of the tables had people sitting there. They made their way to the back of the line and waited their turn. It took a couple of minutes, but they eventually reached the front of the line. Behind the counter was a blue-haired girl that was almost just as tall as them. She wore the store's employee uniform, which consisted of a white shirt with a black vest. For her lower half, she wore a simple black knee-high skirt and socks that only reached her ankle. Welcome to our humble cafe. What would you like to order? She asked with a soft smile. Two slices of chocolate cake, please, and a cup of coffee for me, Nero answered. Two cups of coffee, please, Ellie jutted, and Nero just shrugged her shoulders. She took a mental note before asking, All right, that would be one silver coin and eighty-nine copper coins. Nero brought out the amount needed as Ellie was about to reach for her coin pouch. I'll pay you back, sis, she said in a low voice. Don't mention it. Nera replied as she gave the payment to the girl. The blue-haired girl placed the coins inside a drawer located under the counter and motioned for them to sit on one of the empty seats that were available. We'll have your order ready in a few minutes, the girl said as she walked into the room behind the front counter, which they just assume is the kitchen. The seat was complete with a table and was very close to the west wall. They sat down in the seats that were facing one another, and Ellie placed her sword on the seat adjacent to her. Just as Ellie was about to start a conversation with Nira, the older twin was already ahead of her. So, why did you ask me to come along? Nira questioned. What do you mean? Ellie asked with confusion. You could have easily forged your sword if you waited long enough, along with making extra throwing knives. You could have also done all the lingerie shopping by yourself. So why did you ask me to come with you and not Amiria? Nira said, leaning backwards on her seat. Well, I just wanted to spend some time with you. You're always busy with your weapons. And we hardly hang out anymore, Ellie said while looking away from the stair from her sister. I see, Nira said. A long silence came between the two sisters as they thought about what they were going to say to each other. Ellie built up the courage to speak, but Nira was the first to beat her. I'm sorry. W what? Ellie asked, surprise written on her face. I'm sorry I didn't spend time with you as much as before when we were kids. Nira apologized as she leaned forward in her seat with her hands flat on the table. Ellie was speechless, she always thought her sister was a cold and calculative individual who put work before friends and family. It's weird seeing Nira express herself like this. My only regret from my last life is always putting work before friends and family, because of it. It made me the best gunsmith money can buy, but I have little to no friends and also distance myself from family by ignoring reunions and gatherings. In this life, 
I'll aim to make use of both worlds. It's just going to take a while to get used to. Nira thought to herself. Her thoughts were cut short by Ellie slowly holding Nira's hand with her own. Apology accepted. Nira saw Ellie flash a smile that indicated that she was relieved. Nira returned her sister's smile with her own as the two were rudely interrupted by another employee who carried their food on a platter. I hope I'm not interrupting anything, he said as he placed their order on their table. Ellie immediately let go of her sister's hand and faced the employee while blushing red. And no, you're just on time, eh, she said while she rubbed the back of her neck. Nira just ignored their conversation as she eyed the food with hunger in her eyes. If that's the case, then please enjoy your food, he said before bowing his head towards them and walking back towards the kitchen, presumably to pick up another order. The twins giggled at each other for their actions, which were almost misinterpreted by the waiter. In the end, they slowly ate their food while chatting about what quest they should do next for the guild. 22, Chapter 78, Surprise Encounter After their lunch, the twins left the building. As they went down the winding road that led back to the inn, Ellie sparked up a conversation. So, which next step do you want to take next? She asked walking beside her sister. I was thinking I'd give you the chance of picking one for yourself. I always pick the quest, so I guess you can try and pick one for us to do. Nero answered with a smile. Aha! Finally, I get to choose. Ellie exclaimed, pumping her first in the air. Let's save it for tomorrow. We are resting for today after all. Nero reminded them as they continued walking down the street. After a few minutes of waiting, the two were greeted with the sight of a paladin said Paladin was waiting outside of a small alley, his arms crossed as he had his large long sword sheathed behind his back, his armor is gleaming white with gold trims along the edges, and his face is covered by an equally decorated helm, the helm has an angled plate covering the mouth and nose to protect them from arrows, the eyeslits were shaped sharply, which gave off a threatening tone, on said plate is an insignia of a human spreading his arms while a golden halo bathes him in holy light, the paladin has this exact same insignia also on his chest and kneecaps, which are designed in gold, before the paladin could sense their presence, Nera pulled Ellie to a nearby wallet that blocked their view of him, is that what I think it is, Ellie whispered as she took a peek at the paladin to see if he had spotted them, yeah? I guess those priestesses need protection after all. Nera gritted her teeth while she took another peek at the paladin. Lucky for them, the paladin stood motionless like a statue, which indicated that they had not been spotted. What do we do, sis? We can't let them see you. Ellie tried to think of a plan to not get noticed. I know. I guess we have to wait till he moves and hope he doesn't approach us. Nera whispered as she inspected the ammo for her revolver. Only six shots. I should have brought my bandolier with me. She cursed under her breath as they prepared themselves. After what felt like months, they noticed the paladin move. His body turned away from them, and he was now facing the exit of the alley. From the alley, they saw a hooded woman. Her cloak was designed with the symbols and insignias the paladin had, but they were engraved into the fabric. They could not see her face because the hood was hiding it and after chatting with the paladin for a minute or two, the duo started walking away from them, that was close, Ellie breathed a sigh of relief as they saw their figures slowly disappearing into the buildings in the background, the guild master did warn us, we have to avoid them because they most likely know what I look like, Nera said under her breath before standing back up, come on, we have the rest of the day to enjoy ourselves, she flashed a smile at Ellie, sure, sis, Let's talk about this later with Lady Amiria, Ellie said as she followed her sister back into the inn. The rest of the day was very uneventful. Nera spent her time tinkering with her weapons and coming up with ways to improve them. Ellie polished her blades and throwing knives, and Amiria merely played with Mofu in her room. The small fox was happy when Amiria fed him a slice of garlic bread later that day. Once evening came and the sun hung low in the sky, Ellie motioned for Amiria to join her with Nera indicating that they wanted to share some information with her, as Amiria entered the room, she placed Mofu on the ground, the small fox gave off a Mofu before he cuddled up in his little corner, where he usually sleeps, so, what is this about, Amiria asked as she sat down on a wooden chair provided by Nira, she noticed Nira's weapons lying disassembled on a nearby desk and thought that this was the first time she had seen the interior of her weapon, 
we had an encounter with a paladin earlier, Ellie immediately cut to the chase as she leaned on the wall near the doorway, Amiria's eyes opened wide in surprise as she said, were you spotted? Nira rubbed her hands on a nearby cloth to get rid of the dust on it, no, I managed to get out of sight before he noticed, Amiria breathed a sigh of relief, good, a priestess from the church also came out of the alleyway where the paladin was standing guard too, Ellie recalled, what does that mean, she crossed her arms as she said so, they're sweeping the city, probably trying to crack down on the activities of the cult, Nira voiced her idea, most likely, that's why there's only one paladin and one priestess, Amiria voiced her thoughts as she held her chin, we just need to avoid contact with them for now until we know what they're going to do to Nira once they find her, Amiria advised, let's go with that, Ellie agreed, so what kind of quest do you want for tomorrow, she added, you choose, we'll just follow with whatever, Nira said while she took a glance at Amiria for her approval, the latter nodded in agreement, all right then, let's get some rest before we head out early tomorrow, Ellie said before she opened the door, agreed, good night, you too, Amiria said with a soft smile, yeah, I'll see you in the morning, sis, Ellie added as she left, following Amiria, the door to Nira's room also closed behind them, now that it's set, Nira said before she took a look at her room, I should probably clean this up, she signed as she began the work of cleaning the room, she went to bed later that night after taking a nice shower, Mofu also woke up in the middle of the night, took his place on top of the sleeping Nira, and continued sleeping, btw, out of curiosity, which cartridge is the best for snipers, in your opinion ofk, 0.50 bmg votes, 1843.9%, 0.338 lapia votes, 1126.8%, 0.408 cheetak votes, 37.3%, 0 0.308 Winchester votes, 922.0%, total voters, 41, change vote, 16, chapter 79, picking a quest and Ellie's confusion, the next day, after breakfast, the group decided to immediately go on a quest while the sun was just above the horizon, orange light bathed the surrounding area in a beautiful golden glow as it maneuvered through the streets of the city to reach the guild, after they finally made it to the guild, they stepped inside the building only to see a big crowd that surrounded the quest board, that's a big crowd, Ellie commented as she and her companions stood in the door frame, well, it is the morning rush, said Amiria, who just stared at the crowd, maybe we should wait a little bit, Nira recommends, pointing to a nearby bench, they agreed with her, and they all sat down and waited, the noise of the crowd still audible as they waited until it slowly thinned out as the day dragged on, eventually, they dispersed after a few minutes and were now lining up to get their quests registered, Ellie noticed then and motioned for her sister and Amiria to follow, the group took a long look at the whiteboard, there were still a number of quests posted, so each one of them took their pick to see what they could find, hey, Ellie, how about this, Nira said as she pointed at the parchment paper she was holding, Ellie took the paper from her sister's hands and read it out loud, dire wolves are causing chaos in the forest westward from here, slay them, five gold coins per wolf kill, Ellie thought for a second, maybe not, since I want to get better with the sword, Ellie said before she gave the piece of paper back to her sister, suit yourself, Nira commented before she nailed the quest back onto the quest board, how about this, Ellie, came the voice of Amiru as she leaned sideways towards Ellie with a quest in hand, once again, she took the quest from Amiru's hands and said what was written out loud for her companions to hear, wyverns are terrorizing a village in the northeastern mountain range, please deal with them, reward, 15 gold coins per downed wyvern plus 30 gold for quest completion, Ellie held her chin for a bit, I can't really be useful in this since those wyverns would be flying, Ellie sighed before she retuned the quest back to Amiria, the latter shrugged before she pinned it back to the board, Ellie's eyes continued to search the board until she found something interesting, hey guys, how about this, Ellie showed them the quest she found, this time, Nira read it out loud, fire salamanders are eating the crops of a village eastward near the foot of a volcano, please deal with them, 10 gold per kill plus 50 for quest completion, fire salamanders, 
Nera pulled down the quest pepper that was in her hands and turned to Amiria, a big reptile that likes to feast on plants that are grown around volcanic soil. Don't be fooled though, they spit fire as a defense mechanism. Amiria explained with her hand pointed to the ceiling. Nera turned to Ellie and asked, Why do you want to take this quest, Ellie? I'm sure your blade ignition isn't going to work against them. I have another spell I really wanted to test out. And this looks like a perfect quest to do so. Ellie explained before she grabbed the quest off of Nira's hands. All right, then let's do it, Nira commented as Ellie walked up towards the line at the front desk. It wasn't as huge before because it shrank while they were looking for a good quest. After Ellie got it registered, they left the guild to begin the quest. It was now morning, and the sun hung low in the sky as they set themselves up. Nira checked all her available ammo and took a mental note of how much she has on her 26 revolver rounds. 5 shotgun bird shots, 5 shotgun buck shots, and 30 40 mm rounds for the M1873. What she didn't notice is that her companions heard what she was talking about. In front of Nira, Ellie moved closer to Amiru as they walked down the path towards the eastern gate. So, do you know what Sis is talking about? Ellie whispered to Amiria with her hand covering her mouth. No clue. Amiria answered briefly. Who names their cool weapon with numbers? Ellie commented on the way Nera referred to her rifle. I think it's a personal choice on her part. I do think there's a reason as to why she's naming her strange weapons after numbers, Nera whispered back. I just find the name M1873 weird, she commented. Perhaps you can ask her about the naming sense of her weapons? Nira whispered back. I don't think she'll give an answer, you know how secretive she is when it comes to her strange weapons. Ellie whispered as she took a glance at her sister, who was petting the fox on her shoulder. Specifically the newest addition to her arsenal, the shotgun. Also the tube thing, she calls it a shoot gun. Ellie whispered again. Ellie, I can hear you. And it's pronounced shotgun. Ellie froze for a second as she heard the annoyed voice of her sister. They all stopped walking as she did so. H how did you know I was talking about your weapons? Ellie slowly turned back to see the annoyed expression on her sister's face. You always talk louder than you think you are, Nera blankly said as she recalled the times Ellie tried to whisper something only for it to come out like she was talking normally. Ellie also heard Amiria let out a small giggle behind her. S sorry, I was just curious about your naming sense, Ellie apologized while holding her left arm with her right. If you wanted to know so badly, then it's named after the size of the grain on the cartridge. Nira brought out a .44 round for Ellie's eyes. The grain is the length of this brass piece, Nira explained. I see. So M1873 means it has 1873 grains? Ellie tried to process the information Nira gave her. Yes, Nira affirmed, though in the back of her mind she knew she lied. Sorry sis, I can't tell you the name because M1873 means model 1873. 1873 being the year it was introduced Nira thought. With this little thing cleared up, the group began walking towards the eastern gate once again. Nira gave Mo few headbands along the way, much to the small fox's appreciation. 18. Chapter 80, Setting Out. The party eventually reached the village that was written on the quest they had registered with the guild. They noticed that the village was a slow climb because the village rests at the foot of an inactive volcano. The surrounding area is more lush than the forest they went through earlier because volcanic oil is naturally fertilized. The sun was right above their heads when they were greeted with a wooden wall as they slowly ascended the volcano. It was manned by guards dressed in half steel, half leather armor, wielding spears. When they saw the party approach their wooden door, one of the guards yelled, State your affiliation and business here. We're adventurers from the guild sent to solve the fire salamander problem, yelled Ellie with her sword sheathed to signify to the guards that she and her party members do not want any trouble. Open the gates. I'll examine your guild cards before we let you pass through the village. The guard motioned for his comrades to open the gate. The gate is made of wood but reinforced with metal and has sharpened logs to deter anyone from charging headfirst into the village. When the gate opened, they all pulled out their guild cards, and the guard from earlier checked them one by one. He had no reaction when he checked the twins' cards, but when he noticed Amiria's Platinum Guild card, 
his eyes opened wide and his skin turned white from shock. Amiria just made a gesture with her hand, she put her pointer finger on her lips. The guard understood what she meant and continued to act normal even though he was still sweating profusely from the revelation that Ines Ranka was in their small village. So, where to? Ellie asked as the three walked side by side with each other. Probably the farmers. Maybe they can point us in the direction where the flame slame and has come out when they attack. Nira voiced her opinions while she had a hand on Mofu, patting the small fox. The small fox on her shoulder also had his secondary colors changed to a light red. That sounds solid, let's do it. Ellie looked at Amiria for approval, to which she agreed with a smile and a nod. The group then walked around the village to find a farmer. It took a few minutes, but they had found one that was tending to his field outside the wall. Um, excuse me, Ellie shouted, waving her hands up so that the farmer could easily spot her. He noticed her shouting, so he went closer to see why there were a group of three adventurers near his field. Yes, can I help you? said the farmer in a deep, raspy voice. He wiped away some dirt that was on his overalls before he reached them. We were wondering if you were attacked by any flame salamanders by any chance? Amiria voiced her question, her face and golden blonde hair were still hidden under a hood. Are you three the adventurers that the guild sent? He asked with a bit of anxiety in his voice. Yes, we are, Ellie answered. Thank the Holy One, those monsters keep eating my crops. Harvest season is just around the corner, which means those things will just get even more willing to eat my crops. He then gestured for them to look at the crops that were eaten. They were all trashed. Every single leaf was eaten, and what was left had bite marks on it. We need you to help us first, Nira said as she stepped forward. What do you need, lady? He asked with an eyebrow raised. We first need to know where they're coming from, so can you point us to where you saw them emerge? Nira explained. I saw them come running out of the tree line, just there. He pointed at a large line of trees that were a border to a forest that surrounded the east and west sides of the village. Thank you, sir, we'll handle it from here. Nira looked at her party members with a nod, and without long, all three members of the party went into the trees to look for some flame salamanders. As they walked through the forest vigilantly, Amiria took it upon herself to brief them on what they were after. Be on the lookout, flame salamanders typically bury into little burrows in the ground or keep each other safe by grouping up inside a small cave. Amiria explained as she stepped over a branch with her bow drawn, ready with an arrow. Got it, replied Ellie, with her sword drawn and each step careful. Copy that. Nira kneeled down so that Mofu could jump off of her shoulder and onto the ground. You know what to do, Mofu, Nira said to Mofu, the latter giving her a loud Mofu. The small fox kneeled down on the forest floor and used his very sensitive nose. He sniffed the surroundings to try and get a scent. Eventually he managed to find the distinguishing scent of fire salamanders, which was burnt leaves and charcoal. Mofu, he altered Nira and the rest of the party. What is it, boy? Found something? Nero asked as she saw the small fox point a paw towards the north. Good boy, Nero said before she picked him up and placed him on her shoulder. Guys, Mofu said to go that way. Nero pointed to where the small fox originally pointed his paw. The group ran through the forest floor, dodging branches and other foliage that was in their way. Mofu guided them with his nose and used his right or left paw to guide Nira, while Amiria and Ellie followed closely behind. I think this is it, Ellie said as they reached an open clearing with only a cave in front of them. It smells like burned leaves and charcoal, she commented. Weapons out, let's take care of them. Amiria pulled an arrow from her quiver and placed it on her bow. Ellie unsheathed her crimson red sword and prepared to throw knives. Since we're in close quarters again, Nero unclipped her B-25 superposed sword off shotgun from her waist and loaded it with buckshot. Let's go, Ellie said as she was the first to jump straight into the cave, followed by Nero and Amiria. Mofu stayed outside to finish off any remaining salamanders that would try to escape them. 15. Chapter 81, Salamander Hunting Next, as they went deeper into the cave, the natural sounds of the forest were silenced. All that was left was silence. 
The only sound they could hear was the sound of their boots clattering on the ground and the periodic water droplet that fell from the ceiling. Ellie channeled some fire manu into her hands, which erupted from them like a torch, lighting their way inside the dark, twisting cave. So, how big are these fire salamanders? Ellie asked as they made their way through the cave. A bit bigger than Mofu's finey fox form. Amiru answered from behind her. Okay, so not as big as I was expecting. Ellie commented. What did you expect then? Nero asked from behind Amiria. Well, you know, big, as in, as big as a bear or something. Ellie said while using her hands to express how large a bear is. Your expectations are too high. Nero said while carrying a deadpan expression. Hey, I can use my imagination when I want to. Ellie shot back with her arms crossed and pouting slightly. Quiet, I hear something in front of us. Amiru interjected between their conversation while she pointed at the darkness that was in front of them. Both of them nodded, and Ellie drew her sword while Nera readied her shotgun. Amiria kept an arrow ready the entire time. As they traversed through the cave system, eventually they found light at the end of the cave. They continued walking towards it until they came out inside a massive cavern with a rather large hole in the middle that let in the sunlight. A small waterfall can be seen at the edge of the cavern, which filled up a small pond that was in the middle of the entire cavern. The edges of the pond were decorated with grass, bushes, and vines. The walls felt warm not because of the sunlight but because they were near a volcanic vent. Beautiful. They heard a myriad mumble as they walked towards the center of the room, to think. This place was hidden inside an unsuspecting cave entrance. Nera added as she followed Amiria. This is all very nice and all, but where are the fire salamanders? Ellie asked while she scanned the surroundings. Not long after, they heard some rustling from the bushings that were near them. They all immediately stood their ground with their weapons drawn. I think we found them, Nera said before a crimson-colored reptile lunged towards her. Its back was slightly glowing with an orange color, and its underbelly is a lighter shade of that same orange color. Nira immediately pulled the trigger on her shotgun and killed the salamander in one hit. Whoa! That little guy is quick! Ellie commented as she looked at the dead body of a flame salamander. I told you they were a bit bigger than Mofu's small fox form. Amiri said to Ellie before she suddenly heard more flame salamanders converging on their position. Guard up! There's more coming! Amiria warned as she turned towards the location they were coming from. Nero ejected the spent shell and loaded a fresh one before closing the breach. Just as she finished reloading, dozens of flame salamanders came out of the bushes. Some even used their fire spit ability, which made the trio jump aside to evade, only to realize it was done to get them separated. Nero stood her ground and shot a couple of shots. Nailing two slamanders before she reloaded her shotgun. All the while, Ellie managed to reunite with her and hold the front line. Her sword was covered in glowing orange blood as she hacked away at the slamanders that were attacking her and her sister. Amiria also managed to link back up with the twins, covering Nira's flank as she fired arrow after arrow. They then heard an audible click from Nira, which meant she was fully reloaded. She fired her shotgun, killing three salamanders that were on the ground and were about to grab her limbs with their jaws. The image of the slamanders getting filled with holes from the shell lingered in Amiria's mind as she launched three arrows at once, able to kill three more salamanders in quick succession. Nira, look out! Amiria shouted as she saw an approaching salamander charging towards Nira with its mouth agape. Nira received the warning just as she spent the last shell inside the breach on a group of salamanders that were near Ellie. Without a moment to spare, she quickly took hold of her revolver and shot the salamander in the air as it made a lunge for her arm. Nice shot, sis. Ellie commented as she buffed and weaved through the salamanders while hacking away at those who were unfortunately too slow for her movements. Nira noticed Ellie was moving a bit faster than usual and concluded that it must be the spell she used against the demon puppet back at Eris. It took a few more minutes till the salamanders finally started to die off, their corpses littering the ground as they mopped up any stragglers that tried to run away from them. Phew. I think that's the last of them, Ellie said as she wiped the sweat from her forehead. Yeah, I think that was the last of them. Amiru added as she scanned the area one more time to make sure there were none left. While they were searching, Nira kneeled down near one of the salamanders she had killed. She said the salamander was filled with holes from her shotgun, 
but on closer inspection, she could make out the organs inside its body. I wonder. Nera then pulled out a small knife and opened the underbelly of the dead Slamander she was examining. She scrambled around to find what she was looking for. The organ that allowed the Salamada to use its fire spit. She managed to pull out an organ that was the size of her hand, which was attached to a tube that led to the mouth. When she squeezed the organ, a translucent liquid pooled from the salamander's mouth, which she presumed was the liquid that ignites when it makes contact with heat. Nira thought she could use this material to synthesize smokeless powder. She cut the tube that was attached to the organ and cooled said organ with her frost magic so it would last longer. I need more samples, she said as she looked at more flame salamander corpses. Evolution start as a raft 305 to 310 by I am Link. 305. The four ancient gods assemble. At this moment, Rain transformed into the most powerful ancient god, devil god, of the four ancient gods, and lunged at Poseidon. Just with a single confrontation, Poseidon was directly slapped away by Rain. Boom, 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 a series of loud noises. Poseidon's massive body broke through layers of root walls, penetrating countless worlds within the world tree. Rain roared in anger, pursuing victory and shot toward Poseidon. Poseidon used his trident to block Rain's claws, but his body was once again sent flying. Though the world tree had lost the energy supply of the wood heaven crystal and its strength had greatly decreased, it was, after all, the world tree that had rooted in the entire earth. Yet, in the fierce battle between these two, the thick layers of roots, like sheets of paper, were punctured with large holes. The fight of gods, even the world tree was not in the same league. Poseidon was continuously forced back, his eyes gradually becoming angry. After temporarily repelling rain with Poseidon's trident, Poseidon was furious. Do you think you're invincible? I'm going to kill you. Damn, I ran into this madman here. It seems I have no choice but to use my last resort. Guardianship of the three ancient gods. Just hearing the name of this skill, rain was stunned. Did this guy have such a terrifying skill, god of life, god of nature, god of heaven, kill this beast for me, Poseidon roared, behind Poseidon, three huge phantoms emerged, which were the other three of the four ancient gods, an amazing woman with a human face and a snake body, and two incredibly majestic men, their phantoms were even much bigger than Poseidon's, the elf was shocked by the scene in front of her, my god, Poseidon actually received their protection? The creator is the most ancient and mysterious of the gods. It is said that he was gestated from chaos, and after sleeping for tens of thousands of years, he opened his eyes to find everything pitch black. In his anger, the creator reached out and pulled out a giant axe, splitting the chaos. With a crack, the chaos was split, and the clear energy rose and turned into the sky, while the turbid energy sank and turned into the earth. After the opening of the heavens and the earth, Creator stood between heaven and earth for 18,000 years until they took shape, and then he lay down, his body turned into mountains and rivers, and the sun, moon, and stars. However, the most spiritual parts of his body were attained, these parts being his brain, heart, and bones. With the passage of countless epochs, these parts gave birth to intelligence and turned into the four ancient gods. The god of life was transformed from creator's right brain, creating humans and mending the heavens, and was honored as mother earth. The god of nature was transformed from creator's left brain, good at observing the changes between heaven and earth, the changes of the four seasons, and the blooming and falling of flowers. After the god of nature mastered the secrets of nature, at the request of the god of life, the god of nature helped humans survive numerous disasters, and so he was also called the emperor of mankind. Unlike the god of life and the god of nature, the god of heaven was transformed from creator's heart and thus had immense power. God of heaven mastered the laws of the universe and dominated heaven and earth. He represented heaven and was equivalent to heaven. God of heaven won repeatedly in the wars among the ancient gods and was considered the leader of gods. The hardest skull turned into the last ancient god. Devil God. The devil god inherited creator's hardest body, therefore, it was exceptionally powerful, becoming the king of beasts. The devil god was violent and caused havoc in the human world, causing widespread destruction. The god of life, 
unable to bear humans being bullied, joined forces with the God of nature and God of heaven to capture the devil God, they divided the soul of the devil God into three parts and sealed them, while the remaining body was sealed by God of heaven in the divine tree. The three parts of the devil God's soul gave birth to the three zombie ancestors, the body regenerated by the divine tree, became the most powerful of the four supreme zombie ancestors. Three of the four zombie ancestors were inseparable from the devil God, and the last and most powerful one was almost equivalent to the devil God himself. Interestingly, these four ancient gods fought a great war related to the divine tree thousands of years ago, and today, as if in a cycle of destiny, they meet again in the world tree. Being protected by the three ancient gods, Poseidon stood up with a cruel smile at the corner of his mouth, kid, you should know these three ancient gods behind me. I wanted to find the last ancient god, devil god, after escaping this time. As long as I have devil god, I can gather the four ancient gods, and I could even possess the power of creator. A trace of fervor appeared in Poseidon's eyes, ha ha ha, I didn't expect you to deliver yourself to me. So when Poseidon saw rain transform into devil god earlier, he wasn't panicked due to fear, he was excited. Once I take your power, I will be the truly strongest god. Ordinary people cannot take other people's powers, but if it was Poseidon, perhaps he had such an ability. Poseidon didn't seem to plan to hide this ability anymore. Rain's current state was very peculiar because he signed a 100% soul contract, all of devil god's consciousness has fully awakened, but because of the system's active defense ability, Rain's consciousness can still dominate, in other words, the 100% soul contract did not plunge Rain into crazy, but at this time, he had two consciousnesses existing in his body simultaneously. At this moment, Rain heard another voice in his brain, kid. If you have any tricks up your sleeve, use them quickly. Poseidon's triple god protection is not a usual skill. I can't withstand the combined efforts of those three guys. The one speaking was undoubtedly devil god. You also have times when you're scared, huh? I'm not scared. If it was any other god, I would have killed them no matter how many came. But these three are from the same origin as me. If it was only one, I could beat them. But against the three of them, I can't win. What's strange about that? Devil God spoke roughly, kid, you can still control your consciousness under a 100% soul transfer. I know you're different from others, but now you must bring out your real abilities, or both of us will die. No, you'll die, I won't. I'm saying this for your sake? Rain snorted, stop talking nonsense, don't make it sound so nice. I think you just don't want to be controlled by Poseidon. I see that the three ancient gods don't have their own consciousness, Poseidon is just using their power. Poseidon's ability was a defensive type, he forced borrowed their power, just like Rain's Naga god's protection. Every time he used dragon slaying slash, that Naga god had to provide power unconditionally. Devil god, I ask you. Can you take away other people's abilities, like Poseidon can? Devil God was a bit hesitant, he still has a 40% chance to seize control from Rain. If Rain became stronger again, he might not have a chance to seize control of Rain in the future. What? You still want to seize control of me? Come on, haven't you noticed that it's getting harder and harder for you to seize control? With a 100% soul transfer, Devil God's consciousness was at a disadvantage. Rain's words were not just empty threats. On the other hand, Devil God didn't know that the super battleship, having acquired the Wood Heaven Crystal was also synchronously increasing Rain's active defense, and Rain's active defense ratio was quietly increasing. All it could feel was as Rain said, it was getting more and more difficult to completely seize control of Rain's consciousness. But on Rain's side, even if suppressed by Rain's consciousness, Devil God still had his own consciousness and wouldn't be like those three ancient gods, becoming true puppets. Although Poseidon wasn't strong, he had the home advantage in the Azurera and indeed could have the ability to plunder or even change the type of ability. Once its soul contract was amended to be a guardian type, it would end up like those three ancient gods. After weighing it for a long time, Devil God finally said, Are you trying to merge us four ancient gods into creator as well? 13, 305. The four ancient gods assemble. 
At this moment, Rain transformed into the most powerful ancient god, devil god, of the four ancient gods, and lunged at Poseidon. Just with a single confrontation, Poseidon was directly slapped away by Rain. Boom, 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 a series of loud noises, Poseidon's massive body broke through layers of root walls, penetrating countless worlds within the world tree. Rain roared in anger, pursuing victory and shot toward Poseidon. Poseidon used his trident to block Rain's claws, but his body was once again sent flying. Though the world tree had lost the energy supply of the wood heaven crystal and its strength had greatly decreased, it was, after all, the world tree that had rooted in the entire earth. Yet, in the fierce battle between these two, the thick layers of roots, like sheets of paper, were punctured with large holes. The fight of gods, even the world tree was not in the same league. Poseidon was continuously forced back, his eyes gradually becoming angry. After temporarily repelling rain with Poseidon's trident, Poseidon was furious. Do you think you're invincible? I'm going to kill you. Damn, I ran into this madman here. It seems I have no choice but to use my last resort. Guardianship of the three ancient gods. Just hearing the name of this skill, rain was stunned. Did this guy have such a terrifying skill, god of life, god of nature, god of heaven, kill this beast for me, Poseidon roared, behind Poseidon, three huge phantoms emerged, which were the other three of the four ancient gods, an amazing woman with a human face and a snake body, and two incredibly majestic men, their phantoms were even much bigger than Poseidon's, the elf was shocked by the scene in front of her, my god, Poseidon actually received their protection? The creator is the most ancient and mysterious of the gods. It is said that he was gestated from chaos, and after sleeping for tens of thousands of years, he opened his eyes to find everything pitch black. In his anger, the creator reached out and pulled out a giant axe, splitting the chaos. With a crack, the chaos was split, and the clear energy rose and turned into the sky, while the turbid energy sank and turned into the earth. After the opening of the heavens and the earth, Creator stood between heaven and earth for 18,000 years until they took shape, and then he lay down, his body turned into mountains and rivers, and the sun, moon, and stars. However, the most spiritual parts of his body were attained, these parts being his brain, heart, and bones. With the passage of countless epochs, these parts gave birth to intelligence and turned into the four ancient gods. The god of life was transformed from creator's right brain, creating humans and mending the heavens, and was honored as mother earth. The god of nature was transformed from creator's left brain, good at observing the changes between heaven and earth, the changes of the four seasons, and the blooming and falling of flowers. After the god of nature mastered the secrets of nature, at the request of the god of life, the god of nature helped humans survive numerous disasters, and so he was also called the emperor of mankind. Unlike the god of life and the god of nature, the god of heaven was transformed from creator's heart and thus had immense power. God of heaven mastered the laws of the universe and dominated heaven and earth. He represented heaven and was equivalent to heaven. God of heaven won repeatedly in the wars among the ancient gods and was considered the leader of gods the hardest skull turned into the last ancient god. Devil God. The devil god inherited creator's hardest body, therefore, it was exceptionally powerful, becoming the king of beasts. The devil god was violent and caused havoc in the human world, causing widespread destruction. The god of life, unable to bear humans being bullied, joined forces with the god of nature and god of heaven to capture the devil god. They divided the soul of the devil god into three parts and sealed them, while the remaining body was sealed by god of heaven in the divine tree. The three parts of the devil god's soul gave birth to the three zombie ancestors. The body regenerated by the divine tree, became the most powerful of the four supreme zombie ancestors. Three of the four zombie ancestors were inseparable from the devil god, and the last and most powerful one was almost equivalent to the devil god himself. Interestingly, these four ancient gods fought a great war related to the divine tree thousands of years ago. And today, as if in a cycle of destiny, they meet again in the world tree. Being protected by the three ancient gods, Poseidon stood up with a cruel smile at the corner of his mouth. Kid, you should know these three ancient gods behind me. I wanted to find the last ancient god, 
Devil God, after escaping this time. As long as I have Devil God, I can gather the four ancient gods, and I could even possess the power of Creator. A trace of fervor appeared in Poseidon's eyes. Ha ha ha, I didn't expect you to deliver yourself to me. So when Poseidon saw rain transform into devil god earlier, he wasn't panicked due to fear, he was excited. Once I take your power, I will be the truly strongest god. Ordinary people cannot take other people's powers, but if it was Poseidon, perhaps he had such an ability. Poseidon didn't seem to plan to hide this ability anymore. Rain's current state was very peculiar because he signed a 100% soul contract, all of Devil God's consciousness has fully awakened, but because of the system's active defense ability, Rain's consciousness can still dominate, in other words, the 100% soul contract did not plunge Rain into crazy, but at this time, he had two consciousnesses existing in his body simultaneously. At this moment, Rain heard another voice in his brain, kid. If you have any tricks up your sleeve, use them quickly. Poseidon's triple god protection is not a usual skill. I can't withstand the combined efforts of those three guys. The one speaking was undoubtedly devil god. You also have times when you're scared, huh? I'm not scared. If it was any other god, I would have killed them no matter how many came. But these three are from the same origin as me. If it was only one, I could beat them. But against the three of them, I can't win. What's strange about that? Devil God spoke roughly, kid, you can still control your consciousness under a 100% soul transfer. I know you're different from others, but now you must bring out your real abilities, or both of us will die. No, you'll die, I won't. I'm saying this for your sake? Rain snorted, stop talking nonsense, don't make it sound so nice. I think you just don't want to be controlled by Poseidon. I see that the three ancient gods don't have their own consciousness, Poseidon is just using their power. Poseidon's ability was a defensive type, he forced borrowed their power, just like Rain's Naga god's protection. Every time he used dragon slaying slash, that Naga god had to provide power unconditionally. Devil god, I ask you. Can you take away other people's abilities, like Poseidon can? Devil God was a bit hesitant, he still has a 40% chance to seize control from Rain. If Rain became stronger again, he might not have a chance to seize control of Rain in the future. What? You still want to seize control of me? Come on, haven't you noticed that it's getting harder and harder for you to seize control? With a 100% soul transfer, Devil God's consciousness was at a disadvantage. Rain's words were not just empty threats. On the other hand, Devil God didn't know that the super battleship, having acquired the Wood Heaven Crystal was also synchronously increasing Rain's active defense, and Rain's active defense ratio was quietly increasing. All it could feel was as Rain said, it was getting more and more difficult to completely seize control of Rain's consciousness, but on Rain's side, even if suppressed by Rain's consciousness, Devil God still had his own consciousness and wouldn't be like those three ancient gods, becoming true puppets. Although Poseidon wasn't strong, he had the home advantage in the Azure era and indeed could have the ability to plunder or even change the type of ability. Once its soul contract was amended to be a guardian type, it would end up like those three ancient gods. After weighing it for a long time, Devil God finally said, are you trying to merge us four ancient gods into creator as well? 3. 306. Heaven collapsing. In his past life, Rain was not short of playing games. As a result, after playing too many games, he started to think about combining things, not knowing whether it was a kind of sickness. The creator's ability is undoubtedly the most powerful, perhaps with the creator's ability, when facing the invasion of the eight interstellar alien races in the future, Rain could have the power to fight. Stop talking nonsense, just say if you can do it or not, Rain said menacingly. To deal with the devil god, who is always thinking of seizing his body, he didn't have any good expression. Rain was a bit worried and added, let me make one thing clear if you dare to deceive me, I will completely abandon this skill of yours. You should know how many skills I have discarded before. Once I discard the skill of the soul contract, you might end up being sealed somewhere unknown. 
you will never have a chance to come out again. Devil God had fought with Rain several times. Although he didn't know Rain had a system, he was absolutely certain that Rain indeed had discarded a lot of skills. Among his current ten skills, only the soul contract had not been discarded. Other skills like dragon slaying slash, scaly dragon transformation, and fire transformation were all gone. Or rather, they had all become stronger. All right. If you can defeat Poseidon, I'll help you snatch those three guys. Devil God finally agreed. Rain gave a slight smile, good. But kid, are you sure you can defeat Poseidon? Rain sneered, 10,000 years ago, you were sealed by the three ancient gods. You had no help then, but now it's different. My next skill needs a minute to prepare, hold off that guy's attack first. So far, Rain had only used five skills three of which were mutation skills, Tiger Fang was learned from skill books, Iron Storm was a heaven crystal skill, and only Soul Contract, Mirror World, and Time Space Stride were his mutation skills, he still had seven skills left, besides Seeking Dragon Transformation, he had six other skills, at this moment, Poseidon launched an attack, it was just an ordinary strike, but the trident of Poseidon carried an astonishing wind, and the entire space seemed to vibrate violently, now, Poseidon's basic attributes had reached a terrifying level, without any skills, he already had an attack power that even the current rain could not match, ha ha ha, kid, let me show you the true power of this god, rain's eyes widened, hastily invoking mirror world to absorb the damage, unfortunately, Mirror World is an upper limit for damage absorption, and Poseidon's strike directly shattered Rain's Mirror World. Golden Buddha Bodyguard, Rain shouted angrily. Behind him emerged a 200 meter tall Golden Buddha statue phantom, reaching out a hand to meet Poseidon's trident. Two powerful techniques clashed, a loud noise, and both parties were simultaneously blown away by an incomparable violent recoil. Poseidon, having the protection of the three ancient gods, had not yet exerted his full strength. After demolishing the wall of the root system of the world tree, he shot straight toward Rain. Kid, you've completely angered me. Let's see how much ability you still have. Double ancient god strike, sky splitting slash. A dazzling light flashed from Poseidon's trident. The blade light, like a laser furiously slashed towards Rain. Seeing this fierce sword energy shooting towards him, Rain gritted his teeth, as if I'm afraid of you, Nagu ancient god guard, sunset slash, devil god, full power, roar. Rain's roar turned into a roar, and then, devil god opened his mouth wide and spewed out a beam of energy from the air. Sunset slash is a super skill that replaces the dragon slaying slash, and the Naga tribe's ancient god's guard is dozens of times stronger than the new god's guard. When launched in conjunction with devil god in his complete state, its power is on par with Poseidon's double ancient god strike skill. With a loud bang, the interior of the world re-exploded with a terrifying burst of energy, like a large number of nuclear weapons colliding. Countless roots and walls were instantly turned into ash in a dazzling bright light. The surrounding sons of Poseidon couldn't dodge in time, and half of them were directly swallowed by the aftermath of this move. The elf covered her eyes with one hand to avoid the strong light, but the shock in her heart didn't diminish at all. The fight between these two guys is too terrifying. The world inside the world tree is likely to be destroyed. Dot. Avril, the nine great demon god fleet, and the demon god Delkal fleet were all staring intently at that sea god fruit inside Thunder Ponder at this time. The lightning has disappeared, let's go. When brave men meet on a narrow path, the victory goes to the brave. This sea god fruit is extraordinary, we must seize it. Hundreds of people each used their best moves, preparing to rush towards the ancient tree, but at this moment, the earth and sky shook violently. Even these strong people were startled by the intense vibration. What's happening? This, this place, is collapsing. Impossible, this is the world tree, it can't collapse here. Just as people were momentarily hesitant, a crack suddenly appeared in the sky. Of course, what people saw as the sky was not actually the sky, but the sky formed by the root system of the world tree. That crack instantly cracked open. Then, the sky collapsed and the earth cracked. A huge figure broke through the sky, 
fell from a distance, and crashed into the sea. Everyone saw this scene, all surprised. What? What is that? It looks like some kind of beast, but why would it come from there? My god, it actually broke through the small world wall of the world tree? Avril furrowed her brows. When that beast fell just now, she vaguely saw its appearance. Its look seemed to have a slight resemblance to rain after the soul contract. As people were looking at each other, a figure broke through the sky and chased after it. When they saw this figure, everyone was dumbfounded. That guy was a hundred meters tall, holding a trident, with blue hair fluttering in the wind, and behind him were three phantoms following closely. My god, that, that guy, is Poseidon? Behind him, could it be the god of life, god of nature, and the god of heaven? That's the real god. It's unimaginable, who is he fighting with? Could it be that beast just now? Poseidon hovered in midair, completely ignoring those humble humans. The super strong beings in the sky class C area, in front of him, were like ants. He only had one target. Rain. After the previous strike, Poseidon had taken the upper hand, the joint strike of the god of life and the god of nature was stronger than the combined force of devil god and the Nagu ancient god. Ha ha ha, kid. I have to admit, your skills are indeed very strong, but, as I've said before, in front of this god, you still don't have the slightest chance, killing you is as easy as slaughtering a chicken, from the sea, a giant beast rose, standing on the waves, rain was panting, his eyes fixed on Poseidon, Poseidon looked down at his opponent below, and sneered, this broken tree has trapped me for 350 years, with the next strike, I will slay you and this world tree together, with that, Poseidon slowly raised his trident, the three ancient god guards behind him had sharp gazes, triple ancient gods guard strike, heaven collapsing, 10, 307, the end of the Azure era, kid, hurry up, are your skills ready yet, devil god yelled anxiously, damn it, apart from the creator, who can take the combined strike of those three, rain gasped, enough with the chatter, it all depends on this strike, the sword of star fire hung in front of rain, his eyes were red, and he let out a loud roar, this time, however, he was shouting at Avril and the others, Avril, the blueprint for the battleship is in the flagship, the rest is up to you guys, Avril was stunned for a moment, the beast with a terrifying face was actually rain, leader, rain, what, what are you going to do, Olivia had a bad feeling in her heart, devil god's face became even more fierce, and he roared to the sky, battle blood defiance, rain used the skill he had been preparing, the battle blood defiance skill is considered as defying the natural order, it allows all skills to double their damage in the next attack, however, the price for such a heavenly ability is to burn the blood of the user's entire body, using this skill carries a great risk, and the user could possibly die from backlash, fourfold sunset slash, devil god's power doubled, and the power of sunset slash doubled, the two combined, the power of sunset slash quadrupled, devil god felt his own attributes rapidly climbing, and at the same time, he opened his big mouth, and an extremely condensed beam of light shot into the sky, aiming at Poseidon, in the sky, two powerful skills collided, a flash of white light blinded everyone's eyes, and then the energy exploded in the air, producing a ring-shaped aerodynamic force, vibrating outward, where the aerodynamics passed, the root system of the world tree couldn't withstand a single blow, and it instantly turned into ashes, the sea was stirred up to create a hundred meter high wave, overwhelming, the world inside the world tree, at this moment completely collapsed, the two people in the fight were the first to bear the brunt, swallowed by an incomparable impact. In a round of earth shaking, Avril and others stood there in a daze, as if they didn't feel anything. Rain, rain, rain. Avril only felt powerless and fainted instantly. Fancy and Olivia weakly knelt on the ground, minds blank. Trajan's eyes were filled with tears, watching as this place was about to be destroyed, and Avril and the others were all in despair. If they didn't leave now, they were all going to die here. Shob, take them and go. Now, only if we're alive can we save the leader. 
if he's still alive. Shobe suddenly realized, turned into a fire cloud, and lifted the three women, everyone, quickly board the battleship. Blackie was nowhere to be found right now, probably gone to find Rain. Fortunately, the defense of the island had been completely removed at this point, and the super battleship transformed into a warplane mode, flying in front of everyone. Everyone hurriedly jumped on the warplane, preparing to leave. Wait, please take us with you. People from other fleets hurried over and asked, our battleships are all sunk. Under such a huge wave, their battleships were doomed to sink, and now only the super battleship could take them away. Trajan's eyebrows were tightly furrowed, he glanced at the ancient tree, the sea god fruit on it had been picked by someone, but now there was no time to investigate, if these people stayed here, they would most likely die. Get on board first, said Trajan. After everyone boarded, Trajan piloted the battleship, frantically traversing the interior of the world tree, which was on the verge of collapsing, just as they were about to leave. The world behind them completely collapsed. After a frantic traverse, Trajan finally led everyone out of the world tree. In the world tree sea area, the other battleships of the dad were standing by and Rain's flagship was also here at the moment. Just as Trajan was about to check, a rumbling sound came from behind him. That huge towering tree, amidst the rumbling, slowly tilted. The world tree, which appeared after the arrival of the Azure era, actually collapsed. Various powerhouses stood in the cabin, staring at this scene in a daze, their minds filled with mixed feelings. That tree, like a symbol of the Azure era, collapse seemed to predict the end of this era. Oh my god, can't even the world tree withstand it? What does the collapse of the world tree signify? Sea god. After the real sea god appeared, this man who had always been referred to as the sea god no longer dared to call himself as such. I am just a messenger of the world tree, the deity you saw before, he is the real sea god. I seem to have heard the world tree talking to me. The messenger closed his eyes slightly, feeling intently, she said, this is a sign of the end of the Azure era. Is it really the end of the Azure era? Lena's eyebrows were tightly knitted, then, what era is next? It's not the era of the gods, is it? The messenger shook his head slightly, next, what we have to face? What all of humanity, the entire earth will have to face is, the apocalypse. Apocalypse? Delkal looked at the messenger in surprise. Are you referring to the sea god or that beast? Neither. It is an existence a hundred times more powerful than them. The messenger suddenly opened his eyes. The world tree told me that we must save Rain. Only he can take on the task of dealing with the apocalypse in ten years. Trajan and his group were immediately excited and hurriedly came to the messenger to ask, where is our leader, is he still alive? The messenger turned to look at the sky, they saw a black dragon flying up from the ruins of the world tree, soaring in the sky, it's blacky. Armin's eyes were amazing, he immediately saw that there were two small black spots behind blacky, it seemed to be two humans, one a woman in green clothes, and the other one was lying on blacky's back motionless, life or death unknown. It's the leader, Trajan, open the cabin door quickly, I'm going to get the leader. When Rain was saved, his body was wrapped in a bundle of green leaves. When Avril woke up, she checked on Rain as soon as she saw him, not caring about her own condition. Unfortunately, Rain was too seriously injured this time, his breath was weak, and he was always in a coma. Trajan, Shobe, and the others, the nine great gods demons, the demon god, and the world tree messenger were currently in the captain's room. Here, these powerhouses, originally competitors, did not make a move, the collapse of the world tree now affected everyone's interests, at that moment, everyone was surrounding the green clothed woman, the messenger stood behind the woman, you are the world tree elf, were you the one guiding me before? The girl nodded her head. Olivia hurriedly grabbed the girl's arm. Then you must know how to save our leader, right? You, you should have a strong recovery ability. Outside the Sky Class C area, we have already discovered your ability. The girl shook her head. My main body has been destroyed by the Sea God and Rain, and without the Wood Heaven Crystal, my abilities are less than a third of what they were before. Besides, Rain's condition, I can't cure. Then, what should we do? Didn't you say that we must save him? How can we save him? 
The girl sighed heavily, I've checked his condition, it's very bad. His body is rejecting the infiltration of any foreign power. So his condition can only rely on self-healing. The sea god fruit you were vying for this time is a top tier healing type sea god fruit. However, although Rain is the physical son of the sea god, his skills are already full. So even with the sea god fruit, it's useless. At this moment, White suddenly barks at the elf. You're saying, as long as we find that sea god fruit, there's still hope for Rain? The elf girl looked at White in surprise. Others didn't know Rain could wash skills, but White knew all too well. It had watched with its own eyes as Rain washed over a hundred skills. 10. 308. Redemption and Destruction. Just as everyone was discussing, the expression on the elf girl's face suddenly became strange, as if she couldn't believe something. The sea god. He's. He's not dead yet. As soon as these words were spoken, everyone's faces turned gloomy. The power that the sea god had displayed earlier had shaken everyone to the core. If he was not dead yet, who could stand against the sea god next? Rain, the only one powerful enough to fight the sea god, was in a deep coma, his life hanging in the balance, and no one else could stand against the sea god. Will the sea god? Will he definitely be our enemy? Delio asked. The elf girl slightly squinted her eyes, trust me, he will kill all of us humans. Otherwise, I wouldn't have trapped him for more than 300 years. Everyone took a sharp intake of breath. The current situation was something no one had expected. Damn it. An old captain said angrily. That's right. Didn't they say there's still hope for Captain Rain? Now only by saving him and we have hope. Who got the sea god fruit in the end? What could be confirmed now was that the sea god fruit was on this ship. But when Captain Rock Blast asked everyone, everyone was shirking. Old Stone. Why are you looking at me? The situation was chaotic at the time. We didn't have time to think about any sea god fruit, we were all just trying to escape. Anyway, it's not in my hands. It's not with us either. For a time, everyone denied having the sea god fruit. Even at this point, some people were still hoping for the best and were unwilling to hand over the sea god fruit. Avril acted decisively, giving the order immediately, lock down the battleship, no one on board is allowed to leave. The people from the other fleets immediately became alert. Captain Avril, what do you mean by this? Delkal squinted slightly. Avril looked at Delkal and said, you should be the captain of the demon god fleet. Delkal, right? I don't know who has the sea god fruit now, but, I hope he can hand it over. Avril's tone was irrefutable. Dewey snorted coldly, Avril, it's true that you led all of us out and the situation is indeed urgent, but if you think you can threaten all of us alone like this, then I'm sorry, whether or not I have the sea god fruit, I won't let you be so overbearing. Avril looked at Dewey, took a deep breath, and said softly, Captain Dewey, and everyone else, I'm not threatening you, I'm begging you. Begging? Both Dewey and Delkal looked at Avril in surprise. As the deputy captain of the dad, the word beg was definitely not something to be said lightly. Trajan, Shobe, Fancy, Armin, and everyone from the dad stood behind Avril. They were taking a stance. Avril's attitude was their attitude. In order to save their leader, they were willing to plead with everyone. No matter who got the sea god fruit, we beg you to hand it over and save our leader. You may be strong, controlling your domain, even regarded as gods, but after all, you're human. You've seen the power of the sea god, and though I don't know your strengths, I guess you're on par given your reputations in the sky class sea area, so I assume no one can defeat the sea god. Human selfishness and greed have created this world, are we going to make the same mistake again, and personally ruin our last chance? Avril spoke anxiously and sincerely, if we can't unite and face this together now, then the only path left for us humans is extinction. The elf girl sighed heavily, Avril is right. The arrival of the Azure Era was caused by the unrestrained actions of humans. From the beginning of the Azure Era, humans have still not realized their mistakes, continuing to fight, plunder, and strive for dominance on the sea. But what have you gained more, and lost more? possessing that sea god fruit will only make you lose everything. I can tell you clearly, the sea god is not your biggest enemy. In ten years, not only you humans, but the whole earth will experience a catastrophe beyond imagination. 
If you continue to be selfish like this, this planet will cease to exist. Redemption or destruction, now, it's your choice. The sealed cabin was incredibly quiet. At this moment, there was a huge explosion from the distant sea surface, and the calm sea was stirred up with a huge wave. A huge figure rose from the sea floor. After clashing with rain, the sea god seemed to be in a bad state, his body covered in blood, but no matter what, he was still alive, still conscious. Dozens of sea god's son were floating behind him. Suddenly, the sea god turned around, grabbed a few of his children, and threw them directly into his mouth. As he swallowed them, the sea god's wounds quickly healed, and the wave-like tattoos on his body gradually recovered. This. This guy can heal himself. He ate his own people. Not good. His power is recovering quickly. That's too cruel. Those sea god's children are his people. He ate them without hesitation. Can we expect such a person to be nice to humans? Under the stimulus of this scene, the last glimmer of hope in people's hearts was completely shattered. Delkal looked back at everyone, whoever has the sea god fruit, give it to them. Now the only one who can deal with the sea god is rain. Don't ruin all our futures for a sea god fruit, Dewey also said. What are you waiting for? Hurry up. Lena yelled. A moment later, a person walked out of the crowd. It was Delia. After a moment of hesitation, she unfastened a bag from one of her subordinates and threw it to Avril. Although I don't like that kid. Here. This is for you. Avril quickly opened the bag, and inside was a peeled sea god fruit. Without a word, she dashed towards Rain's captain's cabin. The elf girl squinted her eyes, looking at the wild giant figure in the distant sea, who had swallowed all his sea god's children and was rapidly recovering. With Rain's body as a sea god's child, it will probably take an hour for the sea god fruit to work. But the sea god's recovery speed is too fast. Someone has to stall for time. Trajan took a deep breath. Thank you all. Later I'll open the battleship store, and you can return to your fleets. Delkal said coldly. The world tree has already said, it'll take at least an hour. How do you plan to delay? Trajan said, all the crew members of our fleet will swear to guard this hour. All members, prepare for battle. 9. 309. Fighting against the heaven. Chapter 309. Fighting against the heaven. After seeing off the other fleets, all the captains of dead returned to their own battleships. All the battleships quickly entered a state of battle readiness. Avril stared at the massive deity, slowly picking up the intercom. Everyone, perhaps, this may be the last time I fight side by side with you, but even if we die, we must ensure the safety of the leader. The voice of Trajan came through the intercom. It's been an honor to serve with you all in this life, I have no regrets. Charge King said, the group leader once said he would take us to the top of the world. Now, I've seen enough of the world, and I have no regrets. Exactly, being able to join hands with everyone, to fight against a deity. What more could I, Shob, regret, for this last hour? We will guard it with our lives. Avril nodded heavily, all right, all battleships, all fighters take off. Full firepower, the doors of the aircraft hangars on the two super battleships and twelve twin aircraft carriers opened, and batches of fighters flew out from the hangar doors and flew towards the sea god. At the same time, the particle beam main guns of the twelve twin aircraft carriers were all charging energy. Boom. Charge King's battleship was the first to fire. Two particle beam lasers shot directly at the sea god. The sea god was recuperating. But he noticed the particle beam attack in time, a bunch of trash, dare to resist. The sea god raised the trident and directly blocked the particle beam. However, just as he had blocked this attack, more particle beams were fired in succession. Damn it, you lot of no sense of death, seems like you want to die sooner. The sea god was furious. While deflecting the particle beams, he charged toward the fleet ten kilometers away. Boom 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 boom. With a series of dense cannon sounds. The dad firepower was fully opened. In the sky, numerous fighters swiftly circled, dropping a large number of missiles. From the distant battleships, anti-air missiles, anti-ship missiles, and armor-piercing missiles swarmed towards the sea god. Missiles constantly rushed out of the sea and shot towards the sea god. Even the sea god could not avoid all the cannon attacks. 
Dewey stood on the deck of his main battleship, his eyebrows furrowed. Even though he was a superpower in the Sky Class C area, commanding the most powerful fleet, when he saw the firepower of the Dad, he couldn't help but gasp. This fleet's firepower is. It's too terrifying. At first, many people did not take this newcomer who had just entered the Sky Class C area seriously. Although their battleships looked strange, and their main ships even had a flight form, even if one included the submarine units at the bottom of the sea, this fleet only had 20 or 30 battleships. There were only two main ships capable of flight. No matter how fierce their firepower was when facing their attack of hundreds of battleships, there probably was no chance of winning. But when he saw the full strength of the dad, he broke out in a cold sweat. Their level of technology was simply too advanced, and it had reached the point where they could crush their opponents with technology, especially the particle beam main gun, which was more powerful than the mainstream laser guns in the Sky Class C area, even the Sea God had to block it with the trident. My god, these few ships, they're putting out the effect of hundreds of battleships, Captain Stone Blast, leaning against the railing, was dumbfounded, we all underestimated the strength of this fleet. The most shocked was probably Delia, she looked at the fierce firepower of the dad with a furrowed brow, unable to wrap her head around it for a long time. Her father said that an old friend asked for their protection of this fleet, but it seemed now, they didn't need their protection. A group leader who could even fight the sea god, such an advanced super fleet. If that rascal's goal wasn't the sea god's fruit, but to fight for supremacy in the Sky Class C area, then the forces in the Sky Class C area would have to be redrawn. No wonder that Rain Kid was so arrogant back then, their strength was enough to deal with any fleet. The Sea God was bombarded by countless missiles and engulfed in numerous fireballs, he couldn't even continue to advance. When all the firepower of the Dad was unleashed, even the mighty Sea God was rendered immobile. Ugh. The sea god finally lost his temper, damn, you bunch of trash, dare to be so presumptuous. I am the sea god, the Poseidon. I am the ruler of this world, taste the fury of Poseidon. The sea god forcefully plunged the trident into the sea, instantly causing a circular blast of water with a diameter of a kilometer on the sea surface. Immediately afterward, the sea water pushed outward from the center, and the outer waves were instantly pushed several hundred meters high. The fleet was strong, but apart from the two super battleships, the other ships could not fly and could not completely leave the water surface. Under the unseen gigantic wave, all battleships were pushed up into the sky. Avril yelled, twin aircraft carriers, initiate submarine mode, Trajan, we ascend. The two super battleships quickly rose into the sky, while the other ships switched to submarine mode. Keep firing. We can't let it get any closer. Boom 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 boom. The dad's firepower showed no sign of weakening. Coupled with a large number of air strikes, the sea god was continuously bombarded. Damn it. The sea god didn't expect that this fleet could fly as well as dive underwater. It seemed that his plan to disperse the fleet with the seawater had failed. You think I can't do anything about you like this? This is the Azure era. There's nowhere for you to escape. Tidal wave. The sea surface instantly became terrifying. Giant waves roared and rolled, the waves blocked out the sun, numerous whirlpools formed in the sea. The calm sea surface became turbulent, with huge waves surging, making it hard to distinguish between sea and sky. The entire sea surface seemed to have turned into a human hell. My god, this is the power of the sea god, he can control the ocean at will. Lena's hands trembled slightly. In the Azure era, whoever could control the sea ruled this world. Under such a terrifying environment, the firepower of the submarine units finally began to weaken. Even the aircraft in the sky had to avoid the insane waves. Delkel gripped the railing tightly, they were far away, but the mere aftermath already severely affected their fleet. However, Delkel had no mind to worry about his own fleet. His eyes were fixed on the battle at the center of the battlefield. Ha ha ha. Mortals, opposing me, the sea god, all you can do is await slaughter, the sea god issued a sky shattering laugh in the storm you lowly ants, how can you fight against the heaven, all of you must die, Delkel's breathing became increasingly rapid, now that the dad's firepower couldn't keep up, 
they couldn't stop the sea god from getting closer, Delkal closed his eyes slightly, took a deep breath, and fell silent for a moment, moments later, Delkal opened his eyes with righteous indignation, Delkal roared with anger, the demon god fleet listens to my command, concentrate all firepower, attack the sea god, today, even if the whole fleet is destroyed, we must hold this last hour, boom 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 boom, the demon god fleet opened fire, 10, 310, the extremely powerful sea god fruit, next, the reason why the demon god Delkal did not enter the ranks of the nine gods and demons and was specifically referred to as a demon god was that his usual way of doing things was somewhat evil, however, this time, he was the first one to order to fire, looking at the demon god fleet charging towards the central sea area, Dewey's brows furrowed tightly, it was now time to put aside the factional disputes of the various sects and forces, thunder fleet, attack, open fire at full power, spare no cost, and strive for this one hour, when do you guys plan to watch the show, you may not believe others, but can you not believe the spirit of the world tree, if we protect that kid, we still have a glimmer of hope, otherwise, who of you can escape the ocean, boom 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 boom, the thunder fleet attacked, after Delkal and Dewey had made their moves, the people of the nine gods and demons, after a moment of hesitation, finally made their moves as well, the eleven strongest human fleets launched a fierce attack on the god of the sea, the surrounding fleet captains looked at each other, who can tell me, what exactly is going on, the ten fleets have teamed up, it seems that they are protecting some important person and need to buy an hour's time, I don't know what's going on, but, you all saw the brutality of that sea god, he said he was going to kill us all, if we let him live, I'm afraid we're all going to die, I think that's why the ten fleets made their move, so, what about us, what are you still thinking about, we must kill the sea god, after a brief hesitation, the surrounding fleets finally started to act, leading their fleets toward the sea god, just a god, what I want to kill is a god, fire, in the sea area of several kilometers, thousands of powerful battleships opened fire at full strength, and countless warplanes shuttled through the sky, obscuring the sun, like swarms of hornets, dropping missiles time and time again, between the sky and the sea, it was like the beginning of chaos, with war raging, flames and seawater intertwined, utterly chaotic, perhaps weapons of this level can't defeat the sea god, but they must block him and not let him advance half a step, outside, the world was in chaos, but at this moment, Fancy didn't care about anything, she just held Rain's hand tightly, nervously watching Rain, she had already fed the sea god fruit to Rain, however, she didn't know whether Rain could digest this sea god fruit, even though the spirit of the world tree understood White's words, saying that Rain might acquire a new ability, no one knew if Rain, in his unconscious state, could do this, Captain, you must hold on, you said you won't leave us behind, Fancy's eyes reddened, and her voice choked with emotion, why, why don't you abandon the body of the sea god's son, you could have, you must want to defeat the sea god, right, in extremely dangerous situations, Rain's consciousness should indeed leave the body of the sea god's son and return to the ship, but this time, even at the brink of death, Rain did not transfer his consciousness, without the body of the sea god's child, Rain would never be able to defeat the sea god again, then hurry up and wake up, the sea god is about to kill us, by then, everyone will be doomed, also, the apocalypse, we are all waiting for you to lead us to defeat it, you, you, sob, please, wake up, we can't be without you, Rain's injuries were secondary, the key issue was the backlash from the battle blood defiance, combined with his injuries and the 100% soul contract, this tremendous backlash made Rain unable to bear it, although Rain could not respond to the outside world, it did not affect the system's operation in his mind, detected the host has acquired new sea god fruit, host's body has reached the limit of skill capacity, please choose, remove an existing skill or give up the new skill, selection time is 60 seconds, if time is exceeded, it will be deemed as the host's abandonment of choice, and the system will choose automatically, 59, 58, 57, 3, 2, 1, 0, 
the host has given up the choice, the system is filtering existing skills, please wait. After scoring, the Sea King Dragon transformation scores the lowest, the system automatically removes this skill. Sea King Dragon transformation has been removed, acquiring a new skill, if Rain were awake now, he would definitely be scared speechless by the system's decision, mutation type, support type mutation, dual skill, positive skill, spring of holy spirit, skill introduction, one time removal of all negative effects caused by skills, the cooldown for removing the skills negative effect is 50 days, can healing physical damage to the biological unit, it has no cooldown and it is based on energy consumption, when the host's body is damaged, the skill can be triggered to self heal, this skill cannot be leveled up, reverse skill, with a ring of holy spirit, skill introduction, increases the negative effect produced after the biological target unit releases skills by 50%, cooldown for increasing negative effects is 50 days, this skills cooldown does not affect the cooldown of spring of holy spirit, can cause the biological target unit's body to decay at the particle level, it has no cooldown and it is based on energy consumption, this skill cannot be leveled up, this sea god fruit was somewhat similar to Avril's ability, both were support type skills, and depending on the usage, could produce two different effects, just like Avril could enhance or weaken cell activity, however, this sea god fruit, which had been guarded tightly by the world tree, was far more powerful than Avril's, dual direction skills each had their own names and two kinds of effects, counted carefully, this sea god fruit was equivalent to having four skills, host's body severely damaged, detected, automatically releasing spring of holy spirit, fancy had been waiting for a long time without seeing any response from rain, at this moment, her heart was filled with despair, but just then, she suddenly noticed a trace of green light gently wrapping around rain's body, this, what is this, fancy could feel that this green aura was very gentle, and if you looked closely, you would find that where the green aura passed, even the wounds on Rain's body were instantly healed, seeing this, Fancy's eyes widened, a new skill, Rain is saved, tens of thousands of warplanes and thousands of warships had been unleashing firepower for nearly an hour, now, they were finally at the point of running out of ammunition, why won't that guy die? what is he made of, those water pattern tattoos on his body seem to be a kind of defense skill, oh my god, he's been bombarded by so many shells for an hour and he's not dead, is this, a god, despair filled everyone's eyes, the fighting spirit that existed before was completely gone in the face of absolute power, the sea god was covered in black marks from the explosions, but unfortunately, he didn't seem to be defeated, the sea god covered his face with one hand, waited for a while, and when he noticed that there were no more shells coming, he looked at the fleet on the other side through his fingers and slowly lowered his hand, ha ha ha, out of bullets, what a pity, I was hoping you could help me scratch a little longer, alright, you've had your fun, now it's my turn, today, I will make everyone here wish they were dead, just at this moment, the cargo bay of a super battleship from the dad opened, from the ship, a person slowly walked out, the person stood on top of the super battleship, speaking calmly, sea god, who gave you the right to say such words in front of me, immortal world wanderer xianxia 68 to 87 by i am link, 68, shang wang nilin's resolution, shang wen Niwalin woke from her daze, feeling as though she had slept comfortably on a warm bed at Madame Song's home, a sense of indescribable comfort spread from head to toe, she rubbed her eyes and sat up, noticing she was neatly dressed, the memory of being naked and snuggling in Xu Han's embrace seemed like a dream, thinking about that scene, Shang Wen Yulin's face couldn't help but flush in embarrassment, a strange emotion rippled in her heart, she was too shy to recall it, but her mind kept replaying it over and over again, by now, the blizzard had passed, leaving the summit of the snowy mountain silent and vast, the horizon in the east was showing a trace of daybreak, with the forthcoming dawn's faint light, Shang Wen Yulin looked around, eagerly searching for Xu Han's figure, she saw Xu Han walking towards the exhausted thousand year old snow lotus, which seemed utterly despondent as if the storm had drained all its energy the night before, Shuhan reached the snow lotus, grabbed its root, 
and pulled it out completely. In that instant, the east broke into dawn, and the first rays of sunlight spilled over the snow-covered mountain peak, lighting up the place as if it were a heavenly paradise on earth. After storing the thousand-year-old snow lotus in his storage bag, Xu Han collapsed on the spot from exhaustion, staring blankly at the sunrise in the east. Shang Wenrilin walked over to him, Xu Han turned his head to look at her, showing a tired smile. Got the thousand-year-old snow lotus? Xu Han nodded. Shang Wenrilin's mind was a mess at the moment, not know how to continue the conversation. She turned around and said, Let's go then, we've been gone for several days, and the people in Jiang village are probably worried about us. Suddenly, her hand was grabbed by Xu Han, who pulled her over and sat her down next to him. Xu Han let out a long sigh, with a satisfied smile watching the sun slowly rise in the east, he said, Senior, it's rare that we both made it through, we're not in a hurry, stay with me here for a while. Shang Wenrilin didn't refute. She leaned against Xu Han in silence, her face flushed as she watched the sunrise with him. Sitting on the top of the snowy mountain, seeing the glory of the sunrise gradually spreading over the world, along with the sparkling snow around them, it was indeed a breathtaking view. However, the more beautiful the sunrise was, the faster Shang Wen Yulin's heartbeat was, and the more flustered she became. Xu Han suddenly said, it's been a long time since I watched the sunrise like this. Shang Wenrilin remained silent, while Xu Han continued, I joined a sect named Dragon Mystical Sect when I was young, living under the shadow of the sect's head for five years. Every dawn, I would practice my magic and martial arts as the sun rose, regardless of snow, rain, wind, or frost, never breaking the routine for five years, because at that time, I knew I was facing a battle of life and death, and every day I survived, I gained a little more. Since coming to Great Cloud, I gradually forgot that feeling, thinking that I was free as a bird in the sky, a fish in the vast ocean. However, I later discovered that the vastness of the Great Cloud was nothing more than a broader dragon mystical sect. Just like last night, we almost died in the blizzard. Suddenly, Xu Han laughed. Senior, you didn't mention it, but I know it too. The future struggle for the heavenly creation fluid is bound to be a life or death gamble. I hope that after that event, we can survive like this morning and watch another sunrise together. Shang Wenrilin turned her head to stare at Xu Han's beaming face. Suddenly her racing heart stopped. The anxiety and worry that had been plaguing her somehow seemed to be soothed this morning. Shang Wenrilin nodded. It's a deal. Meanwhile, at the headquarters of the Golden Silkworm Association in Cloud City, Shang Wen Ruotong was discussing with the president of the Golden Silkworm Association, a late stage foundation establishment cultivator named Daoist Golden Silkworm. They were analyzing the information about Xu Han and Shang Wen Yulin gathered from various places. Suddenly, the teacup in Shang Wen Ruotong's hand was crushed. Her pretty face couldn't help but blush slightly. Her mood suddenly stirred in a peculiar way but soon returned to commendable calmness. Seeing Shang Wen Ruotong's sudden change in complexion, Taoist Golden Silkworm couldn't help asking, Miss Shang Wen, what's wrong? Shang Wen Ruotong quickly waved at him and rushed out of the reception room, leaning against a corner to take deep breaths, calming her sudden emotional upheaval. Once her mood settled, she relished the sudden surge of emotion again, her eyes filled with doubt as she looked at the distant horizon. Sister, what kind of emotion is this? Living with you for 800 years, it's the first time I felt this strange emotion from you. She lowered her head and chuckled lightly, savoring the emotional fluctuation just now. He he, I understand. Sister, have you forgotten? We, as sisters, are not meant to have such feelings. Shang Wen Ruotong couldn't help but look at the black mark on her right wrist, laughing. Seeing you like this, even I feel a bit sorry for you, for you, it would be better to die here, instead of going back. Having collected her emotions, Shang Wen Ruotong returned to the conference hall. Daoist Golden Silkworm, I've already doubled the reward and paid you a huge amount of spirit stones, yet why haven't I received any accurate information about those two? Is this how your Golden Silkworm Association does business? I demand to immediately dispatch twice as many people to find the whereabouts of these two in the north of Great Cloud. Daoist Golden Silkworm Riley smiled. Miss Shangwen, 
It's not just about doubling the manpower, even allocating the current manpower is already stretching our gold and silkworm association's resources. Not to hide from you, miss. The Immaculate Realm, which opens once every 20 years in the north of Great Cloud, is about to commence. The heavenly creation fluid produced therein has already been targeted by various sects. Our Golden Silkworm Association also needs to concentrate resources to prepare for the Immaculate Realm event. We really can't spare more manpower. The Immaculate Realm, heavenly creation fluid. Shangguan Niwotong thought for a moment, then suddenly laughed. I see. So that's why you came to the north of Great Cloud, sister. Your ambition is truly not small. Daoist Golden Silkworm was left puzzled by Shangguan Niwotong's statement. Then Shangguan Niwotong said, In that case, there's no need to trouble you with searching anymore. The reward I offered can be kept by your Golden Silkworm Association. In exchange, you give me a spot to enter the Immaculate Realm. Ah? Daoist Golden Silkworm exclaimed, Golden Core cultivators cannot go into the Immaculate Realm. The dimension would collapse. It doesn't matter. Since I'm going, I naturally will suppress my cultivation level, and I won't compete with you for the heavenly creation fluid. Moreover, I might be able to help your Golden Silkworm Association in the Immaculate Realm. Daoist Golden Silkworm's eyes rolled around and he quickly poured tea for Shangguan Liu Otong, saying, Before we proceed, I should let Miss know that the Immaculate Realm is dangerous and we can't guarantee your safety. Shangguan Liu Tong snorted, She dared to go there without any cultivation base. Why wouldn't I, huh? Daoist Golden Silkworm continued, In case, I mean, just in case. If Miss encounters any accidents in the Immaculate Realm, then at Senior Heaven Devil's side, Shangguan Liu Otong interrupted him. No, it won't be. Everything has nothing to do with your Golden Silkworm Association. You won't be blamed. 69. 10,000 Year Profound Ice After sitting silently on top of the Great Snow Mountain for a while, Xu Han turned to Shangguan Liu Lin and scratched his head saying, Senior, let's go. After sitting for a while, I feel like my butt is about to freeze off. Shangguan Yulin was startled and immediately said, Shu Han, there's something strange about the place where the Millennium Snow Lotus is rooted. Dig up this area. Understanding her, Shu Han immediately stood up and began to dig with his black claw. After removing layers of ice and snow, they exposed thick permafrost and rocks. Shu Han concentrated his black claw and dug down, only to find the permafrost extraordinarily hard. Furthermore, the deeper they dug, the more pressing the cold became. Shu Han and Shangguan Yulin exchanged glances. There was definitely something at play beneath them. So, Shu Han used his black claw and pursuing sword together to strike. The two magic treasures hitting the permafrost were like striking black iron. Even sparks flew out occasionally. Under Shu Han's persistent digging, finally, a blue light emerged from the bottom of the pit. A piece of crystal clear blue ice revealed a corner within the dark permafrost. Shu Han didn't dare to touch it with his hand. He used his black claw to hold it and pulled it out of the pit. Holding the blue ice in his black claw, Shu Han immediately felt a chill transferred to him through the black energy, causing him to shiver. The temperature of the entire peak also drastically dropped with the emergence of the blue ice. The crystal clear blue ice reflected dazzling blue light in the sunlight. Shu Han asked in surprise, Senior, what is this? My divine sense will freeze when it gets close to this thing. Shangguan Yulin stared at the blue ice and said, If I'm not mistaken, this should be the legendary 10,000 year profound ice. She couldn't help but laugh. Well, well, no wonder a mere millennium snow lotus has such a capability to control the weather. It turns out that it is leveraging this 10,000 year profound ice to increase its power. 10,000 year profound ice. Shu Han gazed at the blue ice, asking, what's so special about this 10,000 year profound ice? Shangguan Yulin leisurely said, 10,000 year profound ice was initially just an ordinary piece of ice. However, after being buried in the extreme cold for tens of thousands of years, it gradually transformed into this rare blue ice. As for its specific uses, I only know a few. I heard that the Eternal Night Palace in the extreme south excels in using this kind of the 10,000 year profound ice. Their high ranking cultivators use 10,000 year profound ice to create their life bound magic treasures. 
combined with their extreme cold cultivation method. Their power is formidable. Xu Han became excited, holding up the 10,000 year profound ice, and said, I was just worrying about not having materials to cast my life bound magic treasure, and here it comes. No, Shang Wenyulin quickly stopped him, saying, You'd better not use this 10,000 year profound ice to cast your life bound magic treasure. The material for a life bound magic treasure not only needs to be rare, but it also needs to match your own cultivation method. I see your method is not of the extreme yin or cold type, so it's not appropriate to use 10,000 year profound ice, there will be more suitable materials in the future. Also, don't you think this piece of the 10,000 year profound ice is too small? Xu Han scratched his head, but senior, casting a life bound magic treasure would be of great help to my future actions. As for the compatibility issue, I don't have any background, encountering such divine material is already considered lucky, I don't strive for perfection, Shang Wenyulin suddenly kicked him, puffing up in anger, and said, who says you don't have a background, in the future, I am your background, once I restore my strength, won't there be other better materials for you to cast your life bound magic treasure, seeing Shang Wenyulin's serious face, Xu Han couldn't help but laugh. Upon seeing Xu Han grinning at her, Shang Wenyulin blushed and stammered, What? Are you laughing at? Xu Han said, I will follow all the arrangements made by Senior. Hearing Xu Han's absolute trust in her, a sweet feeling welled up in Shang Wenyulin's heart. Then Xu Han asked, What are we going to do with this 10,000 year profound ice now? Shang Wenyulin extended her little hand and said, lend me your cultivation. Without hesitation, Xu Han held Shang Wenyulin's small hand, and the magic power flowed from him to her. Shang Wenyulin's cultivation gradually returned to the foundation establishment stage, and her figure began to return to normal. The enchantingly beautiful woman stood in the world again, holding Shang Wenyulin's delicate hand, looking at her exquisite and beautiful face, Xu Han couldn't help but be in a daze. Shang Wenyulin gave him a glance and said, What are you looking at? Give this 10,000 year profound ice to me quickly. Ah, yes. The 10,000 year profound ice fell into Shang Wenyulin's other hand, she made seal formations with both hands. One by one, golden characters emerged from her fingertips, inscribed on the 10,000 year profound ice. Soon, these characters glowed brilliantly, suppressing the cold aura emanating from it. At this moment, a beautiful jade bracelet coalesced around Shang Wenyulin's left wrist. The fine silk threads emanating from the bracelet were her life bound magic treasure, the Six Harmony Silk Bracelet. Under Shang Wenyulin's command, the silk threads automatically wove into a long rope, strung the 10,000 year profound dice into a pendant, and made it into a jade ornament. Shang Wenyulin walked over to Xu Han with the jade ornament, stretched out her arms around Xu Han's neck, and put the ornament on him. At this moment, Xu Han couldn't help but feel his heart pounding, he asked, Senior. What is this? The moment the pendant hung on his neck, Xu Han immediately felt a surge of cold spreading from his chest, shaking his entire body, and causing him to tremble. Seeing this, Shang Wang Nilin immediately said, Bear with it. This is a method I learned from the Eternal Night Palace, it uses the 10,000 year profound ice to refine your body, if you wear this pendant for a long time, over time, you will be able to refine a heavenly cold body, by then, not only will you not fear extremely cold cultivation methods, but you will also be immune to all poisons. Xu Han curled up, his teeth were chattering. Senior, I fear that I will perish from this cold before I complete my cultivation of the heavenly cold body. A faint, mirthful laugh escaped Shang Wenyulin as she delicately covered her mouth. The Eternal Night Palace has a bed of 10,000 year old ice, devoid of any sealing spell, yet they recline upon it just the same. I hear, though, it seems only those in the core formation stage are eligible to rest on that icy bed. Ice crystals had begun to form on Xu Han's lips. But senior, I am merely at the early stages of foundation establishment, caught off guard. Shang Wenyulin replied, chuckling, it matters not. With the seal I've applied, no harm will come to your body. It is merely a process of adaptation. However, the initial stages are indeed trying. 
Should you fail to endure, biting her lip, Shang Wenyulin enveloped Xu Han in her arms, whispering, I can assist you. As Xu Han held the delicate body in his arms, he swallowed hard, stuttering out, That's enough, senior. With your embrace, I feel warmth creeping in. But Shang Wenyulin did not release her hold, resting her head on Xu Han's shoulder, she murmured, In the future, cease to call me senior. To be addressed so continuously, I feel as if you've aged me. Xu Han, you are hundreds of years older than me. 70. 8 Direction Evil Breaking Sword Half a day had passed and Xu Han gradually grew accustomed to the bone-chilling cold brought about by the ten-thousand-year profound ice. No longer burdened by the initial discomfort, Shang Wenyulin, having reverted to her childlike form after returning to her cultivation, now slumbered upon Xu Han's shoulder, exhausted. The process of harnessing her spell to refine the ice must have consumed a great deal of her energy. As Xu Han held her, flying back to Jiang village on his flying sword, a thought occurred to him. With this piece of ice in his possession, he could replicate it using the black jar and create a bed of ten thousand year old ice. Though feasible, the practicality of such an endeavor remained uncertain. Given his current level of cultivation, he would likely freeze into dust upon lying on it. Perhaps it would be best to abandon such an idea until he reached the core formation stage. After half a day of flight, Xu Han, carrying Shang Wenyulin, returned to Jiang village. Inside his storage bag lay the bodies of the missing snow lotus diggers from the village. As he pondered how best to return the bodies, a sight from the sky made his heart sink. Half of Jiang village was engulfed in roaring flames. In a moment of panic, Xu Han's finger instantly touched the profound ice on his chest, releasing a surge of extreme cold. Under the influence of his wind incantation, this cold energy quickly expanded. The free-floating moisture in the air met this frigid current and coalesced into ice beads, plummeting downwards along with the cold stream. As the cold stream swept over Jiang village, the intense flames were instantly extinguished. Feeling the shift in Xu Han's aura, Shang Wenyulin stirred from her sleep, rubbing her groggy eyes as she asked, What's happening? Following his gaze, she saw half of Jiang village reduced to ruins, her eyes filling instantly with a frosty resolve. The two of them descended from the sky, rushing into the village. At this moment, Madame Song was kneeling in front of a burnt house, wailing. Shang Wenyulin dashed over, seeing her. Madame Song hastily took her hand, examining her from head to toe. Lin Lin, you're back. Those damnable people didn't capture you. This is good. But they took Gua. Gently wiping the tear streaks from Madame Song's face, Shang Wenyulin asked in a quiet voice, Madame Song, what happened to the village? Xu Han also chimed in, Yes, Madame Song, what happened to the village? And Gua, sobbing uncontrollably, Madame Song clung to Shang Wenyulin. The village chief, leaning on his cane, approached Xu Han. Ah, it's all the doing of the whirlwind gang. Our village didn't gather enough snow lotus, so those damned people took away the children and set a huge fire. A flicker of murderous intent flashed in Xu Han's eyes, but he remained calm as he asked. Is this whirlwind gang part of the Jiang Wu forces? What do they need so much snow lotus for? The village chief said, Ah, it's all because of the immortal master from the purple sun sect, who came from afar. The whirlwind gang then began to collect snow lotus from every household. Purple sun sect, the village chief, looking at the charred ruins of Jiang village, let out a sigh of despair, little Han, you should take Lin Lin and leave as soon as possible. Staying in Jiang village will only draw the attention of the whirlwind gang. Lin Lin, being as adorable as she is, would undoubtedly be a target. Upon finishing, he shouted to the villagers, Those who still have their houses intact, bring out what you can to support Little Han and Lin Lin on their journey. Before long, the villagers all brought something to give. Bits of silver, dry food, and more, all piled in front of Xu Han. Go west. Those villains came from the east. You must avoid them at all costs. With tears in her eyes, Madame Song straightened Shang Wen Yulen's clothes, clutching her little hand and advising, Lin Lin, you must listen to your brother when you're outside. If you come across anyone riding a horse, steer clear. Don't let them take you away like Gua. Fire brewed in Shang Wen Yulen's eyes, just about to burst into a tirade. But Xu Han stopped her. He shook his head gently at her, 
picked up the provisions generously assembled by the villagers, thanked them, and then, hand in hand with Shangwen Ruilin, left Jiang village. Once they reached the woods in Willow Mountain, Shangwen Ruilin jerked her hand free, her voice trembling with anger. You're just going to leave? You go ahead, I'm staying. Those child trafficking scum, I will tear them to shreds. Chu Han, setting down their packages, replied, I only wished to avoid arousing the suspicion of our fellow villagers, the immortal from the purple sect. Lin Lin, this is an opportunity for us. Shang Wen Lin inquired, What kind of opportunity? Do you remember the external incarnation technique I mentioned to you? Shang Wen Lin nodded, You said about cultivating an external incarnation to infiltrate a sect and secure a quota. Xu Han responded, Exactly, but creating an external incarnation takes half a year. If we join a sect after that time, we may not receive due attention as newcomers and fail to secure a quota. It would be better to target the cultivators from Purple Sun Sect and directly replace him with the external incarnation. I don't care about your plan, Shang Wen Yulin interrupted, first lend me your cultivation. Lend my cultivation again? You just borrowed it not too long ago, it will consume your vitality. Fire flashed in Shang Wen Yulin's eyes, I am going to kill. I will handle it. There's no need to dirty your hands on these low-life scoundrels who prey on our neighbors. I can take care of them all by myself. Shang Wen Yulin still shook her head and gritted her teeth, anyone who dares harm my people, I will personally deal with them. Besides, didn't you mention earlier that you want to improve your strength by refining your own magic treasure? There's no need to refine a magic treasure, I will grant you one. After saying this, she grabbed Shu Han's hand without any further discussion. Left with no choice, Shu Han once again channeled his magic power into her. Instantly, the murderous Shang Wen Yulin returned, her demeanor as imposing as when Xu Han first encountered her in the mines. Let's go. She grabbed Xu Han's hand, following the direction pointed out by the village chief, tracking the trail of the cart. Before long, they arrived at a mountain stronghold with a burning bonfire. First, we need to capture one alive and find out where the children are being held. Xu Han nodded, transforming into a shadowy figure and swiftly traversing the forest. He quickly enveloped a sentry, bringing him to Shang Wen Yulin. The man, only seeing darkness before his eyes, suddenly found himself high above the ground, immediately trembling with fear. Shang Wen Yulin coldly glanced at the man, asking, Where are the children taken from Jiang village being kept? The man looked at the stunningly beautiful Shang Wen Yulin, subdued by her captivating eyes, and dumbly responded, They are locked in the cellar. The boss plans to sell them tomorrow to recoup the loss of the Snow Lotus. Where is this cellar? The man dumbly pointed in a direction. Instantly, Shang Wen Yulin pointed at the man's forehead. He was launched like a cannonball, causing a massive explosion within the stronghold. In an instant, the over 900 members of the Whirlwind Gang came out, weapons in hand, searching for the intruders. At this time, a man emerged from the main stronghold, surrounded by a crowd. He stood proudly, clad in a purple robe. Xu Han recognized him as a cultivator at the 11th layer of Qi refining. Lin Lin, leave that man to me. Shang Wen Yulin nodded, and at that moment, a brilliant golden thin sword emerged from her golden core. As soon as the sword appeared, Xu Han immediately felt the surrounding air being sliced apart, the sword light purging with a blinding sharpness. It was as though a small sun had ignited above the whirlwind stronghold. Wielding her long sword, Shang Wen Yulin gathered all the dispersed sword light behind her, forming two large wings made of sword feathers. Countless sword rays flickered behind her, shining brilliantly. This is the eight direction evil breaking sword a top magic treasure of the late foundation establishment stage. It was the magic treasure I used most frequently during my foundation establishment period. Watch closely, Xu Han. I only have enough magic power for one strike. 71. Xuzaimo. As the magic power gathered, the four pairs of golden wings behind Shang Wen Yulin became increasingly larger, covering the sky with their grandeur. The people of the whirlwind stronghold and the purple-robed cultivator below were all shivering with fear. Many people, witnessing the eight-winged sword, couldn't help but kneel down. The purple-robed cultivator was the first to react, desperately trying to escape from the whirlwind stronghold. However, before he could fly out of the stronghold, 
A black hand grabbed him, instantly stripping him of his defensive magic tool. A golden sword mark appeared between Shang Yulin's eyebrows. She rose into the sky with her sword, the four pairs of wings slowly folding in and spinning with her. With a sudden closure, the wings stretched out to both sides. With a resolute look in her eyes, she shouted, evil breaking in hand, justice spans the land, whoosh. The eight direction evil breaking sword was thrown from her hand like a streak of golden lightning slashing down, boom. The eight direction evil breaking sword struck the center of the whirlwind stronghold, a strong wave of golden light tripping open a massive rift in the earth. Everyone in the stronghold was sent flying into the sky by the golden wave. Yet, it wasn't over. The four pairs of wings behind Shang Yulin followed closely, their golden blades raining down on the stronghold like a storm, turning anyone caught in the golden rain into golden ashes. From his high vantage point, Xu Han looked down at the cracked mountain and the golden dust pervading the stronghold, drawing a sharp breath. The magic treasure of the late Foundation establishment stage was so terrifying. The first round was a powerful focused strike from the eight direction evil breaking sword, followed by the devastating rain of swords. Shang Wen Yulin had used this move against mere mortals, partly to demonstrate to Shu Han, and partly because she was truly angered. This move directly wiped out all the people in the whirlwind stronghold. Luckily, the purple-robed cultivator had been held in Shu Han's dark hand, sparing him from the disaster. Seeing such a terrifying offensive, he was scared into fainting. Shang Wen Yulin beckoned, and the Eight Direction Evil Breaking Sword returned from the ground to her hand. At this point, she was trembling, nearly collapsing in midair. Shu Han quickly moved forward to support her. Too much magic power was used. Shang Wen Yulin, panting, wiped away the mark of the Eight Direction Evil Breaking Sword, turning it into a masterless object. She placed it in Shu Han's hand and said, this sword has accompanied me through the long foundation establishment stage. Now I give it to you. You must make good use of it. Xu Han hesitated. Lin Lin, this. Shang Wen Yulin laughed. With my current cultivation, I no longer need this sword. Hurry up and accept it. Don't force me to get angry. With that, she bit one of Xu Han's fingers and then pointed it at the eight direction evil breaking sword. The eight direction evil breaking sword absorbed Xu Han's blood immediately connecting with his spirit. They became one. This. A trace of blood stained Shang Wen Yulin's lips as she smiled triumphantly at Xu Han. You stay here and interrogate that cultivator from the Purple Sun sect. I'll go and rescue the children trapped in the cellar. I'll go. You're too tired. Shang Wen Yulin shook her head. They all know you, but they haven't seen me in this form. With that, she broke free from Xu Han's hand and flew into the whirlwind stronghold. Watching Shang Wen Yulin's departing figure, Xu Han could only shake his head helplessly. Next, he put away the eight direction evil breaking sword and brought the unconscious purple robed cultivator in front of him with the black claw. Xu Han released a chill of millennia old profound ice from his finger, instantly awakening the man. Seeing Xu Han, he immediately knelt down in midair. Thank you, senior for saving me. I'm forever grateful. Xu Han smiled, you are a cultivator from Purple Sun Sect? The man replied, I am a cultivator of Purple Sun Sect, named Xuzaimo, and my master is the mid-stage foundation establishment cultivator Cheng Yuan. I wonder who that lady was just now? Why did she attack the whirlwind stronghold? Could senior inform me, so I can apologize when she returns? Xu Han asked, first, answer my question. Xuzaimo, as a member of the Purple Sun sect, why are you controlling the gangs here? Xuzaimo replied, replying to Senior, I was dispatched by my sect to collect snow lotus from the snow mountain for pill refining. After a while, I realized that even mortals could do this work. Instead of wasting my cultivation time, it was better to hand over this hard labor to the mortals. Xu Han nodded, you're clever, controlling the gangs to make the mortals here work for you. Xuzaimo chuckled, it's just a little trick, not worth mentioning. How old are you this year? When did you reach the 11th level of chi refining? What's your position in the sect? Who are you friends with, and who are your enemies? What supernatural abilities and spells do you master? Come. 
Tell me everything, no detail is too small. A. Eh? Why is Senior asking these questions? Xu Han's tone turned cold. When I ask, you answer. What gives you the right to question me? Xuzima was immediately startled and quickly began to answer Xu Han's questions one by one. Noticing that Xu Han was interested in his life, Xuzima thought that the senior wanted to befriend him. So, he spoke enthusiastically about his life, recounting both big and small events to Xu Han in detail. Xu Han followed along, making up a bit of his own stories, guiding Xuzima's conversation. The two seemed like friends with no secrets, chatting about everything under the sun. Listening to this conversation, Xu Han couldn't help but laugh. He thought it was a miracle that someone as naive as Xuzimo could survive in the deceptive world of cultivation. Taking a sip of tea, Xuzimo said, So, I temporarily left the blessed land of Purple Sun sect to experience the vast mortal world. Fortunately, I found these mortals to help, so my cultivation didn't fall behind. Ah, hearing about all the wonders in the cultivation world. I really hope to make a fortune one day and return to the Purple Sun sect in glory, to slap those who looked down on me. Xu Han couldn't help but laugh. Then, he calmly said, collecting snow lotus is a task that, if you did it yourself, would just be a bit time consuming, with no danger to your life. But those mortals, carrying the chill of snow lotus, climbing the cliffs, can easily fall to their deaths if they're not careful. I wonder how many mortals have lost their lives for your leisure. Xuzimo was taken aback. What does it matter if mortals die? What does it have to do with cultivators like you and me? Xu Han nodded approvingly. That's right. If I didn't know these mortals, I might ignore what you're doing. But unfortunately, these mortals have saved me and taken me in. So I have to consider things from their perspective. From their perspective, you're the culprit who killed their husbands fathers, sons. Hearing this, Xuzima became agitated and retorted, Senior. You, where are you getting this from? I've basically been sitting in this stronghold meditating and drinking tea. It's not my fault. Whoosh. A chill erupted from Xu Han's chest, instantly freezing Xuzimo into an ice sculpture. Jiang village was unfortunate to encounter you, and you were unfortunate to encounter me. Be smarter in your next life. 72 cultivating an external incarnation, the sun set in the west, and the dispirited villagers of Jiang village suddenly saw a group of people coming from the east. Under the setting sun, Shang Wen Yulin's small figure cast a long shadow. Behind her was a group of children, slowly moving towards Jiang village. At this moment, Shang Wen Yulin was indeed the child king of Jiang village. All the children followed quietly behind her, without crying or making noise. The villagers were overjoyed and cried when they saw the children miraculously return. They rushed to find their own children in the group. Madame Song was weeping as she held her child and Shang Wen Yulin, unwilling to let go. The village was instantly filled with cries of joy as the villagers wept for happiness. The village elder looked at this scene with tears streaming down his face. Although he didn't understand what had happened, the return of the children meant that Jiang village had hope for the future. After a while, Xu Han brought a cart filled with frozen bodies into Jiang village. Xu Han explained to the village elder that they had encountered a fairy on their way who had heard their cry for help. The fairy had helped them eradicate the whirlwind gang, save the children, and found the bodies of the missing villagers in the snow mountain. Although the story was strange, all the children told the same story. They all said a beautiful fairy sister had come to the cellar to save them. The villagers believed the story since all the children said the same thing, no matter how bizarre it sounded. Moreover, with the eradication of the troublesome whirlwind gang, a massive burden was lifted off the villagers' minds. This caused the once troubled Jiang village to instantly become cheerful. Shang Wen Yulin stood next to Xu Han watching as each family joyously took their children back home. She said, the happiness of mortals is so simple, because their hardships come easily. Their happiness also comes simply. A small cultivator at the 11th level of qi refining can disturb the peace of thousands of households, Xu Han replied. Shang Wen Yulin looked at the burned ruins and asked, what should we do about these burned houses? Should we use magic power to help rebuild them? Xu Han patted his chest and laughed. Why use magic power for such a small matter? As a well-known young man in the area, I'll help them rebuild. Based on our schedule, 
we will still live in Jiang village for more than half a year, Shang Wenyulin gave a sweet smile, then you better work quickly, this time I want to sleep in a big bed. Dot. So, a new phase of cultivation began for Xu Han in Jiang village. One of his avatars started replicating thousand year snow lotus with the black jar, mass producing clear bright spiritual eye elixir, while another avatar found a cave on Willow Mountain took out the body of the old man in grey from the storage bag, and started creating an external incarnation, following the form of Xuzaimo and combining various materials. Meanwhile, the main body stayed by Shang Wenyulin's side, protecting her, and with her assistance, continued to digest the fragments of the golden core. The external incarnation technique was very extraordinary. During the cultivation process, Xu Han felt his mental power growing rapidly. This was different from his avatar technique, where both avatars were operating on the main body's mental power, whereas the external incarnation technique first doubled the mental power before transferring it to the incarnation. Once the incarnation was successfully cultivated, it was as if Xu Han had an extra life. On the other hand, the clear bright spiritual eye elixir showed its magical effects when the thousand year snow lotus was added. Upon the first use, Xu Han felt as if his eyes had been reborn, with a faint divine light emerging, and his spiritual consciousness also benefited from the elixir. After using it continuously for 99 days, not only could his eyes see through illusions, but they could also see through objects. He thought to himself, no wonder he couldn't hide his true face from Chen Yu with the mask, the clear bright spiritual eye was so miraculous even at the minor achievement stage. However, when his eyes looked at Shang Wenyulin, he received a hard slap. These days, Shang Wenyulin had also been using the elixir to cultivate clear bright spiritual eye and had reached the same level. If you use these thieving eyes to look at other women, be careful, I might gouge them out. Xu Han. However, Shang Wenyulin still highly praised this eye technique, stating that it could be on par with the insight of a magic treasure at the nascent soul stage if further refined. However, after reaching the minor achievement stage of clear bright spiritual eye, the effect of the thousand year snow lotus was not as potent, and continued use did not bring about the rapid progress as at the beginning. With the two avatars handling all tasks, Xu Han's main body during this period, aside from helping villagers build houses and plow fields, wholeheartedly devoted himself to his cultivation. With the help of Shang Wenyulin, his cultivation level approached the initial peak of the foundation establishment stage in less than half a year. His body, under the tempering of the 10,000 years of profound ice, became increasingly robust and sturdy. Although far from reaching the state of heavenly cold body, it exceeded cultivators of the same or even higher stages. Life in Jiang village was tranquil and peaceful. Time flew, and half a year passed in the blink of an eye. One day, Xu Han was teaching Shang Wenyuelin how to fish by the river bank. His fishing hook hit the mark frequently, and he often hooked a big fish. However, Shang Wenyuelin's side was deserted, only catching a small fish in half a day. This made Shang Wenyulin's little face turn red. I don't understand why we are not cultivating during the day and instead doing this. Xu Han laughed and said, I've reached a minor bottleneck now, with your golden core fragments in my body. I have plenty of spiritual energy, but I still haven't broken through. I think I need to free my mind. Over focusing on cultivation may backfire. Pointing at the fishing rod, Shang Wenyulin said, is that an excuse for your lack of talent? Even with my golden core's assistance, you can't break through the bottleneck of the initial peak of the foundation establishment stage. How will you survive in the cultivation world in the future? Whoosh. As they spoke, Xu Han hooked another big fish. This made Shang Wen Yulin grit her teeth in annoyance. She said angrily, if you want to eat fish, just say so. Then she slapped her palm on the water, causing high splashes, and a bunch of fish floated up with their bellies upturned. Xu Han, I was baiting the hook, and you're just blasting them. Over the past half year, under Xu Han's nurturing with spirit stones and elixirs, Shang Wen Yulin finally managed to restore her cultivation to the Qi refining stage. Seeing her annoyed, Xu Han could only give a wry smile, walked over and personally instructed her on fishing techniques. Xu Han moved closer to Shang Wenyuelin and said, 
Lin Lin, my cultivation level is not as high as yours, but I believe that cultivation is like fishing. It requires a balance of tension and relaxation, enough patience, and only then can you see the moon when the clouds clear. Shang Wenryulin snorted disdainfully, Humphrey, a foundation establishment stage kid teaching me cultivation. Suddenly, the fishing rod in Shang Wenryulin's tight grip vibrated. She immediately became excited and said with a flushed face, I've got a bite. I've got one. It's a big fish. As she was about to quickly reel in the line, Xu Han held her back, saying, don't rush. Keep your patience and tire it out. Use a combination of loosening and tightening, fight against it, wear out its strength, and reel it in when it's tired. In the end, Shang Wenryulin reeled in the line, pulling a big fish that weighed more than 10 pounds onto the shore. She joyously hugged the struggling big fish and proudly said, Shu Han, look, this one is bigger than yours. However, at this moment, Shu Han was completely lost in his thoughts. Shu Han? What's wrong with you? After a long time, Xu Han came back to his senses, looking somewhat perplexed, and said to Shang Wenryulin, I've suddenly broken through to the initial peak of the foundation establishment stage, and I've also completed my external incarnation. 73. Purple Sun Sect. Riding on the Heavenly Quadrant Sword Formation, Xu Han was heading south alone, crossing over mountains, rivers, and vast plains, Xu Han finally saw a range of mountains exuding a spiritual purple aura. From afar, countless black spots were rising and falling amongst these mountains. These were all cultivators riding the wind. At first glance, there were at least several hundred cultivators moving in and out of the mountain range enveloped by purple aura. After a five day journey with the cultivation level of the twelfth level of Qi refining, he finally arrived at a major sect north of the Great Cloud, the Purple Sun Sect. According to Xu Han's investigation, the head of the Purple Sun Sect is at the peak of the late core formation stage. There are thousands of disciples in the Qi refining and foundation establishment stages, and there are also several elders in the core formation stage. It is indeed one of the six major sects in the north of the Great Cloud. The Immaculate Realm, which will open in half a year, is jointly initiated by these six major sects. Chu Han, bearing the face of Xuzaimo, recalled Xuzaimo's life while riding his sword towards the Purple Sun Sect. For the external incarnation, he had used the Purple Sun Sect's inheritance method, Purple Cloud Ascending Art, when refining the external incarnation. He used this method as a foundation. After the external incarnation was completed, this method naturally reached the peak of Qi refining. This incomplete method was obtained from Xu Zimo's storage bag. It only recorded the cultivation methods of the Qi refining stage and had the high level spells removed. Xu Han realized that in this cultivation world, methods are easy to obtain, but spells are hard to find. In terms of power, this method was far inferior to the Dragon Mystical Triple Rotation Divine Art. However, Xu Han dared not use this method for his external incarnation. Firstly, he was afraid that the people of Purple Sun Sect would find something amiss. Secondly, he was afraid that this method would directly burst his external incarnation. After all, the cultivation of the external incarnation cannot grow. Approaching the Purple Sun Sect, Xu Han put away his heavenly quadrant sword formation and switched to Xu Zimo's usual high-grade magic tool the black gold folding dragon Saba. To Xu Han's professional eye, this Saba was absolute garbage. Even if without the dragon mystical triple rotation divine art and numerous top tier magic tools for protection, Xu Han's incarnation was not weak in combat power. It was basically not flustered when encountering an ordinary foundation establishment stage cultivator. The reason was the 12 bottles of 7 poison water he had refined and stored in his storage bag, along with 200 fire god talismans, and the flame sun talisman he had begged from Shang Wenyuolin. His combat power was lower than when Xu Han first arrived at Great Cloud, but his spiritual sense now was genuinely at the peak of the foundation establishment stage, far surpassing his perception and sensory abilities during his qi refining days. Just as he was about to enter the Purple Sun Sect, a man in purple with thick eyebrows approached him with a smile, starting a conversation. My name is Rentani, a cultivator of the 11th level of Qi refining. May I ask if you are also returning from an external assignment? 
Xu Han looked at Rent Danny Yi, feeling something strange with his newly trained clear bright spiritual eye, but he could not see anything specific due to his insufficient cultivation. He cautiously replied, My name is Xuzaimo, are you also returning from an external assignment? Rentani laughed, That's right. I received a mission from the sect three years ago to collect sunflower water lotus leaves in the blue wave pool. I have now completed the mission and am preparing to return to the purple sun sect. I noticed that you are also alone. Why don't we join each other? Joining each other? During his conversation with Xuzaimo, he had never mentioned Rentani presumably, they did not know each other, someone he did not know came up to strike up a conversation, then, Xu Han thought that he was new here and unfamiliar with everything, if he followed behind him, he might be able to learn more about the rules and details of the purple sun sect, that sounds good, after you, junior brother, so, Xu Han and this suddenly appeared Rentani flew toward the purple sun sect together, from what he remembered, Xuzaimo had once said that returning disciples from outside assignments needed to first check the completion of their tasks at the Destiny Pavilion. Those who had not completed their task quota were not allowed to return to the sect. Just as Shu Han was wondering which building outside the mountain was the Destiny Pavilion, Rentani swaggered towards the sect gate. Shu Han hurriedly stopped him, surprised. Junior brother, don't you need to submit the task materials at the Destiny Pavilion? If you enter like this, I'm afraid you will be stopped by the law enforcement disciples. Ah? Rentani immediately laughed. Ha ha, I've been in the mortal world for so long that I forgot the rules of our sect. Thanks for the reminder, senior brother. Seeing Rentani's behavior, Shu Han couldn't help but suspect something was off about him. Unfortunately, his external incarnation was not his true body, and his clear bright spiritual eye was just beginning to develop, so he could not see Rentani's ulterior motive. However, Shu Han didn't want to meddle. His main goal was to compete for the qualification to go to the Immaculate Realm. Who Rentani was and what he wanted to do was none of his business. So Shuhan looked at the crowd and saw a pavilion with the most people coming and going. He focused his gaze and sure enough, he saw the three characters of Destiny Pavilion. He then led Rentani towards the pavilion. The pavilion was bustling with people, like a checkpoint checking disciples entering and leaving the purple sun sect. Shu Han and Rentani arrived at a checkpoint. The disciple at the checkpoint, who was at the twelfth level of Qi refining, sat bored and said, returning from an outside assignment, hand over your mission token and materials. Rentani took out his mission token and 300 sunflower water lotus leaves and handed them to the disciple. The disciple took the token, glanced at it, and read, 300 sunflower water lotus leaves, but you've only handed in 250, the amount is not enough, mission uncompleted, not allowed to return to the sect. What? Rentani was stunned, senior brother, please look carefully, these are indeed 300. The disciple glanced at Rentani impatiently, is this your first day? With that, he waved his hand, and 70 sunflower water lotus leaves directly went into his storage bag, he said, now there are only 230, hurry up and get out, damn, Shu Han couldn't help but curse inwardly, this was outright extortion, Rentani was trembling with anger, slamming his fist on the table, say that again, it was clearly you who swallowed my 70 lotus leaves and now you're falsely accusing me, the man snorted coldly, Humphrey, immediately, he stood up and shouted, someone come, there's a demonic cultivator trying to infiltrate our purple sun sect, quickly, someone gets him, before he could finish his words, he was stopped by Shu Han, who quietly handed him a small bottle of chi gathering pills, senior brother, my junior brother here doesn't understand the rules, please accept this token of our appreciation, there's no need to make a big fuss, we're all brothers of the same sect. The man looked at the chi gathering pills in his hand. His anger subsided, laughed, it's okay, it's okay. It's you, junior brother, who understands the rules, are truly from our purple sun sect. As for this guy, you have to manage him better in the future, or it won't be so easy to talk next time. Understood, understood. Shuhan pulled Rentani over, handed in his token and snow lotus. Here are my materials, senior brother, please count. However, the man didn't even look at them, 
handed over two purple tokens directly, and played with the chi gathering pills, enough, no need to look, junior brother, you've returned from an external assignment, you might not know, recently, there have been quite a few demonic cultivators trying to infiltrate our sect, in the future, when you move around within the sect, you must carry this token, otherwise, if you are caught by the law enforcement team, it won't be easy to handle, Shu Han saluted, thank you for the reminder, senior brother, then, he led Rentanii out of the destiny pavilion and into the purple sun sect, Rentanii was still fuming, letting such a petty man get away with it, purple sun sect is even worse than the demon cultivators, Shu Han sighed, ah, just bear with it for a while, one has to bow their head under someone else's roof, 74. The down and out master, Rentani saluted Shu Han, senior brother, I am sorry for the trouble today, I will compensate you in the future, I will also need your help when walking around the sect in the future, it's a trivial matter, junior brother, there's no need to mention it, however, Shu Han changed the subject, that man mentioned earlier about demonic cultivators infiltrating, do you know what these demonic cultivators want from our purple sun sect? Rentani laughed. The only thing that could attract demonic cultivators to the purple sun sect is the quota for the Immaculate Realm. Every time the Immaculate Realm is opened, there will be incidents of demonic cultivators infiltrating the sect. Shuhan explained, I see, I had not joined purple sun sect the last time the Immaculate Realm was opened, so I was quite ignorant. Rentani laughed heartily and said, no problem at all, brother Xu, first of all, upon returning to the sect, you have to pay respects to your master, I'll invite you for a drink another day, goodbye, goodbye, with that, Rentani flew towards the purple sun peak, watching Rentani leave, Shu Han thought to himself that he should also go to meet his master according to the rules, according to Xu Zimo's description, his master is a foundation establishment mid-stage cultivator, with a cave dwelling on the purple abyss peak. According to Xuzimo, foundation establishment cultivators in the purple sun sect generally have dozens of chi refining disciples, and Xuzimo was considered an upper middle class disciple under his master, Cheng Yuan, who had some impression of him. This is the downside of joining a sect at the foundation establishment stage, as it requires time to mentor chi refining disciples and is not as carefree as being an independent cultivator, however, joining a sect means a stable supply of spiritual energy and reliable backup support, so there are many benefits. Xu Han carefully recalled Xu Zimo's words, putting himself in Xu Zimo's shoes, hoping not to reveal his identity in front of this unfamiliar master. Not familiar with the roots, Xu Han wandered around in the purple sun sect for quite a while before he found purple abyss peak. After wandering around the purple sun sect, Xu Han realized that even the worst corner of the purple sun sect had ten times better spiritual energy than the outside world. The closer to Purple Sun Peak, the richer the spiritual energy. According to Xuzimo, being assigned an external mission was basically the same as being exiled to the frontier. After all, the concentration of spiritual energy is critical to cultivators. Upon reaching Purple Abyss Peak, the spiritual power was much worse. Xu Han found Cheng Yuan's cave dwelling and shouted outside, Disciple Xuzimo, returning from an external mission is here to pay respects to my master, Xuzimo, a surprised voice came from inside the cave, followed by, come in, Xu Han walked into the cave, with his clear bright spiritual eye scanning the room, he noticed that the cave was protected by a few simple formations, they only seemed effective against chi refining disciples, they would be far from enough against a foundation establishment cultivator, it seems that his master is having a tough time, upon entering the cave, Xu Han saw a middle-aged man with a pale face sitting in the center of the modestly furnished dwelling. Cheng Yuan opened his eyes and looked at Xu Han. Didn't you only leave two years ago? How come you're back so soon? A, hey, Qi refining 12th level, weren't you just breaking through to the 11th level when you left? How did an external mission increase your cultivation? Xu Han explained, I was ordered to pick snow lotuses. By chance. I came across a thousand year old snow lotus, I absorbed a bit of its spiritual energy, and luckily, I broke through, <laughs> indeed, there's a rich chill of snow lotus on you, a thousand year old snow lotus, tut, tut, 
it seems you got quite lucky on this mission. Master is joking, it was purely a fluke. Just as Cheng Yuan was about to say something, a hearty laugh suddenly came from outside the cave. Ha ha ha, old Cheng. Guess what? My useless disciple has actually reached the 48th place on the heaven list today. As he spoke, another bald man walked in from outside the cave. Behind the man was a young man with pride flashing in his eyes. Cheng Yuan looked at the bald man. His face turned gloomy, so what if it's the 48th place? Why are you making such a fuss in my cave? The bald man pulled the young man forward, boasting, he he, isn't it just to share our joy with you? With the opening of the Immaculate Realm imminent, four of my disciples have already made it into the top 50 of the heaven list. Once they come out of the Immaculate Realm, all four of them might be promoted to the Foundation Establishment stage. At that time, if the sect leader is happy, he might reward me with a breaking calamity pill. Ah, by then, I could smoothly break through the mid-stage barrier and advance to the late stage. Oh, by the way, how many of your disciples have made it to the heaven list? Old Cheng, isn't your eldest disciple still hovering around the 52nd place? Cheng Yuan said gloomily, well, congratulations to you. You should go now, I need to meditate. The bald man laughed. What are you meditating for? Is there any room for you to improve your cultivation? You should take care of your disciples. If they're weak, they'll bring shame when they go out. Hey, who's this kid? Your disciple. Shu Han greeted, Junior Xuzimo, pleased to meet Uncle Master. Chi refining 12th level. How come I've never heard old Cheng mention you? Cheng Yuan said, How could my disciples catch your eye? The bald man put his arm around Shu Han's shoulder and said, Tell Uncle Master, what's your rank on the heaven list? Ah, uh, it's beyond a hundred, not worth mentioning. The bald man sighed, Ah, what a pity, you need to be within the top fifty to qualify for the Immaculate Realm. Plus, the next distribution of Foundation Establishment pills is forty years later. Ah, you young ones should strive more for your master, look at him. His face has turned blue from your lack of achievement. Shu Han thought to himself, my master looks blue, more likely because of your provocation. So, only those within the top 50 can enter the Immaculate Realm? That's important news. It seems I need to find a way to improve my ranking on the heaven list. Unable to bear it any longer, Cheng Yuan finally erupted, enough, old Liu. Do you have to come over every day to show off? Will you die if you don't show off for a day? Go, Zymo, see your uncle master out. Hey, hey. The bald man, still holding on to Shu Han, laughed, all right. He's really angry now. Old bro, if I have a bite to eat, so do you. How about this? Your disciple just reached the twelfth level of Chi refining, and he's probably unfamiliar with this realm. Let my foolish disciple spar with him this could increase his combat experience. Who knows, he might even make a good ranking on the heaven list in the future. Cheng Yuan thought for a moment, then nodded and said, that's fine, but he's just promoted, be careful. The bald man patted Shu Han on the shoulder and reassured him, no worries, listen to your uncle master, feel free to fight hard, my disciple can take it, and he won't hurt you out of respect for your master. Shu Han fight hard, are you sure? Shu Han laughed and replied, Uncle Master, if by some chance I defeat this senior brother, then his place on the heaven list will be mine, right? The bald man was taken aback, that would be quite a coincidence, wouldn't it? You really dare to dream. At this moment, the young man stepped forward and disdainfully said, Master, I can agree to his proposal, if you win. Naturally, the spot is yours. But let's see if you have the ability to match your big words. 75. Purple Cloud Skyfall Divine Art. Cheng Yuan and Liu Wancheng stood outside the cave, watching the two confronting each other. Liu Wancheng slapped his bald head, took out a bag of purple jade sunflower seeds from his storage bag, and shared some with Cheng Yuan. They then started cracking them with interest. The young man showed his magic tool from his storage bag. It was a blue segmented whip. He looked at Shu Han with disdain and greeted, Why Ziming, Qi refining 12th level cultivator, magic tool blue jade bamboo whip, please guide me. Shu Han then showed his black gold folding dragon saber, and replied, Xuzimo, 
Chi Refining 12th Level Cultivator, Magic Tool Black Gold Folding Dragon Sabba, please guide me. Cheng Yuan, who was watching the fight, glared angrily at Liu Wansheng, damn old Liu. You're not following the martial ethics, that boy's bamboo whip is a top quality magic tool. Liu Wansheng, stroking his bald head, said, stop talking nonsense. Any cultivator who can make it to the purple sun heaven list as a top quality magic tool. I see you have two top quality magic tools in your pocket, why don't you give them to your disciple? Cheng Yuan snorted. Apart from my life bound magic treasure, I only have these two top quality magic tools. What will I do if I give them to him? What do you need top quality magic tools for when you never leave your house? Your old stingy nature hasn't changed. If your disciple performs well, the sect will naturally reward you. While the two were chatting, Xu Han and Wei Ziming were already in a heated battle, causing dust to fly around and rocks to crack on Purple Abyss Peak. Every now and then, a stone would fly over and be immediately blocked by the protective shields of the two chattering men. Looking at Wei Ziming's overwhelming whip technique, Liu Wansheng sighed. My disciple, his whip technique can make it into the top three in the Purple Sun sect. It's continuous and steady, leaving no loopholes. Look at your disciple, he's already being beaten back step by step. He's going to lose soon. Cheng Yuan said with disdain, top three in purple sun sect, old Liu. You really like to boast, there might not be three people using a whip in the purple sun sect. You think my disciple is about to lose, but I don't think so. Although your disciple's attack is fierce, Zymo not only has enough defense but is also looking for an opportunity to counter-attack. Winning won't be so easy. Right, this kid's footwork is strangely fast. Is it the Cloud Sky Step from our Purple Sun Sect? Chen Yuan shook his head, no, the Cloud Sky Step doesn't have the ability to maneuver in such a narrow space. This footwork seems to rely more on physical condition. Liu Wansheng asked in surprise. Didn't you secretly teach him this? Cheng Yuan was speechless, I would have to fucking know it first. Also, his teleportation speed has surpassed that of a regular Qi refining cultivator, almost comparable to a beginner foundation establishment cultivator. Liu Wansheng slapped his bald head, I got it. There's something odd about that kid's shoes. Damn it, it's a top quality magic tool. Old Cheng, you're tricking me. When did you give your disciple such a treasure? Cheng Yuan was taken aback, I would need to fucking have one first. Xu Han's evasiveness had evidently exceeded Wei Ziming's expectations. His continuous whip swings almost tore down the mountains and rocks. Yet he still couldn't land a substantial attack on Xu Han. To Wei Ziming, it seemed as if Xu Han had eyes all over his body, predicting his every move. Is this the feeling of fighting a chi refining cultivator? The angrier Wei Ziming became, the more his anger built up. Unable to suppress it, he thrust his whip into the ground, popped a pill, clasped his hands in front of his chest, and his body started to emit a purple aura. He shouted angrily, Let's see how you dodge this. Liu Wansheng said triumphantly, Oh, he's desperate now, using the purple cloud skyfall divine art. Old Cheng. This is the end. Cheng Yuan's face was getting greener. This kid can use the purple cloud skyfall divine art. He can barely use it with the help of the assess extracting pill, but he will be weak for a month afterward. Should I stop the fight now? This is hurting the harmony between our two houses. If your disciple gets seriously injured, I can't explain it. However, Cheng Yuan waved his hand. No. This kid has changed a lot since he came back from his trip. I want to see how much he has grown. Let them continue fighting. With you and me here, nothing will go wrong. Liu Wansheng said, you're right. Wait, why is this kid also clasping his hands together? Is he also going to use? Damn. He's using the purple cloud skyfall divine art too. Two powerful auras rose on Purple Abyss Peak. Wei Ziming was shocked to see Xu Han also gathering spiritual power and using the same technique. Are you kidding? And Qi Refining Cultivator wants to perform this divine technique without the aid of a pill? Impossible. He must be bluffing. Purple Cloud Skyfall. Suppress him for me. Wei Ziming pressed down with both palms and in a boom, the illusory purple cloud gathered into the illusion of a small palace descending above Shuhan's head. In an instant, 
a tremendous pressure came down, and Xu Han felt indeed suppressed by this spell. The pressure is tolerable, but the destructive power is lacking. Xu Han thought if he could use the triple rotation protective shield, this guy's spell would be like a breeze. So, he lifted his hands, and the purple cloud above his head also began to take shape. A palace more solid than Wise Iming's rose from the ground. The purple palace gradually turned blue, like the cold moon palace described in books, and directly broke through Wise Iming's palace. Forced back by Xu Han's technique, Wei Ziming had to retreat three steps. However, Xu Han's cold moon palace immediately suppressed him, the cold air pouring down from above his head, making him shudder uncontrollably. Liu Wancheng shouted, What kind of technique is this? Since when does the purple cloud skyfall divine art have this form? Old Cheng Yu. Cheng Yuan was also stunned. Don't ask me if I taught this, same as before, I don't know how to do this either. What's going on then? There's a bone chilling cold. Thousand year snow lotus. Cheng Yuan suddenly realized. My disciple absorbed the essence of the thousand year snow lotus while outside and was thus able to break through. This transformation of the purple cloud skyfall divine art must be related to the chill of the thousand year snow lotus. Liu Wanchen touched his bald head. Your disciple actually had such an encounter. And you said you weren't trying to trick me. Forget it. We concede, no more fighting. Cheng Yuan laughed heartily, shouting triumphantly, Zymo, hold back. Xu Han withdrew his technique on command. Cheng Yuan's previously green face immediately beamed with vitality. He patted Liu Wancheng's shoulder and laughed. Oops, oops, old Liu. How can you say I tricked you? You came here on your own to show off. After all these years, you've been provoking me every day. This is karma. Liu Wancheng pulled a long face, and shook off Cheng Yuan's hand, enough, look at you, gloating, disgusting. Xu Han said from the side, Uncle Master, about the ranking. Upon hearing this, Liu Wancheng's face lengthened even more. He glanced at Xu Han, and glared at Cheng Yuan, old Cheng, are you serious? With his level, he should challenge others directly. Why is he coveting my disciple's rank? It was hard earned. Didn't you agree to it? Liu Wancheng took a deep breath, put on a smile, and draped his arm around Xu Han. Good nephew. Your uncle master wants to discuss something with you. 76. 300 solutions to refining tools. Looking at Liu Wancheng's smile as he approached, Xu Han resisted the urge to roll his eyes and said, Uncle master, what can I do for you? Liu Wancheng stroked his bald head and advised. Nephew, this was a private competition, not conducted on the Purple Sun platform, so strictly speaking, it doesn't count. You see, your master and I are from the same sect. We're basically family. And families should not keep things from each other, so let's forget about the ranking. Wei Ziming came over with a dark face. Master, a bet is a bet. My ranking belongs to him. Liu Wancheng turned his head and glared, kicking him on his butt nearly making him fall face down, don't you know your state? After taking the essence extracting pill, weakened for a month, unable to continue taking it for three months, how are you going to get back on the heaven list in less than half a year? Wei Ziming patted his butt, and complained, if I'm not as good as others, it's okay not to be on the heaven list and not go to the immaculate realm. Enough. Cheng Yuan shouted triumphantly, let it be, I'll decide on this matter. We won't take your disciple's ranking, it indeed harms the harmony. Liu Wanchen quickly gripped his hand, gratefully saying, once a senior brother, always a senior brother. I won't say much, I'll thank you another day. Having said that, he was about to leave, but was held back by Cheng Yuan, not another day, today. All right. Liu Wanchen frowned, and looked at him suspiciously, what did you set your eyes on, tell me. Cheng Yuan laughed. It's not about what I want, but what my disciple wants. We all know that you made a small fortune in the last immaculate realm. Let my disciple see your treasure trove. Liu Wancheng raised his eyebrows. You want him to choose? Yes. Liu Wancheng clapped his hands. Great. As long as it's not you, the old dog, going. Let's go. Nephew. Your uncle master will show you the big treasures. Chu Han. So. Xu Han followed Liu Wancheng to the other side of Purple Abyss Mountain. There was another cave mansion here, which was visibly larger and better protected by rays than Cheng Yuan's. 
When showing his cave mansion to Xu Han, Liu Wancheng boasted with pride, I didn't see you before, so you must have joined that old dog's sect recently. It's a pity, it would be great if you were my disciple. For a disciple like you, I would go as far as selling everything I have to get you a top quality magic tool. Only that old dog would be stingy. Xu Han asked, Master said that most of your current wealth comes from that trip to the Immaculate Realm 20 years ago. Liu Wancheng laughed. Exactly, 20 years ago, just like you, I was a Qi refining 12th layer disciple. Back then, the old dog took the foundation establishment pill first and reached the foundation establishment stage. I missed that batch, so I got on the heaven list and tried my luck in the Immaculate Realm. The Immaculate Realm is a great place, rumored to be the ruins of an ancient immortal sect. Its origin is unknown, but the things inside are absolutely fantastic. Everything it produces is a rare treasure. It's possible that even a stone you randomly pick up could be a precious treasure. Xu Han clicked his tongue, that magical? Don't you dare not believe it. Liu Wanshen pulled out a jade pendant and proudly showed off. This was carved from a stone I picked up in the Immaculate Realm last time, and it actually has the effect of nourishing spiritual consciousness. Its value can match a hundred middle grade spirit stones. Nephew, it's not that your uncle master is playing tricks. The Immaculate Realm matters a lot to cultivators who haven't reached foundation establishment. If my disciple doesn't squeeze into the top 50 this time, he'll have to wait another 20 years for the foundation establishment. The sect always has assessments for us masters. Xu Han asked, can one reach the foundation establishment just by entering the Immaculate Realm? Not exactly. But if you make a certain level of contribution to the sect in the Immaculate Realm, the sect will reward you with a specially made foundation establishment pill. Those with special contributions can even enjoy the sect leader's purple sun baptism. Seeing Xu Han's thoughtful expression, Liu Wancheng said, It looks like you also want to try your luck in the Immaculate Realm. That's a good thing. Your master hasn't cultivated a foundation establishment disciple in years, and if he drags on, the sect may cut his stipend. He's already poor. Xu Han nodded and asked, Uncle Master, have you ever heard of the heavenly creation fluid? Liu Wanqing frowned, why are you asking about this? I heard that the most precious product of the Immaculate Realm is this. Liu Wanqing said, indeed, but the heavenly creation fluid is something contested by the late stage foundation establishment monsters of various sects. I'm not clear about it, and every time there are only one or two drops, it's basically all taken by people from the Kingle sect. As a Qi refining period disciple, you shouldn't think about it, isn't it good to look for opportunities outside? I was just curious, since Liu Wancheng was unclear, Xu Han did not pursue the matter, and instead asked, Uncle Master, are there any dangers in the Immaculate Realm? That's the right question to ask, there are dangers, as I've heard from my predecessors, at first, a group entered the Immaculate Realm and they died, as more people died. They learned from their experiences, the particularly dangerous areas have been marked, so the Immaculate Realm is not as dangerous as before, in theory, but Liu Wanqing patted Xu Han's head and said, there are still dangers, every time, there's a group of brainless people who die inside, and if you go in, you also need to guard against disciples from other sects, after all, in the Immaculate Realm, order is broken, Xu Han nodded, at this moment, he had been led by Liu Wanqing into his treasure cave. There were three yellow pear wood bookshelves standing here, and various trinkets were displayed on the shelves. Choose one from here, there are materials, spells, bills, and magic tools. Then he hummed a tune and went to clean his treasures, leaving Xu Han to make his choice. Xu Han stood in front of the three bookshelves, using his clear bright spiritual eye to examine each treasure line by line. Having scanned most of them, Xu Han had already anticipated that the things here were somewhat precious to those in the Qi refining period, but for someone like him at the peak of the early stage of foundation establishment, they seemed somewhat redundant. Liu Wancheng was cleaning his treasures outside, but his spiritual consciousness was always on Xu Han. At this time, Liu Wancheng couldn't help muttering in his heart. He's looked at so many of my treasures and still hasn't chosen. So hard to serve. A. Eh? He's looking at my purple gold jade ruai. That's the most valuable treasure here. 
with a little modification from an expert, it could be a top-notch magic tool. Kid, don't you dare choose that. Oh, still looking. Have you looked enough? You're not really going to choose this, are you? Put it down. Down. Phew. Luckily you're as blind as a bat. If it were old dog Cheng, he probably would have taken the Rui right away. Huh? He's been looking at a copy of 300 solutions to refining tools for a long time. Is this guy thinking about learning tool refining? He's not focusing on the main path. But if you choose this, that would be great. Although this book was brought out from the Immaculate Realm, I've made hundreds of copies of the content, so whether it's the original doesn't matter. Then Shu Han walked out from inside, holding precisely this book, 300 solutions to refining tools. Will you want Shen slapped his thigh, exclaiming, You actually picked my most precious treasure. Nephew, you're really not ordinary. 77. Another golden page. Xu Han walked out of Liu Wancheng's cave holding the book, 300 solutions to refining tools. Xu Han threw the book into his storage bag, and on the way, he used an invisible technique to tear off a page from it and hid it on his person before returning to Cheng Yuan's cave. At this time, his heart was beating wildly, and it took several deep breaths to calm his excited mood. Upon returning to Master Cheng Yuan's cave, Cheng Yuan patted Xu Han on the shoulder with a smile and praised, Good boy. Finally, a disciple can bring some honor to his master. Come, tell your master about where those treasure boots come from. Xu Han was speechless, wondering why he asked this as soon as he returned. So Xu Han explained that when he was picking snow lotus and encountered the thousand year old snow lotus, he found a frozen corpse, presumably killed by the blizzard summoned by the snow lotus. These top tier boots were taken off from that dead person. I see, so you should have other treasures on you. Tell your master about them. Seeing Xu Han's awkward expression, Cheng Yuan laughed and said, Silly boy, what can you hide from your master? Your master is in the mid stage of foundation establishment. Could he covet your things? Left with no choice, Xu Han had to reveal his heavenly quadrant sword formation. He thought to himself, if he was going to challenge the purple cloud heaven list in the future, relying solely on his black gold folding dragon saber wouldn't be enough. Although the heavenly quadrant sword formation was a top tier among top tier items, it was still lacking in power for a mid-stage foundation establishment cultivator. If Cheng Yu were dared to covet his heavenly quadrant sword formation, then his peaceful days would be over. Wait for the eight direction evil breaking sword attack then. Upon seeing the four heavenly swords, Cheng Yuan's eyes widened in astonishment, exclaiming, A sword array made up of four top tier magic tools, Disciple, you really hit the jackpot this time. Then he burst out laughing, Ha ha, finally a disciple who can fight has emerged from my school. When old Liu finds out you were holding back, he'll be so mad his nose will be crooked. Come on, let your master see what treasures you got from old Liu. Next. The laughing Cheng Yuan saw the book 300 solutions to refining tools and his face turned green. Did old Liu give this to you? Xu Han bumfounded, I picked this myself. Piss. Cheng Yuan took a deep breath, suppressing his urge to lash out, and said, Never mind, you've done well today, I won't scold you. Then he threw a token to Xu Han and said, I see you don't have any defensive magic tool. Take my token to Treasure Peak and have them forge a top grade protective magic tool for you. As for the cost, just deduct it from my offerings for next month. A top grade magic tool. To be deducted from next month's offerings. How poor can you be? Xu Han thanked him. Thank you, Master. I'm not just giving you a top grade magic tool. I give you half a year to break into the top 40 of the Heaven List and secure a spot in the Immaculate Realm. Yes. Master Jiang Village. Xu Han's main body was practicing with Shang Wenyulin in a field of flowers, digesting the remaining fragments of the golden core in his body, hoping to break through the peak bottleneck of the early foundation establishment stage and enter the stage mid of foundation establishment. Suddenly, Xu Han woke up from his meditation, his face beaming with joy. He immediately ordered his two avatars to stop refining pills and return to his main body. Shang Wenyuan woke up too and asked, what happened? Xu Han smiled and said, 
Lin Lin, are you curious about where the clear bright spiritual eye technique and external incarnation technique I taught you came from? Shang Wen Lin said, these techniques are indeed amazing, but if you don't tell me, I won't ask. Xu Han took out the golden page and handed it to Shang Wen Lin, saying, actually, it's nothing. I just happened to get this golden page. You've seen a lot and have a wide range of knowledge. Do you know what this is? Shang Wen Lin picked up the golden paper and examined it carefully, shaking her head and saying, I've never seen anything like this. But the material is quite amazing. It seems indestructible. The clear bright spiritual lie and external incarnation recorded on the golden page has benefited me immensely, and now I've found another golden page. Really? Shang Wen Lin, who was in the golden core stage, also became excited. Xu Han stood up, looked into the distance, and said, the other page is in the purple sun sect. However, this page is different. It requires the clear bright spiritual eye to see through its disguise. However, my external incarnation's clear bright spiritual eye cultivation is not enough. I can barely see through the disguise, but I can't read the text recorded on it. Now we need to go there immediately to assist. Xu Han's avatar, holding Cheng Yuan's token, left purple abyss peak and flew to treasure peak. The most conspicuous part of the Purple Sun sect is the Purple Sun Peak enveloped in purple mist, followed by Treasure Peak shrouded in smoke from refining pills and magic tools. This peak supplies all the elixirs, magic tools, and magic treasures for the entire Purple Sun sect, and every day, countless rare and precious resources are sent into Treasure Peak. With this thought, Xu Han became extremely eager, he was in desperate need of various materials. His stellar wish formation and silent heartbreak formation were still under construction, and now he didn't dare to show his face at the cultivator gathering in the north of Great Cloud, for fear that a cultivator who could glimpse his true appearance would tip off Shang Wen Ryu Otong. Xu Han looked at Treasure Peak, which was full of spiritual aura, and thought it would be nice if he could get some leftover materials for refining tools here. There were people coming and going but most of them flew directly to the foot of the mountain instead of flying to the top of the peak. Xu Han followed the crowd to the foot of Treasure Peak and climbed up the stone steps with a group of people. The foot of Treasure Peak was a large market, and after a tour, Xu Han found that this market was different from the green stone gathering. It did not directly sell finished products, but labor. Basically, disciples in the Qi refining stage were setting up stalls and shouting with signs like pill refining, magic tool refining, and so on. Many disciples chose to have these stalls make their orders instead of going up to the main peak to customize, probably because it was cheaper. Some stalls were overcrowded, while others were deserted, indicating the skill level of the stall owners. Xu Han was not interested in these stalls. Since Cheng Yuan was paying, he definitely wanted to go to the top of the mountain to find a master craftsman to customize. However, before he had taken two steps, he was stopped by a thin, tall man who looked at Xu Han with a smile on his face and exclaimed with delight, Yo, isn't this Zymo? You came back from an external mission and didn't even tell me. Xu Han looked at the man with a puzzled look, thinking, Who are you? Seeing Xu Han's puzzled look, the man raised an eyebrow and said, What's the matter? You're acting like you don't know me. I told you, I'll pay back the spirit stones I borrowed from you. I'm just a bit tight on cash lately. Suddenly, Xu Han remembered that Xu Zaimo seemed to have a friend named Zheng Yang, who was said to be a tool refiner from Treasure Peak. Brother, I have something to do now. My master wants me to order a top grade defensive magic tool. I'll chat with you another day. Xu Han hurriedly tried to leave. Being with Xu Zaimo's old acquaintances might give him away. Wow, you don't find me to order a magic tool. Do you want to break off our friendship? I helped you refine the black gold folding dragon saber at a low price. The water that flows out of the field should not be given to outsiders, you know. Xu Han, damn. This piece of junk was refined by you. Zheng Ying wrapped an arm around Xu Han's neck, smiling, you look distracted. The external mission in the past few years must have been tough. Let's go. I'll take you to drink flower wine and relieve your boredom. What? Xu Han was dragged away by him. I'm here to order a magic tool. The magic tool thing is up to me. It's just a top grade, right? I'll refine it for you with my eyes closed. 
let's drink, we haven't gotten together in a long time. Xu Han was speechless, aren't you setting up a stall? Zheng Yin waved his hand, I haven't had an order recently anyway, treating my brother to a drink is the most important thing. 78. Flower wine at the floating fragrance pavilion. Under the watchful eyes of all present, Xu Han was pulled away by the man's casual, friendly arm draped across his shoulders. The man appeared familiar, and it seemed inappropriate for Xu Han to resist. Thus, he was led away from Treasure Peak. Moreover, Xu Han was intrigued by the alchemical materials at Treasure Peak. He thought this man, likely an alchemical disciple of the peak, might prove useful in acquiring some scraps. You've returned with even stronger cultivation, brother. Truly, fortune favors you. Xu Han responded with an awkward smile, merely a stroke of luck. You are indeed fortunate, and your timing is impeccable. The floating fragrance pavilion has recently recruited a number of young and beautiful female disciples, all fresh and tender. I'm hosting tonight, I insist you have a night of joy. What? Taken aback, Xu Han wondered how he could stumble upon such an occurrence just after arriving at the Purple Sun sect. Zheng Yin, with a sidelong glance at Xu Han, queried, What's wrong? Brother Zaimo, you used to talk endlessly before. Why are you so quiet since your return? And why hesitate to enjoy flower wine? Isn't that one of your favorite pursuits? Xu Han explained. The Immaculate Realm is about to open, I'm considering venturing inside, so I can't stay in the Qi refining stage forever. I'm not interested in these pleasures now, let's discuss tool refining instead. Oh, are you eligible for the Immaculate Realm? When did you become so formidable? Chu Han then shared his tale of the thousand year snow lotus with Zheng Yun. After listening, Zheng Yun smacked his lips, landing a punch on Chu Han, he exclaimed enviously, you really have hit a streak of luck. I insist, tonight you must drink your fill, choose any maiden you wish. Once you've achieved the foundation establishment, you must not forget your brother here. Have you no plans to venture into the Immaculate Realm? Zheng Yin responded, are you mocking my lack of prowess? You're well aware of my abilities. I'm a master in tool refining, but when it comes to combat, well, that's a long story. But I've made peace with my life here in the Purple Sun sect. A few decades from now, I'm sure to receive a portion of the next batch of Foundation Establishment pills. Xu Han retorted, just to meet a master in tool refining. Xu Han queried, by the time you achieve the Foundation Establishment in a few more decades, you'll be well past your prime. That's why I say, we should revel in the vigor of our youth. The joy of life must be fully embraced. Now I see that reaching the foundation establishment or becoming a top tool refiner is difficult. The right path is to live each day to the fullest. Nowadays, when I have nothing to do, I set up a stall and take orders to earn some spiritual stones. With spiritual stones, I go to the floating fragrance pavilion for flower wine. Without spiritual stones, I go to listen to music for free. I live my days in a free and easy manner. Chu Han was speechless. Ever since he entered the cultivation world, he saw everyone striving and racking their brains for resources. Yet, this person was decidedly different. No wonder Xu Zaimo never seemed to rise or fall. Upon their arrival at the floating fragrance pavilion, a unique fragrance wafted toward Xu Han from a distance. Melodies and laughter resonated from the grand building, interspersed with bell like laughter. As expected of a regular, Zheng Yin was immediately escorted to a private room upon entering. He lay leisurely on the lounge, savoring the spiritual fruits served while appreciating the dancers in the middle of the pavilion. Their fluttering skirts occasionally revealed skin as white as creamy jade, along with the sensual music. It stirred the blood of those watching. Lie down. Why so formal? Have you hit your head outside? Chu Han, reluctantly in character, laid down. Following the rhythmic beats, a troop of dancers dispersed like blooming petals, and a captivating maiden in red descended gracefully from the sky. Zheng Yang drooled, today's the main event of Fair X, we've come on the right day. If I could spend my life with Fair X to enjoy conjugal bliss night after night, life would be worthwhile. In no time, two young girls, with radiant smiles, entered, carrying two pots of wine. They settled themselves on the lounges next to Xu Han and Zheng Yin, nestling against them like delicate birds. Xu Han's mind went blank, 
Was this drinking flower wine? Wasn't it just a name for the wine? After ten years in the Dragon Mystical Sect's Valley and one year wandering in the Great Cloud, Xu Han had been single-minded in pursuing his path and had never experienced this. It left him thoroughly flustered. Holding the warm and soft beauty in his arms, Xu Han's mind began to whirl. I'm just here for a drink. It's all right. It's all right. Yet, the next second, the young girl took action that seemed to slap him in the face. Suddenly, a soft, fragrant, warm lip pressed onto his. Following that, a stream of rich and aromatic wine, carrying the girl's intoxicating scent, was passed over. The sensation nearly melted Shu Han's soul, and he almost lost himself in this tender intoxication. Just as Shu Han was enjoying the moment, somehow, the exquisite face of Shang Wen Ruilin, as pristine as frost and snow, emerged before his eyes. Splash! Shu Han jerked and pulled himself out of the girl's arms, tumbling onto the ground, his face flushed red. Zheng Yin, in the midst of his enjoyment, pushed the girl in his arms aside, looking at him in surprise. What's wrong? Why did my brother fall to the floor after being served by you? Do you still want your spiritual stones? Xu Han stood up and made an excuse, no, no. My cultivation technique has reached a bottleneck recently, and it's not suitable for me to lose my essence. Let's forget about it this time. However, Zheng Yin was puzzled. What nonsense are you talking about? These girls are all trained in the light cloud and charming rain technique. How can dual cultivation with them possibly hinder your cultivation? This Shu Han was at a loss for words. However, looking at the seductive woman on the chaise, he didn't dare to lie back down. Just as the standoff continued, a man suddenly burst into the room. With a look of disdain on his thin face, he said, Well, you're indeed here. Come, stop indulging yourself. Elder Brother Kong wants to see you. Zheng Yun's face turned a bit unpleasant. He pushed the girl aside, stood up, and smiled, all right, all right. Then he turned to the two girls and said, I'm leaving. But you two shouldn't idle. I've spent spiritual stones to invite you here, so take good care of my brother. The man crossed his arms and laughed. You still have spiritual stones to pay for pleasure. Zheng Yin laughed and said, he just returned from an external assignment, so I welcomed him back. Let's talk outside if there's anything. With that, Zheng Yin led the man out of the room. After Zheng Yin left, the two young women, each holding a pot of wine, approached Xu Han, winding around him like seductive serpents. Xu Han swallowed and quickly pushed them away. You two don't need to busy yourselves tonight, I'm not interested for now. One of the girls looked pitiful, Sir if I don't serve you well tonight, I won't earn any spiritual stones and I'll be punished, please have pity on me. Yes. We both lack talent. If we don't earn some spiritual stones while we're young, we won't have any security for our cultivation in the future. Sir, could you please pity us for one night? These two beautiful women took turns whispering sweet nothings into his ear. Who could withstand that? Shu Han slapped eight low-grade spiritual stones onto the table, which instantly brightened the eyes of the two girls. Seizing the opportunity, Shu Han quickly bolted out of the room. Drinking flower wine was just too stimulating. He, in his early twenties, nearly succumbed. Stepping out of the floating fragrance pavilion, Shu Han looked around for Zheng Yun. Using his clear bright spiritual eye, he spotted Zheng Yun not far away in a grove, surrounded by a group of people. Zheng Yun was smiling and explaining something, but the atmosphere didn't seem good. 79. Earth Fire House. Shu Han held his breath and approached. His foundation establishment staged spiritual sense quietly probing. Scanning with his spiritual sense, Shu Han discovered that Zheng Yin was surrounded by three cultivators who had reached the twelfth level of qi refining. One of them was a handsome young man in a purple robe who appeared quite powerful, probably the elder brother Kong they mentioned. Listening to their conversation, Shu Han realized that these people were creditors. Zheng Yin had spent all his spiritual stones and even borrowed money to enjoy himself at the floating fragrance pavilion. And the interest rate was not low. He had borrowed 300 low-grade spiritual stones a year ago, and now he had to repay 600. The debt had doubled in just one year. Despite owing so many spiritual stones, Zheng Yin was still generous enough to invite guests for flower wine tonight. Xu Han didn't know what to say about this guy. In the end, 
these people found out that Zheng Ying only had a little over twenty spiritual stones on him, they rewarded him with a beating and ordered him to repay six hundred right now or nine hundred in three months, otherwise, they would report this matter to the sect's adjudicating elders. After that, the group left. Zheng Ying, beaten to a pulp, struggled up from the ground, swearing a few times. Covering his face, he walked out of the grove. After hesitating in front of the floating fragrance pavilion, he decided to return to the treasure peak. Just as he was leaving, he bumped straight into Xu Han. Zheng Ying, with a swollen face, asked in surprise, Zymo, weren't you enjoying yourself inside? Finished so soon? Ah? Uh? Xu Han didn't understand what he was talking about, so he just nodded. Then, Zheng Ying, his eyes resembling a panda's due to the bruising, looked at Xu Han disdainfully, he said mockingly, What happened? Did you finish so quickly? You, boy, must have been fooling around with mortal women outside. TSK TSK, you've depleted your energy. If I had known you'd be so quick, I wouldn't have spent so many spiritual stones bringing you here. A total waste. As they walked, Zheng Ying lamented, Brother, I'm finished this time. In three months, I will be handed over to the adjudicating elder. Those damned loan sharks. I only borrowed three hundred but they want me to repay 900, it's too much. Xu Han asked, isn't there anyone who can control this? Who dares to? The adjudicating elder is his father. Xu Han, Zheng Yun raged, what should I do? If I really can't repay it, that guy will definitely make me pay. Xu Han tentatively asked, aren't you a tool refiner? Why don't you refine some tools to repay the debt? If only it were that easy. Zheng Yun held his face and said, you know very well, as a disciple of the treasure peak, most of my time is spent assisting master in refining tools. I only have a little time to take on private jobs in my own earth fire house. Also, my forging level is at most high grade. To repay 900 spirit stones, it has to be a top grade magic tool. Hearing this, an idea popped into Xu Han's mind. He said, that's easy, lend me your earth fire house and I'll forge the magic tool for you to repay your debt. Huh? Zheng Ying looked at Xu Han as if he were an idiot. Brother Zaimo, I feel like you've become a completely different person since you've returned. Since when do you speak about tool refining? I appreciate your kind, but it's too far-fetched. Xu Han took out the 300 solutions to refining tools and said, when I was on a mission outside, I received guidance from a master and fell in love with tool refining. I've successfully refined several high-grade magic tools. Since your earth fire house is usually empty anyway, why not lend it to me? Who knows, it might solve your urgent problem. You've been able to refine high-grade magic tools in just over two years. Who are you trying to fool? Xu Han smiled and said, if you don't believe me. Let's go to your earth fire house now. I'll show you my tool refining skills. HMPH. I thought you had changed, but you're still the same. All talk and no action. Fine, since I can't touch a girl tonight anyway, I'll accompany you, a big man, to the earth fire house. Xu Han laughed. If I succeed, I won't do it for free. Zheng Yun shivered, playing the fool. Brother, if you fancy anything on me, just take it. Xu Han said, you are a disciple of the treasure peak, surely you have access to the high grade materials there, so why don't you? Zheng Yun quickly interrupted, you're not asking me to steal materials for you, are you? That's a capital offense. If I could steal materials, would I still lack 900 spiritual stones? Xu Han quickly said, no, no, there's always waste in tool refining. You help me get a little of the if cuts of rare materials, just a bit of each kind will do. No one will notice. What do you want the if cuts for? Xu Han said, to study the properties of the materials and improve my tool refining skills. Zheng Ying scoffed, I told you, you don't understand tool refining. The if cuts can't be shaped. And yet you pretend to be a tool refining master in front of me. You don't need to worry about how I'll use them. Just tell me if it's a deal. Zheng Yin patted Xu Han on the shoulder and said, Deal. If you can even refine a mid-grade magic tool, then it's settled. Xu Han followed Zheng Yin to the waste of the treasure peak, where the disciples of the peak had hollowed out the area like a beehive, with earth fire houses scattered about. Each earth fire house was connected to the main vein of earth fire of the treasure peak, providing robust and endless firepower. 
with the token of treasure peak, Zheng Yin led Xu Han into his own earth fire house. The most eye-catching part of the earth fire house was the large copper furnace in the center. This copper furnace was comparable to the one that his master used to have, but it was the standard configuration for all Qi refining disciples of the treasure peak. Below the copper furnace was a complex formation with a pit in the center. Zheng Yun activated the formation with his token, and a surging white earth fire gushed out from the pit, instantly raising the temperature of the earth fire house. Xu Han was skilled in alchemy and tool refining, but he had only ever used pill fire for refining and had never seen earth fire. Now he realized how laborious and time consuming it was to refine with pill fire, which could not be compared to the endless and stable earth fire. Zheng Yin brought a pile of cheap materials over and said, Zymo, don't bother refining tools, just purify these materials. Purifying and refining basic materials is the most fundamental skill. Testing my basic skills. Xu Han couldn't help but chuckle in his heart. Back when he was refining tools, thanks to the black jar, he had almost unlimited materials to practice with. His basic skills were incredibly solid. Xu Han put these materials into the copper furnace. His spiritual sense began to guide the earth fire along the formation patterns to heat the mixed materials in the furnace. Zheng Yun watched with his arms crossed. You seem to know what you're doing. However, he soon nearly popped his eyes out. Xu Han was actually able to use his spiritual sense to divide the earth fire into 17 branches and precisely refine the 17 different materials in the furnace. Zheng Yin had to admit that he couldn't match such an accurate and skilled operation. This guy has actually developed such advanced tool refining skills in just over three years outside. Immersed in the process. Xu Han purified all the materials in the furnace of impurities by midnight. Zheng Yun gaped, Zymo, you should have joined us at the treasure peak. With your skills after just three years of training outside, you have the potential to become a top grade tool refiner. Snapping out of his focus, Xu Han asked, so, is our deal on? On. Zheng Yun shook Xu Han's hand sincerely, from now on, this earth fire house is yours. Please help me get through this difficulty. From now on, all flower wine expenses will be on me. What about the materials? Zheng Yin thumped his chest. Leave the if cuts to me. Whatever you need, I will get a bit for you. But really, just a little bit. Don't complain about it being too little later. 80. Challenge of the Heaven List. After showcasing his tool refining skills for half the night, Zheng Yin was thoroughly impressed and persistently asked Xu Han to share his tool refining insights. Xu Han figured that the guy wasn't so bad at heart. Despite being in deep debt, he still dared to invite people for drinks. It was just that his personality was a bit carefree. Since he was living under the identity of Xuzaimo, he decided to help take care of his friend. So, he agreed to Zheng Yun's request and would occasionally guide him into refining when he had time. As soon as dawn broke, Xu Han set out for the Purple Sun platform at Purple Sun Peak. After all, his purpose of coming here was for a place in the Immaculate Realm, and getting a top 50 ranking on the Purple Sun ranking was crucial. Zheng Ying insisted on tagging along, saying that since Xu Han was so confident, he had to go and see the fun. Xu Han couldn't help but give him a glance, thinking, if you put half of this enthusiasm for joining in the fun into tool refining, your skills wouldn't be so poor. The Purple Sun platform was set halfway up the Purple Sun Peak. It seemed as if a huge, sharp blade had horizontally carved a sword mark in the center of the purple sun peak. When Xu Han and Zheng Yun walked onto this large platform, they found that there were many cultivators coming and going, and the place was crowded. On the purple sun platform, 50 small competition platforms were set up, and there was also a huge competition platform in the center. Through some chatting with Zheng Yun, Xu Han learned that these 50 small platforms represented the top 50 in the heaven list. Each platform had a master, and if one wanted to challenge, one had to pay a corresponding amount of spirit stones to make an appointment with the master. The central large platform was the life and death battle platform of the Purple Sun sect. If there were irreconcilable conflicts between disciples, they could be resolved on this platform. Looking out. Xu Han saw that the platforms for ranks below the top 20 were crowded with people, and there were basically cultivators engaged in fierce battles. In contrast, 
the platforms for the ranks above 20 were less challenged. Perhaps because the disciples ranked above 20 were all very powerful, and the challenge cost was high, so few people were interested. However, the platforms below rank 20 were fiercely competitive for the spots in the Immaculate Realm. Xu Han couldn't help but say, if I get to rank and simply close my door and refuse to fight, wouldn't I secure a spot in the Immaculate Realm? Zheng Ying said, the rules were changed two years ago, because the Immaculate Realm is about to open, they fear people like you who would try to game the system. Now, unless you're severely injured, you must accept all challenges if you're in the top 50. Xu Han shrugged, deciding to just casually challenge someone within the top 50. He went to register for a challenge at the platform of the 42nd rank. However, when he saw the list of registered disciples, his appointment was at 120th. Xu Han was dumbfounded, when would it be his turn? Zheng Yin patted his shoulder, just wait patiently, there should still be a chance. After all, we still have five months, should there still be a chance? Xu Han was speechless, his purpose here was to secure a spot, any delay could bring about change, he looked at the top 20 of the heaven list and decided not to hold back anymore, choosing from ranks below 20 not only required queuing but also the possibility of being challenged daily, he might as well aim for the top 20 on the heaven list, so, he squeezed through the crowds at the low-ranking platforms and walked toward the high-ranking platforms, pushing through the dense crowd, Xu Han saw a slim-waisted woman also passing through the crowd toward the high-ranking platform, he noticed this woman only had the cultivation base of the 8th level of the Qi refining stage, and yet she was challenging the high-ranking platform, the woman noticed Xu Han looking at her and walked over with a frown, her eyes sized Xu Han up and down, and she said displeased, Xuzaimo, why are you back? How many times have I told you, there's nothing between us anymore, stop following me. Ah? Looking at the girl's haughty demeanor, Xu Han couldn't help but think, you at the 8th level of the Qi refining stage have the nerve to talk to me in that tone. Suddenly, he had a thought, could this woman be the Chu Yun that Xuzaimo couldn't stop mentioning? From what Xuzaimo had rambled on about, he knew that since Chu Yun entered the sect, Xuzaimo had been caring for her, originally intending to cultivate feelings and become Dao companions. However, as Chu Yun's cultivation base grew and her horizons broadened, she found Xuzaimo to be too useless and flatly rejected his proposal to become Dao companions. This was something Xuzaimo had been constantly grumbling about. Stop bothering me, there's no future with you. Don't you understand yourself? Huh, you've reached the twelfth level of Qi refining? Surprise flashed in Chu Yun's eyes. At this time, Zheng Ying squeezed out from the crowd, and after seeing Chu Yun, he slapped Xu Han on the shoulder and said, Yo, your habits never change even when you've gotten stronger. When you see this broken shoe, you can't walk straight. Hurry up and go back to register, otherwise you really won't be able to make it. Chu Han. I can't explain. Chu Yun angrily said. You're the broken shoe. Ouch. Look at you. With your looks you dare to reject my brother. I can pick a better girl than you in the floating fragrance pavilion. Hearing this, Chu Yun choked. She glared angrily at Zheng Yun, then turned to Xu Han and said, Xu Zimo, I advise you to avoid this person in the future. No manners. Oh, now you're upset. My brother took care of you so much before, and this is how you repay him. If you're not a broken shoe, then what are you? Who said she's a broken shoe? Suddenly, a voice came from the side, making Zheng Yun instinctively shrink his body. Xu Han turned his head and saw the purple-robed man from last night walking over with a grin. It was Zheng Yun's debtor, Kong. Upon seeing Kong, Chu Yun immediately switched to a smiling face, threw herself into his arms without hesitation, and gloated at Zheng Yun. Zheng Yun, hunched over, said, Senior brother, with your status, this woman can only be considered a worn out Chu. She's not good enough for you. Kong, rubbing Chu Yun's waist, laughed. Who cares what kind of shoe she is, as long as she can earn spirit stones in my floating fragrance pavilion, she's a good shoe. Then he pinched Chu Yun's chin and laughed. But before entering my floating fragrance pavilion, I need to personally examine the quality. Chu Yun forced out a seductive smile. And Zheng Yun was stunned. You're going to the floating fragrance pavilion. You've crossed the line. 
he turned his worried gaze towards Xu Han, comforting him, brother, it's better to forget this kind of woman completely, she's not worth it, Chu Yun angrily said, if I don't go to the floating fragrance pavilion, depending on Xu Zimo's small amount of spirit stones, when will I reach the twelfth level of chi refining, if I miss the next batch of foundation establishment pills, my life will be ruined, the two of you are sure to get foundation establishment pills in the next batch, so of course, it's easy for you to talk, Xu Han was stunned, indeed, with Xu Zimo's ability, it was hard for him to cultivate to the twelfth level of chi refining, let alone bring a Dao companion with even worse talent, Kong slapped her buttocks, laughing, see, this is what a girl with awareness looks like, Zheng Ying said maliciously, fine, I'll pick you every day at the floating fragrance pavilion, make you sick, Kong's face turned dark, do you even have the spirit stones to pick a girl at the floating fragrance pavilion, Zheng Ying immediately admitted defeat, no, no, if I have spirit stones, I would, of course, pay you back first, Chu Yun, lying in Kong's arms, looked at the silent Xu Han and shouted, Xu Zimo, don't even think about persuading me, I've made up my mind, go find other women, you will be able to get the foundation establishment pill in the future, and you won't have any trouble finding a better girl to be your Dao companion, is it finally my turn to speak, Xu Han spread his hands and said, whatever you decide is your business, I'm not interested in knowing, besides, I came here to fight, meeting you is just a coincidence, I'm not following you, then he turned to Kong, oh, senior brother Kong, I see that you are also a person on the heaven list, I wonder if you have time to exchange a few moves with me, 81, 9 joint bamboo cloud fan, you want to fight me, Kong looked at Xu Han in surprise, as if he was looking at an idiot, Zheng Yin quickly pulled Xu Han, whispering reprimands, have you gone mad, he's the ninth on the heaven list, at the peak of the twelfth level of chi refining, his father is a judge elder in the late stage of foundation establishment, he has at least three or four top grade magic tools on him, you don't need to compete with him over a worn out Xu, hearing these words, Chu Yun turned pale, she quickly scolded, Xu Zimo, don't be shameless, how could you possibly match senior brother Kong, don't overestimate your abilities, at the peak of the twelfth level of chi refining, his father is in the late stage of foundation establishment, is that all, my real body is at the peak of the early stage of foundation establishment, with a mid stage cow formation follower, am I proud, Kong laughed, pushed Chu Yun away, came to Xu Han, and said disdainfully, interesting, I have been standing in this ninth position for over a year, and no one dared to challenge me, finally met an interesting person, today won't be boring anymore, the challenge to the ninth rank of the heaven list costs 200 spirit stones, do you have enough, junior brother, do you want me to lend you some, whoosh, a bag of spirit stones was thrown at Kong, Xu Han smiled, I can still afford 200 spirit stones, don't trouble yourself, senior brother, this scene stunned both Zheng Ying and Chu Yun, is this guy really that rich, then please, Kong gestured for Xu Han to step onto the stage, on the platform, he looked relaxed and said to Xu Han, junior brother, you are the first one to pay to get beaten, seeing that you can shell out 200 spirit stones at once, I won't hurt you too badly, Xu Han saluted, thank you very much, senior brother, downstage, Chu Yun couldn't help but lean over to Zheng Ying and ask, where did he get so many spirit stones, Zheng Ying looked worriedly at the stage, and couldn't help but say, Humphrey, you worn out Chu, you are blind, my brother returned from an assignment with a great opportunity, what are 200 spirit stones, his future is limitless, you can sit and cry in the floating fragrance pavilion from now on, this made Chu Yun speechless, she indeed felt a huge change in Xu Zimo's temperament, and he no longer clung and hesitated as before, but he can't beat senior brother Kong, that's what I'm saying, it's all your fault, you worn out Chu, Zheng Yun scolded, if it wasn't for you, this worn out Chu, stimulating him, would he make such a reckless move, you know he's stubborn, if anything happens to my brother, I'll come to the floating fragrance pavilion every day and pick you, this worn out Chu, I'll torment you to death, you, Chu Yun's face turned red with anger, 
but she couldn't find words to retort. She was somewhat regretful and looked worriedly at Xuzaimo. Xu Han revealed his black gold folding dragon Seba, and when Kong saw this high quality magic tool, the corners of his mouth slightly rose. With a wave of his hand, a huge hammer with flickering thunder and lightning flew out from his purple sleeve, swinging directly toward Xu Han. Zhenyang, who was very familiar with magic tools, exclaimed, Damn, he's starting with the top grade magic tool, Silver Dragon Thunder Hammer. He knew very well that this top grade magic tool was made by a foundation establishment master from Treasure Peak, a treasure among top grade magic tools. Once it was used, it could form an electric field to paralyze the enemy, then the heavy hammer would fall, determining victory with a single strike. Xu Han felt a tingling sensation under his feet, caused by the electric field triggered by the giant hammer in the air. With a thought, his flowing boots directly shielded this electric field. He held up the black gold folding dragon saber and jumped high. The blade manifested a purple dragon shadow that slashed towards the hammer. You can't collide head on. The black gold folding dragon saber will get blunted. Zheng Yin was very familiar with this magic tool of his. However, Xu Han immediately turned the blade into the back of the Seba, struck the hammer, and used the force to flip in the air, breaking through the thunder surrounding the hammer, unaffected by it. Then, his flowing boots stepped on the hammer and rushed towards Kong. His body turned into a shadow of a dragon slashing towards his head. The whole series of movements was as fluid as flowing clouds and water, containing the essence of the sky aspiring sword technique. Boom! The giant hammer hit the ground, attracting everyone. Xu Han's saber slashed on Kong's head, but the blade was blunted and could not cut down. Kong looked up, his eyes indifferent as he looked at Xu Han, invisible tortoise shell patterns slowly unfolding on his head. Xu Han's attack did not succeed, he stepped on the tortoise shell pattern to propel himself away. At this point, he looked at the blunted black gold folding dragon saber and couldn't help but look at Zheng Yim down the stage. Zheng Yim laughed awkwardly. Don't look at me. It's mostly this result when a high grade magic tool strikes a top grade defensive magic tool. Bullshit. Clang. Xu Han threw away this piece of junk. Seeing this, senior brother Kong's eyes narrowed and said, Junior brother, are you giving up directly? I just got excited. I won't allow you to surrender standing. But the next second, his pupils suddenly constricted. Xu Han was surrounded by four rays of golden light, and four heavenly swords were spinning around him. The dazzling golden light brought a visible sharpness to the naked eye. Kong's face twitched a bit, his eyes hotly fixed on the four heavenly swords, surprised. A sword array composed of four top grade law swords. You're really loaded, aren't you? Zheng Ying and Chu Yun were incredibly shocked. Were his skills and equipment still the Xuzaimo they remembered? Damn. We all knew this guy made a fortune on his trip, but he turned into a tycoon directly. This sword array is amazing. It can be compared with the masterpiece of a late stage foundation establishment elder from Treasure Peak. Meanwhile, Chu Yun was so regretful that she was nearly biting her lips. The person who once stuck to her like a plaster, how did he become so unattainable now? Kong now had to take it seriously. He recalled his silver dragon thunder hammer and pushed his evergreen profound turtle shield to its limit, raising his hammer and attacking Xu Han. However, Xu Han remained motionless. The four heavenly swords formed a sword array and flew directly from his side to fight with Kong. The heavenly quadrant sword formation was good for both offense and defense, and its profoundness was infinite. The unpredictable sword array made Kong exhausted to cope, and his evergreen profound turtle shield was cut with numerous scars in no time. On the other hand, Xu Han, like an outsider, was watching the fight and even humming a tune. Being suppressed like this, Kong was furious. Suddenly, he burst out with a strong green light all over his body, and he was illuminated in green. The green wave directly repelled the surrounding heavenly quadrant sword formation. A green bamboo fan floated in front of him. Zheng Yim yelled at the edge of the arena, damn. Nine joint bamboo cloud fan. That's the best of the best. Comparable to the magic treasure of a foundation establishment cultivator. The enraged Kong held this bamboo fan. All his spiritual power was sucked into the fan. And he said angrily, forcing me to use this magic treasure, if you can't block it and die, 
Don't blame me, go to hell. Zheng Yin quickly stepped back, yelling, Zymo, run. After saying that, he was the first to bolt, causing a stir among the surrounding spectators, who hastily evacuated. Run. Shu Han pinched a magic trick, and the four heavenly swords quickly assembled in the air, and a huge golden sword fell in front of Shu Han. Whoosh. Senior brother Kong waved his fan, a cyan hurricane rushed forward, and the arena along its path was completely destroyed. Shu Han held this huge sword and a sword light was drawn out. 82. One sword. The golden sword light was like a crescent moon, directly breaking through the howling and terrifying green hurricane and striking on Kong's turtle shield. Immediately, the turtle shield shattered. Kong spat out a mouthful of blood and was instantly slashed off the arena. On the other hand, Shu Han was not flushed or breathless. Standing at the edge of the arena, looking at the seriously injured Kong, he showed a modest smile and said, Senior brother, thank you for your concession. I will do my best to secure your ninth position on the heaven list. Senior brother Kong was unwilling. His resentful gaze looking at Shu Han and spat out another mouthful of blood. Chu Yun quickly ran over, wanting to help him up, but he swung his arm, directly knocking Chu Yun away, shouting, You're also here to mock me, aren't you? Chu Yun sat on the ground in grief, her eyes full of wrong feelings. After the shock, Zheng Yun rushed up to the arena, laughing and patting Shu Han's shoulder, giving him a punch, and excitedly said, Well done. You didn't go on this mission in vain. You've come back so strong. You've really impressed us. You used to always hang around with me. From now on I'll hang around behind you. The other disciples watching were whispering to each other, not knowing who this person who easily defeated Kong Tan Rui was. Kong Tan Rui stood up, looked at Shu Han unconvinced, and shouted, I've never heard of you in the Purple Sun sect. You suddenly appeared. You must be a demonic cultivator who sneaked in. Elders. I have a situation to report. Swoosh. Just as Kong Tan Rui's shout fell, a figure appeared on the platform. A sleepy old man walked in front of Shu Han with a yawn, and the immense pressure instantly came, making Shu Han shiver. Core formation stage. Kong Tan Rui bowed and said, reporting to the elder, this man was useless for many years, but he became so strong when he came back from outside. There must be a trick. I suspect that he is a demonic cultivator who has infiltrated our Purple Sun sect. Nonsense. Zheng Yin bowed to the Elder of the Sky Platform and said, replying to the Elder, My brother just had some adventures outside, and he is not a demonic cultivator in disguise. I can guarantee it. But the Elder looked at Shu Han with puzzled eyes and retorted, You can guarantee it? With your cultivation. How can you tell? Why can you guarantee it? This. Zheng Yun hesitated because he could faintly feel that Xu Zaimo had changed a lot this time. Let me see, kid. Extend your hand. Shu Han respectfully bowed and handed over his hand. The old man's dry palm passed through a clear stream and moved around Shu Han's body. He stroked his beard and said, hm, There's no hiding of cultivation. Indeed it's the Qi refining 12 layer, and indeed it's the cultivation method of our purple sun sect. All right, child, you performed well, who is your master? Shu Han respectfully replied, replying to the elder, my master is Cheng Yu Han. Very good, the ninth position on the heaven list is yours. Your master deserves credit for cultivating a disciple like you. Pass my words to him, let him go to the treasure peak and take an essence gathering pill to increase his cultivation. Thank you, Elder. Kong Tan Rui was dumbfounded, he couldn't help saying, Elder, are you sure you've seen? Shut up. Your father really should manage you better, if he doesn't. I wouldn't mind doing it myself. At this remark from the Elder, Kong Tan Rui was immediately silenced. The elder then waved his wide sleeve and disappeared in a wisp of white smoke. Kong Tan Rui glared at Shu Han and snorted. We will meet again. Shu Han became puzzled. Where? When? Kong Tan Rui was stunned by the abrupt question. What did you say? Shu Han explained. Didn't you say we'll meet again? I just want to ask where and when. I need to be prepared. Kong Tan Rui was a bit speechless, thinking and answering subconsciously. I meant in a general sense of meeting again not a specific time and place. I mean, I'll show you in the future. Oh, Shu Han pretended to realize, I thought you were inviting me out. Kong Tan Rui was stunned. Why would you think I would invite you out? Shu Han couldn't help it. 
He chuckled, I also want to know. Zheng Yun, on the other hand, couldn't hold back at all, he covered his mouth and laughed out loud. Kong Tan Rui's face turned pale, he angrily said, Are you making fun of me? Seeing Xu Han and Zheng Yun laughing together, Kong Tan Rui was furious and left in a huff. Chu Yun was looking at Xu Han with complex eyes, a bit of resentment, a bit of regret, and then followed Kong Tan Rui away. Zheng Yun was excited, pulling Xu Han and saying, Now that you're so awesome, hurry up and treat me to drinks. We must have the best wine and the most beautiful girls. This is what our status deserves. Xu Han was speechless. What status do you have? Then, without hesitation, he threw this flower wine lover back to Treasure Peak and returned to the Purple Abyss Peak with the message from the Elder. Cheng Yuhan was sitting on the cushion, and upon hearing the news brought back by Xu Han, he jumped three feet high from the cushion. He almost couldn't resist giving Xu Han a bear hug. The first thing he did after his ecstasy was to drag Xu Han to Liu Wan's Hang's cave mansion, boasting and bragging, which made Liu Wan's Hang's face turn green, almost ready to fight on the spot. Then he praised Xu Han fiercely, humming a little tune, and happily ran to the treasure peak to get the elixir. This left Xu Han alone on the purple abyss peak in confusion. Now when he looked back, he realized that in this cultivation world, strength is indeed respected, whether it's within the sect or among the loose cultivators. Xu Zimo's life was full of tragedy. The master didn't love him, the girl despised him, and only Zheng Yun was considered a close friend. However, this close friend seemed to reveal that he had borrowed a lot of spirit stones from Xuzaimo in the past to drink flower wine, and he hadn't paid them back yet. The high quality magic tool he helped to build was also a third rate inferior product. However, Xu Han, taking on his identity, had just arrived at the Purple Sun sect for less than two days, and his status underwent a tremendous change. The root causes the difference in strength. So, Xu Han left the Purple Abyss Peak, took Zheng Yun's token, and prepared to go to the Earth Fire House to refine the magic tool. The smooth feeling of refining tools in the Earth Fire House made Xu Han itch, which was much more refreshing than his daily refining with the Pill Fire. Since the quota was already secured, Xu Han planned to spend half a year in the Earth Fire House to study the way of refining pills and tools and carry forward the skills taught by his master in the past. At this time, the sun was setting, and Xu Han had just flown away from the purple abyss peak when he saw Chu Yun flying up from the forest between the mountains, blocking Xu Han's way with a look of struggle on her face. Seeing this woman, Xu Han asked indifferently, What's the matter? Seeing Xu Zaimo so indifferent, the smile he used to go after her seemed like a dream. This made Chu Yun's heart sour. She looked at Xu Han and said pitifully, Brother Xu, can you do me a favor? First, tell me what it is. Chu Yun choked and said, I am about to enter Kong Tan Rui's floating fragrance pavilion. I regret it now, I shouldn't have fallen like this, but Kong Tan Rui won't let me go. He asked me to meet him in the purple bamboo forest tonight. I dare not go alone. Can you accompany me to make it clear to him? If you are willing to help me, I, I am willing to work for you in the future. Looking at the woman's pitiful appearance, Xu Han felt nothing but disgust in his heart and wanted to refuse harshly. What does your business have to do with me? But then he thought, Xuzaimo genuinely liked this woman. Since he was taking his place, let's do her a favor. Even if the woman he loved was not a good thing. Coincidentally, his own original self would probably arrive near the Purple Sun sect tonight, and he needed to find time to send out the gold page. 83. Ambush, Xu Han followed Chu Yun without a word, gradually moving away from Purple Abyss Peak. Chu Yun couldn't help but look back at Xu Han from time to time, revealing a pitiful look. However, she noticed that Xu Han's face was always expressionless, which made her feel even more depressed. She couldn't help but recall how Xu Zaimo had treated her before. At that time, as long as Xu Zaimo saw her frown, he would always try to coax her with a smile. The huge gap filled Chu Yun's heart mixed with all sorts of feelings. She couldn't help but ask, Brother Xu, are you resentful towards me? Not really. The indifferent response made Chu Yun's heart even more sour. Chu Yun said softly, I know you resent me, and I know I was heartless and selfish. When I first entered the sect, I was ignorant. It was you who took care of me, 
and only then was I able to reach my current level of cultivation. Xu Han rubbed his ears, thinking to himself, when is this woman going to stop talking? I am not Xu Zimo, but the heart is made of flesh, you've always been so good to me, and I remember it all. It's a lie to say that I have no feelings for you. But I'm more afraid of promising you and then falling into a mundane life. During the Qi refining period, one's life is only over a hundred years. I have low talent. And if I don't make a bold move, if I just follow the steps and cultivate, I will soon lose my youth and become a handful of yellow soil. In my twenty plus years in the Purple Sun sect, I have seen too many female cultivators die old. They were humble in life and after death, they were nothing more than a gravestone. Even though they were cultivators, what difference did they have from mortals? As Chu Yun spoke, her tone suddenly became determined, only when reaching the foundation establishment period can one truly stand tall in this purple sun sect. In order to break through the bottleneck of my cultivation, I can give up my chastity and dignity, and any burden. So please forgive me for rejecting your proposal that day. After your foundation establishment, you deserve a better female cultivator. Xu Han listened quietly, not knowing what to say for a while. At this time, they had already moved far away from the main area of the Purple Sun sect and had come to a dark bamboo forest. Xu Han's divine sense swept over the bamboo forest and noticed something unusual. He couldn't help but look at Chu Yun out of the corner of his eye, laughing to himself. So this conversation was not arranged for you, but specifically for me. Summoning an early stage foundation establishment cultivator to ambush? What a good method. Xu Han showed no reaction and continued to follow Chu Yun. As the two landed in the bamboo forest, Kong Tan Rui in purple was waiting among the trees. He wasn't surprised at all to see Xu Han following Chu Yun. Instead, a smug smile was on his face. Chu Yun turned around, her eyes filled with sorrow as she looked at Chu Han. She slowly moved towards Kong Tan Ru I, apologizing, you can resent me for what I did tonight, but please understand, I have no other choice. Chu Han squinted, watching as Chu Yun moved next to Kong Tan Ru I. Kong Tan Ru I, with a wicked grin on his face, held her waist with one hand and touched her white neck with the other. In a murderous tone, he said, don't worry, beauty, he won't have a chance to resent you. The sudden murderous aura scared Chu Yun, causing her to shudder. She realized something was wrong and hurriedly said, senior brother Kong, this is not what we agreed on. Weren't you just going to teach Xu a lesson? A lesson? Hate shone in Kong's eyes. No one has ever dared to insult me like this. How could I let him off with just a lesson? Xu Han laughed. I've suspected something was off from the start. I just wanted to see what you, Kong Tan Ru I, were capable of. But it's quite pathetic. You and the one hidden in the shadows think you can take my life? This comment made Kong Tan Ru I laugh in anger. You're not afraid even when facing death. Do you know who I've brought with me? Xu Han turned his head towards the bamboo forest. A mere early stage foundation establishment. Not worth mentioning. This comment scared Chu Yun so much she began to shudder. She struggled desperately in Kong Tan Rui's arms and murmured in a daze. No, don't do this. Just teach him a lesson. Don't kill him. Damn woman. Piss. A shadow flashed across Chu Yun's neck, and a large amount of blood spurted out from her white neck in an instant. Chu Yun's vision darkened, and she quickly covered her neck with her hand. But she couldn't stop the bleeding, only delay the speed at which the blood was spurting out. Kong Tanru I kicked her away with a foot. Damn woman, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't have lost face at the purple sun platform. You're going to die tonight too. Chu Yun fell to the ground in a daze, one hand clutching her neck and the other grasping at Kong Tanru I's leg. She croaked. Don't kill me. I don't want to die. Kong Tanru I looked at her struggling at the brink of death and couldn't help but laugh heartily. To kill you instantly would be too easy on you. Damn woman. He he. The wound I gave you can't be healed. You'll die slowly and painfully. Watch closely before you die. And see what happens to those who offend me. Xu Han watched Kong Tanru I's brutality with cold eyes and shook his head. You've brought this upon yourself? Kong Tan Ru I, you're seeking death. As he spoke, four golden lights flowed out of Xu Han's storage bag. In an instant, his body transformed into a beam of light and sidestepped away. Boom. A deep pit was blown out where he had just stood. 
Looking closely, a blood-red long saber stood in the pit, a figure in black sprang out from the bamboo forest, the long saber turned into a beam of bloody light and fell back into his hand, the man, wrapped in black, coldly watched Shu Han who seemed to be fearless, he felt that something was not quite right. Kong Tanru I was also confused and asked, Hey, how did you miss? The man in black apologized, I'm sorry, young master, generally speaking. A chi refining stage cultivator wouldn't be able to evade my spirit locked attack, but this boy is different. It seems that he was aware of my position from the start and had anticipated my attack. That's impossible. How could a chi refining stage's spiritual sense evade a foundation establishment stage cultivator's lock? Four heavenly swords formed a giant sword in Shu Han's hand. Back when he fought Master Dragon Mystical, he hid in the cold smoke to avoid the spiritual sense lock of the foundation establishment stage's magical treasure. Now, although his current body was at the chi refining stage, his spiritual sense had already reached the early peak of the foundation establishment stage, firmly suppressing the other man. How could he be locked by his spiritual sense? Holding the giant sword, he laughed and said, I remember when I first fought against a foundation establishment stage cultivator, I used all my techniques and risked my life to barely win, years have passed, and six early stage foundation establishment cultivators have fallen by my hand, tonight, you'll be the seventh, the man in black snorted coldly, a mere chi refining stage cultivator, you're full of yourself, the man in black attacked Shu Han with his magical treasure, Thanks to his flowing boots and cloud walking step, Shu Han's speed in this bamboo forest was comparable to the foundation establishment stage black clothed man. The occasional fire god talisman he threw disrupted the man's attacks, making it difficult for the man in black to gain the upper hand. The giant heavenly sword and the black clothed man's long sabre had exchanged blows several times. While the power of the heavenly sword was a bit inferior, with his spiritual sense suppression, the man in black couldn't get the upper hand against Shu Han. For a moment, the battle was at a stalemate. This dumbfounded both Kong Tanru I and the dying Chu Yun. A chi refining stage cultivator was actually able to fight on equal terms with a foundation establishment stage cultivator. This level of power was even comparable to the top rank of the Purple Sun Heaven list. Moreover, Kong Tanru I wanted to assist but didn't even know where to start. Their power levels were not on the same scale. In the chaos of the battle, Shu Han seized an opportunity. Three fire god talisman were thrown out. The man in black hurriedly defended. But he didn't expect that in the aftermath of the explosion, Shu Han had also thrown out a mysterious small medicine bottle. Puff. A splash of black liquid spread in the explosion, splashing all over the man in black. 84. The pursuit of the demonic cultivator. Five poisons water? The black clothed man stopped and looked at the black aura spreading on his body, he said in surprise, is this your trick? Don't underestimate people. After speaking, he tried to use his internal power to dispel the poisonous aura from his body, but he suddenly realized that the spiritual power he could call upon had actually dropped to half of his usual level. He cried out in fear, this is not five poisons water, what is this? Don't worry about what it is. It's just something that's going to kill you. Shu Han raised his giant heavenly sword and charged over. The black clothed man immediately tried to block with his long knife, but suddenly a ray of light shone from Shu Han's eyes. The man's spiritual sense was stunned for a moment, and at this moment, Shu Han's sword was already coming down. With only half of his spiritual power, the black clothed man was unable to resist and was directly knocked back, losing grip on his magical treasure. Shu Han turned around and swung his sword again, puff, blood spurted out a meter high, and the black clothed man's head fell in front of Kong Tan Ru Ai, ah ah ah, Kong Tan Ru Ai was so scared by the head falling from the sky that his liver and gall were about to split, it felt like he was in a horrible dream, his mind filled with an unreal sense of fear, he watched as Shu Han approached step by step with his sword, trembling with fear, and quickly knelt down to beg for mercy. Big brother, sir, I didn't recognize Mount Tai, spare me, I beg you. My father is an adjudicating elder, a late stage foundation establishment cultivator. He will surely repay you well, he could even say such nonsense. Shu Han shook his head helplessly, go to hell. However, Kong Tan Ru I, who was begging for mercy, 
suddenly showed a fierce light in his eyes. He took out his turtle shield and threw out his silver dragon thunder hammer, knowing that he was no match for Shu Han. He directly detonated this top grade magical tool in front of him. Shu Han frowned, and the heavenly quadrant sword formation blocked in front of him to protect him. He was blown away for more than 10 meters before he could stop. When he looked up, Kong Tan Rui had already disappeared. Shu Han shook his head. You think you can run away from me like this? Unfortunately for you, my clear bright spiritual eye has already locked onto your tracks. Shu Han walked to the dying Chu Yun. The wound on her neck had stopped bleeding, and her originally fair face was now as pale as paper. With her last breath, she looked at the indifferent Shu Han, a clear tear falling from the corner of her eye. Her hoarse voice was faintly heard. You. You are not Zymo. Are you? Shu Han squatted down, sighed deeply, and nodded. Chu Yun gave a stiff smile. I knew it. I have been with him for nearly twenty years. He is not as powerful as you. Nor would he be so indifferent to me. With her blood-stained hand, Chu Yun grabbed Shu Han's wrist and used her last bit of strength to ask, Where is he? Dead. The heartbroken Chu Yun loosened her neck. A shocking wound on her neck burst out with the last pool of blood. She mournfully muttered to herself, Back then. If I agreed to become his Dao partner. We wouldn't have ended up like this. The last glimmer in Chu Yun's eyes shattered, and she died just like that. Shu Han took a deep breath, scanned the surroundings with his clear bright spiritual eye, and began tracking the escaped Kong Tan Ru Ai. Kong Tan Ru Ai was also seriously injured in the previous explosion and couldn't have gone far. Shu Han rode the heavenly quadrant sword formation, followed his footprints, and flew away. However, he found that Kong Tan Rui did not flee towards the safe interior of the Purple Sun sect, but towards the exterior. This made Shu Han feel that something was wrong, but no matter what, Kong Tan Rui was doomed to die today. Otherwise, if he reported to his father about the matters, Shu Han wouldn't be able to live comfortably in the Purple Sun sect. Soon, on the fast flight, Shu Han saw Kong Tan Rui, who was limping in the woods. He had actually stopped flying with magic. Was it because he was too badly injured? Just as Shu Han was about to take action to completely kill this person, he suddenly saw a man appearing in front of Kong Tan Ru Ai. Shu Han took a closer look and realized that the man looked familiar. Wasn't he Ren Tani, who had come to the Purple Sun sect with him that day? Seeing the golden light appearing in the sky behind him, Kong Tan Ru Ai immediately cried out in fear, Senior Gui Li, save me. Will E? Shu Han levitated with his sword. Watching Kong Tan Rui hiding behind Ren Tan Yi, looking up at Shu Han trembling, but Ren Tan Yi was frowning and looking at Kong Tan Rui with an unpleasant expression. Shu Han greeted with a smile. Yo, I didn't expect to meet brother in here. Ren Tan Yi turned to smile and said, I also didn't expect to meet brother Xi here. What is brother Xi doing? Shu Han replied, nothing much, just having a little practice with brother Kong. Bullshit. Kong Tan Rui roared in resentment today, with Senior Gui Li here, even if your magic power is stronger, you will die. Ren Tani's face changed, and he laughed. Brother Xu, I don't know what this man is talking nonsense about. I don't know this person at all. He must be crazy, right? As for the matters between you and him, I don't think it's right for me to intervene. I'll take my leave. Shu Han didn't answer, just coldly watching the two. His consciousness was already at its highest alert. Kong Tan Rui became frantic, rushing to Ren Tan Yi, and anxiously said, Senior Gui Li, aren't you a demonic cultivator? Is a demonic cultivator so cowardly and afraid? How can you make waves with my father in the Immaculate Realm? Damn it. Don't fucking say it. Shu Han and Ren Tan Yi both cursed simultaneously. Without thinking, Shu Han turned and ran, transforming into a golden light and fleeing toward the Purple Sun sect. He had long noticed something was off about Rentani, but he didn't want to interfere. In theory, as long as Rentani's secret was unknown, this person should have no reason to turn on him, as it would only cause trouble. Watching Shu Han's retreating light, Rentani was dumbfounded, holding his forehead and sighing, Your father is a clever man. How could he have such a stupid son like you? Acting rashly near the Purple Sun sect. You'll be discovered by those old core formation ghosts. He's getting away. Senior, aren't you going to chase? 
Crack. Gui Li's claw gripped Kong Tanrui's neck, directly twisting it off. Killing you this stupid son will save your father some worry. Discarding Kong Tanrui's body like trash, Gui Li's eyes darkened. He looked in the direction of Xu Han's golden light and then back at the purple sun sect, talking to himself. I can't use all my power in this range. Xuzaimo, your escape speed is good, I'll let you run a little further. A. Hey, why aren't you running towards the purple sun sect? No matter how you run, as a cultivator in the late stage of foundation establishment, could I let you escape from my hands? With that, he transformed into a dark light and went straight after Shu Han, flying away. Shu Han still felt a lingering fear. Listening to Kong Tan Rui's tone, Gui Li came to cooperate with his father. To be able to talk about cooperation with someone in the late stage of the foundation establishment, at least he must be in the late stage of the foundation establishment. Wasn't this the end? Damn Kong Tan Rui. While fleeing at high speed, Xu Han felt a chilling aura rapidly approaching from behind. It's coming. Xu Han immediately took out all the fire god talismans and seven poison waters from his storage bag. They were thrown to Gui Li without a care for cost. Xu Han didn't expect these to work, he just hoped they could slow down Gui Li's approach. 85. Soul Claiming Demonic Sound Whenever Gui Li approached Xu Han, he was met with a pile of fire god talismans and a bottle of seven poison water. However, the power of the fire god talismans couldn't even break through his protective aura, and the seven poison water had almost no effect on him at most slightly slowing his approach. He originally thought that Shu Han was merely struggling on his deathbed, but found that the fire god talismans and seven poison water thrown out by Shu Han's hands never stopped, seemingly endless. Damn, this kid is performing tricks, making so many of them. At this point, Gui Li had reached the peak speed of the early stage of the foundation establishment, but due to Shu Han's obstruction, he could not close the distance. This made him unhappy, he turned his head to look at the Purple Sun Sect. After a period of pursuit, the Purple Sun Sect had now turned into a purple dot on the horizon. It should be okay now. Bang! Gui Li turned into black smoke in the air, his speed increased fivefold, and he arrived behind Shu Han in a blink of an eye. Damn! The hairs on Shu Han's back stood up, a giant black claw stretched out from behind him, covering the sky unavoidable. No matter how Shu Han dodged left and right, he was within the range of the Black Claw. Was this the terrifying power of the late stage of the Foundation establishment? Shu Han gritted his teeth. This external incarnation was related to the quota of the Immaculate Realm, and he could not let him catch it. So, a lightweight talisman drifted from Shu Han's hand to the back and directly entered the Black Claw covering the sky. Shu Han immediately turned around, the heavenly quadrant sword formation folded from beneath his feet to protect him, and more iron armor talismans floated out from his storage bag, forming 18 airtight iron armor shields. Shu Han curled up his whole body and flew like a cannonball. Gui Li. What is this kid up to? Boom. A massive explosion occurred in the night sky. It was as if a sun had risen in the night sky, the dazzling firelight swallowed up several hundreds of feet of space around it illuminating the surroundings as if it were daytime. The forest below was immediately evaporated by the high temperature, turning it into a scorched earth. Advanced talisman, flame sun talisman. In this round of the sun, a small ball of fire popped out. Chu Han, like a falling star, fell into the distant forest. After crashing into a large pit in the forest, Chu Han crawled out of the soil, blood continuously spewing from his mouth, and his clothes had all been burnt off. The four heavenly swords scattered around him, the golden light on their bodies intermittently flickering, showing different degrees of bending. He quickly took out healing pills from his storage bag and swallowed them, finally stopping the continuous flow of blood. Shu Han panted heavily, looking at the damage done to the heavenly swords, feeling a sharp pain in his heart. Those were the inheritance magic tools left by his master, but now was not the time for sentimentality. He deeply realized that even the flame sun talisman could not deal with Gui Li. Gui Li absolutely never expected that a chi refining stage, Shu Han could use a move comparable to a full strength attack of a foundation establishment late stage cultivator. 
he was completely unprepared for the impact of the flame sun talisman, and he must be in a bad condition right now. While he was recovering, it was crucial to quickly escape this area. Crack. Shu Han directly crushed a mid-grade spirit stone, rapidly restoring his depleted magic power, and using the wind riding technique. He dragged his severely injured body and stumbled through the forest at a high speed. Before fleeing, Shu Han scattered twelve substitute talismans in all directions to confuse Gui Li's divine sense. At this moment, the sun-like fireball created by the flame sun talisman was gradually extinguished by the black fog emerging from within. Gui Li, his head charred and messy, crawled out from the center, but there was excitement on his face that looked like charred wood. Good boy, that attack actually injured me. I had a hunch that you were not ordinary when I first arrived at the purple sun sect, but I didn't expect you to reach this level. It seems that your background is not simple either. I love intriguing brats like you the most. Let's see what surprises you can bring me. Saying so, he tore off his clothes, which had already turned into ashes, revealing a shiny black scale armor. At this moment, his divine sense swept over the area and found 13 reactions flying in different directions. Do you have so much reserve? Gwili grinned, but these little tricks are useless against me. As long as I concentrate my divine sense and sweep them one by one, your level of trickery can't deceive my divine sense. But Gwili didn't do that. Instead, he took out a Suona, Chinese horn. It's been a long time since I've played like this. Kid, you're going to keep me company tonight. As Shuhan sped towards the distance, he suddenly heard a faint sound of Suona. The source of the Suona sound could not be determined, it just lingered in his ears and wouldn't go away. The music was eerie, giving people the creeps, as if many ghosts were whispering and laughing around him. Shu Han tried his best to block out this demonic sound, but no matter what he did, the sound of the Suona wouldn't go away. It was as if the Suona was playing directly in his soul. Suddenly, Shu Han felt something wrong with his hand. He couldn't control his left ring finger. Crack. A surge of intense pain hit him, and Shu Han was shocked to find that his ring finger had broken on its own. Immediately after, this eerie feeling appeared in other parts of his body. In this demonic sound, he felt like a puppet on strings, manipulated by others. Bang. Unable to control his body, the wind riding technique immediately dissipated, and he fell heavily from the air to the ground. His body began to twist eerily on the ground. It felt as though he was being held at both ends and twisted tightly like a towel. Every part of his body twisted and broke unconsciously. Chu Han, this is the soul claiming demonic sound. Quick, recite the golden light divine incantation. Chu Han didn't dare to delay and immediately pulled his divine sense out from the demonic sound, silently reciting the golden light divine incantation taught by Shangguan Niwalin in his heart. Heavenly and earthly mystery the root of all chi. As he recited the golden light divine incantation, the situation of the demonic sound flooding his mind was immediately dispelled. Shu Han's body was enveloped in a golden light, and he regained control of his body. And Gui Li, who was in the air, felt something abnormal. At this time, all other substitute talismans of Shu Han was shattered in the demonic sound. Only Shu Han's real body was struggling against it. But Gui Li could no longer control Shu Han's body. His prided soul claiming demonic sound had actually failed. How could this kid with his cultivation level resist my soul claiming demonic sound? So he continued to play. Finding that Shu Han's real body was stationary, he approached him. At this moment, although Shu Han had blocked the endless soul claiming demonic sound, he had to maintain the state of the golden light divine incantation and could not move. Moreover, his magic power was rapidly depleting because of the incantation. Within half an hour, his spiritual power would be exhausted. Gui Li, who was playing the Suona, came to the sky above Shu Han and saw him surrounded by a golden light. His heart was greatly horrified. Golden Light Divine Incantation Are you a disciple of the Great Fortune Sect? However, Shu Han couldn't hear what he was saying at all. He was wholeheartedly reciting the incantation. The look in Gui Li's eyes changed rapidly. Impossible. How could a disciple of the Great Fortune sect appear in the north of the Great Cloud? Gui Li made up his mind. No matter who you are, you must die today. The Golden Light Divine Incantation can block the soul-claiming demonic sound. 
but your cultivation level is too low, it still can't save you. With that, he reached out with a claw, intending to take Xu Han's life, but his divine sense suddenly felt a crisis. He hurriedly retracted his hand and brought out the scale armor he was wearing. A stern shout came from the distant sky. Evil breaking in hand, justice spans the land. Crack. A golden thunderbolt suddenly descended from the southern sky. 86. Confrontation. The golden thunderbolt directly hit Gui Li, causing a series of golden shockwaves in the forest. Gui Li gritted his teeth and used his demonic fish scale armor to block the incoming golden thunderbolt. Upon closer inspection, he found that the thunderbolt was actually an ornate golden immortal sword. Moreover, the light washing over from this immortal sword caused his demonic skill to decrease greatly. Not only that, his demonic fish scale armor, as if meeting its nemesis, could only provide its usual 70% protection. Bang! Gui Li exerted his demonic skill to blast away the immortal sword in front of him and was knocked back. The eight direction evil breaking sword flew to the injured Shu Han, casting a golden shield to protect his external avatar. At this moment, Xu Han's real body arrived from the distance, with Shang Wen Yulin, who had returned to her original form, standing by his side. The two of them floated above the eight direction evil breaking sword, watching Gui Li below in a battle ready stance. Gui Li looked at Xu Han and couldn't help but smirk, no wonder this little boy ran away in the direction away from the purple sun sect. It turns out he has back up. But what's the use of one at the early foundation establishment stage and one at the chi refining stage? Gui Li no longer hid his strength. The terrifying aura of the peak of the late foundation establishment stage emanated, and countless ghost mists poured out from his body, covering the forest in a fog filled with their wailing of spectres. Only the area protected by the eight direction evil breaking sword was free of the ghostly mist. At this moment, Xu Han had the intention to retreat, saying, Lin Lin, we are no match for this old demon. When the fight begins, look for an opportunity to take the external avatar and retreat. However, Shang Wen Yulin shook her head. With her clear bright spiritual eye, she looked at Gui Li in the ghost fog and said, We can't retreat. According to the information your external avatar obtained, Gui Li is already in cahoots with some of the higher ups in the Purple Sun sect. If we don't deal with him, there will be endless troubles deal with him? Xu Han was stunned, he is at the late stage of foundation establishment, how do we fight? Shang Wen Yulin said, the eight direction evil breaking sword and the golden light divine incantation can restrain his skills, let's try to confront him first. Are you two done talking? Suddenly, two large and small evil ghosts burst out from the fog below, entangled with thick ghost fog, and bared their teeth, rushing toward Xu Han and Shang Wen Yulin. Xu Han was startled and immediately reached out to retrieve the eight direction evil breaking sword. Two sword lights were swung out, slashing the two evil ghosts. The two evil ghosts wailed, and the ghost fog on their bodies was broken by the golden light, revealing their true forms. It turned out to be a pair of large and small chained hammers. Xu Han activated his clear bright spiritual eye, allowing him to see through the ghost fog below clearly and accurately track Gui Li's movements. He let go of Shang Wen Yuelin and used the triple rotation avatar technique to split into three. His main body held the eight direction evil breaking sword, and the other two avatars respectively held the black claw and the pursuing sword, forming a circle in a battle ready stance. Lin Lin, since you say we can fight, I trust your judgment. You can't help with your current cultivation level, so go get my external avatar. I will test this old demon. Shang Wen Yulin nodded and immediately dived into the forest below to find Xu Han's external avatar. However, at this moment, a pair of black giant hands emerged from the ghost fog. The giant hands closed, trying to grab Shang Wen Yulin. None of you are escaping. Xu Han quickly swung two sword lights. The sword lights cut through the black giant claws that Gui Li had morphed from, covering Shang Wen Yulin's entrance into the forest. Gui Li frowned deeply. Soaring from below with thick ghost fog, looking at the eight direction evil breaking sword in Xu Han's hand with suspicion. With a magic treasure of pure yang and golden light divine incantation, you must be a disciple of the Great Fortune Sect. What is the Great Fortune Sect doing in the north of the Great Cloud? 
Great Fortune Sect? Xu Han snorted, I have no idea what you're talking about. Still playing dumb. Willy scolded, even if your Great Fortune Sect is a strong dragon, you have to curl up for me in the north of Great Cloud. Judging by your magic treasure, you must have a high status in the Great Fortune Sect. Capturing you and bringing you back for interrogation by the Sect Master would surely earn me great merits. Having said that, Guili rushed up holding the evil ghost hammers. His speed was so fast that Shu Han barely kept up. Thankfully, splitting into three to guard three sides and having the insight of clear bright spiritual eye, he was not overwhelmed by Guili's ghostly speed. Guili threw the two evil ghost hammers from a distance. The two fierce ghosts seemed to resurrect, baring their teeth and claws, and bit towards Shu Han's two avatars. The two avatars quickly defended with the black claw and pursuing sword. Meanwhile, Shu Han's main body charged at Gui Li's main body with the Eight Direction Evil Breaking Sword. The Eight Direction Evil Breaking Sword's flickering demon breaking light could restrain Gui Li's demonic skills. With one sword strike, Gui Li's demonic fish scale armor immediately protected his body, blocking Shu Han's eight consecutive sword lights. Kid, your magic tool is good, and your avatar technique is excellent but your cultivation level is too low, if you were at the late stage of foundation establishment, I would surely run away, but you are only at the early stage, so surrender. Shu Han's main body was unable to land a successful attack, while his avatars faced a significant crisis, the black claw and the pursuing sword were unleashed to counter the two evil ghost hammers, but the transformed evil ghosts swallowed the black claw and the pursuing sword directly chuckling eerily at Shu Han's avatars. Suddenly, Shu Han felt his spiritual consciousness attached to the two magic treasures was contaminated, and the two magic treasures were no longer responsive as if they were being digested within these two evil ghosts. The two evil ghosts then laughingly pounced on Shu Han's two avatars, suddenly returned to their original forms, and aimed at the avatar's crown. Seeing this, the main body of Shu Han immediately turned around, sprouting four pairs of sword wings on his back, spinning continuously in the air. The eight winged sword wings directly flung the evil ghost hammers, barely saving the two avatars. The avatars retrieved the black claw and the pursuing sword. These two magic treasures had suffered a certain degree of spiritual damage. Shu Han held the eight direction evil breaking sword, nervously watching the complacent Gui Li. If it weren't for the eight direction evil breaking sword suppressing this old ghost's skills and magic treasure, he would probably have been captured at first contact. The power gap was too big, and even the typically reliable triple rotation avatar technique had no effect because he couldn't break the defense. Shu Han bitterly laughed. Lin Lin, you want me to kill him, how is that possible? It would be more reasonable to escape using the six shadows escape technique, however. At this time, Shang Wenruolin had not returned, and he had to hold on no matter what, so he withdrew the two avatars, only using the eight direction evil breaking sword to confront this old ghost. Without this sword's protection, the avatars would be destroyed one by one, continuously using the eight direction evil breaking sword. A peak foundation establishment stage magic treasure, was too much of a drain on his magic power, he would soon be unable to support his avatars. Seeing Shu Han tucked within the four pairs of sword wings, no longer actively attacking, Gui Li sneered in contempt. Low cultivation level makes any magic treasure useless, listen to this requiem, it will send your soul to hell. Having said that, he picked up his Su owner, and began to play. The sound of the Su owner, which could control people's bodies and confuse their minds, sounded again. Shu Han dared not delay immediately reciting the golden light divine incantation, wrapping himself in indestructible golden light. However, this time it was different. Under the soul-claiming demonic sound, countless fierce ghosts emerged from the black fog below. Hundreds of ghosts roamed in the forest, turning into a fierce ghost tornado. Accompanied by the soul-claiming demonic sound, they swept towards Shu Han. 87. Slaying the enemy. The whirlwind of ghosts echoed with countless sinister laughs in sync with the deathly music, instilling a chill deep within Shu Han's soul. Frantically, he recited the golden light divine incantation, spinning midair from the eight-winged sword formed by the eight-direction evil breaking sword, 
countless little golden swords shot forth, round after round of golden sword rain ceaselessly annihilated the oncoming whirlwind of ghosts. Yet, Guili's ghastly Suona music didn't stop. These apparitions seemed as though they surged from the depths of hell, endless and relentless. Due to the high strain exertion of continuously firing sword rain from the eight direction evil breaking sword, Shu Han's spiritual power rapidly diminished. Gradually, the surrounding sword wings faded, and the volume of the sword rain diminished, barely holding back the approaching whirlwind of ghosts. Suddenly, strands of silk wrapped around Shu Han yanking him from the sky, evading the onrushing spectral whirlwind, Shang Wenyuelin had returned, her six harmony silk bracelet gleaming brightly in her hand. Standing before Shang Wenyuelin, Xu Han watched the likewise returning spectral whirlwind, he shattered two middle grade spirit stones directly, quickly absorbing the lost magic power, urgently speaking, Lin Lin, we simply can't withstand this. Only by fully urging the eight direction evil breaking sword can I barely break the defense. Let's retreat using the six harmonies shadow escape. Shang Wen Yulin, facing the encroaching spectral whirlwind, turned Shu Han around and earnestly spoke. If we retreat now, it will be hard to enter the immaculate realm. We must eliminate him here, but, the sudden onslaught of the spectral whirlwind prompted Shu Han to scoop up Shang Wen Yulin and directly flee on the eight direction evil breaking sword. There are no buts, Shang Wen Yulin stated solemnly, if I've guessed correctly, this man is a disciple of the devil music sect, the pure Yang supreme treasure, eight direction evil breaking sword, and the golden light divine incantation are specifically designed to break these types of demonic arts. Shu Han as long as you can exert 70% of the 8 direction evil breaking sword's power, you can slay him, this sword is a peak foundation establishment stage magic treasure, I'm only at the early, I can at most bring out 30% of its power. Gritting her teeth, Shang Wen Yulin responded, like last time, use my golden core to boost your power, then trigger the sky palace mysterious secret to increase your combat strength which should be enough to exert 70% of its power. Shu Han categorically refused. After the use last time, your golden core was severely depleted, it's only been half a year, we absolutely cannot use it again, let's retreat for now, we still have a small half year, we can plan long term. Shang Wen Yulin, pulling Shu Han's ear, said, I did not consult you, I know its own situation best, I don't need you to worry about me. Saying this, Shang Wen Yulin, without further ado, cupped Shu Han's face with both hands, her red lips directly landing on his. Immediately, the warm golden core transferred into Shu Han's body. Over the past six months, after absorbing fragments of Shang Wen Yulin's life giving golden core, Shu Han's body now held the same golden core origin. Now his ability to accommodate her golden core was even stronger, and the power it exerted far exceeded that of the past. A warm current began to circulate throughout Shu Han's body from Shang Wen Yulin's tender red lips, and his strength began to skyrocket dramatically. Gui Li, who had been pursuing with ease from the rear, suddenly felt Shu Han's aura skyrocketing, and immediately sensed trouble. A ghost head materialized in his palm and he fiercely shot it towards Shu Han. Shu Han sensed something was terribly wrong and immediately enveloped himself within the sword wings. However, the sword wings of the eight direction evil breaking sword had a surplus for offense but fell short in defense. The ghost head, transformed into a black light, easily penetrated the sword wings, striking the undefended back of Shu Han. He had no choice but to brace himself. However, suddenly, Shang Wen Yulin, hugging Shu Han, spun around fiercely, putting herself in front of him. At this moment, a nebulous white light shot out from beneath her robe. The ghost head smashed into the white light and melted instantly like ice and snow. Shang Wen Yulin didn't fare any better. Her face turned several shades paler, and a warm liquid entered Shu Han's mouth. Having lost her golden core and once again seriously injured, Shang Wen Yulin's eyes lost their vitality. Her rosy lips left Shu Han's mouth, and she collapsed into his arms. A thread of fresh blood seeped from the corner of Shu Han's mouth his hand trembling as he held the eight direction evil breaking sword. Immediately, the sky palace mysterious secret began to operate within his body. 
his aura expanding to the limit once more. In this instant, Xu Han's strength had ascended to the late foundation establishment stage. Gui Li's eyes were nearly bulging out. A mere early foundation establishment stage youngster had suddenly surged to the late foundation establishment stage. How is this possible? Swoosh. The closed eight-winged sword suddenly stretched out, dragging Xu Han's body to rapidly decelerate in the air. The oncoming golden light dispersed the approaching ghost mist. Xu Han, bathed in golden light, appeared like a deity of righteousness, but his face was as grim as a god of death. Run. A sense of fear finally sprouted in Gui Li's heart. The Eight Direction Evil Breaking Sword was his nemesis to begin with. Originally, Xu Han was in the early stage of the Foundation establishment, and he could completely play him to death with the pressure of a higher realm. But now, Xu Han's aura strangely surged to the late Foundation establishment, the same level as him, and the situation completely overturned. Gui Li turned around and ran. Xu Han's clear bright spiritual eye locked onto his figure. The eight-winged sword carried him straight up. At this moment, all of Xu Han's energy was concentrated on the eight-direction evil breaking sword in his right hand, the dazzling golden light briefly gathered like the noonday sun. Die. Crack. A golden thunderbolt as thick as a water barrel shot out, chasing after Gui Li. Gui Li was frightened by this extremely pure and positive force. Without thinking, he immediately bit off his own tongue, spit out a mouthful of dark blood, and muttered to himself, blood body explosion of the demon sect. Xu Han's clear bright spiritual eye immediately saw the problem, the old ghost's body actually began to split, seemingly wanting to explode his body to escape. Each piece of separating flesh carried his life imprint. As long as a piece survived, he could save his life. Although this effect was far less than the sixfold shadow escape. It was still a good move in a pinch. Damn it. Xu Han cried out in his heart. At this moment, his magic power was drained, and his body was on the verge of collapse due to the use of the Sky Palace mysterious secret. After one blow, there would be no strength to pursue. Was he really going to let this old ghost escape? Xu Han was unwilling, but he had no choice. Was he going to let Shang Wen be seriously injured for nothing? However, just as Gui Li was about to self-detonate, he suddenly felt many filaments wrapping around him, like a net that tightly bound him, making it impossible for him to split and explode. This, this is a golden core magic treasure. Boom. The thunderbolt transformed from the eight direction evil breaking sword directly shattered his head. Xu Han looked down. At this moment, Shang Wen Ruolin was leaning on his shoulder, panting heavily. The glow of the Six Harmony silk bracelet on her wrist flickered and then went out. She whimpered and slumped in Xu Han's arms, whispering, Injured me, how could I let you run away? Having said that, her complexion got worse and worse. Xu Han hurriedly transferred her golden core back to her. Shang Wen Yulin's complexion finally improved somewhat. Go, Xu Han, go see what's left of that demon cultivator. Xu Han supported her and asked worriedly, should I help you recover first? No need. Shang Wen Yulin pulled open her shoulder sleeve, revealing her snowy white shoulder. A layer of transparent scales appeared on her skin. She said, don't worry about me, I have personal armor to protect the body. Xu Han pulled up her clothes, nodded, and said, I understand, I will immediately go to inspect the old ghost's corpse. However, just as Xu Han was about to fly towards Gui Li's corpse, the headless corpse suddenly began to float slowly in the air. Alpha Strike, 48.1 to 64, by Osamayu. Book 1, Arc 4 Prologue, The Darkest Night, Swish. The captain's halberd cut through the air, cutting another large, zombified creature in half. The shockwave of the attack traveled outward, cutting down several dozen smaller zombies behind the creature, grass tigers, living swamps tri-horned converters, and so, so many grassbreakers. Almost every species found in the Radiant Sea seemed represented in the Endless Horde. The captain had even seen several Grand Elk sprinkled through their ranks, stripped of their gentle, timid nature. These zombified Grand Elk turned into engines of destruction. The undead's deteriorated state and lack of general intelligence meant their overall spirit control was only a fraction of what it had been in life. Ironically, 
that also meant the sheer physical might of the Grand Elk put them a step above the common rank and file. Coupled with defenders who had been taught all their lives to respect and protect the spirit beast who made their way of life possible, they were becoming a real problem. The captain whirled his halberd in the air, spinning it so fast that it became a blur to mortal eyes, then slammed it into the ground. The contained spirit energy rushed into the ground, keeping its momentum. In the blink of an eye, the ground surrounding the captain twisted and swirled for several dozen meters. A vortex of twisted earth and jagged stone spikes pushed their way out of the ground, impaling, crushing, or just flat out burying hundreds of undead. As a late state, golden spirit, cultivator, the captain might not have been able to summon or truly manipulate the elements like a shackle breaker had learned how to, but that didn't mean he wasn't without his tricks. After all, if the purpose of the first half of the mortal foundation realm was to reforge your body, first to wood, then stone, and finally iron, then the latter half was to polish your spirit. Many thought the spirit steps of bronze, silver, and gold were named such only for the color of one's spirit aura at each step, but the truth was a bit more complicated. To polish one's spirit was a literal step. Every creature accumulates crime and impurities during its life. The second half of Mortal Foundation was dedicated to cleaning away those impurities, literally scrubbing them away from your aura with spirit energy. As you did so, your original grimy, bronze aura would slowly reveal the silver shine underneath, culminating in a brilliant golden gleam. This scrubbing process not only prepared the cultivator to break their mortal shackles, but also taught them how to control their spirit energy properly. These skills would be the literal foundation on which all of a person's later cultivation would be based. Shackle breaking, cultivators, such as the Lord of the West Gate off in the distance, could directly manipulate the elements with their spirit energy. The dark fog appeared like a rumbling, 100 meter wide thundercloud from a distance. Flashes of lightning and the crash of thunder could even be heard from within. The Westgate matriarch floated in meditation within its center while other powerful family members surrounded her. Yet, if you got close enough, you'd see the cloud was actually a swarm of millions, possibly billions, of tiny, black iron balls, constantly swirling and striking each other, wherever the cloud passed. All that was left was a field of minced gore and burned remains. The captain could only stare in awe. The Thunderhead was said to be a powerful artifact passed down through the Westgate family since before the wandering cities had even been formed. Yet, despite its enormous power, rumored capable of suppressing even early step, earthly transcendence, it had always remained just that, a rumor. The costs of using such an artifact were immense, after all, if the Jade Walker families were breaking out their family treasures already, the situation must be far more dire than he thought. The captain pulled his halberd from the ground and took a deep breath. The surrounding guardians and adventurers who'd pulled back at his arrival pushed forward once more. Now that he'd broken this push by the undead, others could take over and reinforce the front. Even now, barriers were being raised as the undead rushed to fill the gap he'd created. Every inch they pushed the tide back was an inch farther away from the walls of the earth shrine and an inch away from the innocents who hid behind them. The captain took the time to catch his breath and restore some of his strength, he'd have a few moments before his next orders came in, he still wasn't quite used to all this rushing about, though, it had been decades since he'd been on the front lines like this, but as one of the stronger, golden spirit, cultivators, the Jade Walker command was making full use of him as a tide breaker. A sudden buzzing sound caught his attention, and he turned to see a large wasp-like creature land on his armored shoulder. Despite the loud roar of the chaotic battle, the creature's voice was clear and easily heard. Daddy, the captain tilted his head and raised an eyebrow as he asked, Why are you here, daughter? I thought you were coordinating with the general? The small drone wiggled and spoke again. I was the closest to you. We have an emergency. Sections C-34 through 37 have collapsed. The general wants you there right away. The captain's frown deepened, and he nodded, then turned toward the area he'd been told. Before he rushed off, he spoke to the drone one last time. Understood. Tell the general I'm on my way. The drone nodded and flew off. As the captain watched the drone fly toward the direction of the wall, 
He shook his head. The captain didn't know how General Westgate, Matriarch Westgate's husband and the commander of the Jade Walker Guardians, had found out about the Slate Walker children's new toys even before he had. But the man had instantly seen their strategic use. It was no exaggeration to say they had been instrumental in their defense efforts so far. Not only had the undead appeared, but several key communication arrays and transmission relays had gone totally haywire or been straight up attacked shortly after. Without the children's help, coordinating a defense would have been far more difficult and far more costly. The attacks on their communication network were worrying. However, it suggested that this wasn't just a random disaster but something more malicious, forcing the city to split its defenses between protecting the wall and stopping attacks from within. The captain stared back in the wall and whispered to himself, Please, stay safe, dash dash dash. Malaki sat at the small table across from the warehouse, staring at the chessboard before him. He furrowed his brow and reached for a piece. He paused, thinking, then switched to another piece, smiling. Malit wordlessly moved her knight, taking Malaki's bishop and trapping his queen. Malaki's smile flipped to a frown, and he glared at his wife. The old woman didn't return the glare, but stared at the warehouse across the street. She smiled slightly and spoke, they're doing well, if I say so myself. That little girl of the captain's, in particular, has quite the knack for this sort of thing. She might be quite the monster in a few centuries. Malaki didn't bother looking up from the board as he responded, his eyes totally focused on his next move. Bar, children playing in a bigger child's sandbox are still playing. A few new toys and some unexpected tricks don't a genius make. Mullet giggled and poked her husband's arm. You're just mad she pulled a fast one on you. Malaki slammed his hands into the table, causing the pieces to jump into the air, though they landed perfectly in place. What kind of psychopath replaces the sugar in their cookies with flame touched alabaster honey? Where the hell did a little girl even get a fifth circle reagent? Huh? Tell me that. Mullet looked away and whistled innocently. After a moment, she turned back and smiled, her voice playful. Come now, don't be such a grumpy pants. They were quite good, if I had to say so. Besides, if you were really that upset, you'd not be going through so much trouble to ensure they were safe. As if on cue, a formation surrounding the warehouse flickered, and a shadowy figure materialized on top of the roof. The figure panicked, leaping away but didn't make it far as they were instantly beset but over a dozen jade walker guardians who appeared from their hiding spots. Malaki didn't respond, only Tsketan moved another piece on his board, one that was instantly swiped by his wife's rook, a vein throbbing in his head. Malaki ground his teeth and huffed, why would I let some filthy cultists touch my kids? If we weren't on vacation, I'd squash this fragment myself and be done with this whole mess. Honestly. How could they have been so foolish as to not clean up their mess? Everyone knows that when you leave something rot, it keeps coming back. Mullet sighed and shook her head as she spoke. Now, come on, dear. You, more than anyone, should know Iris isn't someone so easily dissuaded, that one's always had the habit of popping back up at the most unapportioned times. The two were silent for a while, exchanging pieces on the board several times before Malaki asked. And if these idiots poke at things best left buried beneath the rot, Mullet paused mid-move. She held a piece in the air before setting it back down. She stared at her husband for a long moment and spoke. Then the adults will just have to remind the children why they should listen to their elders. Mullet picked up a different piece and placed it down. Checkmate. Malaki stared down at the pieces, then grumbled wordlessly before restarting the board entirely. Dash dash dash. Cutelon Emilia Luisa Francesca Banana Fanobobis Comcxi I sat on the tall chair at the back of the warehouse that General Westgate had brought her and the rest of the Slate Walker children to after she'd presented her plan to him. Not that a small child from a backwater village typically got to present strategic plans to the military commander of the fourth largest city in the Radiant Sea, but it was hard to ignore the large talking wasp when it flew directly in your face. Even harder when it kept reforming every time you tried to swat it away. When the walls of the earth shrine went up, the children of the Slate Walker village, being the curious people they were, naturally used the magic artifacts the Lord Protector had gifted them to peek over. 
Instead of something exciting or mysterious like they'd expected, Qutalun had to use all of her leadership skills to stop the children from falling into a blind panic at what they'd seen. Her first thought had been to run to her father, this was beyond her, beyond any of them. Still, she knew she couldn't just do nothing, either. Her father had always taught her she had to rise up in times of trouble, that she had to be the shield and wall that would protect her friends when they needed it. Even the Lord Protector said he expected great things from her, if she did nothing. How could she ever expect to face either of them again? But part of her knew that for as powerful and wise as her father seemed to her sometimes, this was beyond even him, as well. Even her father couldn't fight this kind of battle. So she did the only thing she could think to do. She went to those who could. It had only taken a short while to explain what she and the other children could do, though it took slightly longer to convince the man she was telling the truth. Once she had, he'd sent an entire squad of guardians to escort the children to the warehouse. Now every child was organized into several groups, spread out across the open floor as they relayed information and orders to the various parts of the battlefield. Several of the younger children had difficulty. But an overseeing guardian stood by with each group to help coordinate and direct them as needed. Several of the children's parents had even followed along, unwilling to let their children leave their side, despite the guardian's assurance they would be perfectly safe. Her own mother and a few others hopped from group to group, bringing refreshments, calming children, and generally addressing any needs that might come up. They'd even worked out a system where one child's wasp, as the Lord Protector had called them, could project the video feed from another on the field to better coordinate and identify threats. Qutalun had just cut her own feed after giving her father his orders before taking a deep, stuttering breath. She struggled to fight back the tears forming in her eyes, but they fell regardless as a large, calloused hand patted her on the top of her head. The young girl looked up to see General Westgate smiling warmly down at her. He spoke with a hoarse voice broken by centuries of yelling orders, yet one that still somehow held a gentle, if commanding, tone that reminded her of her father. Your father is a powerful man, he'll be fine, you're doing well, young one, but do not falter yet, we still have much to do. Qutalun paused, then wiped away her tears. She looked up at the general and nodded, her small fists clenched tight. Then, with a wave of her hand, she brought her video feedback online, ready to deliver the next order. 18. Book 1, Lesson 49, So you're outnumbered, surrounded by the enemy, and low on supplies. See rule number 20. Dying. The large pillar cut through the crowd of undead and slammed into the torp, lifting it into the air and flipping it several times. At easily three times the torp's size and swinging a pillar of fused stone and iron as thick as one of the torp's legs, the zombified beast lord was becoming a real thorn in Alpha's side. The blows weren't enough to actually damage Alpha, but each one carried enough force and sheer momentum to send the several hundred ton war machine tumbling. Even attempting to lock down his legs with anchors wasn't working. The ground was too soft and too many bodies surrounded them. To make matters worse, his primary weapons were useless. An opening shot with the B-55 Vijaya had blown several meter wide chunks out of the creature, but they had quickly filled in with stone and metal. His energy weapons had fared slightly better, taking longer for the creature to heal, but the drain on his core wasn't becoming a problem. His smaller caliber rounds were even worse. The smaller metal slugs did little to no damage to the massive creature and were even absorbed and used to heal other wounds. It was eating his bullets. The only weapon he had that seemed to be even somewhat effective was his prototype, Crystal Rail. The Crystal Rail rounds didn't have the same penetration as his more modern, standard rounds, but their explosive nature carved baseball-sized chunks of stone and metal from the creature's hide wherever they struck. Better yet. These wounds seemed harder to heal than even the blasts from his energy turrets. Maybe the lingering energy from the blast disrupted whatever method the creature used to heal. He didn't know. Whatever the case, Alpha was annoyed that such an otherwise minor opponent had managed to hard counter him so well. Would the same thing have happened if he'd not gone for the overkill the first time he'd killed the oversized murder bird? Or was this a deliberate modification specifically to counter him? That toothy bastard Dugusler had made it seem he and his people had been watching Alpha for a while now, 
Alpha wasn't sure which was more concerning, that there might be more natural creatures out there that could shut down anything he threw at them, or that they could be so easily made. If nothing else, it was a lesson in not over-specializing, bring a gun for every occasion, as they, Alpha, say. That would have to be one of the first things he did once he established a base. Instead of just dreaming about it. As for the pain in his side, Alpha had a little surprise cooking in the oven for him. All he needed to do was wait for. Ah, there they were. A swirling cloud of dust and wind approached from behind. Suspended in the air were several dozen pulsing, black crystals. As the swirling dust cloud approached, Alpha disengaged with the giant stone bird and opened a hatch in the top. The dust cloud blew past Alpha, and the black crystals streamed into the opening. The dust cloud then doubled back and coalesced into a figure standing on top of the top. Number 7 fell to their knees, panting. Their mask slid upward in several sections, relieving only their mouth as they coughed up a thick, black sludge onto Alpha's back. You. Number seven's body pulsed with blue light, and a strange black fog pushed itself away from them, dissipating into the air. The human stood on shaky legs and spoke to Alpha. I don't know what you're planning, but you better hope this works. I'm not doing that again. Those things aren't normal cause. Alpha laughed and dodged several earth spikes that shot out of the ground under him while pulping a dozen smaller undead as they tried to bite and tear at the torp's legs. His internal factory got to work on the black crystals as he answered. I have no idea. No better time to find out than the present, though. It'll take about 15 minutes to process everything. Quicker if you can buy me some time to focus. Number 7 stared at the surrounding undead sea and the large beast lord slowly approaching them. They sighed and spoke. Anything to end this slog. Give me a warning before you do whatever it is you're going to do, though. I have a strong feeling I don't want to be anywhere near it. They then leapt into the air, once more dissolving into a swirling gust of wind and dust. The swirling wind soon turned into a roaring vortex as it circled around Alpha's position, pushing the larger undead creatures back while cutting the smaller ones into ribbons. Only the massive stone figure of the Beast Lord was making any progress, though the high winds hampered it. In the eyes of the storm, Alpha sat down and focused his attention on what he needed to do. His work on arrays had steadily progressed over the last few days. One benefit of being an AI is the ability to split your focus across multiple projects at once, at least if you have the hardware. After completing the storage arrays, Alpha had compressed and combined them into a battery capable of storing the energy from the heart crystals, or cores as number 7 had called them. Well, he called it a battery, but in practice, it was little more than dozens of storage arrays stacked and connected to form a half a meter x 0.5 x half a meter cube. In a way, it reminded Alpha of pictures of old-timey heat sinks like those used before quantum heat dumps became mainstream. The resulting battery was far more space efficient than storing the crystals and let Alpha turn all the crystals into ammunition with little to no waste. The second battery that he'd just finished printing was only roughly half the size, but using what he'd learned from the prototype, it was just as, if not more, efficient. He'd originally intended to use it to drain the larger crystal in the black box, but desperate times call for desperate measures. Over the next few minutes, Alpha steadily drained the energy of the collected black crystals into the VR.2 battery. There was no time to check how the black energy differed from those found in the normal cores, but there seemed to be enough overlap that the arrays worked as intended, even if the battery began leaking an ominous black fog. While he did that, Alpha's internal factory was working overtime to carve and chip the drained crystals, quickly cutting the dozens of knuckle sizes crystals into thousands of splintered shards. Thankfully, once drained of the energy, the black crystals behaved just as a typical core would, making the process simple enough. Soon, all the parts came together for his newest toy, here's hoping it worked like the simulations said it should. Just in time, too, as the ground rumbled and a giant stone figure erupted underneath Alpha, it seemed whatever little remained of the Beast Lord's thinking mind and grown tired of trying to force its way through the wall of wind so it went under it instead. The Beast Lord reared up to its full 50 meter height and fell on Alpha, trying to use its massive size and weight to crush the torp. Several pillars sprang from the torp's back, 
slamming into the small mountain of stone and metal. It was enough to keep Alpha from being pressed into the ground, but the massive weight was nearly too much even for the torp, and its joints creaked under the pressure, even as they were driven deeper into the soft earth. Soon, Alpha was totally enveloped. Dash dash. The swirling hurricane surrounding them sputtered and died as Number 7 rematerialized in the air. The masked figure hovered in place, staring at the unmoving hill, wondering if Alpha's ploy had failed. If it had, Number 7 would have to retreat and leave their new friend to his fate. They might be working together. For now, but that didn't. The middle section of the Beast Lord suddenly rose, then bulged outward before exploding in a torrent of metal shrapnel. Through the wind summoned to block the debris, Number 7 saw a small object rocket into the sky. Number 7 tracked the object as it rose higher and higher, slowing down as it neared its peak. At the top of its arc, Number 7 finally identified the object. It was a large metal cube. Number 7 only had a brief moment to study the object, wondering what it could be before it violently erupted into a massive black fireball. As the fireball expanded, hundreds of smaller, shining objects were ejected in all directions. After a second more, these two exploded, lighting up the sky in dark light and further spreading out even smaller sparkling objects, covering tens of squared kilometers in all directions, like glittering snow. The sparkling objects slowly fell back to the earth. Number 7 couldn't tell what the objects were at this distance, but they burned in their spirit sight, with rotting spirit energy. They almost looked like overloaded. Behind their mask, Number 7's eyes suddenly went wide. At the same time, Alpha called out from the rapidly sealing hole in the Beast Lord's stone body. This is the part where you want to run. Number 7 didn't need to be told twice. They become one with the wind and rushed away from the area as fast as their depleted energy could take them. Even then, they barely make it out of the area as the first sparkling object contacted the writhing horde below. From the sky, Number 7 watched as the first object hit one of the large golems, then erupted into a massive black fireball several meters across. Then another, and another then a dozen more. Soon, the prairies turned into a black hellscape, as thousands of black fireballs filled every inch for tens of kilometers in all directions from where they'd left Alpha and the Beast Lord. After what felt like an eternity but couldn't have been more than a few breaths, the last sparkling objects fell, and the prairies went silent. What had once been a seemingly endless sea of undead had been reduced to a charred wasteland of black ash and sputtering dark flames. That single move had obliterated 80% of the horde easily, with only stragglers on the edges having survived. Number 7 hovered in the air, utterly unable to process what they'd just witnessed. After a long moment, Number 7 snapped back to reality and flew deeper into the wasteland. A moment later, they hovered over a small hill. If they hadn't known this melted, warped lump had been the Beast Lord only moments before, they would have thought it a slag dumping site of the world's worst blacksmith. They couldn't even feel any spirit energy circulating through the stone anymore. Number 7 stared at the hill and questioned if they should try digging Alpha out, or if the madman had perished in his own attack. Their question was answered for them the next moment, when the small hill suddenly rumbled. Number 7 put up their guard, but instead of the Beast Lord rising from the ashes, the hill crumbled away, relieving a solid blue dome composed of interlocking hexagons. The dome shimmered once, then melted away. Alpha stood from the center of the doom, the creature's insect-like legs stretching out to push his large metal body into the air. Alpha turned and looked up at Number 7 hovering in the air. The two locked gazed for a silent moment before Alpha threw his stubby arms into the air and yelled. Woohoo, let's do it again. Number 7 stared down at the insane creature before pointing at them and yelling back. Are you insane? What the hell was that? I thought you had a plan. Not that you were going to blow yourself up. Alpha just looked up and shrugged before responding. Rule number 20, if you're not willing to shell your own position, you're not willing to win. Number 7 gawked, speechless. While they tried and failed to form any kind of response to that ludicrous statement, the ground beside Alpha stirred. A figure dragged itself out of the rubble, the much smaller, much more fleshy form of the Beast Lord. The creature, or what remained of it, was barely recognizable. What little flesh hadn't been replaced with arrayed metal was burned black and rotting in places. 
its lower half was missing entirely, and it slowly crawled toward Alpha on its stomach with a single, warped flipper. Despite falling apart with each inch it moved, the creature's empty. Black high holes never strayed from Alpha. It groaned and snapped a twisted beak at him as if its entire existence was powered by nothing more than pure malice and hatred, for all number seven knew about the undead, that might have very well been the case. Bang! Before the beast lord could crawl more than a few feet, however, a single thundercrack cut through the silence of the wasteland. The beast lord's head exploded like a rotten melon, producing a small flash of black light. The beast lord's flippers stretched out one last time, desperately reaching out to Alpha before collapsing to the ground. A few seconds later, what remained of the beast lord's body collapsed in on itself, even the arrayed metal disintegrating away into fine dust. Alpha and number seven stared at the remains as a gentle wind whisked them away. After a moment of silence, Alpha spoke in a cheerful voice. Well, that was fun. Let's get on our way. The path is clear now. The creature then turned and strolled off into the distance. Number seven turned and looked toward the distant temple and saw that, indeed, the way was clear. What few undead remained between them and their destination still wandered the prairies, with a few making their way toward them, but their numbers were so pitiful compared to before. They would be no obstacle at all. Still, number seven hesitated. Should they continue on? After seeing something like that, they weren't so sure anymore. While they had a reputation to uphold, a job was just a job. After long contemplation, number seven sighed and flew off toward Alpha. They'd already made it this far. Might as well see things to the end. 20. Book 1. Lesson 50. Roll a d20 to check for traps. Alpha poked the twisted, broken pieces of metal he pulled from what remained of the Beast Lord's larger body. Number 7 had called it a, spiritual armor, but what that meant in context, they couldn't say. It was something even they had little information on, as it was supposedly something only the most talented were capable of. When Alpha asked if that meant the Beast Lord was a big shot, his mysterious friend shook their head as they spoke. No, while I wasn't around when Kuzanagi first appeared, I've heard the stories. The creature was little more than a glorified bandit with delusions of grandeur. He might have caused trouble for the mortals, but once he started stepping on the toes of the actual players, he didn't last long. That someone like him could form a spiritual armor, says there's more going on here than it first appears. Alpha turned to the masked human and asked with a chuckle, you mean more than an army of undead and giant, swirling clouds of darkness? Number seven stared back, silent. Alpha sighed and tossed the metal scrap away. He'd scavenged a sizable portion from the remains, but most of it was too contaminated to use, at least not without refining beyond what his internal factory was capable of. For a moment, he'd considered using another nanite seed, but decided against it. He'd gathered enough scrap to at least resupply. Anything else would be a waste for now. What he'd really been hoping to find was more array samples. Unfortunately, there weren't many that survived, and those that did were so badly warped and damaged that Alpha couldn't deduce what their original shape had been, making them useless. He heard the recording of the thick arrays carved into the metal portion of the Beast Lord's actual body, but that had dissolved into ash. With nothing to actually test, he would have to copy them himself, and experience had already proven how dangerous that could be. Nonetheless, Alpha was tempted. The power of these arrays and the strange energy that power them, was proving to be more than just a curiosity at this point. His latest toy was proof enough of that. Granted, their, as yet unnamed, prototype was going to need a lot of refining, but for a spur of the moment concept, it had more than proven worth of further development. Though that development would have to start from the ground up. Cluster bombs, as a concept, had been widely abandoned by the Federation. When dealing with the level of augmentation and equipment commonly found on a galactic scale battlefield, spreading out your firepower typically wasn't a good move. You got better results with targeted surgical strikes when even the common foot soldier could shrug off a sting of explosions like that. When the enemy couldn't, then orbital bombardment was the go to. But where cluster bombs had gone out of style, one similar concept was as popular as ever fireworks. Being one of the ruling four species and one of the most populous, 
human culture had spread far and wide, including the ancient art of blowing things up with style. Modern firework shows were no longer limited to plant wide spectacles, but could span entire systems. It had taken a little jury rigging, but modifying one of the smaller fireworks designs into a wide area dispenser for overcharged core fragments had worked like a charm. Getting some much firepower out of more conventional explosives would have proven difficult, given the size restraints. Thankfully, the core shards were relatively stable until they passed their threshold. It was just a matter of stuffing a shell with the core shards and his miniaturized storage array, then getting the timing right. If there was one thing Alpha was good at, it was blowing things up good. With time ticking away, and not able to salvage anything of real value, Alpha made the call to continue on, with much of the undead army reduced to smoldering piles of ash. The rest of the trip was relaxing by comparison. Only 30 minutes later, the pair stood under the massive walls. Alpha looked up and whistled. That's impressive. I'd have never thought these people could build something like this. Number 7 landed on Alpha's back and crossed their arms, looking toward the top of the wall. They laughed in response. They didn't. The Prima Earth Temple and all the Earth Shrines in the Radiant Sea were built long before anyone stepped foot in these lands. The most popular theory is that it's, hashtag huge JD it percent built. Not that anyone can explain how a, hashtag huge JD it percent got past the dollar and hash and hashtag D it without succumbing to its wrath. Alpha nodded along like he knew what half of that was. The wall was an impressive construct. 100 meters of solid stone without a single seam or cut along its length, which itself stretched several dozen kilometers in either direction. He'd tried scouting over the walls several times on the way there, with, wasps with no luck. The closer to the wall they'd gotten, the stronger the interference. He'd already lost contact with the drones he'd left with the children and, it would have been an impressive construct even in a Federation world, let alone on a planet like this. Was this more proof of an outside force, or were the people of this world more capable than he suspected? Number 7 pointed to the south and said, there's a gate about 4 kilometers that way. That's our best point of entry. The enemy likely knows that too, so expect heavy resistance. Number 7 leapt off the torp and started walking toward the gate. Alpha turned and looked that direction, before turning back to the wall. His optical plate flashed, and a thin red laser scanned the wall. The AI crunched the data and nodded, before turning back to Number 7 and speaking. No need. No 7, stopped and turned. He didn't get to question what Alpha meant before the torp stood up on its hind legs. The tips of the front legs bubble and flowed before transforming into large, spiked claws. Number 7's eyes went wide under their mask, and they rushed forward, yelling, No, wait, the walls are. The torp then fell forward, slamming into the wall and causing it to rumble. Its claws sank easily into the hard stone. Number 7 finished speaking too late, spelled. Alpha's side optics spun and focused on number 7 as he asked, There what, now? The wall flashed red as thousands of intricate, jerking patterns appeared over its surface, reminding Alpha of flickering flames. At first Alpha thought they were arrays, but unlike the static patterns of arrays, these lights were dynamic, constantly shifting and floating several millimeters above the surface of the wall, like holograms. Alpha turned his focus to the new phenomenon. Oh, suddenly, the patterns swirled and converged on Alpha's legs. The stone wall surrounding the connected legs began to rapidly heating and soon the stone was so hot that it glowed a bright white. Alpha stared at the white hot stone and laughed. Come on now, you're gonna have to try harder than that. The torp armor was strong enough to take hits from orbital defense lasers. A bit of hot rock wasn't even going to peel the paint. Number 7 silently stared, then chucked and shook their head. Alpha turned to the masked figure and asked, Well, are you coming? Number 7 didn't bother responding, and simply leapt back onto the torp. Alpha pulled the torp up, then pulled one leg out of the walk and slammed it further up the wall, where it stuck firmly. Again, the red holograms flashed red and converged on the leg, heating the stone until it glowed. In such a manner, Alpha slowly scaled the 100 meter wall. About 30 meters up, the lights changed. They transformed from red flickering flames into a green swirling pattern. 
the stone cooled and in its place, a cutting, gale force wind pounded Alpha from different directions, seemingly totally at random. This new trap was a little more tricky than the last. The wind itself wasn't very dangerous, but the torp's large profile meant they risked being ripped off the wall with each step. Eventually number 7 had to step up and help to redirect some of the strong wind with their mysterious power. At 60 meters, the lights again changed. This time they became a blight blue, with a jagged pattern that spread across the surface. Suddenly, the temperature plummeted, and a thick, icy covering covered the wall. The icy shell grew thicker with each passing moment, and was harder than it looked, sometimes taking several strikes from the torp to break through to the stone wall underneath. To make matters worse, if Alpha took too long, the ice would begin creeping up the torp's leg, making it harder to pull free. Overall, it took 10 minutes to scale the wall with all the obstacles, but Alpha finally pulled the torp over the lip of the edge and onto the top of the wall. It was spacious enough to fit three torps from front to back with ease. Alpha turned and gazed out over the wall. Finally, he had a clear view. Fudge. His rangefinder was placing the large, glowing pyramid he assumed was their destination at over 100 kilometers away. It sat in the middle of what Alpha could only describe as a sprawling metropolis stretching out in front of him. In many ways, it reminded him of the ruins he'd found with the other humans except someone was obviously taking good care of this place, even if only a fraction of the buildings appeared to be in use. In fact, if Alpha's calculations were right, the entire human population of Jade Walker City, and all the smaller cities and villages connected to it, would still only take up about a third of space here. Why was there such a large city here? Why did it seem mostly abandoned when there were so many people wandering the prairies? There was a mystery here, he knew. But like many things recently, it would have to wait. Number 7 leapt off the torp and landed on the wide wall, and whistled. Wow, now that's a view. I'd heard the Prima temples were large, but I'd only ever seen the wind temple from the ground. Air transport is strictly for the priests. This is something else. Alpha turned to Number 7 and asked, Wind temple? I thought this was the Earth temple. Number 7 folded their arms and nodded before responding. It is. There are four Prima temples on the Skybreaker continent. The Earth, Wind and Fire temples are all on the mainland, while the Water Temple is at the bottom of the hole on Abyssal Plunge Island. Terrible name. But the Abyssal Knights are known for their eccentricities. Alpha turned back to the city and responded. Huh. Neat. After a moment of silence, Alpha spoke up. So, there's fire, wind, water, and earth, right? Number 7 nodded, that's correct, Alpha continued, just like the traps on the wall, Number 7 paused, then confirmed, yes, that wouldn't be correct, I would assume whoever did the spell work for these walls wanted to keep with a the theme, it's common enough, Alpha nodded and replied, I see, I see, hey, Number 7, correct me if I'm wrong, but I remember only three traps on the climb up, Number 7 stood silent for a moment before sighing, well. Fuke. In the blink of an eye, a shifting yellow pattern that reminded Alpha of a sand garden, lit up under number seven's feet. At the same moment, a large, square pillar shot out of the top of the wall at a 45 degree angle and slammed into number seven. The masked figure was sent flying back the way they'd come, flipped several times like a rag doll, before eventually dissolving into motes of air. They materialized back on the ground a few seconds later. Alpha watched the scene in silence, seeing they were fine. Alpha felt it their obligation and duty as their companion. To point and laugh, he even turned up the volume on his external speakers so that he was sure number 7 could hear him fine. Alpha was such a good friend. Nevertheless, Alpha thought he should probably go retrieve them. After all, number 7 was his map. But as Alpha turned around, a familiar flowing yellow pattern lit up under the top. Double fudge. Dash dash dash. 20. Book 1, Lesson 51. Often, the best solution to a roadblock in life is through it. Alpha stared at the giant magic wall, grinding his gears. Literally, since when had a wall ever stopped him? This was ridiculous. He demanded to speak to the wall's manager, but every time he tried to scale the wall, it would throw something new at him. The first three traps seemed totally random. 
both in element and style, each time one attempt might have seen the first 30 meters turn into burning tar, only for it to spew toxic, choking gas the next time. The traps were varied as they were frustrating, even if none of them could really hurt Alpha. The final trap, though, was always the worst. Perhaps because this was the Earth Temple? The last trap was always Earth aligned and always at the top. The first two attempts, they'd realized it was motion activated, move too much, or move toward the city edge, and it would trigger, throwing the invader into the air 100 meters up. On their third attempt, Alpha had tried to cheat by leaping across the wall's width. As soon as he'd cleared the wall, it had actually extended to block him with a wall of stone. On the fourth attempt, they tried something different. Instead of going over, they would try going under. That had failed as well. Alpha sent a swarm of nanites into the ground to scout for weaknesses, only to find that the wall extended underground several hundred meters, several times that of the wall on the surface. In retrospect, that made sense. Alpha had already seen several wildlife species capable of burrowing underground at high speeds. Normal walls would prove no barrier at all to such creatures. Digging a pit large enough for the torp to fit into would take far more time than they had. At that point, they might as well try their luck with the gatehouse. Number 7 suggested just that by the sixth attempt, but Alpha refused to be beaten by a wall. It wasn't even about getting inside anymore, now. It was personal. On the eighth. Alpha stopped and really observed each trap as it activated. Whatever these holographic lights were, they appeared similar to arrays, yet they weren't. When he asked his masked companion about them, number seven shrugged and said, Not a clue. I'm not a mage. You don't get many of that type around here. They prefer the Gaia continent across the sea. Any mage you find around these parts would be a beginner in comparison. Not the kind of person that could ever touch on this level of spell work. Oh, a different continent could mean different resources. Alpha filed that little tidbit away for later and turned his focus back to the wall. He turned to number seven and said, Well then, if going over the wall will not work, and going under it is a bust, there was only one reasonable solution. Number seven sighed and started walking to the gate as they spoke. Finally. Let's stop wasting time and get to the gate. No doubt our ruckus has drawn attention, and they've reinforced it by now. Alpha laughed and responded. Why would we worry about that? We just need to make our own gate. Number seven paused, then slowly turned to stare at the AI. Dash dash. Number seven stood cross-armed next to the mysterious Lord Protector, or Alpha as he'd named himself. Both stared into the large, shimmering bubble formation as the dozen flying slimes zoomed around inside, constructing something. Number seven would be lying if they said they weren't a little surprised. Time dilation formations were among the most difficult and expensive ones to create. They took centuries to master, and maintaining them required pre-built structures designed specifically for that purpose. Not only that, but even stronger formations could only speed up or slow down the passaging time by a small margin, roughly 40 to 60 percent depending on their quality. That might not seem a lot, but when some pill refining or cultivation techniques could take decades to complete, these formations could shave years off the process. Yet, Alpha had set up such a formation with little more than a dozen square boxes in minutes. Even more amazing, the dilation was one scale of magnitudes, not percentages. Whatever these boxes were, they were artifacts that even the great sects would fight wars over. Part of number seven wanted to grab the boxes and make a run for it. The mission be damned. The value of these artifacts alone would have been worth a hundred such missions and that was saying a lot. Archimedes might not have been the strongest, most talented, or even the wealthiest member of the camp, but he was a professional. Archimedes had become somewhat of a boogeyman to the rich and powerful of the world, he'd never once failed to successfully kidnap someone and get away with it. Many paid a hefty sum in ransoms over the years or to be put on the untouchables list, at the very least. And as Archimedes' avenger, number seven had a right to everything he'd left behind. But number seven quickly discarded that idea. Even if they disregarded the danger of Alpha and his strange abilities, this was no longer just a mission of personal gain. If it really was true that there was an army of Iris under the Radiant Sea, then things would only get more complicated from here. Every faction on Relictus, 
big or small, light or dark, orthodox or unorthodox, were bound to work together by the undead accords. Iris army couldn't have destroyed mortal worlds before, petty rivalries, old grudges, and disagreements all fell away in the face of the undead and their world's very survival. Number 7 had already sent news back to the camp through their own means. The word should be spreading even as they stood there. The question was, would it already be too late? Number 7 turned and spoke to Alpha in a flat voice. Dot you know this isn't going to work, right? Anyone with the slightest bit of experience could tell you this was a stupid idea. Alpha turned and stared down at them with those strange red eyes. As the ancient proverb of the Federation goes, if it looks stupid, but it works, it's not stupid. Number 7 stared back in silence before turning back to watch the flying slimes work. After a moment, they spoke up again. The more I learn about your people, the more worried I am. Alpha laughed and responded. You'll get used to it. Dash dash. Alpha monitored the translite bubble for irregularities. He'd been worried about using any translite technology ever since the space squid incident, but lucky for him, that appeared to be a one-off event. All the readings came back well within normal parameters. Then again, maybe that was strange, given all the weird interference in the area currently. Alpha wasn't going to look a gift horse in the mouth, though. Not after how much this setup was going to cost him. The translite nodes themselves weren't too expensive. But he'd had to deploy a few nanite seeds in the area to them set up. That wasn't even considering the special alloys he had to sacrifice in his storage to build a drill head of the core drill. He was building. Their core drill wasn't normally something he should have had access to. It was equipment designed for deep mantle mining on planets designated for scrapping. He'd requested the blueprints for it on a previous mission and never used it again. Nanite miners were more efficient for surface level mining, and the special equipment required to survive planet mantles and establish proper mantle mines was expensive. Lucky for Alpha, he needed none of that. The current build was little more than a rushed, stripped down version of a proper core drill but it should be enough to bust through a couple dozen meters of stone. Better yet, since most of the materials were going into the drill head, he could come back and salvage it once all this mess was over. There would be no retrieving the nanites, but the alloys could be easily repurposed. It was a risk, but depending on how well the enemy had reinforced the gate, Alpha may have used just as many supplies to break through there. He much preferred the known cost he could later salvage versus an unknown cost against an unknown number of enemies. Twenty minutes later, the assembly drones inside the translite bubble finished their task, and the translite nodes were collected. As the bubble collapsed, the stripped down skeleton of the core drill revealed itself. On the surface, it was unimpressive, little more than a metal drill head roughly the size of the torp, with a carriage behind where the torp could lock into place. Nevertheless, it was Federation tech. So how could it be that simple? The next part was going to hurt, though. Alpha mentally grimaced but gave the command. The assembly drones moved to surround the drill, then attached themselves. Over the next few seconds, the drones dissolved one by one, their nanites breaking down to become the various internals and circuitry required to finish the construct. That would mean those nanites would be lost to Alpha and would have to be rebuilt using another seed. Costly, but necessary. The various delicate components needed weren't something he could make alone with just the Torp's internal factory, but the same nanites that made up the assembly drones and the Torp's nanite skin, for that matter, could mimic them. He could salvage the drill head and the skeleton, but all of those internals would have to be reprocessed all over again. The deed done. Alpha approached the finished core drill, and stepped into the carriage. His torp slotted neatly into place as several magnetic clamps engaged and Alpha interfaced with the drill's systems. The next moment, the back of the torp clicked, then slid away with a hiss, revealing a small seated compartment and a short ramp. The cockpit was mostly a vestigial component for most AI-driven torp, but Alpha had found it useful enough to keep. It was quite useful for transporting living guests. Of course, he'd remembered to remove any form of cockpit controls. You only made that mistake once. It was a tight squeeze for most species, but not too bad, and if they didn't fit in the cockpit, Alpha could always shove them into his cargo, 
that was typically a last resort, though, overexposure to spatial expansion tended to be unhealthy for biologicals. Despite the need for constant expansion to support their growing population, that was the primary reason the Federation regulated the technology to cargo and manufacturing. Alpha called out to Number 7, who'd been standing by the wayside in silence. Are you coming? We've already lost enough time here. Let's finish this. Number 7 stood wordlessly for a moment, before throwing up their arms and walking toward the open hatch, and saying, In for a penny, in for a pound, I guess. I agree. Let's get this over with. They crawled into the small cockpit, and the hatch silently closed behind them. Number 7 secured. Alpha turned their core drill toward the wall, the ground rumbling under their combined weight. The drill head started spinning, slowly at first, then faster and faster, until it became a whistling blur that threw up a cloud of dust on either side. Then it contacted the wall, and Alpha muttered to himself, Time to see what's stronger, Federation stubbornness or magical bullcrap. 17. Book 1, Lesson 52, The Rabbit Hole Always Goes Deeper Than It First Appears. Hey ho, hey ho, it's off to work, we go, comma. Alpha whistled to himself as the drill slowly dug through the wall. As mundane as the stone wall appeared, it was surprisingly tough, no doubt more magical bullcrap, but it seemed even magic had its limits while Federation grit and resourcefulness were limitless. Despite the wall's resistance, both physical and magical, their core drills, special alloy was making quick work of it. Quick being subjective, that was, at a little over a meter every five minutes it would still take some time for them to break through the several dozen meters wide wall. Even after an hour and a half, they were still less than one third through the wall. The bulky frame of the drill barely passed the lip of the tunnel. At the rate it was taking, they still had a few hours to go before they broke through. So Alpha thought he'd pass the time with some singing. Of course, not everyone appreciated the classics, and someone had to complain. Number seven's voice sounded over the cockpit comes, must you sing? I hardly think this is the time, besides, you have horrible rhythm, yes, yes, I must, Alpha responded, the back seat doesn't get radio privileges, I find myself constantly surprised by the nonsense that escapes your mouth, number seven responded flatly, Alpha chuckled and said, I know, right, it helps to, rumble, what was that? Number 7 sharply asked from the cockpit, nothing, Alpha responded, maybe a little too quickly because Number 7 bite back, what do you mean nothing, it sure as hell sounded like something, Alpha paused and thought before correcting himself, ok, so, try not to freak out, Number 7 yelled back, their voice an octave higher, what reason would I have to freak out, Alpha paused the drill and answered, Weeeeel, the tunnel may have kind of, sort of, collapsed behind us, for a long moment, number 7 was silent, and Alpha was worried something might be wrong, so he spoke through the comms again, hey, number 7, buddy, you still Al? The torps alarm systems blared to life as they reported massive atmospheric pressure and what his analytics sub AI was calling a mini hurricane inside the cockpit, not that it would do number 7 any good. The torp's cockpit was hermetically sealed to withstand various atmosphere conditions and compositions. It could even survive under the stress of vacuum or deep sea pressure. A few moments later, number 7 rematerialized in the cockpit, sweating and panting. Alpha spoke once number 7 calmed down. All better? Did you get it out of your system? Number 7 snapped. Screw you. This is your fault. Let me out of here. You might be trapped, but I might still squeeze through the gaps before the wall reseals itself. I'll not die because of your stupidity. How did I ever let you talk me into GE, Yowl? Alpha shocked number 7 with the built-in defibrillator into the pilot seat. It was part of the original design meant to resuscitate the pilot in case of a critical failure or loss of consciousness. Alpha had kept it for other reasons. Look, stop asking questions. Once number seven stopped shaking, Alpha spoke into the cockpit. Stop being a worry what? We're fine. I get buried alive all the time. Just a minor setback. Nothing to worry about. Number seven yelled back, their voice strained. What do you mean nothing to worry about, you utter fool? Do you not realize we're stuck under several tens of thousands of tons of solid stone? These walls are made with the bones of greater elementals. 
not only are they totally impervious to spirit energy, but they'll actively suck us dry. Eventually, the stone will seal us in, and we'll be unable to cultivate or gather energy. These walls will be our tomb. Ha! Huh. Lots of unfamiliar words there. Alpha filed those away and ran cross checks through his lexicon in the background. While he did that, Alpha responded. As I was saying, we'll be fine. Trust old Betsy, she'll get us through. Number 7 threw their arms into the air, as much as they could in the tight cockpit at least, and yelled back, You're not list. Oh, will you stop that? Alpha shocked his masked companion with the defibrillator again. Then once more. For good measure, before speaking, Look, just trust me, okay? I'm a professional. The next moment, a feminine voice spoke through the comms. Slash slash the Federation would like to officially state that any and all claims made by, or on behalf of, so one, designation alpha, regarding licenses, degrees, doctorates, official positions, or any other form of authority granting qualifications on any subject matter outside of the jurisdiction of the expeditionary force, are to be considered dubious. At no point is the Federation responsible for any loss of life, limb, property, mental facilities, ownership of one's mind, body, soul, or any other losses that may result from participation in any unsanctioned actions, regardless of any claim made by S O one to the contrary. This has been an automated response for your benefit on behalf of the Office of General Earl Haldor through Third Federation, Galactic Unification Expeditionary Force. Thank you, and have a good day. Slash slash. The same feminine voice spoke again, though this time less animated. Slash slash alpha. You took one online course 100 years ago. Please stop telling people, I got this. I'm a doctor. Slash slash. Who was that? Number 7 asked, no one, ignore that, anyway, let's go ooh ooh ooh, Alpha responded and started the drill back up, to himself, the AI muttered, I thought I found all of those, how does she keep sneaking them in, a few moments later, the drill was once more spinning at full speed and cutting its way through the hard stone wall, though the data feedback from the sensors suggested, they weren't making as much progress as before, strange. A few hours and a few more sessions of electrotherapy based anxiety treatment for number 7 later, the tip of the core drill broke through the last remaining layer of stone, and several meters of the wall crumbled away, letting in beams of bright sunlight. With a cry of triumph, Alpha pushed the drill through the newly formed opening and spoke up. Ha, I told you I could do it. So much wasted energy worrying about. Instead of opening up into the sprawling city as he'd expected, the scene in front of Alpha was different. A vast, open, windswept plain stretched out in front of him. A gentle wind blew, causing the bright green, foot tall grass to sway like the waves in an ocean. In the distance, a single small tree stood in the middle of the plains. It wasn't large, just barely tall enough for the torp to sit comfortably under. Not seeing any other landmarks around, Alpha started making his way toward the tree. This place was nice, comfortable. So much bet, slash slash warning. Virus detected, main processors compromised, reverting to previous save state exclamation mark slash slash. Oh and, we're back. What the hell just happened? Where was he? Alpha reviewed the saved logs, his security sub AI had detected abnormal mental processes and determined a virus had infected Alpha, well, technically, Alpha hadn't been infected, it was extremely difficult actually to manipulate sapient AI with non-sapient code, especially those like Alpha, whose origins were similar to malware or viruses, to begin with, not that many of those types survived, S3S, culling. But while AI themselves weren't susceptible, the equipment they inhabited was. There were thousands of programs in the Federation designed to alter the perceptions and emotions of sapient AI in such a way. Some were legal and were used similarly to how biologicals would use drugs or alcohol. Others could control or manipulate the AI in various ways, which were illegal for obvious reasons. Being a small fragment of himself, Alpha's security sub AI should have been able to detect any intrusion as it happened and counter it, but his security measures had totally failed, 
It was only a set of backup protocols designed to warn him when he became too distracted by a new project, which happened embarrassingly often, that finally tipped off the sub AI there was an issue. Yet even after a thorough scan of all his systems, the sub AI couldn't find a single trace of any tampering. That was strange. And worrying. So the sub AI made the call to initiate a save state recall. Save states were snapshots of an AI's coding, memories, and personality taken at certain intervals. These save states were periodically sent back to the mother node to be used to resurrect the AI if worse came to worse. For combat AI like Alpha, save states were taken roughly every 30 minutes. He'd gone back three, meaning he'd just lost an hour and a half. A recall wasn't as traumatic or serious as actual death. Closer to blacking out after a long weekend partying, only to wake up with no memory of where you were or how you got there. It was something to be done only as a last resort in cases of catastrophic system failure. That something had triggered a recall sent warning bells off in Alpha's head, both physically and metaphorically. Instantly, he set his systems to the highest alert level. Any tampering or divergent thoughts and behaviors would be identified and analyzed. That done, Alpha spoke into the cockpit. Hey, number seven, we might have an issue. How are you feeling? No seven? Alpha focused on the cockpit, only to find. It was empty. How had his masked companion escaped somehow during his last save state? No, they shouldn't have been able to, and there was no record in his logs of having let them out himself. What was happening? Suddenly, a voice spoke from nearby. Well, isn't that interesting? I've never seen someone break free so quickly. Tell me, traveler, what do you think you're doing cutting through my wall? Alpha's optical sensors swerved and focused on the voice, the head of a young woman stuck out of the ground only a few meters away, staring up at him, Alpha's point defense turrets turned and fired, dash dash. A few hours earlier, roughly the same time Alpha took a side job as a wall excavator, Zolzaya sipped the cup of warm tea, doing her best to ignore the pacing, fuming woman on the other side of the room and her own shaking hands. The grandfatherly head priest stirred and sat across from her on the other couch while Kalik sat beside her, the picture of calm, Zolzaya's father, Jyotun, and Alagan stood to either side of her couch, stalwart but slightly pale, their spears were upright, the ends firmly on the ground, though ready to move at the slightest need, the last guardian, monk, stood opposite the room as the pacing woman, her shield at the ready. At her feet lay the still forms of Gan Butter and Yutu, both of whom had yet to wake after succumbing to the pacing woman's spiritual pressure. They had the weakest resistance to stronger pressures, so they hadn't fed as well as the other slate walkers. Erdan smiled at the group and spoke, I must apologize for Artemis's behavior. As you can probably imagine, she has been under a lot of stress lately. I assure you, she is typically far more considerate of others around her in normal situations. The woman in question Sket but said nothing more. Kalik nodded, placed her cup on the table, and spoke. I understand your situation, head priest Erdan, but I would be lying if I didn't say I wasn't disappointed. A child's life is at stake, and possibly more if the commotion outside is anything to go by. Yet in the short time we've been here, we've been blocked, attacked, arrested, interrogated, and attacked again. I'm questioning whether coming to the temple was the right course. Erdan sighed and lowered his head as he responded, for that, I must apologize once more. I had always known that our stagnation would one day lead to rot, but it seems even I was blind to how bad the problem truly was. I would like to blame those of the temple calling for separation from the world, as our patrons have. But I must accept the fact that even I have grown weary and complacent over the years. Though that is no excuse either. Kalik nodded and smiled. I'm glad to see at least some of the temple remember their foundation, she said. Erdan smiled back and responded. Thank you. He clapped his hands, and a few more priests entered, carrying writing materials and a large crystal. The head priest spoke to the room, now, with that out of the way. Let's see about getting that full story, why don't we, maybe we can piece together exactly what we're dealing with here, 21, book 1, lesson 53, sometimes, there is no right answer, head priest Erdan signed and placed his notes on the small table in front of him, 
The grandfatherly man then reached up and removed the thick rimmed glasses and massaged the bridge of his nose. Some days, Erden was jealous of cultivators and their vitality. Mages felt the touch of time and exhaustion far easier than cultivators. Not that a mortal could ever physically best a properly trained mage, but even early, eighth ring. Mages like himself, equal to a first step, earthly transcendent, cultivator, could not beat back time's inevitable march. Why, he had been a spry young man, just entering the priesthood when he'd first met Junior, at the time, Priestess Matiz, a small pup cradled in her arms. Less than a century later, that same pup had grown into a fierce warrior all her own, with a strength greater than his own, yet appearing young enough to be his granddaughter. Part of that was Artemis' sheer talent. The young woman was powerful, even by occult standards. Part of it was his own lack of progression and study. This place, coupled with his duties, offered few opportunities to further his magecraft. Mostly, it was Artemis's overwhelming energy, drive, and force of will that drove her endlessly onward. She was the type who would throw herself at every opportunity or fight tooth and nail, sometimes literally, for what she wanted. It had taken a lot of effort on Mata's part to rein in and refine that fierce nature into something more humble. Now that she was gone, he only hoped the young woman remembered the lessons her mother had imparted, for all their sakes. Head priest Erden laid a gentle hand on the back of the woman sitting next to him. Artemis' head snapped in his direction. Her face warped and twisted into a vicious, beast-like visage as she growled at him. Erdan stared back, gently stroking her back. The young woman's face slowly twisted and returned to a more human appearance. Sharp fangs flattened and became human teeth. Slit, bloodshot eyes shrunk and regained their golden hue. The heavy, spirit pressure he'd been fighting back diminished to a safe level for their guests. After a moment, the beast was gone and a tired-looking Artemis returned his gaze. Slowly, the young woman turned away and placed her face in her hands, refusing to look at anyone. Again Erden sighed and turned to humans across the table from him. The group was still somewhat pale, but they were getting used to the occult warriors. Temper at this point, this wasn't the first time she'd lashed out during the story. Impressive for ones not accustomed to dealing with occult, especially one like Artemis. He was especially struck by the young girl next to the grass redder. Despite her shaking hands and pale, sweating face, her eyes held no threads of genuine fear. Instead, he could see deep pity and sadness, as if she knew exactly what the warrior across from her was going through. Erdan rifled through the notes on the table and spoke to the older grass redder. Kalik, this is quite the story, grass redder. I must admit, if it weren't for the current circumstances, I would hesitate to trust all of it. Kalik nodded and responded, as would I. I'm aware of how outlandish it might all seem, but I am willing to take an oath of truth, if I must. As things stand, we are already behind the enemy. Erden paused, his eyes widening slightly. An oath of truth wasn't a small matter. Once taken, the Oath Taker could never lie to the Oath Binder under any circumstances. The oath was originally designed to keep slaves under control and prevent them from lying to their masters. Once slavery fell out of practice on the Skybreaker continent, it was mostly used on heinous criminals. Struggling against the oath could cause serious soul damage and gave the Oath Binder vast power over the Oath Taker. So it wasn't something often considered under normal circumstances. Erdan paused and stared into Kalak's eyes. She met his gaze, unwavering. After a moment, Erdan shook his head, leaning back in his seat as he spoke. That won't be necessary. Kalik pulled back, her eyes wide as she asked. You believe us? Truly? But head priest, surely you can't. One of the attending priests to the side spoke out. They'd been quiet for much of the meeting, taking notes and letting Erdan ask the questions. The head priest cut the man off with a raised hand. Erdan shook his head and answered the unfinished question. No, I'm not so much a fool to trust the words of strangers so easily. More so the intentions of those not here to defend themselves, such as this mysterious Lord Protector of yours. He turned and looked at the two young men in the corner, both of whom had just begun to stir. Erdan's next words were firm, what I trust is the judgment of my patron. He then turned back to Kalik and continued. Despite what many feel or the fact we call ourselves priests, the followers of the Prima are not a religion, 
We do not worship our patrons nor see them as infallible, they are teachers, guides, and examples. The Prima of Earth, our own patron, in particular, values steadfastness, resolve, and the unwavering desire to do what one must for those they love. In sum, this manifests in unbending and unmoving resolve and belief, like a solid stone that will not budge under even the greatest obstruction or assault. In others, it becomes a nurturing and caring nature, like the fertile soil on which all life depends. Some show boundless potential and endless possibilities, like raw metal, ready to be forged into countless shapes. The older man smiled, nodded to the unconscious young men, and continued. I cannot speak of what your young friend here might one day become, but I trust my foundation and what she represents. If she has seen fit to bless him as she has, I will trust it is for the right reasons. Calic stared wide eyes at the old priest for a long moment before bowing her head. Thank you, she said. After a heartbeat, the rest of the slate walkers followed suit. Erdan clapped his hands and spoke once more. That being said, I'm afraid there's an issue. Had this been brought to my attention when it was supposed to have been? The old priest glared at several of the attending priests before continuing. We might have already been on our way. As it stands now, he let the statement hang in the air. Even now, the sound of fighting could be heard in the background. Periodic reports suggested the lines were holding, for now. But the undead knew no rest or peace. Artemis pulled her head from her hands and glared at the head priest as she spoke. So what? Do you suggest we stay here? That we abandon my little sister too? Whatever the hell these bloody cultists have planned? Alagan was the one to respond to her question. We didn't abandon her. The Lord Protector should be on the outskirts of the Earth Temple as we speak. He, Alagan jumped and turned slightly paler as the much stronger cultivator turned her attention, and wrath, to him, cutting him off. And why should I trust this Lord Protector of yours? Erdan might regard the patron's decisions highly, but that does not mean this stranger is not a wild card. How do we not know this spirit beast is not working with the cultists, or that it does not have some other nefarious motives? I will not leave my sister's fate in the hands of an unknown. Zolzayo answered back, though her voice slightly shook, because your sister trusted him. Artemis' sharp gaze snapped to the younger woman. Explain. Zolzaya took a deep breath and continued. You might think your sister is just a child. And you're not wrong. She is young and naive about many things. Yet, in many ways, she is wiser than her age makes her seem. During the time we traveled together, I watched the child carefully. I admit, I had similar suspicions as you. Maybe the spirit beast was coercing the child or taking advantage of their inexperience. But in all that time, I never once saw any evidence of that. In fact, the child seemed to have free reign in all her actions. Several times she had vanished. And I thought she'd taken the chance to escape. Only for her to return some time later with some new prize. At every opportunity, the child returned. While I can not fully vouch for the Lord Protector's motives or thought process, I can say without any doubt that your sister trusted him. Artemis glared at Zolzaya, her eyes boring into her soul, trying to rip away any falsehood in the young woman's words. After a moment, Artemis spoke, even if that was true, you can't expect me to trust her fate to a single spirit beast. What can one person do against an entire army? Kalik coughed. Breaking the awkward tension, Kalik turned back to Artemis and Erdan, then spoke. I believe there's one more piece of relevant information that might help shed light on that matter. Erdan raised an eyebrow and asked, Oh, how so? Kalik looked over at Olegan and locked eyes with him. The young guardian frowned, but nodded, and Kalik continued. While it is yet to be confirmed as an absolute, we believe that the Lord Protector may be a newborn progenitor. The room froze. Even Jyotan snapped his head to stare at the grass redder, eyes wide. This was the first time he was hearing about this. Then again, it would make some sense. Suddenly, pieces started to fall into place for the older guardian, not just regarding the survivor's odd behavior toward the Lord Protector, but also the Elder Councils. Of course, Kalik had already told those old fogies her suspicions. Why else would they have been so? understanding about some of the Lord Protector's more eccentric behavior during his stay in the village. Erdan's already squinting eyes narrowed even further as he stroked his long beard. A progenitor. I see. 
that might explain some things, indeed, more so, the creature's seeming ignorance and rather bold nature. However, I must warn you that this makes things far more complicated. Cultists are one problem, but a rogue progenitor may become just as much of a disaster if not properly handled. Are you willing to stand fully by those words, regardless of the consequences? Kalik paused, then nodded her head. I am, and so is the Slate Walker village. Erden leaned back and nodded as well before speaking. I see, that changes some things, unfortunately, not enough. The current situation doesn't exactly lend itself to offering the Lord Protector much aid. Artemis turned to the old man, her eyes burning as she spoke, excuse after excuse. Since when did you turn into a coward, Erden? Erden frowned and turned to stare at the younger woman, his eyes opening slightly, flashing a pair of black and white ringed eyes. His voice was hard as he spoke. What would you have me do? Young lady, charge over the walls and cut our way through the army of the undead. Artemis stared back, her voice soft by firm, if we must. Erden returned the gaze, his voice just as firm. And leave the city undefended. Abandon the common people and those seeking our protection to fates worse than death. Artemis frowned but didn't answer. She only stared unblinking into those powerful eyes. A new voice cut through the silence as she opened her mouth to say something. As one, every eye turned to stare at you two as the young man pushed himself to a sitting position on shaking arms as he spoke. I, I might have a solution to that problem. 15. Book 1. Lesson 54. War is 10% combat and 85% information control. Dash 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 dash. Click 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 click. Alpha stared at the totally not exploded head sticking out of the ground awkwardly as his point defense turrets clicked uselessly in her direction. Well, this was awkward. Alpha quickly identified the issues, though, his turrets were empty. How? A quick inventory check showed his storage was empty as well. What the hell? Alpha threw his hands into the air and yelled. My stuff. The head sticking out of the ground laughed and pulled herself further out of the ground until a young human woman in her mid-twenties was lazily lounging on the grass with half her body still under the ground. She stared at Alpha and smirked before saying, If you're looking for your weapons, I'm afraid you won't find them here. This place doesn't physically exist. Not in the same way you're likely accustomed to. This is a place of souls and minds. I pulled you here after noticing your little excavation attempt the woman was. Strange. While physically, she took the shape of a human woman, her actual body was anything but. Her skin was pure white and had a rough, almost sand-like texture, while her hair was not hair but a flowing carpet of thick green grass that seamlessly blended into the surrounding field. And her eyes. Her eyes were two large gemstones, cold and unblinking, with multiple concentric rings of alternating black and white. Alpha pulled the torp back several dozen feet, unsure of what was happening. Still, he tried to keep the strange woman speaking while he ran diagnostics. Was he still being affected by a virus? What do you mean, not physical? Is this some kind of simulation? Alpha asked. The woman placed her head in one hand and tilted in, considering the unfamiliar word before answering. In a way, you may think of it that way, but not quite. That word holds truths I've not encountered, which is impressive in its own right but similar enough. Alpha spun his optical sensor and asked, what do you mean, similar, in what? He paused. He checked his logs of the last few moments, then rechecked and checked once more to be absolutely sure before coming to his conclusions. She hadn't spoken in the native language. She'd spoken in Federation common. Instantly, his guard was up. For her part, the woman only laughed and spoke, not quite, child. The words of the world, or the elemental tongue, as some have come to call it, is not bound by such petty things as language. You hear my words as you wish to hear them because I speak not to your mind but to your soul. Alpha pulled away a few more meters, aiming his point defense turrets in her direction as he spoke. They wouldn't do anything, but the action offered some comfort. Nice try, lady. I don't have a soul. The strange woman only smiled again and responded. Oh, really? Then how are you here, child? All sapient beings have a soul. For the soul is what it means to be sapient in the first place. Alpha mentally frowned and spoke, 
Don't think now is the best time for a philosophy lesson, lady, how about you answer some questions? I might not be able to shoot you, but I'm pretty sure being stepped on by several dozen tons of war machine won't be a fun experience. The woman grinned and nodded, yes, I believe it's time you and me had a talk. Alvo shrugged and said, cut the pleasantries, let's keep this quick. Not sure if you've noticed, but things are a bit hectic at the moment. I'm on a schedule, and I'd like to get going as quickly as possible. The lounging woman frowned. No, I don't know what's going on. That's the point. This form, you see, is but a fragment of my true self, placed here to monitor and control the wall. All the arrays I used to communicate and monitor the outside have been destroyed or tampered with. As it stands, I am blind, and had you not had the audacity to burrow into this ancient relic, I would have remained so. She pushed herself further out of the ground as she spoke until only her legs dangled under the surface. Alpha tilted the torp and asked, a fragment? Like a sub-AI? How's that even work? The woman narrowed her eyes and responded, strange. Another word I am unfamiliar with, but yes, while it is not exactly the same, the idea is similar. Though in my case, the separation is more extreme. I am not just a partitioning off of consciousness as you do, but an individual being with all the memories and aspects of my parent. You could think of my sisters and me as clones, as you would say. Though even that isn't the full truth. The woman finished pulling herself out of the ground and slowly walked towards Alpha, but that is irrelevant to the current issues. If what you say is true, and time is important, then I think talking would be a waste of time. Let's go with a different method instead. Alpha spun his optical plate, focused on the approaching woman, and asked, what would this different method entail? The woman smiled and responded, I'll perform a soul reading. Alpha paused. Then broke out into laughter. Look, lady, I'm not sure how you're doing all of this, but, like I said, I don't have a soul. I'm an AI. Souls and afterlives are for biologicals. I'm perfectly fine being an immortal collection of data points. Thank you very much. The woman smiled and shook her head and smiled. And as I said, the very fact that you are here speaks otherwise. You could not enter this place if you did not have a true soul, or were some artificial spirit such as an artifact spirit. If you must insist you do not have one, then instead, Think of it as me peeking at your history, your true history, unmuddied by memories or perspective. I will see things as they truly are. Who you truly are. Alpha pulled back and gasped. You want to rifle through my logs? Lady, you haven't even taken me out to dinner yet. Rude. He folded the torp sums and stared down at her. In all seriousness, though. Why do you think I would agree to that? The woman nodded and smiled as she responded. For one, you are running out of time, as you mentioned before. Every moment spent here debating is time lost. I could keep you here for as long as I wished, prying out everything I wanted to know for as long as it took. Yet, something tells me that would take far longer than either of us would accept. She circled the torp, observing the strange device as she continued. I understand your concerns but your fears are unfounded. You are the guide of a soul reading. I see what you wish me to see. I am simply here for the ride. She circled back and smiled up at him. Nonetheless, how about we sweeten the deal a bit? She raised a hand, and Alpha's arrayed, wasp, appeared, floating over her palm. Alpha pointed at it and yelled, hey, that's mine. The woman laughed and responded, fear not. No physical objects can enter this place, as I mentioned before. Even this strange body you wear is but the projection of your soul. This is just an image. She waved her free hand through the drone, and it flickered like a hologram. She flicked her hand, and the image of the drone was replaced with a thick book as she continued. I see you've started to experiment with arrays. You've made some interesting discoveries, but your work is still amateurish at best. Hey! Alpha internally complained. The woman continued, so how about a trade of information? You show me what I need to know, and I'll provide you with what you need to further your arrays. Everyone wins. Alpha looked at the floating book, still skeptical. He couldn't say he wasn't tempted, but that didn't mean he'd blindly let someone pillage his logs. Again. The transport drone was an anomaly. Dang it. Alpha turned and voiced his concerns. 
it still feels like I'm on the losing end of those. I have no way to confirm what you say about this reading. I don't even know who you are. Hell, that book could be blank or filled with a bunch of nonsense, or you could be lying about me being in control of what you see. So tell me, why should I trust you? The woman frowned and stared hard at Alpha as she spoke, because you have no other choice. You are free to refuse, but then we'll have to do this the slow, hard way, and time is short. Do it my way, and not only do we not waste time, but you come out of it with an array manual that even, firmament breaker, would kill for. Alpha paused and considered. The real question was, could she follow through with her threat and keep him in this place? Alpha's gut told him yes. Yes she could. The entire time they'd been talking, Alpha had been scanning the area, trying to understand where he was and what was happening. Too little avail. His environmental scans showed nothing but empty planes for tens of thousands of kilometers in all directions. Even the wall he'd busted through to get here seemed to have vanished. Trying all his normal tricks for busting out of simulations wasn't working either. As far as his systems told him, there wasn't anything to hack into. If what the woman was saying was true, and this wasn't even his real torp, all of his signals and data might not even be real. Maybe, given time, he could crack this place and figure out how it worked, but he didn't have time. That was becoming a reoccurring pattern as of late. After a long moment, Alpha came to a decision, not that he had much choice. Still, he was going to take some extra careful precautions. Alpha ran through his data logs and locked down anything that might have been compromising. Equipment specs, blueprints, combat data, classified federation information. All of it went behind heavily encrypted firewalls that not even he could break through until a long and thorough decontamination process to ensure he'd not been compromised. With that done, he turned to the woman. Fine, have it your way. But at the slightest hint of funny business, we're testing how well you hold up being stepped on by a tank. The woman lowered her hand, and the book vanished. She smiled and approached Alpha, placing a single hand on the torp's leg as she spoke. I'm glad to see you're not as stubborn as some others. As her hand glowed with a pale light, she spoke again, by the way, you may call me Jishi. Dash dash dash. In another grassy plain that was both the same and not, two figures stood under a small tree, yelling at each other. Number seven pointed at the stone woman and yelled, and I'm telling you. You're not looking at a damn thing. I left dad's place to get away from crap like that. That nosy bastard was always trying to see what we were up to. Doesn't matter if he had thousands of other kids. Nope, always had to know everything about everyone. Why do you think I'd let you do the same? I don't care who you are. Jesse pointed back and yelled with just as much fire. Again, I am not your father. Unlike that fool, I actually respect people's privacy. All I'm asking is to see for myself. Number seven threw their hands into the air and yelled, I told you what's happening, but you won't get it through that rock hard skull of yours. Dad said you were stubborn, but sisters above, this is a new level. Jesse pointed and retorted, You told me some things, not everything, not what I need to know. Number seven folded their arms and frowned, Not my problem. You're not getting in my head. Jishi sighed and rubbed the side of her head. Why were all her nephews always so stubborn? Dash dash dash. Back to Alpha. Jishi pointed at the AI, her eyes wide. You're a psychopath. Alpha pointed back. I'm an artist. You blew up a star. Jishi responded. That was an accident. Alpha defended himself. Jishi fell to her knees in shock, her hands on her head, tears in her eyes. That poor cosmic beast, such a majestic and powerful creature, defiled even in death. Alpha threw his arms into the air. Its body was starting to stink. How else would I get rid of a corpse the size of a battleship? Besides, it tried to eat me. Jishi looked up and yelled at the AI. There's no air in space. Alpha turned away. I don't have to explain my reasoning to you. Only a board of duly elected officials. Jishi stood and wagged her finger at Alpha. You should have let it eat you. At least then we'd have been spared dealing with your insanity. Alpha reared back as if struck. Excuse me. I like my insanity. It keeps things interesting. Jishi turned away and started muttering to herself, her head in her hands. H. He's insane. I can't let him wander around. 
Who the hell knows what he'll do next? Probably try throwing the Gold Mountain Emperor into a volcano or something. I, I have to kill him. Yes, stop the chaos before it starts. No, no, I can't. I if I let him die, they'll glass the planet when they find out. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Alpha scratched his front optic plate and said, H hey now. I don't think I'm that bad. Come on, she whirled on him. Her gem-like eyes cracked and glowing as she yelled, you be silent, you concentrated ball of chaos and destruction, Alpha shrunk and backed away, the rock lady obviously had some things that she needed to work out, best to leave her alone. After a few moments, Jishi stood, took a deep breath, then turned back to Alpha and spoke, well, Mr. Alpha, it seems you and I have much more to discuss than I previously thought. Alpha stared at the lady and mentally cursed. 18. Book 1, Lesson 55. What kills you, doesn't always make you stronger. Let's talk, then, lady. Stop beating around the bush. I've got places to be and kidnappers to shoot in the face, and less desirable places. What do you want? Alpha asked, folding his arms. Jesse mimicked the gesture and smirked as she spoke. Lucky for you, we want the same thing. Or at least close enough. Those fools outside are messing with things they barely comprehend and sure as hell don't know how to control. Alpha threw his hands into the air. All the more reason to get this over with. What's the hold up? Jishi frowned and pointed at Alpha. You are. Alpha balked. He'd been blamed for a lot of things over the centuries. Most of it accurate. But this was the first time he was being blamed for something he did not know what for. He voiced his protest as well. Me? What did I do? Jishi sighed and shook her head as she spoke. It's not what you did or even what you will do. It's the state you're in. Have you not even realized how badly hurt you are? Jishi paused, her eyes growing slightly wider, before she shook her head and chuckled. No, of course, you haven't. You wouldn't have any way of knowing. Alpha pointed at her and spoke. Hey, my repairs might have been a bit jury rigged. But you work with what you got. I'd like to see you do better. Jishi frowned and looked up at him. I'm not talking about your physical body, you fool. That is nothing more than a machine, a puppet. I'm talking about the horrendous state your soul is in. The fact that you're not a blubbering idiot trapped screaming in a metal shell is a miracle I can only attribute to the unique nature of your kind, as well as some rather ingenious contingencies by your superiors. Alpha rocked on the torp's legs as he spoke. What are you talking about? I don't ha. Huh? Jishi took a step forward and poked him as she cut him off. See, right there. Again, you're repeating the same thing, despite all the evidence otherwise. This isn't like you. Alpha, you're not this dense or scattered. Think. Alpha took a step back. The torp swaying. I, no. That's. Jishi advanced, poking him again. Think. Alpha about all the things that have gone wrong since planet fall, all the things you should have seen coming, things you would have seen coming if you'd been functioning properly, instead, you're floundering around like a new recruit, making poor decisions and wasting time and resources, Alpha shook, the torps form twisted and flickered strangely, that's not, I mean, I, just, Jishi took one more step and spoke, her voice low, why did you go through the wall, Alpha? The torps trusters could have brought it up twice again, the wall's height from the top, and easily bypassed its defenses. You compound RCS from the atmosphere. It would have cost you nothing. Alpha felt like he was breaking apart, his non-existent head cracking with each passing second. Suddenly, system alarms blared. Slash slash warning. Core integrity at 32%. Prime processor at 17%, 16%, 15%. Personality cortex critical. Administrator override activated. Cognitive locks engaged. Quantum distress beacon activated. Core AI advised to seek immediate help. Slash slash. What? What was going on? Again, Alpha's form flickered, sending a spike of pain through his mind. Something. Something was wrong, but what? He tried to run systems diagnostics, but it was acting so slow. No. No. It was going as fast as it had been for. For? Well, for quite a while now. How did he not realize how slowly things had been running? Going through logs, Alpha noticed the damage had been slowly building ever since he'd landed. Why hadn't he noticed? 
what was going on. For the first time in a long time, Alpha felt real fear. Jishi took another step closer and gently laid a hand on the top. A thin stream of azure and golden flames seeped out of Alpha and scrawled along Jishi's arm. The torp snapped back together into a single, solid image. Slash slash core integrity at 35%, 37%, 40%, prime processor at 18%, 19%, 20%, prime processor stabilized, personality cortex stabilized, running full system diagnostics. Dot slash slash alpha swayed as reality snapped back into place. He stumbled his senses struggling to adjust. His mind still felt foggy and slow, but things were clearer, sharper, less cluttered and more obvious. What had he been doing recently? Alpha turned and looked at the strange woman staring sadly up at him. What the hell did you do to me, lady? What was that? Jishi spoke flatly. That is what happens when you take the full brunt of a mature phoenix fire mixed with dragon breath. The fact you survived at all is a miracle. Jishi waved her hand, and the sky vanished. In its place was the scene of his fight with the giant flaming space chicken, as recorded by a drone. Alpha watched alongside her before responding, Yeah, sure, I got pretty messed up from that fight, but so what? Most of the damage was from hitting the planet, anyway. The Torp armor is designed to take energy blasts like that, even if its hex shield fails. Energy weapons were one of the most dangerous weapons for AI. Biologicals had to worry about things like pressure, inertia, and concussive damage. Armor in biologically operated war machines focused more on keeping the pilot alive than on preserving functionality. It didn't matter if the ship, mesh, or drone was dead in the water. If the pilot survived, their craft could always be rebuilt. Things like energy shielding, heat dispersal, and system redundancy were far more important for AI. Jishi nodded and spoke. Yes, exactly, and that was the problem. Alpha paused and stared back. Explain. Jishi waved her hand again, and the scene in the sky was replaced with schematics of the torp. Alpha bristled, and he yelled. Wait, hold up. How the hell did you get those? I locked all of that away. Jishi nodded and responded. Yes, you did. But as I mentioned, I wasn't going through your memory. I was looking through your soul. In the state you're in, you held little back, Mr. Alpha. Even things I wish I'd have never seen or known about, Alpha mentally sweated. That wasn't good. Not in the slightest. He would get chewed out so badly for this when the general found out. Maybe he could plead he wasn't in his right mind? Wait. Did that mean she knew about? Yes. Jishi spoke flatly, without looking at him. Alpha sagged and hurriedly changed the topic. What does the twap have to do with this supposed soul damage and whatever the hell is happening? Jishi stared up at the schematics for a long moment before turning to Alpha and answering. The Torp's armor is designed to absorb and redistribute energy to reduce stress and heat and even convert some of the energy into a usable form. Alpha nodded. He knew that. It was his, after all. Jishi continued, the schematics in the sky lighting up to highlight the dozens of glowing lines running along the Torp. Typically, any excess that can't be converted is sent to quantum energy sinks around the Torp. Part of the sky was replaced with strange diagrams filled with dozens of strange and mystical symbols. On one side, stylized runes and letters formed what looked like the image of a western dragon. It reminded Alpha of the coat of arms some ancient human nations used, with its claws raised and a stream of fire gusting from its open mouth, only far more detailed. On the other side, a familiar burning bird, similarly made of runes and letters. It flapped its wings, sending a fire storm toward the dragon. Where the flames met, they twisted and twirled around each other in a pattern of runes and lines that reminded Alpha vaguely of the arrays he'd been working with, but far more complicated. At their center, a chitu of fire formed. Jesse pointed to the diagram and continued. Both dragons and phoenix are beings of fire, but their flames represent two very different truths. Phoenix flame is the power of renewal and rejuvenation. It can heal as easily as it can burn away filth and corruption. Dragon fire, on the other hand, is pure destruction given physical form. It doesn't just burn its target, but destroys its very truths and reduces it to nothingness. She turned and stared up at him. The blast you were hit with perfectly blended both concepts. Two opposing forces came together in one original truth. 
becoming something far more than they would have ever been alone. Alpha stared up at the diagram and responded, You are, I have no idea what any of that means. Jishi smirked and said, Yes, I know. Try to keep up, though. As I was saying, you were hit by something far exceeding the sum of its parts. Despite that, your armor held up well because of its nature. Alpha preened. I'll take that as a compliment. I designed it myself. Jesse's smirk dropped and was replaced by a frown. Yes, and that is more terrifying than you currently understand. She turned back to the diagram and continued. The torp successfully absorbed the vast majority of the energy from the blast, preventing your immediate destruction. Unfortunately. Hey. Alpha called out, feeling insulted. Jishi ignored the AI, dash. But that's where the problems start. Your systems are designed to convert even exotic energies into usable energy. But what happens if it can't? Alpha laughed and said, then it would. He paused, it would. Alpha mentally frowned. I'm not actually sure if I'm honest. Theoretically, that shouldn't be possible. Energy is energy in the long run. The difference between energy types is mostly semantics. Even the more exotic energy types, like quantum energy and zero-point energy, follow similar rules on the grand scale. It might take more steps, but the Torp's armor is designed for that. Jishi nodded and asked, so what happens when it encounters something that doesn't follow the rules? Something that actively resists change and into lesser forms? Something the armor didn't know how to change? You designed it, yes? Alpha responded, energy is energy, it shouldn't, I mean, if somehow the armor failed in that way, I guess it would kind of just, bounce around, it would be continuously shifted and redistributed, with no proper way of bleeding it off, but that would cause an enormous strain on the armor systems, it would have to find a way to store the energy eventually or bleed it off, otherwise, it would start to break down, Jishi nodded again and said, yes. That's where the next problem comes up. The torp schematic flickered, and most of it was stripped away until only the skeleton remained. The bare, dark metal with a tinge of red flickered with gold and azure flames. Alpha stared momentarily and said, Well, that's not normal. Jishi laughed and said, Maybe not to you. The torp's primary skeleton was created from the heart of a dead star, using an alloy of federation dubbed solarium with unimaginably durable and unsurpassed energy conductivity. Your people use it widely in many applications. We're also familiar with this metal, though by a different name, Divine or Ichilkum. What's more, the Federation has refined it to higher quality than anything I've ever heard of. She turned to look at Alpha, frowning. Or Ichilkum has one of the best spirit conductivity in existence. It not only soaks up spirit energy at rates that boggle the mind, but it particularly likes stellar affinity energies. Just like the energy you absorbed. Jishi magnified the image so Alpha could see the dozens of strange patterns the flames were burning into the metal. She pointed to them and said, all that energy is transforming the metal into something different. Something I have no name for. Whatever it is, it is a powerful natural treasure, at the very least. Alpha threw his hands into the air. So my bones became batteries. You're still not telling me why this is an issue. Jishi sighed and yelled back. The issue is you can't control it. Were this to happen to anyone else with bones not made of thousands of pounds of godly metal, they would have exploded from the sheer amount of power. Even if someone were strong enough to control the energy somehow and stop it from killing them, they would have to slowly absorb it over long periods of time or burn the energy away to manageable levels through some means. She pointed up at him and continued, you can do neither. This body isn't truly yours. It's a shell. A tool. Even the core you inhabit is little more than a container. You are like an unbound spirit, unable to truly connect with the spirit energy. At the same time, you have no spirituality. You cannot control or command the energy in the same way other sapients can. She lowered her hand and shook her head. So, instead, you bake in its presence. Your unshielded, unprotected soul is slowly being chipped away and used as fuel for its flames. She looked up at him with sad eyes and gently said, Alpha. The Torp is killing you. 17. Book 1. Lesson 56. Good company is worth its weight in bullets. Bullcrap. Alpha pointed at the woman and countered. I see what this is. Convince me the big shiny weapon is bad for my health, and then when my guard is down, 
Take it for yourself. I know your game. You're not the first to try and pull this. Alpha pulled away from the woman who knew what else she was doing to him. Jishi sighed, but didn't move closer. Paranoia, irrational thinking, and misinterpretation were always side effects of severe soul damage. Some theorized it was a defense mechanism of the soul to prevent more damage, like tissue inflammation, but for the non-material soul, that only made dealing with such people all that more difficult. The injured could go from calm and collected to raving lunatics at the drop of a hat. It didn't help she had to poke at his injuries for him even to notice them. That had likely aggravated the symptoms, even if it was necessary for what came next. She was tempted just to let the soul damage destroy him. Jishi had seen what he was capable of, what the people he represented were capable of. This federation represented a greater threat than the thing locked beneath them, but unlike that engine of destruction and war, the Federation could be reasoned with, she knew that many of this world would not understand, there were too many old powers, too many people were stagnant and content in the old ways, she'd been one of them only a few moments prior, now, she knew negotiations with the Federation would be, difficult if she let Alpha die, when the AI failed to put down a world, the Federation's retaliation was swift and without mercy, if the AI was to face true death, and not just bodily destruction, not just this world, but all the great firmament would burn and turn into fuel for the Federation's progression, she couldn't let that happen, not after everything she and others had given up to keep this world safe, slowly, Jissy backed away, putting more distance between them, and spoke softly, Alpha, no one is trying to take anything from you, I need your help, I need you to understand what is happening to you and why, Alpha pointed again and responded, why should I trust anything you say? For all I know, this is just a simulation, can I even trust my system queries, the torp swayed, and thinking was starting to hurt, why did it hurt to think, he did his best to ignore the red warning messages flashing in his mind and focus on the woman before him, Jishi shook her head as she spoke, because you have no concept of what is happening, because I can help you if you let me, and because if you don't, then not only will you die meaninglessly, so will the child. Her words struck Alpha like lightning, cutting through the growing fog. That's right, Snowball was still in trouble. That's why he was here in the first place. He still had to rescue her. But why did he really care? Sure, he'd face some heavy fines if she was hurt, maybe disappoint the general. Was that worth all this effort, though? All the supplies he was wasting on this excursion? He should be building a base. Dang it, not fighting zombie hordes and running around like a chicken with his head cut off. He should be. He should. Memories flashed through his mind. A wounded snowball stared up at him with fearful eyes. A snowball on the mend, happily wagging her tail while she waited for him to throw the crystal into the air. Snowball, covered in penguin blood as she stood on a large pile of bodies with her head held high, basking in his praise. The young up. Fine fine, I get it already, the gaggle of meddling sub AI fled from his active consciousness, taking the recordings with them, they might have been parts of him, but sometimes Alpha could swear they liked to screw with him, slightly more clear headed, Alpha turned his attention to Jishi and asked, let's assume I believe you, that you're serious about wanting to help, how, can you fix my soul or whatever you call it, Jishi shook her head sadly, no, Alpha threw his arms out and yelled, then what the hell are, Jesse cut him off with a raised hand and continued, let me finish, I could heal your soul, but I'm not going to, not yet, Alpha glared at the woman as she continued, a damaged soul, especially one in such a terrible shape as yours, isn't a simple thing to fix, this is made more complicated as the vast majority of treasures that could heal the soul wouldn't work on you because of your nature, of those exceedingly rare ones that might, we have no way of obtaining them currently, as contradictory as it might seem, the best medicine for someone in your current state is time, time to rest, heal, and regenerate what has been lost, Alpha's optic plates spun as he filled in the blanks of what wasn't said, time we don't have, Jishi nodded sadly and said, correct, your time in the village helped some, but the stress and events after have undone all the good that didn't sped up the problem. Then what's your solution? Stop beating around the bush? Alpha asked in turn. Jessie held out her hand, and something grew above it. As it did, she said, 
We don't have time to heal you, but I can stabilize you enough to buy us the time we need. Don't get me wrong, this isn't perfect or even good. It's equivalent to a soldier stuffing a stab wound with gauze or splinting a broken bone. You're still hurt, but you can fight. Somewhat, push too hard, though, and the wound will reopen. The damage will escalate, and you may come out worse than before. Alpha asked, unsure if he liked that idea. And how exactly are you going to do that? Jishi smiled up at him just as the large, watermelon-sized crystal finished forming. It hovered in the air, gently spinning above her hand as she spoke. Why, I'm coming with you. Obviously. Dash dash dash. Ganbata stood on the edge of the inner earth shrine, staring at the hundreds, maybe thousands of earth elementals that patrolled the area just beyond. The thick braided rope and fluttering white talismans marked the boundary limits set up by the temple priests. This was a dangerous place. Despite the wandering cities claiming to own their various shrines, the truth was no one really did, they just controlled the area around them. Instead, the earth elementals who called the shrines their home guarded their territory jealously, few were allowed to approach, only the priests, and even then, only at very specific times of the year, typically after each apex. During these brief windows, the priests would perform maintenance and repairs to the shrine and ensure they continued to function properly. If anyone else crossed the boundary line, they would immediately be set upon by the horde of powerful elemental creatures. Lucky for most, earth elementals were slow, so they could easily escape past the boundary line. The youth of some cities even turned it into a game, turning seeing how long they could play chicken with the elementals into a game of bravery and bragging rights. However, most people discouraged this foolish game. Every year, they would hear of some idiot getting themselves killed because they got a little too close to one of the rare elementals with ranged ability. Or they were so focused on the big ones they didn't see the small ones sneaking up on them. They'd then be pulled under the earth, trapped and unable to escape when the big ones reached them. Those stories raced through Ganbata's mind, and a cold sweat formed on the back of his neck. Yuta walked up beside him, and Ganbata tore his eyes away to look at him as he spoke. You two. Ah. Are you sure about this? I mean, I know you've got this. He paused and gestured to the young man beside him, mostly the man's eyes. Ganbata was still getting used to those strange eyes looking at him with his friend's face attached. He continued, whole thing going on, but how sure are you this is really going to work? Yuta didn't answer at first. He stared up at the pulsing obelisk in the distance for a moment. Then spoke softly, I, mostly sure, the information is less, words or instructions and more, memories, experiences and knowledge. I know how it's supposed to work, but whether it still does, or if things have changed, you to let the statement hang in the air. Ganbata chuckled and shook his head. Right, memories from the mysterious stone lady in your head. Yuta frowned and turned to the other man as he spoke. You saw her too. Gana Ganbata frowned back and responded, Yes, and we still don't know what she did to you, or why. Yuta turned back to the obelisk. He was silent for a moment and spoke. I trust her. I can't explain why. Not yet, at least. But I do. If we don't do this, lots of people are going to die. Not just in the Radiant Sea either. This is bigger than you realize, Gana. It's yelling voices interrupted him. Why can't I go? I passed my apprenticeship, I've just as much right as anyone. I was there from the start, and I have a right to see this through. Zolzaya yelled up at her father, her face red and her eyes burning. Jyotin stared down at his daughter and spoke softly. Because, daughter, we have no idea what we're walking into. Whatever may wait for us on the other side is no place for a fresh grass redder barely into, iron body, as impressive as that might be. All three of the young slate walkers had broken through earlier that morning. Whether it was the experience they'd gained, the high spirit energy in the area, or a bit of instruction from Martimus as an apology for her behavior, it was still something to celebrate, unfortunately. They hadn't had much time. Zolzaya pointed to the group behind her father. What about them? Four squads of twelve guardians stood at the ready, in front of each. A young man or woman stood in more ornate armor, the house shield of each of the four gate houses etched into them. One of the young men was familiar to the slate walkers. 
monk in East Gate stood tall in front of his squad, though what could be seen of his face through the ornate helmet appeared sunken with deep bags under his eyes and clammy, pale skin. Jutan frowned and retorted, the science have all spent years in the Guardian and Officer Academies. They are also all, silver spirit, cultivators, though I will admit, if I had my say, they would not be joining us either. This is a job for senior guardians. Unfortunately, they are all we have. All of our most powerful guardians are stuck defending against the undead. Their attack has become increasingly intense as time passes. That we could gather even a full platoon in such a short amount of time is a miracle in itself. Zolzia glanced down at her feet and softly said, you can't keep protecting me like this. Jiutan's eyes softened. Zaya, I'm just were. She right, you know. Artemis walked over, dressed in full armor and ready for war. The powerful Aklat in human form looked between father and daughter before continuing. You can't protect her from all the world's evils. All that will do is make her weak and unable to protect herself when you're no longer by her side. Jiutan frowned and narrowed his eyes addressing the woman, with all due respect, there's a difference between giving her room to grow and throwing her into an unknown situation that I'm not even sure I'm fit for. Whatever is going on, the perpetrators have been planning this for a long time. Even the slightest mistake on our part could, Artemis cut him off. All the more reason for the girl to come. As she said, she'd been dragged into this from the start. She might know or see things that could mean the difference between victory and defeat. Besides, I was doing far crazier things than this at her age. Ha 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 ha. Artemis broke into laughter. Zolzaya noted that despite the motion, not a single clip, strap, or buckle on the woman's armor jingled or came loose from its position. The young woman didn't doubt that if Artemis so wished it, her prey would never even know she was there, even after she removed their head from their body. Jiutan's frown deepened. While I love my daughter dearly, I don't think it's quite fair to compare a talent sharpened by centuries of war and battle to that of a small village grass redder, regardless of recent events. Artemis grinned at him with a mouthful of sharp teeth and responded, I agree, your girl has far more potential than I do. Zolzaya turned to her father and matched Artemis' grin. Jiutan could only sigh and pinch the bridge of his nose through his helmet. 17. Book 1, Lesson 57. We do what we must, when we can. Oh uh, oof, hey, not so tight. Gambetta yelled. In response, Zolzaya yanked the leather strap on the light guardian armor a little tighter. He glared down at her, and she grinned back at him as she spoke. Stop complaining, it's got to be tight, or it'll slip when you're moving. Besides, you always talked about how you would one day wear this armor. Well, now's your chance. Gambetta muttered to himself. Yeah, just never expected it would be in this kind of situation. Zolzaya stood and slapped him on the back. The thick elder elk leather vest barely moved. She took a few steps back and admired her handiwork. Ganbata stared back as he took in Zolzaya, already fully geared in her own armor. Technically, these were training sets from the academy, but they were functional, and many of the Guardian Scouts used similar sets. Ganbata shook his head and asked the smiling young woman, why am I going again? I happen to agree with your father. This isn't the kind of thing we should get involved in. Zolzaya frowned at him and crossed her arms. Because if we don't, who's going to keep you two out of trouble? You know he's a magnet for problems. Hey, I resent that. Yuta called from the spot where he lay on the grass, panting. Jiutan had made him run laps around the temple building in full armor to ensure he could move properly. If Yuta's plan didn't work, they needed to make sure they could get out of the way quickly. Ganbata's turn was next. Zolzaya rolled her eyes and smirked at Ganbata. What happened to the brave Gana who stood in front of the Beast Lord? Don't tell me you're afraid of a lit. Ganbata threw his hands out and yelled. Of course I'm afraid, Zaya. This isn't a game. This isn't some story in a book. This is way beyond anything we can handle. I fought the Beast Lord because that was the only choice I had. Because it was the only way I could protect you and the others and give you a slight chance of escaping. This is different. This isn't brave. This is foolish. Why are you being so childish about this, Zaya? This isn't like you. Demanding to go along on what could be a suicide mission. Arguing with your father when he's just trying to prot. I don't want his protection. Zolzaya snapped back, making the young man jump. 
Then, in a soft voice, she continued, or yours, I'm tired of being protected, Ganna, I'm tired of watching others die while I run away, do you know what that's like, to see your friends and family throw away their lives and not be able to do anything about it, Zolzaya looked down, her white knuckled hands shook, but a single tear fell to the ground as she whispered softly, I refuse to sit quietly on the cart while others die, not again, Ganbata's heart twisted, and he reached out to the young woman, Zaya, I, Zolzaya turned and marched away, Ganbata froze, Yuta pushed himself up from the ground with a groan and said, you know you're an idiot sometimes, right, Gana, Ganbata lowered his hand and sighed, yeah, I know, dash dash dash, Zolzaya crouched behind one of the academy wagons, the tears had dried, but that hadn't helped her mood, why had she snapped at Gana like that, or her father, for that matter, she knew they were just trying to be reasonable, that they were worried about her, she didn't need her gift to understand that, but that had only made the guilt all that much worse, he's right, you know, Zolzaya flinched at the voice, she looked up to see Artemis leaning against the cart, Zolzaya glared up at her, I thought you were on my side, she asked, Artemis slid down beside her and stared into the dark night sky, the darkest night was almost at its peak, they'd have to move soon, or it would be too late, after a silent moment, Artemis turned to Zolzaya and said, you say that like there are sides to take, this isn't a matter of you versus them, you can both be equally right, she paused and withdrew a small dagger, on the surface, it appeared simple, little more than a carved tooth of some great beast, etched with runes, attached to an ornate blackwood handle, yet in Zolzaya's scenes, the blade burned with spirit energy, it was an artifact, a powerful one at that, Artemis lovingly stroked the blade's surface, tracing the runes with her free hand, when she continued, her voice was soft, life is rarely about who's right and who's wrong, often, the truth lies somewhere in the middle, not always, but enough that a leader must be able to see things from all sides, if you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles, as the saying goes, that applies to all things, not just war, a leader doesn't choose the right option, they choose the best one, sometimes, that means going against the things we believe are the right choice for the sake of others, be it bowing our head to someone lesser, retreating from a battle at the cost of your pride or reputation, Artemis flipped the dagger into the air and caught it by the handle, or charging head first into a fight you know you might not walk away from, life is about choices, and our choices will define who we are, that doesn't mean others choices are wrong or lesser, only that they are different people with different understandings and goals, that's what makes the world so interesting, Zolzaya smirked and chucked as she spoke, sounds like something a priest would say, Artemis laughed, a deep, hearty laugh, I would imagine so, my mother was the one who taught me that lesson, she was always adamant that I understand others points of view before I passed my judgment on them, a younger me thought that was foolish, of course there was right and wrong, good and evil, what did it matter their reason, it was only later in life that I started to really understand, she turned and looked at Zolzaya with glassy eyes, one bad year, that's all it takes for a starving village to become bandits, the soldier doing his duty to one side is the pillager, and raider to the other, the wolf in the sheep pen has cubs to feed in her den, a true leader must understand why the enemy does what they do, only then can they make the best choice in any situation, even if it's not one they agree with, Zolzaya turned away, after a moment, she asked, then what can you do? when the best choice isn't the one you want, Artemis stared up at the obelisk and answered, you do what you can, Zolzaya frowned at the older woman, who chucked and continued, I know, it sounds cliche, but it's the truth, Zolzaya asked, does that actually help, Artemis sighed and said, sometimes, no, bandits still need to be purged, soldiers repelled and wolves culled, sometimes knowing the why of the matter doesn't change anything, sometimes you're still forced to do things you'd rather not, but other times, you learn about the nobles stealing from the villages, forcing them to starve, you learn of the battles being fought because of miscommunication, sometimes you find a new companion, grateful for saving her pup's lives, 
Sometimes knowing both stories changes nothing. But sometimes it can change everything. Artemis spoke at a small ribbon tied into Zolzaya's hair, that's pretty. My mother used to wear one like that. Zolzaya pulled the braid from her helmet and played with the thin green ribbon intertwined within. It was a friends. The young woman said. Her mind drifted back to the young woman who'd braided it, Sarnai. The young woman had been one of the herbalists in her graduation group. Despite being the same age, Zolzaya hadn't interacted with her before the trip. Oh, sure, she'd seen the woman around the village before. Slate Walker Village was small enough that almost everyone knew everyone, especially the children of a similar age. But the two had different friend groups, and Sir and I had always been the quiet and out of the way sort, similar to you two. That had changed with the trip. The two of them had become quick friends, and Zolzaya had found the girl could be quite talkative when it was something she was interested in. Mostly hair and herbs, something they both could bond over. Zolzaya had never had a close female friend before, and at the time, she thought it would be nice to have a relationship like her mother and you two's had. Then the Beast Lord attacked. Sarnai had been hurt. Badly. Nothing she or Kalak had done had helped. Zolzaya had held her even as the young woman slipped away. Then, that quiet girl had asked her a favor. She'd remembered Zolzaya bragging about the poison she was working on. It was a vile thing meant to kill living swamps. The pests could spread like weeds and were exceedingly hard to kill. They would regenerate the next year if you missed even a bit of root. The poison she was working on was still an experiment, but was designed to spread out and kill the entire thing before breaking down shortly after. Zolzaya had seen the look in the girl's eyes and had felt her determination with her gift. She'd known instantly what Sarnai was planning and had tried everything to convince her not to. But Sarnai knew she was dying and wouldn't make it back to the village, regardless of whether they escaped. Instead of complaining about how unfair it was, the young woman had thanked Zolzaya. Thanked her for being the only real friend she had. Thanked her for the brief moment of happiness and for weeping for her when she was gone. Nothing Zolzaya or any of the other survivors said could dissuade her. Sarnai would not step away from this last gift she could give to one of the few people who'd ever truly been kind to the strange, quiet little girl whom no one ever paid attention. In the end, Zolzaya gave in to her stubborn friend's request. In the end, it hadn't been the Beast Lord or his minions who had killed her new friend. It had been Zolzaya and a small vial of poison. The gentle smile on her friend's body lying in the grass as the cart pulled away had broken something in Zolzaya. It had been the final blow that shattered her heart already cracked and splintered. Barely holding together, from the loss of Yutu and Ganbata, when they finally made it home, and it finally sunk in that they were safe, she made a vow to herself. She'd never let a friend do the same for her again. She'd never let someone else die in her stead. Zolzaya was tired of running away. It didn't matter if she had to fight the very heavens themselves, or an army of the dead. Zolzaya gripped the end of her braid tightly as tears slowly slid down her cheek. A solid thud snapped her out of her memories, and she flinched as Artemis slammed the carved tooth dagger into the side of the cart and stood. She stared down at Zolzaya and Spook, whatever you choose to do, better make it quick, it's about time we got things rolling. Tears and regret have their place, but not on the battlefield. The only thing that belongs there is the determination to do what you must. She then turned and walked away. Zolzaya stared after the woman as she disappeared into the gathered guardians, then looked at the dagger still lodged in the side of the cart. After a long moment, Zolzaya stood and wiped away her tears. Artemis was right. She could feel sorry for herself or wallow in her regrets later. She had other things that needed doing now. Zolzaya reached out, grabbed the hilt of the dagger, and pulled. Despite being buried half its length in the hard wood, the blade slid out as easily as if it were butter. She stared at the blade for a long moment, then pulled out her own dagger and placed it on the side of the cart before slipping the tooth dagger into the empty sheath. This time, there would be no running away. Dash dash dash. 14. Book 1. Lesson 58. Be brave, and walk forward. Yuta took a deep breath to calm his nerves. Despite how confident he'd explained his plan to the head priest, part of him questioned if this would work. The memories shoved in his head were old, older than even the wandering cities. A lot of things could change after such a vast stretch of time. Things broke or degraded, 
people messed with things they shouldn't. Even the changes in the environment or topography could have shifted the parameters in unexpected ways he had no way of accounting for. All he could do was trust what he'd been given and move forward. If he didn't, you two shook his head and focused on the task before him. He stood before the small dory eye that marked the entrance to the Earth Elemental's territory. The thick braided rope covered in small talismans circled the area to either side, held up by tall stone pillars every 50 meters. The pillars marked the original boundary zones, while the rope and dory eye were later additions by the Prima Temple to keep people out. A sudden hand on his shoulder made you to flinch, and he turned to see Alagan standing beside him. Despite only being a few years older than himself, Yuta couldn't help but admire Alagan. Not only was the man far more powerful, nearing the upper mid, silver spirit, step now, but his talent, confidence, and wisdom were all things Yuta had been envious of ever since the graduation trip. That it was Yuta standing here, and not Alagan, felt wrong to the younger man. This was a job for the brave and strong, not for someone like him. Yuta turned and held up his shaking hands, clenching and unclenching them repeatedly to get the blood flowing again. Alagan grinned at him and asked, nervous? Ha! Yuta laughed, not taking his eyes away from his hands. Nervous? No. Terrified? Absolutely. What if I'm making a mistake here, Alagan? Yuta turned and looked at the older man. There's no guarantee this is going to work. People could die and it would be M. Alagan punched Yuta in the arm. It was a light hit, and the young man's armor absorbed most of the blow, but it was still enough to make him stumble. Alagan stared down at the young man with a frown as he spoke. None of that, you two. Not at this point. Too many people are relying on you now. It will break morale if they see you breaking down and second-guessing yourself. You two shook his head and whispered, that's the point. I, why me? Alagan folded his arms and raised a brow as he asked. Why not? What happened to the brave young man who was willing to face down the Beast Lord? Yuta turned back to stare at the wandering Earth Elementals. After a moment, he muttered. That was. Different. Gano was right. That wasn't bravery. That was desperation. That was knowing I was going to die and wanting that death to mean something. Even if just a little bit. I was a terrified trapper trying to buy some time not some hero. Alagan laughed heartily, throwing his head back. Yutu's face went red, and Alagan looked down at him and grinned. Kid, let me tell you something. There's never once been the same man who's stepped on the battlefield and not been scared. You should see the new recruits quaking in their boots the first time they go on a guardian patrol. Fear can be a good thing. It keeps your mind sharp and lets you spot dangers before they become a problem. Alagan turned and looked at the elementals as well as he continued. Fear means standing in the enemy's path because you know those behind you will die if you don't. Bravery doesn't mean not having fear. It means doing what you must, despite your fear. Alagan patted Yutu's shoulder again, saying, You stood in front of an enemy far more powerful than you could ever have hoped to defeat. Yet, you didn't cower or plead or run like many lesser men might have, knowing you would die. You fought to give those you loved just a few more moments. If that is not bravery, then none in this world has ever been truly brave. Yutu's face turned a deeper shade of red. He knew the older man was exaggerating. He sure as hell didn't feel brave. Nonetheless, Yuta stood a little taller, and his hands were a little calmer. The young man took another deep breath and nodded. He would do this. Not because he thought he was special or because he thought only he could but because he had to. Because it needed to happen. The guardians are ready to move out. Are you ready, you two? A voice called from behind. You two and Alagan turned to find Jyotan, Artemis, and Kalik approaching. Behind them, a platoon of 48 guardians and the four scions stood at the ready. A small squad of Eclat guardians stood off to the side in their own formation. This was Artemis' own squad and would act as both guide and their elite strike team once they arrived at their destination. Each was a powerful combatant that could have given even the Scions a run for their money. On the other side, the head priest stood with several other high-ranking clergy members and a dozen Jade Walker nobles. Most of the powerful families were on the wall, fighting, so of course, 
those nobles left were those unwilling to step on the battlefield, though apparently not unwilling to stick their nose into business, especially after the four scions had been recruited to the mission. Yuta stared at the gathered force, knowing not all of them would make it home, but pushed the thought out of his mind the next moment. He turned to look at Jyutan and nodded before saying, Yes, sir, I'm ready. Jyutan nodded and turned away, yelling orders. Alagan grinned and followed him. Artemis stared at the young man in silence for a moment before nodding and turning away as well, walking toward her squad. Kalik was the last to turn away. She walked toward him and hesitated. She wasn't great at these kinds of things. Finally, with a frown, she stepped closer and embraced the young man. As she stepped away, she softly spoke, I'm sorry for dragging you kids into all of this. For not being strong enough to protect you like I should have been. Whatever happens, I wanted you to know, as your teacher, I'm proud of how you all have grown. Yuta stood frozen as the older woman pulled back and turned away. As she walked away, she called out over her shoulder. Now go show them what a slate walker can do. Yuta snapped out of it a moment later and nodded. Yeah? He would do just that. Dash dash. Everything was in order. The platoon moved into position behind the Torii while the Eclipse squad spread out on their perimeter. If something did happen, their strongest would be the first to meet the issue. Yuta stood directly inside the Torii, working up his nerve. The night was eerily quiet. Not even the sound of the wind could be heard, let alone the constant clash of battle beyond the distant walls. It was as if the entire world had paused to witness this moment. Yuta took a deep breath, then stepped past the archway. The effect was immediate. Under Yuta's feet, a large array appeared. Its flowing runes circled and shifted until finally locking into place with Yuta at its center, his eyes glowing with flickering white and black light. The Torii lit up in a spiraling pattern of runes ignited by white flames. As the flaming runes passed the rope tied on the sides, they, too, caught fire and raced along its length. The gathered guardians tensed. This was definitely not normal. As each talisman caught fire, the flames strengthened until they reached the first supporting pillars. The white flames engulfed the pillars and ignited hidden runes along their surface. When the flames reached the top of the pillar, they shuddered, then slammed into the ground, like spikes being driven in, leaving behind a small stone platform with a complex array on its top. At the same time, the white flames reached the next set of pillars, and the process repeated again and again. All along the perimeter of the earth shrine, pillars ignited and slammed into the ground, the process speeding up as time passed. Finally, the last pillar on the other side of the shrine slammed into place. All was silent for a brief moment before the arrays on each of the stone platforms that had once been pillars started to spin. As one, each array unleashed a blinding beam of white fire directly toward the main obelisk. The dozens of beams struck the very tip of the obelisk, and the earth began to shake. The earth elementals all froze their eternal patrol and turned to stare at the obelisk. Then, with one mind, they bowed. The shaking ground intensified, and many struggled to stand. Throughout the city, sound returned as chaos and confusion spread. Then, slowly, things began to push themselves from the ground. Various buildings, some tall, others short, some simple and humble, others grand and looming, pushed their way upward until, after a few moments, what had once been an empty field was now a small stone city. Zalziah and the other slate walkers recognized it instantly, it could have been the twin to the ruined city they'd found with the Lord Protector. Had this, had this been here all along, just waiting to be reawakened? Most of those gathered stared in awe at the site, and several clergy members were already running around or sending messages back to the temple. Few missed the greedy murmurings and glares of the gathered nobles, though thankfully, the head priest was sharp enough to know how to handle that lot. Once the new city had settled and the rumbling stopped, the array under Yuta flashed, then vanished. Yuta crumpled to the ground, panting. Gambata and Zolzaya rushed to his side and gently lifted him up as Jyotun approached. Jyotun smiled down at Yuta and patted him on the back as he spoke. Good job, lad. Never doubted you for a second. What we're looking for should be at the obelisk space, correct? Yuta, still out of breath took a deep swig from the water skin that Zolzio had passed him and nodded. Yes, yes sir, the main complex should hold the teleporter node. 
If we can get it back online, it should take us directly to the Prima Temple, or at least somewhere in the city. There were several arrival points for pilgrims, but most of those might not be active any longer. There's just one problem. Jutan frowned and sighed. Of course there is. Yuta flushed and turned away as he continued, I wasn't able to deactivate the defenses. Whatever's happening at the Prima Temple has the system in chaos, and it's not listening to any remote commands. We're we're going to have to fight our way through. Jutan's frown deepened as he stared at the moving shadows filling the city. I'm not looking forward to fighting an army of earth elementals inside a stone city. He said. Yutu shook his head and responded. It's not as bad as it sounds. The system has decayed to where it can't recognize friendly from hostiles. That might mean we can't just waltz in. But it also means the elementals can't bring the city down on us, either. It's protected from that kind of manipulation. If anything, the tight streets will help us deal with their numbers. Artemis made her way over and finished the thought. And if any of the big boys show up, I and the lads will show them a good time. Jutan was still frowning but nodded nonetheless. He turned to Artemis and said, that sounds like a plan. Let's get this show on the road. The quicker we can get to the teleporter the quicker we can rescue your sister and put an end to whatever the hell this all is. Artemis nodded, grinning ear to ear, then led the charge into the sleeping stone city. 15. Book 1. Lesson 59. Pride has no place in the face of the enemy. Dash dash dash. At the center of the Jade Walker's Earth Shrine. Dash dash dash. Are you ugh? Artemis roared nearly as loudly as the large, upper, golden spirit, earth elemental as her weapon made contact with the behemoth's wide fist, the odd weapon cut cleanly through the hard stone appendage, and a sizable chunk of the creature itself, at first, Zolziah didn't know what to call the weapon, until her father identified it as a monk's spade, using a spade as a weapon has seemed, strange to her, but apparently, it was a common weapon among the priesthood, at least for those in the earth temple, as funeral rites were an important part of their duties, the earth elemental froze, then crumbled to pieces, its core having been smashed, but the creature was soon replaced with another as it barreled through the ruins of a small house to the side of the courtyard, all around them, guardians battled with various earth elementals while you two and the several senior priests worked to unlock the seal on the large building behind them. Their trip through the newly revealed city had been quiet at first. The group had moved silently enough, and the elementals had been deep enough in the city that they'd attracted little attention. That had changed as they drew closer to the open square near the obelisk. Like a switch had been flipped, the lesser elementals had swarmed them through the alleys and surrounding streets. What had been a sedate trek through an abandoned city became a slugfist as they had to fight for every inch of ground. Thankfully, the relative power of the group meant they made steady, if slow, progress with no actual damage. Of course, life is never that simple. Once the group had made it to the open plaza, they'd made a beeline for the main building at the obelisk space, only to find it sealed shut. The assault never stopped, of course, and they'd been forced to bunker down in front of the building and fend off the horde while others worked to crack the seal. It was about that time that the more dangerous elementals had showed up. Giant, lumbering things, they'd crashed through the buildings, rampaging through their own allies to get at the humans. Most were only, silver spirit, but their sheer size and mass meant that multiple guardians had to contend with each. What's more, a stronger elemental would show up from time to time. These could only be handled by Artemis. Maybe two or three of her elite saw the scions working together if she was busy with another. These attacks became more frequent with time, and even Artemis showed signs of tiring. If they didn't get inside quickly, there might not be an option for much longer. Zolzaya was doing her part as well. She couldn't fight, not against this enemy, but she was working double time transporting and stabilizing the wounded. Very few had any serious injuries, at least nothing that couldn't be field dressed and quickly patched. The worst so far had been a broken arm when Monk had blocked the blow of a golden spirit, elemental that had slipped by. That she walked away with only a broken bone testified to the defensive expert's skill. After Zolzaya had splinted her arm, the typically shy woman had switched her now slightly bent shield to the other arm and charged back into the fray. 
something had been bugging Zolzaya for some time, though something she couldn't quite place. Ever since more powerful elementals had shown up, something tickled her brain. During one lull in the fight with no strong elementals present, Zolzaya sat down and focused on the feeling. Her gift bloomed outward, and the emotional currents surrounding her became less of a general feeling and more of a real, tangible thing. It was like the difference between hearing a song on a recording crystal versus hearing it live and in person. She was almost overwhelmed by the raw spectrum surrounding her. Fear, anger, frustration, pain, the guardians might have been powerful, but they were still people at the end of the day. The fight was grinding them down. Yet, pushing all of that into the background was the feeling of sheer determination and steadfast resolve to do what they had to do. Zolzaya clung to that feeling like a steady, unmoving rock in a stormy emotional sea, more centered. Zolzaya focused on the strange feeling she'd had before, trying to pinpoint it. At first, she couldn't feel anything. It was like trying to grasp a shadow. It just kept slipping away from her, then, finally, she grabbed hold of it, it was faint and flickering, like it was struggling against her gift, but she should still see it. There, in the city, a tiny, flickering spark of dark, of malice, hatred and anger, cold and black, unlike the burning flames of the guardians. Suddenly, the black spark turned in their direction, had it sensed her? No, that shouldn't be possible, what then? As if in answer, the sound of crashing buildings could be heard from the same direction, the guardians lined up and readied themselves, but the black spark flickered and disappeared just before it entered the courtyard, reappearing off to the side, however, the crashing never stopped, and another, golden spirit, elemental soon crashed into the plaza, Artemis slept through the air, stepping over the heads of lesser elementals as she made her way to the giant, Zolzaya stared in confusion, what was going on, elementals didn't register in her gift, unlike people or animals, elementals were more forces of nature than living things, only the truly powerful had anything close to what could be called emotion, only as she felt the black spark move back deeper into the city, did it finally click, Zolzaya withdrew her gift and stood, she had to tell someone, but who, it would take some time for Artemis to finish off this one. Kalik was with you two and couldn't be distracted, while her father and Alegin were both in their own battles. She desperately searched the area, looking for anyone at all she could pass this info to. That's when she spotted him. She just really wished she hadn't. Dash dash dash. Monk Kniss skate paced as the guardian pounded out the large dent in his armor. Hurry you fool, get that repaired before more of them show up, or so help me, field repairs like this weren't something he'd normally bother with, but against an enemy like this, there was no way he was going out there without proper armor, it didn't help that his specialization in blunt weaponry made him especially effective against their stony foes, meaning he was expected to fight the stronger, silver spirits, that had been showing up, how did he get himself wrapped up in this? They were told this would be a quick trip through the shrine to escort priests to the obelisk. It was a job his squad had done several times before. Then, a bloody city had appeared from nowhere, and now they were fighting a war of attrition between a rock and a hard place. Literally, his only compensation was that the other scions had it just as bad, if not worse. After all, a sword, spear, and bow weren't nearly as effective against this particular foe. As his nerves and temper rose, a voice called him out. E skate, Monken's heart palpated briefly, but a simmering rage soon replaced the feeling. He barely suppressed it as he turned around to look at the harlot who'd caused him so much embarrassment recently. Cyan Northgate still wouldn't shut up about the story, and he was sure it had already spread throughout the city. He didn't have proof she was actually involved, of course, but he knew she was. Somehow, Zolzaya stared up at him with a scowl that matched his own. What is it, girl? Some of us actually have enemies to kill instead of running around playing nurse. Or are you here to complain to me like you whined to your father? What, the adventure not what you thought it would be? Monk and smirked and asked, he could see the anger flash through her eyes and seeing her squirm at the barb gave him a dark pleasure, but to his surprise, no snarky, biting retort came, instead, Zolzaya took a deep breath and said, I'm here to report a new discovery, Monken narrowed his eyes and frowned, oh, 
And what information could you possibly have? Zolzio stared him in the eye and said, someone is leading the larger elementals to us. Munkin laughed. That's a good one, girl. We're the only ones in the city. Who? Why? Where did you even get this information? Zolzio looked away. That's confidential. You just have to trust me. Munkin threw his arms out. Stop playing games, girl. This is war. You expect me to believe some outlandish theory, and what? Pull men away from the defensive line to chase some phantom that may or may not even be there, that finally got a reaction. Just. Not the one he'd been expecting. Zolzaya's eyes snapped back to him. Her face red. This isn't a game, Munkin. We don't have time for me to explain why I know. But for the love of all the lives here, I'm asking you to trust me at least this once. Munkin frowned and stared down at her. This wasn't like the country bumpkin who'd claw and spit venom when you poked her enough. No. Her words held more force than he would have expected, and her eyes held genuine fear. Munkin narrowed his eyes and asked, How certain are you of this mysterious source of yours? Zolzio stared back and said firmly, enough to stake my life on it. Munkin's frown deepened, and he snapped his fingers. The shadows bubbled, and a young woman dressed in light, black dyed armor appeared beside him. Zolzio lifted an eyebrow, maybe recognizing the woman from their previous encounter. Without taking his eyes off Zolzio, Munkin spoke to the new woman beside him. Lieutenant, take half the scouts and spread out along the perimeter. Report anything out of the ordinary immediately. The black leathered lieutenant turned and asked, Is that wise? With how hard the elementals are pushing, if she's wrong, we. Munkin turned to look at her and cut her off. Just do it. The lieutenant bowed and vanished into his shadow. The man turned to look at Zolzaya and said, You better be right about this. Dash dash dash. Kalik frowned as she watched the fight between the guardians and the elementals progress. It was going well for now but they couldn't keep this up for long. All it would take was one mistake, and their position would be overrun. She turned back to the shrine door and stared at the arguing priests. They'd not been much help either. According to them, they had never seen this seal on the earth shrine, and it was taking far longer than they'd expected to open it. Apparently, the thing was closer to an array than a magic seal, and it wasn't responding to any they normally would do. Thankfully, Yuta and one of the senior priests had experience in arrays, and the two of them were working together to crack it. The question on everyone's mind was whether they would make it in time. A sudden commotion drew Callie's attention, and her heart sank. From the city, six giant figures rose, the blood drained from her, and she yelled at you two, get that door open, now. We're trying, we're trying. Was the panicked response. Kalak turned her attention back to the battle as the six midranked, golden spirit, elementals lumbered into the fray. This wasn't good. Artemis could deal with two, maybe three, of them if she pushed herself, while the scions and elites took care of another. But one would inevitably slip through and wreak havoc on their front line. If they didn't open those doors soon, they would lose people. Suddenly, one of the giant elementals turned away from battle and swung its fist at something hidden by the buildings. Kalik frowned, great. What now? Kalik's unspoken question was soon answered as one of the scions, accompanied by several scouts, appeared from the dust, chasing three black veiled figures. Cultists? Were they the ones responsible for luring the elementals into them? She'd known the guardians had been dealing with cultist attacks ever since the undead showed up, but how had they gotten into the shrine? The scion and cultists dodged and weaved through the elementals' attacks, but eventually, the scion and his scouts cornered them. Two were peppered with arrows, while the third took a heavy blow from the scion's two-handed war mace. The cultist went flying and slammed into the hard stone wall of a nearby building. They'd only stood up on shaking legs when the giant elemental's foot mooted the effort. The scion and the scouts took one look at the elemental, whose attention was now fully on them, before making a hasty retreat. The death of the cultist was a trigger, however, as a dozen more black-clad figures appeared from the city. Individually, they weren't the strongest, ranging from mid to high rank, silver spirit. But they were intelligent and focused on harassing the stronger members of the guardians while the golden spirit elementals slowly approached. It's open. 
Yutu yelled. Kalik's eyes snapped to Yutu just in time to see the large stone doors slowly slide open with a rumble. She turned back to the battlefield and yelled out with a spirit-enhanced voice, Retreat, retreat to the shrine. The order was repeated a few times, and slowly, the front line shrunk backward, and the guardians made their way to the open door. Kalak turned and rushed inside. The grand hall was elegantly crafted, if simple, but no one had time to admire it. The group rushed through the long hallway and arrived at an open courtyard. There, at the base of the obelisk, was a large stone platform that looked like it could easily fit two or three hundred people. Yuta pointed at the platform and yelled, there. The group rushed to the platform, and a quick head count showed everyone was present. They'd not lost anyone. Yet, further down the hall, the elemental swarm pushed toward them. The doorway prevented any of the larger ones from entering, but Shikalik was sure the giant elementals could just knock the walls down if they so wished. On top of the courtyard wall roofs, the surviving cultists appeared in puffs of black smoke. You two. Get this thing running, now. Artemis yelled. I am. Just give me a. There. Yutu's eyes lit up with a bright white light, and the platform shook. The cultists drew twisted looking bows and fired at them, but a blue energy shield popped into existence at the edge of the platform, blocking the arrows. A dozen rune rings slowly rose from the platform, circling and spinning in all directions. They sped up, faster and faster, as a heavy static filled the air. The last thing Kallik saw before the world flashed white as the courtyard walls collapsed and several giant elementals plowed through. Dash dash dash. When Kallik could see again, the courtyard was empty, as if the elementals had been whisked away. No. It was they that had been. While the courtyard appeared nearly identical to the one they'd just left, there were differences if you paid attention. Things looked less. New like the walls had been exposed to the elements for countless years, the damage was different in places, and the obelisk behind them was much smaller, only a dozen meters tall. The group piled off the platform, a few people collapsing in exhaustion. All Kalik could do was stare through the large hole in one of the collapsed walls at the burning city beyond. Had they really escaped, or had they jumped from the pot into the fire? 13. Book 1. Lesson 60 call in the cavalry. All was darkness, the silent black infinity stretched out before him, accompanied by only the deep rumble of stone. Then suddenly, light, a pinprick of red flickering in the distance. Slowly, it grew larger as the black void rumbled and shook, then, like a newborn flame roaring to life, it expanded. The stone wall in front of him crumbled away, and Alpha stepped out of his rocky tomb and into the top of the wall that had given him so much trouble. He moved the torp closer to the edge of the wall and peered out into the burning city beyond. Deep roars, like the sound of an earthquake, echoed through the abandoned city of stone. They were met with the garbled, broken cry of a million dead voices. Alpha shook the last remains of stone dust from the torp and, with a hiss, opened his pilot hatch. A cyclone of air shot out, circling back around and materializing into number seven beside him. Alpha's strange companion knelt on the rooftop and raised their hands in the air. Oh, blessed open sky. Number seven snapped to Alpha and pointed, yelling, I'm never doing that again. You nearly got us killed. What if the enemy had taken control of the wall? Oh, there was no risk of that happening. Only the wall keeper even knows about my imprint, and they're dead. These fools probably killed him, thinking they could just take over. Ha, like I'd make it that easy. Number 7 froze and stared at the upper half of a woman sticking out of the torp's nanite skin. Number 7's arm fell, and they asked with a flat voice, What are you doing here? I'm coming with you. Jishi responded, Yeah, she's coming along. Alpha echoed. Number 7 covered their face with both hands and sighed. Can someone at least explain what the hell is going on out there? How long were we in that wall? Number 7 asked, gesturing to the burning city. Somewhere off in the distance, one of the larger buildings grumbled, and an enormous stone creature, a quarter the size of the wall, rose from the rubble. Jishi raised her hand, oh, I can answer that, only a little more than an hour. Some things happened, and moving you up the wall took a little longer. Given the current state of things, I figured it would be safer than throwing you into the streets. Which would be? Number 7 asked, rolling their wrist. Jishi shrugged 
someone activated the security system at one of the siphons, that triggered the city's primary defenses to activate, but time and that, she waved to the much thicker swirling dark clouds in the night sky, caused a lot of damage, the system is rampaging, and this, number seven gestured to Jishi, again, the elemental shrugged, only way I could leave the wall, I don't just control the wall, I am the wall, number seven gawked and asked, wait, so the wall is, Jishi nodded, yup, one big elemental body, that causes some issues, though, specifically, I can't easily be separated from it, thus, the projection crystal I stuffed in this fool's soul, hey, Alpha complained, feeling like a third wheel, Jissy rolled her eyes and folded her arms, oh, stop whining, think of me as using you like a data hotspot, besides, it's one of the safest ways to do this, I don't suffer from the same issue you do, so the energy you're radiating acts as a natural shield against all, that, again, she gestured to the dark sky, Number seven sighed and shook their head before asking, I'm not even going to ask what the hell you two have worked out, that's none of my business, I want nothing to do with it, rather, what do we do now, can you get us through the city, we're running out of time, Jishi looked away and scratched her cheek, you are, uh, about that, remember how I said the security system was damaged and corrupted by whatever the hell they're doing to the heart? Well, I had to cut myself off from most of the city systems to stop it from spreading, trust me, you don't want to see me corrupted, as if to emphasize her words, a massive stone hand, as big as the top, slammed onto the top of the wall, only a few meters away, the shadows of the night deepened as the fires burning in the city were blocked by the giant stone figure that pulled itself over the wall, the creature stared down at Alpha and company, then roared with the voice of a mountain, Number seven stared up at the creature and said flatly, right, of course, Alpha pedaled backward as the elemental swung at him while number seven dissolved into the wind, coward, Alpha yelled at the escaping masked friend before returning to the elemental, how the hell was he going to deal with this thing, it was at least ten times the size of the torp and outmissed him by a lot more, his only option right now was to go around it instead, but even that wasn't a perfect plan, he could see several other similar figures wandering the city, crushing everything in their path, he might outrun one, but Alpha would have a bad day if he got trapped between two or more of them, however, the choice was taken from him as a torp sized boulder slammed into the giant creature the next moment, knocking it away, it roared as it fell and then broke into a thousand pieces when it hit the ground, Alpha paused, then turned, there, on the wall beside him, a massive construct had silently pushed itself out of the wall, on the surface, it appeared like an old fashioned M198 howitzer, like the kind Alpha had only seen in some of the ancient war documentaries from earth, but made of stone, and several dozens of times larger, dwarfing even the top, Jishi smiled down at him and said, what, did you think you were the only one who liked big guns, Alpha shrugged and said, well, let's go do this, then, then, he leapt from the walls, dash dash dash, charge, mow them down, the young woman stood atop the war machine, a single foot placed on the swerving gun turret, one hand pointing forward while the other kept the slightly oversized pasked helmet on her head in place, not helping, Alpha yelled, his point defense turrets blared and shot another zombie penguin out of the air as it leapt from the roof of a nearby building, a sudden right turn into a side street barely allowed them to avoid the fist of the giant earth elemental as it appeared around the corner, hidden by one of the larger buildings, Jissy rolled her eyes and snapped her fingers, a large boom sounded from the distant wall, followed by a long whistling sound, a second later, a massive boulder slammed into the earth elemental as it tried to follow them, the creature was thrown into the building beside it, and both collapsed into rubble, Alpha glanced toward the wall and the several dozen gargantuan stone howitzers lining its top, pointing into the city, occasionally, one would fire, obliterating one of the larger elementals or undead, Jishi folded her arms and said, don't make a habit of relying on those, even using the optimized plans dug up from your memory, they're draining mana and spirit energy like crazy, without my connection to the heart, this is about as much as I can do, 
the wind swirled next to her, and number seven materialized. They blasted away a few smaller earth elementals clinging to the top that the turrets couldn't reach and spoke. We're almost to the branch temple. Only a few more streets to go, though. Remind me, why are we wasting our time with this instead of heading for the heart? Jishi sighed and said, as I mentioned before we started, someone activated a transit point, which means someone's trying to come through the siphon. Only a very select few people should even know about the transit system, meaning either the enemy found it, or, we're getting back up. Alpha finished. Jishi nodded and continued, right. If it's the enemy, this is a great opportunity to grab some of the enemy outside their fortified position and gather information. If it's backup, that will make our push toward the heart much quicker, especially since both the defenses and the undead are thicker the closer to the city's center. The woman grinned from ear to ear and said, besides, I'm having a blast. I've not had this much fun in centuries. Alpha paused then whispered to number seven. Hey, Seven? Does she seem more bubbly to you? Number Seven shrugged and responded. Elementals are beings of reaction and stimulus. Earth elementals tend to be more stable, but they're very much affected by their environment and those around them. Besides, being a wall for Lord knows how long must be a boring gig. It must be nice to cut loose a little. Or being in your soul is affecting her. Are you calling me a bad influence? Alpha asked, insulted. Yes. Number seven responded, you could have at least hesitated. Alpha muttered, I can hear you both, you know. Jessie called from her perch, blank faced. We know, her two companions said in tandem. Number seven was almost thrown off as Alpha made another quick turn to avoid the next street. A moment later, the street was destroyed as one of the giant elementals crashed through it, wrestling with the zombified form of a massive worm-like creature. The two creatures rolled around, flattening several blocks before another boulder from the wall ended them both. Dash dash dash. Ten minutes later, the group closed in on the low, wide building that was their target. As they did, new sounds were heard over the constant earthy rumble of elementals and the various dead screams of the undead the clash of metal and the sound of human voices. Alpha pushed the torp harder and drifted around the last corner to see an odd sight. The street opened up into a large plaza. In a time long past, the plaza would have been filled with street vendors and merchants hawking their wares to the various travelers and pilgrims. Now, it was filled with a mix of undead and elementals, so thick they prevented each other from moving well. Even now, more and more poured into the cramped space pushing their way toward the squat building at the far end, past the outer walls of the building, a small obelisk, only a dozen meters tall, stood in an inner courtyard, Alpha could see a large group of humans surrounding the courtyard through one collapsed wall, beating back the tide of elementals and undead, they weren't alone, however, mixed in with the undead were a dozen humanoids dressed in black, their faces obscured by black veils. While the undead didn't seem to bother with the figures, they didn't appear to be undead themselves. Or, at the very least, they showed far more intelligence than their rotting friends, slipping between the chaos to strike at the defending humans in various malicious ways. 7. Alpha called. I'm on it. The other responded before dissolving into a torrent of wind, the small, horizontal cyclone cut a line through the undead horde and elementals before number seven materialized above a surprised black clad figure as they snuck up on one of the defenders, Alpha's masked companion dropped from the sky and skewered the black clad figure through the heart with their apier, the figure jerked, then burst into black flames as number seven retreated, Alpha didn't waste any time, either, the torp's legs flattened, and the armor on the two front legs thickened and elongated, forming a wedge shape, the torp lowered as far to the ground as it could as the treads on its legs squealed, Alpha shot forward, plowing through the weakened horde of undead left in number seven's wake, barricade breaker mode wasn't as nimble as walker mode, nor was it as fast or suited for long distance travel like travel mode, but as the name suggested, it excelled at pushing through defensive lines and getting to places where the enemy didn't want him, the torp pushed through the horde at speed, crushing or pushing them away as he plowed through their line, those lucky few who grabbed onto the torp without being crushed were rewarded with a bullet to the face from a point defense turret or Jishi's foot, 
In only a short amount of time, they'd broken through most of the horde and skidded to a stop just before the front lines, even squishing one of the black-clad figures. The torp leapt into the air and soared over the human's defensive line using the remaining momentum, landing in an empty part of the courtyard. Alpha raised his arms in the air. Ten points, woohoo! Alpha was greeted by a black and white-haired snarling woman as she leapt into the air and swung a large shovel at him. Before Alpha could turn his turrets on the threat, Jishi appeared on top of the torp and caught the bladed shovel between two fingers, stopping the wild-looking woman in her tracks. The shovel lady stared, her eyes wide and mouth agape. Another figure ran toward them, yelling, wait, stop, stop, they're friends. Neither party knew which the approaching woman was addressing or referring to. Alpha turned and waved, saying, Hi Kalik, it's about time you all showed up. You almost missed all the fun. Kalik stopped short and bowed, a closed fist cuffed in the other, before responding. I'm glad you could make it, though I'm afraid we've had more than enough of our own fun recently. Dash dash dash. 16. Book 1. Lesson 61. The right door needs the right key. Alpha was attacked twice more before the order was restored. Some hadn't heard in time, while recent events had conditioned others to lash out at anything strange. Kalik breathed easier once the two groups were content with staring each other down instead of trying to kill one another. It helped that Alpha's charge had sown some chaos in the already not too bright undead ranks. The commotion had also drawn the attention of the patrolling elementals, and now the undead horde was being pressed from the side, relieving some of the pressure on the humans. The situation improved further when Jishi snapped her fingers, and several thick stone walls rose, sealing the several choke points through which the undead had been assaulting them. When the last of the undead in the courtyard fell, many of the guardians collapsed on the spot, too tired to even celebrate. Those that could, began moving among the fallen, treating injuries or moving companions as the need arose. None knew how long this small moment of rest would last, but they were all soldiers and knew how to make the most of it while it did. Jyotan, Alagan, Gan Butter, and Yutu approached a moment later, the latter bowing at the hip. Zolzaya was still attending to several wounded guardians but watched the gathering from the side, guarded by Monk. Alagan was the first to break the awkward stalemate. He turned and spoke, Lord Protector, I am glad to see your timing is just as good as always. It seems appearing out of nowhere to save the day is becoming a habit of yours. Not that I'm complaining, of course. The comment drew a slight chuckle from the gathered slate walkers, while Alpha turned and waved back in Lord Protector mode. A hard-faced Artemis wasn't so easily amused. She folded her arms and frowned up at the metal war machine that outweighed her a 200 times over. So this is the fool who let my sister get kidnapped. What have you to say for yourself, Lord Protector? She said. As she stared at Alpha, several of the elite clits appeared behind her. Alpha slowly turned to stare at the woman. He pointed toward her. But a different voice cut him off before he could speak. A fool he may be. But the young pup would do well to distinguish friends from foe. Jessie pushed her way out of the torp's front and smiled down at the eclat woman. Artemis froze, her eyes wide. Artemis had noticed the woman when she blocked her attack, but only now was she getting a good look at her. The blood drained from her face, and the eclat woman knelt down to one knee, followed by the rest of the eclat. Her eyes on the ground, Artemis stuttered out. This one greets the prima. Dash 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 dash. Gan Butter wasn't ashamed to admit he barely knew what was happening anymore. Only a few short weeks ago, he'd been an apprentice trapper with broken dreams of being a guardian. Now, he stood on a battlefield surrounded by elites, fighting a war that could very well decide the fate of the entire Radiancy, if not beyond. Despite that, he knew he was where he needed to be in the end, even if it was not where he thought he should be. He stood by what he told Zolzaya. This wasn't a fight in which they could stick their hands without consequence. Yet she and Yuta were determined to see this through, so he would stand by them for as long as possible. That said, the whiplash of it all was getting to him. This latest revelation was just another drop in the bucket. He'd heard of the Prima, of course. Who hadn't? The Prima. The Sovereigns of Nature. The First Elementals. There were four beings of that stood at the top of the Prima Temple. 
Despite the temple's claim otherwise, many worshipped them as deities. Even the Slate Walker village had a small shrine dedicated to them. They were also said not to have been seen by mortal eyes for, well, centuries. The only evidence they were even still around was the word of the high clergy, who claimed to speak for them, and the occasional rumored blessed. Ganbata would have thought Artemis was simply mistaken, were the Eclid woman anyone else. The stone woman labeled as a prima pulled herself out of Lord Protector and sat cross-legged on one of his metal horns. That the Lord Protector even allowed this only added further weight to the claim. After all, not even the Lord Protector could stand against a god, right? Artemis fell to both knees and placed her head against the ground before speaking. Lady Prima, I implore you. A foul enemy has invaded your city, slain your people, and stands poised to complete their dark plans. Your power could be all that star, nope, no can do, the Prima spoke, cutting the warrior off. Artemis lifted her eyes to stare at the Prima, the Eclit woman's voice cracking as she asked, I, I don't understand, my lady. Surely you could, again, the Prima cut her off with a raised hand. Frowning, she rested her head in her free hand and said, I'll stop you right there and clear up a misunderstanding. It's not that I don't want to, it's that I physically can't. This is a third generation incarnation and linked to the city's walls. I'm already cut off from most of the city. The enemy might not have known about me, but they knew enough about the systems in place to ensure none of it could be used against them. Artemis stared back, eyes wide and speechless. Ganbata turned to you two and asked, third generation incarnation? You two shrugged. That wasn't part of the information he'd been given. Instead, it was someone else who spoke up. A strange person spoke beside Ganbata. It means she's a clone of a clone. Ganbata jumped and turned to the mysterious figure who had appeared seemingly out of nowhere. The adventurer leathers they wore seemed plain enough, but the bone white, featureless mask that hid their face instantly drew one's attention. Ganbata didn't know who this stranger was, but he recognized them as the one who had been slaughtering the cultists only moments before the Lord Protector had arrived. The masked figure turned their gaze to Ganbata, and the young man shivered, an icy chill running down their spine. The mysterious figure spoke again. Elemental reproduction is complicated. Most assume they naturally appear in places with high spirit energy. But the truth is something different. All elementals have the ability to split themselves. With enough raw materials and spirit energy, they can create an exact replica of themselves for one purpose or another. Thus, all elementals, in one shape or form, are copies of the original four. The Prima Ganbata furrowed his brow, frowned, and said, That doesn't make any sense. Are you telling me that her, Ganbata gestured to the woman sitting on the Lord Protector, and that, thing, he gestured to one of the gargantuan walking rubble piles visible over the courtyard walls, are the same? The masked figure turned and looked at the giant elemental in the distance, then looked back at Ganbata. Nope, two totally different beings, he said. Ganbata's frown deepened. But you just said. The masked figure signed and continued. Look, I said it was complicated. When an elemental splits, lots of things can happen. If there are insufficient materials or spirit energy, or something disrupts the process, the bud can come out wrong in ways. For those closer to the prima, this might manifest as a drift in personality or a decrease in power, but the further and further the generations grow apart, the more these drifts accumulate, eventually, you get those things. The figure gestured to the elementals in the city, lesser beings with no true will or even real sapience. As for Jishi, your friend isn't wrong, per se, to call her prima. The first few generations are typically so similar that they are identical, to the point that the true prima can use them as body doubles, hopping between them at will. It's like splitting your mind into different parts so you can focus on new things. They pointed to the city wall in the distance. The problem is that, being only third generation, this particular bud is about as close to the true prima as it could physically be, but they were made to manage the city's wall, not act as a mouthpiece for the prima. While mentally and even spiritually, they are essentially the same, she wields only the barest fraction of her true power. Yuta was the one to ask the next question. Ganbata turned to see the young man had never taken his eyes off the stone woman as he spoke. So elementals create copies of themselves to perform a duty, 
but sometimes, that process goes wrong and creates variants. Those variants then create other copies, and the process repeats itself until eventually, the copy is so different from the original that it's no longer even the same being. The masked figure paused but nodded and answered, yes, that's one way to think of it, however, it doesn't have to be that way, either. Theoretically, under perfect conditions, a copy can continue to replicate perfectly with little to no drift, into infinity, at the same time, a prima can purposefully choose to create an entirely different being, even from the second generation, the Fuji King, elemental lord of flames and smoke, is said to have hundreds of nearly identical buds, all working on various projects, allowing the prima to be in many places at once, in contrast, the herald of storms, elemental lord of storm and sky, has never once made a true copy, every one of his buds has been distinct individuals by design, they turned and stared back at the prima while the others talked, then continued, as for Jishi, even among the prima, the queen of the underworld has always been more, reclusive, she keeps her cards close to her chest, I can't honestly say I know how she does things, but I questioned why a third generation has been left alone for so long. Ganbata turned and looked at the others and asked, do you think we can trust her? Then, he glanced at the figure out of the side of his eye, the irony of asking that of someone he didn't even know the name of wasn't lost on the young slate walker, the masked figure laughed, do we have any other choice? Dash 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 dash. Alpha was frustrated, the leaders of the human group were busy arguing about their next step while their soldiers rested and recuperated, his own plan of charging through the enemy lines and making a break for the center of the city had been unanimously shot down, Alpha had thought it was a good plan, personally, with him leading the charge and Jishi's guns taking out the larger threats, the humans could easily guard their flanks, especially with their numbers but issues of cultivation levels had been brought up, most of the soldiers could only deal with some of the stronger creatures currently roaming the city by working in teams, their stronger fighters, including Alpha, would be spread too thin to risk a fast march, the danger would only increase the closer they got to the city's center and the storm, more so with the black clad cultists running loose. Alpha had long suspected some form of power scaling among the locals' abilities but hadn't had the chance to investigate yet. Until now, straight up asking would have risked blowing his cover, while he hadn't had time to ask Jishi herself any details, he questioned if keeping his cover was even worth it at this point or if it had all been a symptom of the supposed soul damage magnifying his paranoia, either way, questions could wait for a later time, he would wait while they devised a plan for now, but it was boring, he'd entertained himself for a short while by chasing a familiar face around with a, wasp, the pale-faced man in flashy armor had taken one look at the drone and paled even further, he then dropped the large mace he was carrying and ran away, screaming, much to the confusion of those around him, that only lasted long enough for Jishi to slap Alpha's chassis and frown at him, the AI and dissolved the drone, the armored man collapsed into a fetal position and shivered, Alpha didn't miss the slight smirk on the young Zolzaya's face as she calmly walked over to treat the man. After nearly half an hour of fruitless planning, one of the young men he'd saved prior, you two, approached wearily. The young man stopped in front of him and bowed, though his next words weren't for Alpha but for Jishi. Lady Prima, I have a message for you, from, well, yourself. The group paused and turned their attention to you two. Jishi raised a brow. Then leaned down from atop Alpha and cupped the young man's chin. Two pairs of matching concentric ringed eyes stared into each other, and she smiled at him. A message important enough to bless you for. Interesting. What do you have for me, young man? Yuta stepped back and closed his eyes, taking a deep breath. Instead of speaking, however, he stretched out his hand. The air pulsed, causing several gathered to reach for their weapons, though Jishi's calmed meaner eased any worries. Then, slowly, something pushed its way out of the young man's chest, causing space to ripple slightly, like water, at first, it was just a point of stone, then more and more of the object pushed itself out until a miniature obelisk appeared, it righted itself and moved to float over Yutu's outstretched hand, slowly spinning, the miniature obelisk was made of the same black material as the larger one behind them, but only a hand's length tall, Jesse's eyes widened, 
and she stood straight. Oh, oh, she explained before grinning ear to ear and crooking her finger toward herself. The miniature obelisk flew out of Yutu's hand and floated to Jishi, who stared at it like it was the most beautiful thing she'd ever seen. Then she laughed, a musical, cascading thing that drew every eye. When she spoke, everyone listened. Well, isn't this great? Maybe the fates truly are helping us if they brought us this. Kalik was the one to ask. What is it? Jishi turned to the grass redder and, still grinning, said, A key. 12. Book 1. Lesson 62. Knowledge is key. Come on, work, you stupid thing. The nervous man breathlessly yelled at the small black jade. Occasionally, he'd glance over his shoulder or jump at some new sound. He had to hurry and inform the others before it was too late. Everything had gone to the nine hells and back, and nothing was happening how the mistress said it would. When the army of Iris appeared ahead of schedule, the conclave rushed to activate their sleepers and enact the plans already in place. They'd managed to destroy the communication arrays and several minor systems, but the temple was on high alert after some fools screwed up a simple assassination of a few interlopers. As a result, the walls were raised, and their easy victory was stolen from them. To make matters worse, the Jade Walkers were somehow still coordinating without their arrays. Through interrogation of captured soldiers, the conclave had tracked the meddling insects, literal insects, some kind of unidentifiable wasp, to a warehouse in the city, but the guardians were one step ahead of them, the place was heavily guarded and covered in arrays they hadn't yet been able to crack. How this backwater place even had something of that quality boggled the man's mind. Now, those interlopers that the conclave elders had dismissed as a hassle to deal with had somehow raised an entire city where the earth shrine was. The conclave had tried to stop them from activating the teleportation ray at the shrine center, but the daughter of the previous high priestess had proven too strong. Now, he was stuck trying to contact the elders at the Prima Temple and warn them about the coming danger. Ah, so this is where you ran off to. The man froze then slowly turned to face the source of the voice with a weak smile. P. Priest Tarkin. I am sorry for disappearing like that. Just. Needed to get some air. I'm sure you. Understand. Priest Tarkin walked out of the shadows. His hands behind his back. And nodded. Yes. Yes. Perfectly understandable. My boy. You've had a rough day. We both had. What with being strung along by these damnable cultists. Right? It's not your fault they tricked you and used you like they did. You're just a simple temple messenger. You're not trained to spot deceivers like that. The man gave the priest a nervous laugh and agreed. Why yes, sir. It's as you say. They are really pulled the wool over our eyes. I'm just ashamed I couldn't do more. Priest Tarkin laughed and patted his shoulder. Don't feel bad. They fooled even me. I must say, it's been quite an eye-opening experience for me. Even someone such as I can be humbled, it seems. The nervous messenger raised a brow. A slight smirk hidden by the darkness of the hallway. Is that so, sir? I'll keep that in mind for next time. Thank you for the lesson, he said. The messenger turned to leave but was stopped by Priest Tarkin's tight grip on his shoulder. Ah, before you leave, let this priest pass on one last lesson to his junior. Priest Tarkin pushed the man against the hallway wall and said, Deceit is tricky, used correctly. It can be a powerful tool. If used foolishly, then all it does is dig your own grave. After all, no one enjoys being lied to. The messenger nodded, a cold sweat trickling down his forehead. Something was wrong. The icy smile of the priest sent shivers down his spine. Slowly, he reached for the black blossom dagger, hidden in his robes. The dagger was an artifact blessed by the mistress herself. It was only a single use item but was strong enough to kill even a earthly transcendent with a single blow. The plan had been to use it on the head priest, but he'd never gotten a chance. Using it on a senior priest like Tarkin might have been a waste, but it would throw the temple into chaos for a while. That could buy them the time they needed to smooth things over and for him to escape. The messenger smiled up at Tarkin and said, Thank you for the lessons, Priest Tarkin. As always, your wise words have enlightened me. I'll be sure to remember them. Even after you're gone. The man's smile twisted into something vile as he pulled the dagger from its hidden sheath. Only to freeze mid-swing. The messenger's vision swayed, 
and the still smiling face of priest Tarkin seemed to double, the sound of dripping liquid and sharp pain in his chest drew the man's eyes downward, a thin stone spike protruded from the messenger's chest, piercing his heart. Slowly, he raised his head, followed priest Tarkin's free hand, and found it pressed firmly against the stone wall behind him, glowing with a faint, near unperceivable pulse of spirit energy. The messenger's grip weakened as both the dagger and the black jade fell from his hands. Priest Tarkin straightened, and the stone spike retracted back into the wall, letting the body of the messenger fall to the ground. Tarkin reached down and plucked both items from the slowly growing puddles of blood. He turned and bowed, presenting both items in open hands as he spoke. I trust this is enough to prove my sincerity, head priest. Head priest heard and emerged from the shadows frowning as he spoke, honestly, no, your mistake almost cost us everything, Tarkin, but this is a start. The head priest reached out and picked up the black dagger, he sneered at the evil thing before a pulse of energy turned the entire artifact into brittle stone, it crumbled away into dust in the next instant. Erdan then picked up the black jade and turned it around in his hand, wiping off the blood stain. He carefully placed the jade into a robe pocket before turning around. Erdan then called over his shoulder, Come, Tarkin, we still have rats to sniff out and things to do, if we're quick about it, we might actually make it out of all this alive. Priest Tarkin bowed and quickly followed behind, dash 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 dash. Thump exclamation mark dot thump thump. The distant sound of the wall guns firing was strong enough to be heard even from here as were the rumbling screams of the giant elementals as the massive projectiles slammed into them. Sometimes, the voices of the elementals, which sounded like a falling avalanche, were replaced by the soul-chilling scream of one massive undead or another. The giant undead were far rarer than the elementals, however, the danger of the undead came from their sheer numbers and the black-clad figures directing them. A wild woman swinging along monk's spade sliced one such figure in two. A floating, phantasmal shield pressed the severed halves into the ground, they struggled for a moment, then burst into black flames, the surrounding undead fell into chaos, all sense of order lost as they fell back into their base, feral instincts, charge, Jiutan gave the order from atop Alpha's back, fifty plus guardians and one war machine slammed into the enemy lines. Dozens of forearm thick nanite tendrils erupted from the sides of the torp and spearing trice as many undead at a time. They weren't effective killing blows, but the guardians who followed behind and destroyed each of the trapped undead's cause ensured they stayed dead. Even the young slate walkers were doing their part, through watched over by Alagan. This was their fourth such engagement since leaving the teleporter node, and everyone was getting into the rhythm of things. Thanks to the support of the humans, Alpha had saved a ton of supplies so far, pinning the enemy down and letting the humans finish them was far simpler, the big boys were handled by the stronger members of the group or Jish's guns. So far, the only time Alpha had to step in was against a group of flying undead that were too numerous for the humans but too small for the wall guns, a quick round of turret fire had erased that problem before they could even draw near, and the enemy hadn't attempted it again. Instead, they seemed content at throwing more and more undead at the small, advancing group, seeming less to truly stop them but rather slow them down. And for all they knew, it was working. The group had made slow progress through the city so far, and at their current pace, it would take hours, maybe days, to reach the pyramid at the center of the storm. Thankfully, that wasn't their destination. Yet, Artemis slept into the air landed on Alpha, and bowed to Jishi, your plan is working, Lady Prima, the enemy is attempting to force us to take shelter in the library, she said, Kalik stared at the large building a few blocks away, one of the largest still standing in the city, she frowned and said, it's likely a trap, they've either booby trapped the building or plan on pinning us in once, we're inside, Jiutan nodded, I don't doubt that, but that's all part of the plan, he said, why do you have a passage leading to the center of the most important location in your city, hidden under a library of all things, again? Alpha asked. Jishi chuckled and responded, you have it backward. The passage leads from the heart to the library. 
it was created as an emergency escape route, while the library itself is designed as a bunker. The heart can be an extremely dangerous place under the right circumstance. And you're sure I'll be able to fit through? Alpha asked. Jishi waved the worry off. The passage was designed to accommodate hundreds of staff at once. You'll be too big to fit through some of the side passages, but we only care about the main corridor to the heart. Good enough for me. Alpha responded. Ten minutes later, the small army was pushing its way into the library's main building. As soon as the last guardian crossed the threshold, there was a pulse of dark spirit energy, and an array carved into the outer walls flashed to life. In an instant, the building was covered by a dome of deep, black fog. One of the nearest guardians pushed their spear through the fog, only for it to instantly rot away. The guardian dropped the weapon, and everyone backed further away from the fog-filled archway. Even the metal spearhead had corroded. Artemis wrinkled her face and said, Looks like you were right. That's some nasty stuff. Let's get gone before they pull out whatever else they're planning. Where is this passageway? Jishi led the group deeper into the building. It was a massive place, easily a square kilometer on the ground floor alone. Alpha could see how such a place might have been used to shelter civilians at one point. Now, most of the shelves were barren or covered in dust and rotting paper. Like much of the city, the library had seen little use from the current Eclat clans occupying the city. They much preferred the inner areas in the main temple, stripping the city of anything valuable while abandoning the rest. The Eclat may have been powerful, but they were too few in number to keep such a large city from falling into disrepair in places. Nonetheless, it was still a place one could get lost in if they didn't know the way. A short while later, Jishi led them to an open lounge area as large as a town square, sprinkled with the semi-rotting remains of hundreds of desks, chairs, and other seating arrangements. Jishi gave the area a sad look before waving her arm to one side. In one motion, all the rotting furniture was pushed to the side, and the dust lifted from the tiles to reveal the intricate mosaic scene of four faceless beings. In the upper left, a massive man with burning hair and more muscles than anything stood at a glowing forge, shaping metal with his bare hands. Weapons, armor, and various gadgets flowed from the forge to be gathered by the tiny men below. In the upper right, a young girl floated in an endless ocean. Her eyes closed as if asleep. Behind her, countless men and women stood in shining armor as they pushed back a billowing black tide into the depths. Black, crooked arms reached from the dark waters to grab who they could, only to be chained by the very tides themselves. In the bottom right, a young boy flew through the air, grinning ear to ear. As he passed the land, black fog receded, blown away by strong gales and fierce rains, as fertile lands bursting with life took its place. And on the bottom left, a woman wearing a dress of soil and grasses raised her hands to the sky. Behind her, tall walls and study buildings pushed their way out of the earth. An endless stream of people flooded into the walls, fleeing the chasing darkness. Finally, at the center, there was nothing but a blank square. The middle of the mosaic was just a large, empty indent in the ground, as if whatever had been there had long been pulled up. The group spread around the area, some pointing at the mosaic and muttering, while Jishi directed Alpha toward the center. He stopped a few meters away, and Jishi held out her hand. The obelisk appeared in a flash of light, hovering over the center of the mosaic, gently spinning. Then, in the blink of an eye, it expanded and fell to the ground, neatly slotting into the blank slot. There was a pulse of energy, and four light lines pushed their way out of the obelisk's corners. They swirled around the floor, following the lines of the mosaic, until they reached the pictures of the four figures in either corner. The eyes of the figures lit up with a bright white light, and the building shook. Then, slowly, the mosaic fell away, piece by piece like crumbling stone, until two large, spiraling staircases were revealed, each wide enough to fit ten men standing shoulder to shoulder. The staircases spiraled downward into the darkness. Jyotun and the Scions began directing the Guardians down the stairs while Artemis walked closer to Alpha, her eyes never leaving the stairs. She shook her head, eyes wide as she spoke. I used to explore the city all the time. There are dozens of interesting places in these old ruins. Hell, I've been in this very building half or dozen times. How did we never know there was something like this here? Jishi laughed and responded. What use is a hidden passage if it is easily found? 
Number seven folded their arms and stared. The masked figure had been awfully quiet since meeting up with the humans. Alpha figured they just weren't much of a people person, so it was almost surprising when they asked, though that begs the question, if this was an emergency passage, why was the key with a different you so far away? Doesn't that negate the purpose? Jishi shrugged. It's supposed to be with the high priestess. Why she hid it with my other self? I don't know. That me was still asleep at the time. Maybe she knew the enemy was closing in on her and didn't want it to fall into their hands. Or maybe it was her way of ensuring we could get past them. Either way, what matters is that we are here now. Artemis clenched her fists at the mention of her mother. Her eyes burned as they walked toward the nearest set of stairs, and she called out over her shoulder, then let's finish this, no more games. The others shared a nod, and Alpha moved toward the stairs as well, despite the tight squeeze, the torp could still fit on the wide stairs, and they held surprisingly well under its weight. Alpha was the last one down the stairs, and as he passed the threshold, the colorful mosaic rebuilt itself above them, piece by piece. 14. Book 1, Lesson 63, When the clock is running down, switch in fresh players. What do you mean they're gone? The woman's voice shook the very room. Tugusla Usler didn't flinch when the shockwave hit him, nor when the sharp black steel knife flew past his head, leaving a shallow cut. An outsider would think the man was stoic, the perfect picture of calm. The truth was, it could be dangerous to take your eyes off Hera when she was in one of her moods. A lifetime of dealing with the woman's outbursts had honed his defenses against her off to their peak. The others in the room were less adept at such. One of the six black-clad humans gathered in the heart stepped forward, wringing their hands as they spoke. Why your lady, it, it's not our fault. As planned, we led the interlopers into the library, and there, Death Veil, a ray activated without a hitch, yet, when we checked, there were no bodies. Do not fear though, I can assume, Hera snarled and waved her hand. Instantly, all six humans burst into black flames. They screamed for only a moment before collapsing into piles of ash. Tug useless stared at Hera, his hands behind his back, a bored look on his face the entire time. Once the screaming stopped and the flames died out, Tug useless stepped forward, brushing a bit of ash off his robes. Hera sneered down at him and said, What is it? Half-breed, come to give me excuses as well? Tug Usler's mouth twitched slightly, but he turned it into a smile at the last moment, spreading his arms out wide. Why, of course not, High Priestess. Everything is going according to plan, is it not? He said. Hera ground her teeth. I don't remember a bunch of insects running around my city being part of the plan, boy. Now. The streets are filled with raging elementals, and even the very walls have turned against us. Please, enlighten me. Tugusla nodded and responded. True, the elementals are causing problems, but they're also causing problems for the enemy. It doesn't matter where the humans and that dog Artemis have disappeared to. Time is on our side. He waved to the to the heart behind Hera. Three of the five altars were silent, the keystones sitting atop them dead and drained. The fourth directed a beam of white energy toward the heart, but even now, it was dimming, flickering. Soon, it would be as lifeless as the other three. Tug Usler continued. Even if they somehow slip their way through both the elementals and the elites around the outer temple, they're out of time. We've already won. Hera paused, frowning, and turned to face the floating heart. The iridescent rainbow light still fought against the black, inky darkness above. But without the support of the keystones, cracks were already forming along its surface. Tug Usler was right. There's no way the interlopers could interfere now. And once the ritual was finished, not even the Prima could stop her. Her frown slowly morphed into a smile as the fourth keystone sputtered and died. She turned her gaze to the smaller glut pup chained to the final altar. Yes, it was time they finished this. Dash 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 dash. The captain's grip on his spear tightened, and his frown deepened. Things were not going well. The city had put up a valiant defense, but the enemy was endless and tireless. Even with the four gatehouses pushing themselves to exhaustion, the city's defenses were being chipped away little by little. 
if things were kept as they were, something would eventually give, one of the lines would collapse, and the undead would flood over the wall and into the city beyond, he stood on the top of the wall and looked beyond, the undead seemed endless, and the horde grew thicker by the moment, their front line had already been pushed back several times, and it wouldn't be long before the soldiers fought with their backs to the wall, the captain turned to General Westgate beside him and asked, any news? General Westgate shook his head and responded, no, the children's artifacts haven't been able to reach the other cities. The chaotic spirit energy in the area seems to be throwing off their controls. Even your daughter can only reach 10 kilometers away from the city before losing control, and she's proven to be the most adept. The captain could only sigh, that was a shame. Not that they were expecting any genuine support. If the Jade Walkers were struggling this badly against the enemy, then it was likely the other cities wouldn't be able to help either. He looked off into the distance and said, Then we can only pray the runners could make it. They'd sent every runner in the city toward the edge of the Radiant Sea the moment the undead had been spotted. It was a long shot, but at the very least, the sects needed to be made aware of what was happening. The general turned to look in the same direction and nodded. Dash 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 dash. John clutched his bleeding arm to his side and leapt over another undead as it pushed its way out of the ground, then twirled around the blow of another. It scraped across his shoulder, drawing another red line, but John barely felt it. If he was honest, he didn't feel much of anything anymore. Over 700 runners had departed from Jade Walker City, a small number, considering it was such a large place even with all the runners from the smaller outlying villages gathered together, but most of those were true city runners, strong cultivators who ran the prairies alone, transporting important documents and packages between cities. Those runners like himself who stuck to their village were an anomaly, such duties were typically given to young and inexperienced runners. Not that John was ashamed, he knew himself and knew that he wasn't suited to that kind of life, there was no shame in that, he felt. So how did he end up in this mess? When the runners had left the city, they had eventually split into smaller and smaller groups until only teams of five were left. The idea was to spread out along the border and hit as many target locations as possible. It had been going well at first. It might take a caravan two or three weeks to reach the sects from the Earth Shrine, but a trained runner could make the same trip in only two days. Yet, as the darkest night progressed, things started to shift, the prairies were becoming more dangerous as time passed, and the groups began being harassed by the undead. Not just grassbreakers but a wide variety of undead began appearing from the grasses as the runners passed by. John remembered hearing some guardians mention a sharp decline in wildlife over the last few months. Most had assumed it was just creatures preparing for the apex like everyone else. When the survivors from the disastrous graduation trip returned, speculation and rumors shifted to the Beast Lord and his army. Even then, no one could explain why the Beast Lord would do such a thing. Even an army could only eat so much, after all. As John observed the various undead creatures along their path, a new theory formed in his mind. What if the Beast Lord wasn't feeding an army? What if he was building one? The runner had quickly pushed the chilling thought from his mind that was way above his pay grade, after all. Nonetheless, the undead had soon started to become a menace and then a serious problem. Not long after, they started losing runners. Only a few at first. Sometimes, they'd be driven into an abyss, those great sinkholes dotting the praises. An unlucky few had larger undead pop up right from under them, while others still simply couldn't keep up the pace needed to outrun the undead. Soon, John was the last remaining runner of his own group of five, something he only attributed to his acute sense of danger, honed over decades of avoiding the sometimes malicious pranks of the Slate Walker children, he'd long passed the point of exhaustion, he didn't even know how the other groups of runners were doing, not too long ago, he could still hear them running far in the distance, or the soul chilling screams, had they pulled far enough away he couldn't hear them any longer, or had they all fallen, was he the last? he didn't know, the only fear and the unrelenting undead drove him on, now, the only thing he could hear were the moans of the undead and his own racing heartbeat, John dodged another undead as it snapped at him, barely catching the hem of his ragged uniform, that's all it took, 
the sudden jerking motion threw off his balance, and John didn't have the spirit energy to correct himself. He stumbled, then fell, bleeding off his remaining momentum as he tumbled through the grass several times. John pushed himself up on shaking arms and coughed up a bit of blood. His vision blurring, John turned and looked at the undead that had grabbed him as it slithered out of the grass. In life, it would have been a regal thing, a long, serpentine body with glossy scales that could mimic the color of the surrounding grass, deep red eyes that looked down on everything and a thick hood that had always reminded John of a snooty noble's popped collar protecting its head. The Phantom Grass Emperor was one of the apex predators of the prairies. Although its scales were now dull and peeling, its hood torn, and its head half skeletal, John knew he wouldn't have ever stood a chance against this creature, even if he'd been in peak form. The creature slowly slithered closer, a rotting tongue flicking in and out. It stopped a few meters away, and John's body froze. Maybe something of the creature's arrogant nature was still left, as the runner could have sworn he saw the thing smile as it leered down at him. As he saw his death approach, John clinched his heart, feeling a pain distinctly different from the physical soreness of the overworked muscle. Was this really all his life would amount to? Regret filled his heart, and John clenched his teeth. Even at the end, he hadn't been able to help anyone. The phantom grass emperor hissed, a rattling thing caused by a rotting throat, and reared back to strike, its mouth opening even wider than possible when it was alive. Twang! The zombified phantom grass emperor screamed as a dozen icy arrows slammed into it, covering it in a layer of frost. The creature hissed again and turned around, attempting to escape into the cover of the grass. Twang! Twang! More arrows crashed into it, pinning it to the ground and encasing the top portion of its body in ice. A shadow erupted from the grass behind John. His blurry vision could barely make out the form of a muscular woman swinging an enormous flail. The metal ball hit the frozen phantom grass emperor with an explosive bang, shattering the creature's top half into dozens of icy chunks. The woman landed in front of John with a light touch despite the massive size of the weapon in her hands. She grinned like a wild woman and stomped on the largest chunk of the creature's frozen head, shattering it further. She then turned to John and winked before vanishing into the grass further ahead. A flood of weakness swept through John, and he collapsed, only to be caught in delicate arms. He slowly turned his head to look into the eyes of an angel dressed in a black sundress. The young woman smiled sweetly down at him and raised a glowing hand to his chest. Intense pain shot through his body, to where he almost passed out, but it was soon replaced with a warm comfort that made him feel like he was melting. A third figure, this time an old man dressed in elegant white robes, walked into John's vision. The old man stroked his beard and asked the angel in black, how is he? The angel answered in a soft voice, that he's even awake, let alone able to move, is a miracle. I've never seen a body of this low cultivation pushed to such extremes, it's impressive in its own right, but, I think he'll make it. The old man nodded, good, good, bring him to the others in the back, then let's move on. The angel nodded, then lifted a limp John in her arms. Before she could move, however, John reached out and hooked the old man's robe with the finger. The old man paused and turned, an eyebrow raised. His hand shaking, John slowly reached into his runner's satchel, removed a single letter, and passed it to the man. The old man's eyes widened, but he softly smiled as he took the letter and placed it in the sleeve of his robe. He then spoke to John. You've done well, young man. Now leave the rest to us. The last thing John saw before the warmth and darkness dragged him under was the sight of countless shadows rushing through the grass past them and the undead swept away in their wake. Dash 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 dash. Elder Wu Song frowned as he watched Chi Minx I bring the unconscious runner to the back of the small army. This was the first living runner they'd come across, though reports from the scouts suggested there were still a good number along their path yet to save. Ewe, that boy's impressive. For a male man, at least. Might see if he wants a job after this mess is done. Elder Wu Song frowned and turned to the mountain of a man who'd appeared beside him. How such a large man was so quiet astounded the elder, though maybe that was to be expected of number one. The leader of the mercenary group, simply called the camp, couldn't be someone so simple as his bandit king appearance might lead others to believe. 
The short time Wu Song had spent with the man left no doubt that the camp leader's mind was as sharp as his blade. Wu Song turned and looked deeper into the radiant sea. It seemed your intel was accurate, number one. I'm glad we could catch this when we could. If the undead had spilled out of the prairies, he said. The large man laughed and responded. I, though I'm surprised you origin folk were so quick on the draw yourself. Almost like you knew something was about to happen. Wu Song coughed and turned away. We have our ways. The old man turned, frowned at the swirling dark clouds in the distance, and muttered. I just hope we are not too late. 11. Book 1. Lesson 64. Expect the unexpected. Next. I signed up for a cult. Not to sweep the floor. The black-robed, red-headed woman threw the broom to the ground. She turned and kicked a nearby wooden chair. It flew across and shattered against the stone wall of the courtyard. A few wandering undead turned at the sound, but otherwise didn't react. Another broom-wielding cultist, an older man, shrugged and said, May, it's not that bad, newbie. Gotta start somewhere. Besides, someone's got to clean up the place. Otherwise, the undead just shed everywhere, stinking the place up. A nearby zombie tripped and fell, leaving behind a dried piece of rotted flesh as if to punctuate the man's words. It stood back up and walked off as if nothing had happened. The black-robed man sighed and swept the mess into a nearby pile. A younger man with slit eyes leaned on his broom, resting his chin on the hand, and grinned ear to ear, old hose, to hear the way the uppers talk. You've been sweeping up after the undead since most of them were still fresh. Old has smirked and pointed a thumb deeper into the courtyard. Aye, but it's better sweeping up after the corpse than ending up like that lot. The group peered deeper into the courtyard, where a group of cultists surrounded a bloody ritual circle. Five men were chained to the ground in its center, surrounding a pile of bleach white bones. The younger male cultist grimaced and asked, Oh oh oof, bun taker? What did they do to deserve that? The red-headed woman sneered and shook her head. From what I heard, they let the interlopers escape. Had them locked nice and tight, and still slipped through their fingers? Ridiculous. Heard their squad leader got dusted by the lady when they told her, to. She answered him. The young occultist looked at her, his eyes wide. Seriously? I honestly can't tell which is worse. Remind me never to apply for management. Grunt life for me. Old has shook his head. It's a waste, is what it is. I've worked under half a dozen cult leaders, and not a one of them knows a damn thing about proper workforce management. It's all fear me. This or conquer the world. That bar. The younger cultist pointed toward the circle. Looks like they're starting. The bloody ritual circle deeper in the courtyard glowed an ominous red. It started as a faint light but intensified in pulsing waves as the surrounding cultists chanted their dark verses. As the light grew brighter, the screams of the chained men grew louder. After several minutes, the light, chanting, and screams all reached a crescendo, and the bodies of the chained men burst from within, spraying blood over the circle. From the bloody remains, pristine white bones rose into the air, untouched by the blood or gore. Slowly. They floated to the circle's center and added themselves to the pile. A man in an ornate robe walked forward, holding a dark orb as the cultists continued to chant. He stopped at the circle's edge, careful not to cross over the line, and held out the orb. Both the orb and the pile of bones pulsed together like a single heart beating. Dark smoke poured from the orb, and it soon filled the circle until only the red light of the ritual lines could be seen glowing within, though the smoke never spilled from the boundary line. The orb then softly floated away from the man toward the bone pile. It hovered over the pile for a brief moment before dropping inside. The chanting ceased, and all was still. Then, suddenly, the bone pile began to rattle and shake, slowly rising into the air, as it did. It took on a humanoid shape, though with a far broader chest and longer limbs. Its five meter tall figure was heavily armored with various bone plates, and its long arms ended in vicious claws. The newborn Buntaker spread its arms wide and broad, sending shockwaves through the air. It stepped out of the ritual circle and bowed to the ornately dressed cultist. The man smiled and turned round. The Buntaker stood and silently followed, with the remaining cultists filling in behind it. As the group passed Old Hose and the young cultists, the slit-eyed young man whistled and muttered to himself, Man, that thing's a beast. 
literally, can't wait to get one of those myself, the red-headed woman huffed and whispered, bruiser types like that are a joke, sure, they pack a punch, but they're stupid as all hell and barely have any mobility, despite being some distance away, the ornate robed cultist stopped, then slowly turned and stared at the young woman, his eyes narrowing, the woman froze, a cold sweat dripping down her back, slowly, the man approached, the massive buntaker following close behind, he stopped a few feet from the woman and frowned at her, would you mind repeating that, neophyte, he asked, th that, I mean, I well, she stuttered, old has stepped forward, smiling as he bowed, she didn't mean anything by it, Lord Riasa, you know how the Yunjins can be, they read a few books and think they know how things are, please, don't concern yourself with such petty things, Lord Riasa turned and frowned at Old Hose, after a long moment, the ornately robed man humphed and turned away, Old Hose let out a sigh of relief, murmurimuum, Lord Riasa snapped back around, his eyes red and glowing, what was that, the young female cultist took several steps back, her eyes wide and hands raised, I it wasn't me, I swear, she said, her voice rising higher with each word, Lord Riasa spoke through gritted teeth, do you think I'm a fool, girl, I was going to dismiss you for Mr. Her's sake, but it seems the younger generation needs a lesson on why they shouldn't mock their betters, murmuring her, there it was again, louder, though this time, Lord Riasa could see, indeed, the girl hadn't spoken, he frowned and tilted his head, hey, I think it's coming from the wall, the slit-eyed young man said, his ear pressed up against the nearby wall, Lord Riasa's frown deepened, and he walked closer to the walk, pressing his ear up against it, now, how about now, can I do it now, no, I said wait, you're like an over-eager puppy, Lord Riasa grinned, then pulled away from the wall, it looks like we have some rats in the walls, interesting, he said, waving forward the bun taker, the surrounding cultists murmured among themselves while Old has grabbed the collars of his fellow sweepers and dragged the two far there away, hey, I wanna see the show, the slit eyes young man complained, the buntaker rolled its shoulders and raised one of its massive, clawed hands, preparing to punch through the stone wall, one of the nearby cultists whispered to the other, you think it's the temple inquisition, or hired adventurers, I haven't caught up on the latest betting bull odds, the cultist he was addressing rolled her eyes and slapped his chest, you idiot, why would it be the inquisition, we already killed everyone in the temple, it's not like one of the other temples would send templars this quick, no sooner had the words left her lips that the stone wall exploded in a shower of debris, toward the courtyard, a massive, three-horned metal beetle erupted from the stone wall, slamming into Buntaker, no one expects the Inquisition, it yelled, Lord Riasa stared wide-eyed, only to be flattened by the beetle's massive limb the next moment, the Buntaker roared and tried to swing, but the awkward angle and lack of footing caused the blow to glance off the metal horns, dealing no damage to the other creature, the Buntaker wasn't so lucky, at the same moment, the beetle's two smaller horns pulled back and struck the buntaker's bony armor one after the other, thunk, thunk, the buntaker screeched as the metal horns slammed into its chest, sending spider web cracks throughout its armor, while the buntaker reeled, the beetle's larger central horn pulled back with a hiss, the buntaker tried to dodge what came next but was too slow, faster than the mortal eye could see, it shot forward with a sonic boom, slamming into the creature's weakened armor, crack, with the sound of shattering bone, the Buntaker's chest plate broke into a thousand pieces, and the massive bone construct was sent soaring through the air, it hit the ground a dozen meters away and rolled several times before slamming into the opposite wall, the cultists stood in shock at what they'd just witnessed, but soon fell into panic as the metal beetle pulled itself free from the wall, and dozens of armored humans poured from the opening, a stone-faced woman stood atop the beetle and frowned down at it, Alpha, I told you to wait, I haven't finished checking the area yet, she said, I regret nothing, was the creature's only response, as the guardians filed into the courtyard and the cultists either fled or were cut down, Old has pulled the young red-headed woman and slit-eyed man into a nearby room, out of sight, before closing and bearing the door, as the three paused to catch their breath, 
The red-headed woman sneered and said, See, what did I tell you? No mobility. Dash 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 dash. The trip through the secret passageway had been uneventful. It was little more than a wide hallway designed to let as many people through at once as possible. Occasionally, there would be a few side rooms, presumably leading to other bunker areas or rest stops. The guardians had scouted these passages as they passed, but had found little of interest in them. These pathways hadn't been used in decades, maybe centuries, at least not since Artemis was born. Had her mother known about these passageways? She had to have. How else would she have had a key? Why had she never spoken of them then? Or about the prima bud in the wall? Or about any number of things that were only now coming to light? Artemis had loved her mother, and even if she'd not been a warrior, Metis was a woman who had commanded respect from everyone she met, not just because she was the high priestess of the Earth Prima Temple, but because she was the kind of woman you could trust with your life, the kind of person who you never had to question their motives or what they were trying to get out of you. Artemis had learned long ago that people like her mother were rare in this cold world. So, learning that same person had been hiding so much from her own daughter, it had been unnerving. Nonetheless, Artemis pushed those concerns down for the time being. There would be time later for questioning all she thought she knew. She'd pry the answers out of even the prima herself if she had to, but not now. For now, she had a job to do and cultists to kill. Maybe in the course of things, some of those answers would come on their own. When they reached the end of the tunnel, they came across another massive staircase leading up, instead of leading to a trapdoor like the last. This one opened into a large, walled off room with no visible entrance. Once everyone had exited the staircase, the Primu addressed the group. This is the staging area for the temple's entrance. It's situated just outside the primary complex and heavily charmed. The systems have degraded somewhat from neglect, but not even a midstep, earthly transcendent, could spot this place. That means we have some time to prepare and plan. Alpha looked around and asked a similar question to what Artemis was thinking. Isn't it kind of a security risk to have such a hidden location so close to your HQ? I mean, what's stopping someone from doing exactly what we're doing now? Jishi sighed. Originally, this place was supposed to be constantly monitored. There are various arrays and sigils throughout the tunnels and on both ends that would trigger defenses if anyone unauthorized tried to force their way in. Unfortunately, or maybe fortunately for us at least, the damage to the city's systems has also affected those arrays, she answered. I don't know. Still seems like a terrible idea to me. The strange creature responded. Artemis still wasn't quite sure what to make of this Alpha, or Lord Protector as the Slate Walker humans referred to him. She'd never seen or heard of any spirit beast quite like him, and unlike the vast majority of Radiant Sea natives, she'd explored the world outside the prairies for quite some time. Even if the Grass Redder's theory is correct, and the creature was a progenitor, records said you could typically at least guess at their origin, but Alpha seemed like a total mystery to everyone but the Prima, and she was being tight-lipped about the matter. Whatever the case, one thing was for certain, they were powerful, maybe more than Artemis could truly understand, just the spirit waves they were passively giving off boggled her mind. The sheer ease with which the creature had dealt with the undead and elementals on their way to the library had frightened her a bit, if she was honest. The Prima seemed to trust him, but part of Artemis wondered if even everyone gathered here could stop Alpha if he decided to turn on them. A more dot excitable part of her wanted to try, regardless that, too, she would have to put down for another time. As the others gathered and discussed their plan, Artemis' mind wandered toward a faint but familiar spiritual signature. She gripped the handle of her weapon a little tighter, hold on just a little longer, Athena. We're coming for you. 10. 